Signal Gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood Signal Dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Summer Thunder. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. There is a curious connection between an entry in the records of the British Weather Bureau and a corresponding item in the annals of the Police Department of Plymouth. The first indicates that at 9 p.m. on the night of August 18th, 1937, tourists and vacationers on the southern channel coast of England were disturbed by a radio warning. Attention, all vessels in channel waters between Land's End, Cornwall and Beachy Head, Sussex. Low pressure area approaching rapidly from the southwest. Violent storm in prospect. Put into the nearest port immediately. I'll repeat that. Attention, all vessels in channel waters between Land's End. The heat was oppressive, deadly. The atmosphere was so heavy and damp that breathing was an achievement. People at the watering places of Torquay and Brixham couldn't sleep and tried to pass the night over tall drinks and sodden bridge games on their verandas. So much for the weather report. The police records indicate that on the same night, a night when the heat had put everyone in southern England on edge, murder was taking shape in the mind of at least one human being... It began in Plymouth, in the second-floor apartment of Perry Elliott. Claudia, for heaven's sake, where have you been? I've been calling all over town for you. I'm sorry, Perry. It's nine o'clock. I know it's nine o'clock. Well, why didn't you call? I thought I'd better wait. Will you come to the point? Perry. I'm sorry, dear. This blasted heat's getting on my nerves, I suppose. I know. Now, come on. Let's sit down here and I'll explain. Now, I... I know this is going to be difficult for you, dear. I want you to try and understand. What are you getting at, Claudia? I've been up to Ivy Bridge. What do you mean? I've just had a talk with your Uncle Rodney. Claudia, you had no oh, please, right to... Perry, let me finish. He realizes now how very foolish it was to disinherit you. I think it was a good idea. For the first time in my life, I'm free. <laughs> well, listen, Claudia. I know him like a book. He's frustrated. He doesn't know which way to turn. He's discovered for once that there's something his filth the money won't buy for him. He can't pull strings anymore and watch me jump about like a marionette. Oh, Perry, you don't understand. I'm afraid I do. Did he call you? No, it, it was your aunt. Agatha? She's, she knows better than that. She's only trying to make peace in the family, Perry. I tell you I don't want his money, is that clear? He changed his will. Let him leave it that way. I said he's sorry about it. He wants to apologize. Apologize? Wait a minute. Do you know why it all happened? He didn't approve of you. He said I'd married a social climber, that I was dragging the noble name of Elliot in the mud. <laughs> Claudia, I can't understand how you could fall for it. I said I'll forgive him, Perry. I see. He's bought you off like the rest of them. Perry, you're not being fair. And you're not very perceptive. Don't shout at me. Very well. Cigarette? No, thank you. Do you have a match? I don't know what's become of my lighter. Here you are. Thanks. Well, Perry? Claudia, darling. Tonight, for the first time in my life, I feel quite capable of killing a man. Perry! I'm rather pleased about it. It'll put me on equal terms with Uncle Rodney. What do you mean? I'm going to see him, dear. Where? 
Ken. Now. Two hours later, an unreal calm settled around Plymouth. Nothing stirred. Crickets stopped chirping. Trees suddenly became very still. And the bridge players paused to note there was an electric feeling in the air. The mind of the murderer was tense, too. Like the atmosphere. Then it hit. Bridges washed out. Roads became bogs. And shortly after midnight, the telephone rang in Claudia Elliott's apartment. Yes? Claudia. Oh, yes, Aunt Agatha. What is it? Something terrible has happened. Rodney's dead. Where's Perry? I don't know. He and Rodney had a terrible scene about money or something. Did you... Did you notify the police? The inspector will be here directly. I'd better come out right away. Here's something for you drivers to think about. Do all Chevrolets get the same number of miles per gallon of gas? Do all Fords? Of course not. For it's an established fact that the mileage you get depends on three things. The condition of your car, the way you drive, and the kind of gasoline you use. Well, those first two factors, they're up to you. But when it comes to gasoline, that's where I come in. For the same company that sponsors the Whistler Signal Oil Company also makes the gasoline that's become famous throughout the West as the go-farther gasoline. Yes, for years, wise Western drivers who kept careful record of mileage found you do go farther with Signal gasoline. But what's most important is that even today, you still go as far as before the war with Signal. And I'll tell you why. You see, although certain high-octane anti-knock ingredients are reserved for war, the mileage ingredients which made pre-war signal famous are still in today's signal formula. And what's more, new hydrocarbons rich in mileage have even been added. Oh, but you're not interested in chemical formulas. You're interested in miles. And there's an easy way to prove that for yourself. Invest your next gas stamps at one of the friendly stations displaying signals yellow and black circle signs. Let your own car prove that it's as true today as before the war. You do go farther with Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. You're stunned, Claudia, as you hang up the phone. You aren't conscious of the storm raging outside. All you can hear is Perry's voice over and over saying, Tonight I feel quite capable of killing a man. He should be home in a while, Claudia. What can you do? What can you say to him now? No, he couldn't have done it. You mustn't even think of it. Go out to Ivy Bridge and see the inspector. Find out for yourself. Better take a coat. Perry's raincoat hanging on the rack near the door. Yes, it's going to be a rough trip. But you arrive safely. Evening, madam. Hello, Edmund. Is... The inspector here yet? Not yet, madam. I expect the storm will delay him considerably. Where's Aunt Agatha? Upstairs, madam. Be down directly. Edmund, tell me what happened. Where is Rock? I mean, the body. In his room, on the floor. Exactly where I found him. You found him? Yes, madam. I found him. You... You don't seem very disturbed, Edmund. I'm not, madam. I see. For 20 years I served him. Now I'm through. No, madam. I'm not uh, disturbed. Oh. What are you looking for? Oh, I, I... I had some cigarettes somewhere. There's some on the table. Oh, thank you. Matches there, too. Oh, thanks. I, I've got a lighter. 
Could I take your coat, madam? Thank you. Hmm. Get a soaking, madam. Edmund, may I see the body? Well, I don't know, madam. The inspector said to leave everything as it oh, was. Oh, please, it's very important. I won't touch anything. Very well. This way. In here, madam. Oh. He was strangled with a chain. The marks are still in his throat. A chain? Oh, but his head... Oh, bloody. He was struck first, madam. Oh, no. No, he couldn't have done it. Not very. Not very. Come along, well, madam. Claudia, Claudia, dear, where are you? I want Agatha. Claudia, darling. Why did you take her in there, Edmund? She asked me to, madam. You should have known better. There, dear. You may go, Edmund. Oh, it wasn't, Perry, Aunt Agatha. Really, it wasn't. He said some awful things, but really... Just a minute, dear. Oh, no. I said you may go, Edmund. We won't need you anymore tonight. Very well, madam. Oh, Aunt Agatha, I must try and call Perry. He may be home by now. You can't, dear. The lines are down. I just tried. Oh, what can I do? I'm sure he didn't do it. Of course he didn't. I'd better go back. The roads are impossible, dear. You'd be taking an awful chance. I know it, but I... Now suppose you get some rest. The storm will very likely blow itself out before morning, and you can go back to town with the inspector. <laughs> Yes, Claudia, you could use some rest, but you lie awake until three in the morning telling yourself over and over that Perry had nothing to do with it, never quite believing yourself. You finally drop off to sleep only to find Perry smiling at you from a hundred angles as he toys with a short length of chain. You're trying to tell him, trying to explain, but he continues to smile and tie loops and knots in the chain until finally... It's morning. Six o'clock by your watch. All you can think of now is finding him. You dress hurriedly and leave while the others are still asleep. The storm has passed. The sky is blue. And the morning air is cool in your face as you drive back to town to your apartment. The bed's been slept in. And piled in a heap on the closet floor are the clothes Perry wore last night. The navy blue jacket and white linen pants sodden and muddy. You lay them out on the floor, and then there's a suspicious-looking stain on the left leg of the white trousers. Quickly, go through the pockets. A card with a red smear on it, a fingerprint in blood. Now the coat. In the right outside pocket, a short length of chain. Oh, no, Perry. No. Yes? Inspector Dutton, city police calling. Is this Mrs. Elliot? Yes. We're detaining your husband here at headquarters, Mrs. Elliot. Oh, could, could I speak to him? He's being questioned at the moment. If you don't mind, I'd like to come out and have a look at your apartment. Oh, of course. Right oh, I'll be out in 20 minutes. Very well. Claudia, that puts it up to you, doesn't it? You can go one way or the other. You can produce the piece of chain and the blood-stained linen trousers and see Perry safely off to the gallows. Or you can do what you really want to. After all, does it matter what he's done if you love him? You better decide, Claudia. There isn't much time. First you burn the card. Then connect the electric iron, get out soap and warm water and a bottle of benzene. Blood is nasty stuff to get out, isn't it? It takes a lot of scrubbing. But finally it's gone, no trace. You iron it partly dry and rumple it up. There, a little dust from the floor and you can't tell it's been touched. But what can you do with the chain? There's the inspector. Quickly, Claudia, put it anywhere. In your purse, that's it. Good morning, Inspector. How do you do, Mrs. Elliot? You returned rather early from Marvie Bridge, didn't you? I was quite concerned about Perry. 
We couldn't get through on the telephone. Did you think of calling at headquarters? Why, well, I, I just arrived when you telephoned. I see. Now, uh, let's take a look, eh? Mr. Elliot presumably slept in this room last night? Yes. You haven't disturbed anything? No. Mm. Ah, here. Oh, here we are. Now, these are the clothes that he wore last night? Yes. Blue jacket and white linen trousers. I'll take these along if you don't mind. Let me see. Hmm. What is it? Nothing in the pockets, eh? Well, I suppose he emptied them when he changed clothes. I'm afraid your husband is getting into this thing rather deeply, Mrs. Elliot. What do you mean? I think you'd better come along. Oh, couldn't I... Couldn't I drop down later, perhaps a half hour? I'd like to clean up and... It's rather a peculiar position to take, Mrs. Elliot. Perhaps you aren't aware of the fact that your husband's life is at stake. I... I realise that, Inspector. I'll get my purse. Yes, Claudia, your husband's life is at stake. And you realise as you ride to headquarters with Inspector Dutton that his fate may depend on what you do with that short piece of chain in your purse. Oh, Inspector. Hey? I've got a frightful headache. Would you mind stopping for a minute at that chemist? I'd like to get an aspirin. Well, of course. I'll get it for you. Oh, no, please. Well, I insist. It'll only take a moment. Oh, but I'd rather. I'll be back in a jiffy. You can still get rid of it, Claudia. Look, here comes a dump truck. It's filled with dirt. Throw it in the back. Ready? Now! Missed it. You'll see it, Claudia, lying there in the street next to the car. Pick it up. Hurry. Here he comes. The sewer right next to the car. He's coming around the other side. He can't see you. Throw it. Oh, Oh, here we are. Well, they didn't have any aspirin. Will a bromide do? Oh, yes. Yes, That will be splendid. Reeves? Uh, Yes, Inspector? Uh, Mr. Reeves, uh, this is Mrs. Elliot. How do you do, ma'am? Would you get Mr. Elliot, please? Uh, Yes, sir. Uh, He's right here in the next room. Sit down, please. Thank you. Come in, Mr. Elliot. Hello, Claudia. Perry. Sit down, Elliot. Now, I want the complete story this time. I must warn you that anything that you say may be used in evidence against you. Take it down, Reeves. Yes, sir. I've said it so often, I know it by heart. I'll say it again. I left Uncle Rodney's at 11.15. At 11.30, the storm broke and I got stuck in the mud about halfway home. I was there for three hours and all. That's that juicy poor alibi. I told you I can prove it. The chap who stopped to help with... Well, what about him? I asked him for his card. I was going to try to find him and reciprocate. What's his name? I didn't even read it. The card's in the pocket of my blue jacket, though. You can call him. The card isn't in the pocket, Mr. Elliot. You can see for yourself. Here. Why, why, I don't know how... Why, it was there last night. All right. Where's the chain? What chain? Perry. Wait a minute, Claudia. I told you, Inspector, the man tried to pull me out of the ditch with a chain, but... But the chain broke. I remember putting the odd piece in my pocket. Now, what have you done with it? I haven't done anything with it. That jacket's exactly the way I found it on the floor of your closet. You're lying, Inspector. It's got to be there. It's not there. You can see for yourself. All right. When the motor went dead, he thought he might, it might be a clogged petrol line, so we drained a quarter so of ethyl from his petrol tank to fill the carburetor. I spilled some on my trousers. I remember there was a red stain on them when I got in this morning. I I never use ethyl petrol, do I, Claudia? Do I? Oh, Perry, I... Here are the trousers, Elliot. Look at them. Why, I... What? You see, Elliot? You don't have much of an alibi. Why, I don't know. I... And furthermore, can you explain the cut on your hands? They look very much as if you took too tight a grip on a chain. They did quite a bit, didn't they? I, I was holding on to the shackle when he pulled me out. It was a chain. Oh, of course. It's... It's a frame-up, Inspector. 
Someone's been in my apartment. No one's been in your apartment. Except your wife. Claudia. You. Oh, I don't know what... Take him back, Reeves. Oh, dear, Reeves. That'll be all. Yes, sir. You don't need your sister, Reeves, thank you. I can make it alone. I know it's difficult, Mrs. Elliot. Oh, they can't convict him on that kind of evidence. Just because he can't prove he was somewhere else. It'll go a long way. We have more positive evidence, of course. What? We know, for example, that he was in the bedroom of the deceased about the time he was killed. Oh, you're wrong. Oh, listen, Inspector, you've got to believe me. This may sound fantastic, but it's true. I destroyed that evidence. I burned the card. I cleaned the red spot in the trousers. What are you talking about? I tell you, I did. Why? Because, because I thought Perry had done it. The card had a bloody thumbprint on it. I thought the pig stain in the trousers was blood. I thought I was protecting him. What about the chain? I thought that was, was what he killed Uncle Rodney with. Hmm, what did you do with that? I threw it in the sewer by the chemist when you went in for the aspirin. That's why I wanted you to stop. I'm sorry, Mrs. Elliot. You... You don't believe me? No. Of course, we'll check, but, uh... uh Reeves! Yes, sir? Take the lady home. Oh, Inspector, please! I said I'm sorry, Mrs. Elliot. Good day. <laughs> Well, Claudia, you're finally beginning to grasp the horror of the thing you've done. You couldn't have made a smoother job of it if you tried to frame your husband. There's no way out. Or is there? You do believe Perry, don't you? He didn't do it. But if he didn't, who did? Rodney wasn't what you'd call a model of popularity. He had enemies, plenty of them. Some, perhaps, with motive enough to kill him. Who would know... Aunt Agatha, as soon as you can get a call through to Ivy Bridge, you telephone her. Perhaps she can help. You feel better when she arrives at the apartment late in the afternoon. I'm so glad you've come, Aunt Agatha. I've made a terrible muddle of things. I wish there was some way I could help, dear. You, you believe Perry, don't you? Believe what? Well, he's getting stuck in the ditch and having the man help him. I, I don't know. What do you mean? He acted so strangely with Rodney last night. I tried to make him understand, but first thing I knew, Rodney said some things he shouldn't have said, and there was a horrible scene. Perry went into a blue rage and threatened Rodney. I had to leave Claudia. I was afraid of him. What's that? Oh, the back door blew open. Oh, I'll get it. Oh, leave it. It's so hot. On the Agatha, he couldn't. I know Perry has a temper, but, but he's kind and good. Oh, don't you see? It must have been someone else. But who, dear? Oh, I don't know. But Uncle Rodney had lots of enemies. There must have been someone who would gain something by his death. Don't you see? Perry had nothing to gain and everything to lose. But he wasn't thinking clearly, dear. Oh, you must know of someone else. That's really why I asked you to come here. There must be someone. Why, I don't know. Agatha, they can't convict him just because he can't prove an alibi, can they? Well, I think that's pretty important. The inspector said something about more positive evidence. What did he mean? Why, I don't know. The lighter, perhaps. The... The what? His cigarette lighter. They found it next to the body. Next to the... Well, that, that's impossible. What do you mean? He didn't have it last night. He left it in the pocket of his raincoat. I had it. I used it right there in the house. And when I came back this morning, I left the coat. Agatha. Somebody took that lighter out of the coat and put it near the body before the police arrived. Afternoon, madam. Edmund, what are you doing here? I've been listening at the door, Miss Agatha. Eavesdropping. So that's it. You, Edmund. Better take it easy, madam. I've got a gun. <laughs> The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to tell you about two live-wire young Californians who typify the more conscientious, more thorough service your car gets from a privately owned signal station. 
I'm talking about Bud Morley and Frank Sager, who just a year ago took over their own signal station in Burbank, California. Both, of course, had had years of experience servicing cars. Well, before long, Bud Morley and Frank Sager had more than doubled their business. Now, there must be good reasons for such success, and there are. Those boys are friendly, courteous, eager to please. They not only give service with a smile, but include many little unasked-for extras. For after all, being in business for themselves, they have a personal reason for keeping customers so well-pleased they'll come back again and again. And there, friends, you have the important difference in signal service, a difference in thoroughness and conscientiousness that can add so much to the life of your car. What's more, it costs nothing extra. It's ready for your car at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealers. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Claudia, it came to you in a flash the minute Agatha mentioned the lighter. Edmund. The peculiar remarks he made when you arrived at the house last night. I'm not disturbed, he said. And then something about being free after 20 years. Yes, it all fits together now, Claudia. Too bad he's standing in front of you with a gun in his hand. You're being very foolish, Edmund. Do you think you can get away with this? As a matter of fact, madam, that's precisely what I was going to ask you. What do you mean? Edmund... You took the lighter, didn't you? You put it in the bedroom next to the body before the police arrived. Begging your pardon, Mrs. Elliot, but if I may say so, you're underestimating my intelligence. Do you think I'd be so foolish as to plant a piece of evidence which I knew wasn't there at the time of the killing? I saw you use the lighter, you know. I took your coat. Edmund, I refuse to listen. That will be enough from you, Miss Agatha. You'll have your chance to talk directly. Inspector Dutton is on his way. What do you mean? I heard you saying that Mr. Perry had nothing to gain, Mrs. Elliot. That perhaps there was someone with a bit more of a payoff, you might say. Don't listen to him, Claudia. Edmund, what are you trying to say? Mr. Rodney was determined to change the will in Mr. Perry's favor, madam. But he didn't. He planned to call the lawyer this morning. He told me to remind him just before the unfortunate incident. So you see... There was someone who stood to lose everything if he'd lived. If you hadn't tried to make it too perfect, Miss Agatha. Agatha! He's lying. The monster's making this up. The small matter of the cigarette lighter, you see. Only you could have made the mistake of thinking Mr. Perry had left his raincoat at the house with the lighter and the pocket. You beast! You can't prove it, you can't. You have a chance to talk, madam. And you'd better be working on your speech. Inspector Dutton is a mighty critical listener. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The 
The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, what makes a murderer? the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Murder is a peculiar affair. All it needs in many cases is the right pressure, the right set of circumstances, the right opportunity and an otherwise respectable member of the community becomes a killer. If you tried to explain that to Arthur Winslow, he wouldn't have understood. If you told him he was in a fair way to become a murderer in a few months, he would have looked at you strangely. For Arthur was respectable, solid, exactly like a hundred thousand other respectable, solid Jersey commuters. His life was a pretty drab affair. Part of it was the office. J. Simmons and Company, American investment broker. American Light, seven and an eighth, no change. Seven and an eighth, no change. American Tell and Tell, one seventy nine and an eighth, off an eighth. AT and T, one seventy nine and an eighth, off an eighth. American Tobacco, seventy seven, up one. Seventy seven, up one. Uh, better leave it there, Arthur. Five o'clock. Got to make that five nineteen. Why? Hmm. Why do we have to make the five nineteen, Stanley? Why? Why, Arthur? Because we always do. Why is that a good reason? What? I mean, do you think because we've always made the 519 that we ought to keep on making it the rest of our lives? Is, is something wrong, Arthur? Uh, maybe, I don't know. I've been thinking, Stanley. Huh? For ten years now, you and I have been analyzing investment securities eight hours a day, catching the 519 every night, arriving home in East Orange promptly at 622, kissing our wives at approximately 650, eating dinner at exactly 7, reading the evening paper, and then going to bed. Well? Well, it's a little like... like death, isn't it, Stanley? What in the world gotten into you, Arthur? I've got a book here. Hey, hey, take a look. Book? Huh. It's a novel. Got me to thinking. Moon and sixpence. Hmm. It's about a man like us, Stanley. Mm -hmm. A man who got fed up with the 519 and dished the whole works. Well, what did he do? He took a chance. He walked out, just picked up his hat, and went off to the South Sea. You mean he... he just left his family? Mm. They preferred the 519. Huh. Well, I can't say that I approve. No, I didn't think you would. Well, you better hurry along, Stanley. You'll miss your train. Yes, but what about you? Well, tonight, just for a change, I believe I'll catch the 5.55. Just for a change, Arthur, after ten years. You walk slowly down Broad Street, deliberately casual, noticing the swarms of hurrying commuters objectively, as if for the first time. It's pleasant strolling along like this, taking your time stopping to look in a window now and then. Finally, you stop at a cigar stand. Have you, uh, you got a pack of cigarettes? Well, if you can smoke them. <laughs> yeah. Here. Eighteen cents. Mm -hmm. Twenty-five and fifty. Thanks. Yeah. Say, uh, uh, what's that back there? Oh, you interested in the uh, bang tails? Huh? Bang tails. Horses. Opening up Pimbergo tomorrow. Hey, uh, come here. Sure. Now, there's the board. Take your pick. Turn it out in this car. Huh. Pink Lady. Mike the Third. Big Bonanza. Moon and Sixpence. Hey, what's that? Uh, moon and Sixpence. Top horse in a parley. Don't know nothing about them, though. Parley? What's that? You, you don't know what a parley is? No, I don't. No. Well, okay. Well, in that parley there, you got three horses, see? Yeah. Now, you put your dough on Blue Bonnet in the first. Uh. If he comes in, the dough goes on Glow Worm in the second. If he comes in, the works rides on Moon and Sixpence. In the third. Can it? We interrupt this program.
The B-29s are back in the war. The super fortresses, which have been the major factor in bringing Japan to her knees these past few weeks, have dropped high explosive and incendiary bombs on the Marifu Railroad Yard, the first purely rail target to be hit in Japan. There was no Jap fighter or flak opposition. It was the first heavy bombing Japan has received since last Saturday, the 11th. And during the three days that the very heavy bombers have rested at their bases, the diplomats have taken over to consider Japan's reluctant offer to surrender. However, the diplomats haven't done so well. If the tension here in the Pacific is any standard of judgment, the Japs have succeeded in conducting a fairly effective war of nerves against us by their failure to reply to the Allies. So now, General Spot's strategic bombers are back over Japan dropping explosive reminders to the Nipponese people they had better surrender or else. It is a feeling here that the super forts were sent to Japan as an allied prod for Hirohito and his ministers to make up their minds. If they don't, Japan can make, expect more of the same treatment. As a matter of fact, today's bombing is continuing right now. More and more bombers are over the Jap homeland, and the bombs away signal will come back to Guam many more times today. The Marifu rail yards and shops were hit by the 313th wing of the 20th Air Force, based on Tinian. Three B-29 groups planted the area with high explosive bombs. The rail yards form one of the most critical bottlenecks in the Japanese railroad system, serving the double-track rail line that runs from Tokyo to Kobe and along the inland sea of Japan. Interruption of traffic on this line will first of all affect the Jap oil supply, and more important, it will affect the critical Jap food shortage already desperate in Japan's big city. The strategic air forces are not playing tag in this operation. Japan right now is being hit and being hit hard. The process will continue until we receive that notification of unconditional surrender, or wrest it from the hands of the emperor himself when we take his imperial castle in Japan itself. If they want it that way, that's the way they're going to get it. And this is Bill Downs and Guam returning you to CBS. But that's almost a year's salary, and you're holding it right in your hand. You just walk the streets for an hour or two, thinking, gradually realizing what happened. It can mean a new car, new dresses for Ethel, and more of the same. Or it can mean, yes, Arthur, if you took a chance. It's crazy, it's wild, but if you act before you think. You walk into a phone booth in the financial center lobby. <coughs> The South Seas. No more figures. No more 519. Uh, hello? Brighton Travel Agency? I, uh, I'd like to uh, inquire about a reservation to, um, let's see, uh, uh, to Florida. Yeah. The name? Oh, yes, the name is uh, uh, Charles White. <laughs> There's good news for drivers in recent announcements that new cars are already in production. But there's bad news in the statement of Defense Transportation Director J. Monroe Johnson that it will be at least three years before all the people who want new cars can get them. Three more years? That's a long time to make today's cars last, especially when the average car is already seven years old. It means that now more than ever, your car needs the more thorough, more conscientious kind of service you'll find at Signal Gasoline Dealers. Yes, there's a very real difference in Signal service, and for two good reasons. You see, being in business for themselves, Signal Dealers have made car care their specialty. They're experienced. They know cars. And two, because independent Signal Dealers are in that business not just for today, but permanently. They're eager to please you so well, you'll come back regularly and be their steady customer. Added up, that assures you the kind of service that will keep your car happy and you satisfied. The kind of service that makes it well worth your while, getting acquainted with your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the whistler.
Yes, murder can strike anywhere, even among quiet, drab little people like Arthur Winslow. He has no way of knowing it, of course, as he buys a first-class reservation on the train to Florida. His only thought now is that this will be escape at last. New clothes, new luggage, a new name, and a new life. No 519 tonight, Arthur. It's the 730 to Florida and Waypoint. Oh, uh, which way is the dining car, waiter? Yeah, the three cars back. Oh, thank you. Better hurry along. Yes. Okay. Oh! Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> oh, that's, that's quite all right. I didn't either. I wasn't looking. Well, neither was I. Where is it? Uh, what? The book. Book? Book? Oh, yes, the book. I knocked I... it out of your hand. It must be down here on the floor. Oh, here, let me. It's probably down under the no, seat. No, let, let me see. I can... Oh, oh I bumped my head. Oh, <laughs> oh, look at the gum under here. <laughs> ah! What'd you get it? Last year's timetable. I've wanted one for ages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. There it is. Where? To the right, just a little under the seat. Here, let me... No, let me get it, please. Uh, here we are. It's a fine thing getting yourself all dusty that way. Uh, uh, turn around. Oh, thanks. Hmm, <laughs> moon and sixpence. There we are. That's a little better anyway. Wonderful, isn't it? Hmm? Moon and sixpence. I loved it. Oh, yes, I haven't quite finished it, of course. Do you believe it? I mean... Do you think it's right? You mean to toss everything over and take off to the South Seas? Uh, if you don't mind, pal, while you're going to the South Seas, I'll go to dinner. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Excuse me. <laughs> we seem to be holding up traffic. We do, don't we? <laughs> Matter of fact, I was just going into dinner myself. So was I. Uh, well, would you consider... Why not? Yes, yeah, why not? <laughs> You know, I think Moon and Sixpence was a wonderful story. Of course, I can't say it was very realistic. Well, what do you mean? Well, I admit it was convincing, but when you stop to think about it, this, um, this running away business... Oh, you you don't believe in it, huh? Well, after all, running away is no solution. Well, sometimes there's uh, nothing else to do. He could have stuck it out. You mean licked it if it took the rest of his life? Yes. Or... Well, all right. All right, he licks it. He's found happiness at last. And he's 70. Mm-hmm. Is that all there is to life? Well, I haven't seen too much of it I, yet. I, I know it sounds cowardly, but I think there are times when sticking it out for 20 years is wrong. Time doesn't wait, you know. We, we beat our heads against a wall day in, day out. We're tied down to a deadly routine. And then the first thing you know, it, it's too late. No, I, I, I think running away is better than that, don't you? I did once. Oh, uh... Sorry, I didn't mean to... Oh, that's all right. That's quite all right. You see, I did run away. It was just as you said. It was routine, a deadly routine. And when I couldn't stand it any longer, I ran away. Well, what kind of routine was it? Well, perhaps you've heard of my father, Edgar Brewster. Edgar Brewster? Mm Mm-hmm. He's in Miami Beach now, waiting for me. Oh, I see. I'd finally decided to go back and face it, but, uh... Oh, dear. Now you've got me confused again. Oh, I'm sorry if I don't... Oh, don't misunderstand. You've really helped me a lot. How do you mean? Well, you seem to know why I did it. It's a kind of uh, moral support. Oh. You're going to Miami? Yes. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm I'm Charles White. I'm Vivian Brewster. Well, perhaps uh, perhaps I'll see you in Miami, huh? I hope so. Yeah, so do I. The daughter of Edgar Brewster. It's fantastic, isn't it, Arthur? You talked with her, had dinner with her. She even said she hoped you'd meet in Miami. But the first week goes by in the hotel set on the shore looking across Biscayne Bay. It's beautiful. But you aren't conscious of anything except Vivian. You wait for a call, but it doesn't come. You begin to realize how ridiculous it is. Of course, she's forgotten about you. You were just someone to talk to, a traveling companion. You can't hide the Jersey commuter under that Palm Beach suit. And then... Hello? Oh, hello. I'd like to speak to Miss Vivian Brewster. Speaking? Oh, uh, (laughs) this is Charles White. Well, hello, Mr. White. (laughs) I thought you'd forgotten me by this time. Oh, no, not at all. Uh... (laughs) 
I I thought uh, we might have a, a drink together or something. Well, why don't you come out? You mean to your house? Sure, of course. Father would love to meet you. Your father? Yes. What about it? When? Oh, tonight. <laughs> All right, tonight. Well, Arthur, you can hardly believe it, can you? A few days ago, an obscure clerk. Today, sitting with Edgar Brewster, drinking his bourbon. Is that about right, Mr. White? Father's a tightwad with his soda. <laughs> Outrageous way to treat good bourbon. What about it, White? Oh, that looks about right, Mr. Brewster. There you are. Oh, thank you. What are you doing in Miami, White? Why, I, uh, I just got a little... Tired of New York. Yeah, you get the right idea. I did the same thing myself 20 years ago. I never went back. What's your line? Uh, well, I I was in the, the market, more or less. Yeah, the less, the better these days. Nobody knows where it's going. Hard to figure these war babies. My broker and I were talking today about consolidated plastics. Know anything about it? Yes, a little. What do you think of it? Well, I don't know whether I should say or What's not. What's the matter with it? After all, it's your business, Mr. Brewster. I don't think I'd kid off an opinion. Oh, all right. I'll put it this way. What would you do if you were into it pretty heavily right now? Well, I'd sell out. When? Right now. Any particular reason? Only that I happen to know that stock is being manipulated by a, an inside ring. That it'll take the Securities and Exchange Commission about six months to catch up with them. Boy, that's unbelievable. My yeah, broker I, told... I know, it's, it's only my opinion, Mr. Brewster, but I happen to know that company's financial position. <laughs> you, you asked me what I'd do, and I just told you. You seem to know what you're talking about. <laughs> Investments are my uh, hobby, you might say. I see. May I say something now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, dear. I forgot you were still with us. I thought so. <laughs> Well, now that you've settled the stock market problem, suppose we get down to the club. The water should be beautiful tonight. What about it? <laughs> oh, I'm afraid it's past my bedtime, dear. You two run along. No place for an old duck like me, anyhow. <laughs> well, Mr. White? Oh, well, Miss Brewster? Oh, what are you waiting for? Get out of here. I'm going to bed. <laughs> And that was the beginning, wasn't it, Arthur? That $1,800 was a magic door opening up a thrilling new life for you. And incidentally, bringing you closer to murder. The next three weeks passed like a dream. More nights at the beach club, dancing in the open under the stars. With Vivian in your arms. Vivian? Yes? Vivian... Why is it you've never asked me about myself, my my background, where I came from? Oh, I don't know. Maybe because it doesn't matter. You know, I, I wasn't going to tell you, but I think perhaps I, I'd better. Will it make any difference? About us? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes, it will make a difference. It'll make a lot of difference. Well, then don't tell me. I really don't want to know. No, but Vivian, you... Please. Oh, darling... Darling, did I ever tell you I, I like you very much? I'm glad, Charles. I'm so glad. You were in love, Arthur. And for the first time in your life, you knew what it really was. Mr. Brewster began to concern you. He'd never approve in a million years. Or you thought so until that evening he dropped up to your hotel room with a copy of the financial journal in his hand. Look at that, Charles. Oh, what is it? Don't ask silly questions. Look at it, man. Hmm. I thought so. Consolidated plastic snowed under in selling rush. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Brewster. I am not. Oh, what do you mean? I took your advice. Sold out three weeks ago. I saved myself a hundred thousand dollars. Well, congratulations. Don't congratulate me. You're the one who deserves it. Uh, do you mind if I sit down? Oh, of course not. Here, here you are. Yeah, thank you. Uh, would you be open to a proposition, White? What kind of proposition? Oh, I realize you probably have other interests, but uh, I could make it with you a while, I think. There are two considerations. Yes. 
The first is the plain fact that my affairs are getting a little beyond me. As you know, I'm retired and haven't time to look after them properly. I think you're the man to take over. But, Mr. Brewster, I... I'm a businessman. If it weren't a profitable deal for me, I wouldn't think of it. I, I see. What's the uh, other consideration? I believe you're aware of that already. Vivian, you uh, approve? I do. Uh, may I have time to think this over? Of course. Just let me know in a day or so. There it is, Arthur. Brief and to the point. Everything you ever wanted right in the palm of your hand. Open sesame, he said, and there it was. You go into the bar downstairs to think. There's only one thing in your way now, Ethel. You can't run away from that. You've got to make her see your side of it. You've got to go back to her and face it. Make her give you a divorce. You walk out of the bar, through the door, into the hotel lobby. And just as you're rounding the corner by the desk, something stops you in your tracks. This is Ethel Winslow, 5769 Laurel Road, East Orange, New Jersey. Is that all you want? Thank you, madam. Uh... Could I see the register, please? Oh, I'm sorry, madam, but we don't... Well, I, I understand there's a Charles White registered here. Charles? Oh, yes, madam. Uh, room 132. Uh, is he a friend? Uh, yes. Uh, will this help? Oh, well, in that case, I, I, uh, I could give you room 131 next door. The windows open onto the same balcony. Oh, uh, very well. Uh, 131. <laughs> It was too good to last, Arthur. Just a beautiful dream, and you're just waking up. It's all over. Go back in the bar and think. Ethel, your wife, here. She's found you. And she'll never let you go, will she? You know her too well, Arthur. Cold, calculating, heartless. She'd laugh at you, wouldn't she? Yes, sir. Will it be? Bourbon, straight. Right. Uh, just leave the bottle. <laughs> You're beginning to see now, Arthur, what makes a murderer. You couldn't get away from her. Just as Vivian said, you can't solve anything by running away. All you get is a build-up to nothing. Whatever made you think you could talk her into a divorce? There's no other way out, is there, Arthur? You sit in the friendly darkness of the bar all afternoon, late into the evening, thinking, thinking. It's almost 11 when you make up your mind. There's a phone booth near the door. Hello? Hello. Hello, Vivian. Vivian, I have to talk to you. It's important. Why, Charles, what's the matter? Never mind. Just listen to me, yes. Vivian. Just listen. I'm a phony. M my name is Arthur Winslow. I was running away when you met me on the train. I'm just an investment clerk. I have no money. I have nothing. Just $1,800 I won in a horse race. Listen, Vivian, I got a wife in East Orange, New Jersey. I've hated her for ten years. I'd rather be dead than go back to her. I'm not going back to her. I I'm telling you this, Vivian, because... I love you more than I ever dreamed I, I could love anyone. And I, I probably won't ever see you again. Goodbye, Vivian. Eleven o'clock, Arthur. You've got it all planned. Ethel is asleep in her room, room 131. A balcony connected with yours. It's easy, isn't it, Arthur? Yes, there she is. And she's asleep. You take a firm hold on the heavy brass candlestick you picked up from the mantel in your room. A blunt instrument, the police will say. You can hardly breathe, Arthur. Your stomach is full of ice water. You feel your heart's going to burst. Careful, Arthur. Careful. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. 
Meantime, a word about teeth and tires. They have a good deal in common, you know. For the good of your teeth, you see your dentist twice a year so he can catch small cavities before they grow big and endanger the tooth. And for the good of your tires, it's equally important to have your signal gasoline dealer inspect them regularly so any small injuries can be repaired before they spread and ruin the carcass. Or so he can warn you before your tread is worn too thin for proper retreading. You'll find your signal gasoline dealer is completely equipped to give you the finest in modern tire repair whether it's a small patch or a full recap. For those friendly dealers displaying signals, yellow and black circle sign, are much more than just a place to get signal go-farther gasoline and fine signal double-check lubrication. Each signal dealer offers a complete line of automotive services and fine accessories to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. And now, back to... To the Whistler. No, Arthur, when the cards were down, you couldn't do it. The wife you hated for ten years at your mercy, and you couldn't do it. But you came close enough to see what makes a murderer. And now you're standing over her. I can't. I I can't do it. Sorry, Ethel, I... I'm sorry I woke you up. Well, turn the light on. Don't stand there. Yes, Ethel. Oh, hand me my other slipper. Yes, Ethel. Well, you thought you could get by with it, didn't you? No, no, Ethel, I, I, I didn't. Don't deny it. I know what's been going on, and I can prove it, you, you philanderer. Ethel, I tell you... What, what did you say? Well, I have a complete report on your activities for the last month. You weren't very clever, Arthur. The detectives say you left a trail a child could follow. What are you getting at, Ethel? Joe? Joe? Listen, there's someone knocking on your door. A woman. Ethel, come back. Where are you going? This door, Miss Brewster. Oh, Oh, Vivian. A pretty picture. And you have the crust to ask me what I'm getting at. I've known about Miss Brewster all along. In fact, we've had a little talk. And for your information, Arthur, I'm leaving for Reno in the morning. In view of what's happening, I don't think you'll feel it's wise to contest the case. Contest it? We've waited five years for a chance like this. We? Mr. Dinwiddie and I. Mr. Dinwiddie. (laughs) Mr. Dinwiddie. (laughs) Arthur. What in the world were you doing with that brass candlestick? Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Everett Tomlinson and Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal Gasoline. Signal, the new gasoline you can prove is superior. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, phone call from death. the
Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Always a bridesmaid, never a bride. You know the old saying. But have you ever thought how that thought must rankle in the minds of women to whom it is applied? Ellen Livesey, for instance. Ellen always seemed to lose out with the men she set her cap for. And who can say what emotion plagued her now that she could no longer be called a young woman? She didn't show it, of course. Even when men came to her about their troubles with other women. Like Glenn Reed. It's maddening, Ellen. What am I going to do about it? There's nothing much anyone can do when a girl falls in love. Don't say that. She's not in love with Paul Carroll. She can't be. Glenn, pull yourself together. I'm sorry. I know what Sheila means to you. But you can't deny reality, Glenn. The fact is, Sheila's met someone else, and there isn't anything you can do about it. Two months ago, she was going to marry me. I didn't know that. Well, not a definite promise, but until Carol came along... What has she told you about him? Glenn, you can hardly expect me to tell You've you what... You've got to tell me, Ellen. I've got to know. I don't think I have to violate a confidence for anyone. But you said she's in love with him. How do you know? Did she tell you? Yes, she told me. I don't believe it. Really, Glenn, if you're going to behave this oh, way... I... I know I'm a fool. But, Ellen, if you knew what all this is doing to me... I think I know. Ever since Sheila met Paul Carroll, she's been infatuated with him. And I can understand why. But why can't she see her money's made a hit with him, too? Oh, Glenn, lack of money doesn't mean anything to Sheila. I've certainly never been wealthy. Why, the jobs I've had. Dime store clerk, telephone operator, stenographer, and now secretary. Yet Sheila and I have always been close friends. Very close. Ellen, I... I'd do anything. Humiliate myself, anything, if she'd only let me talk to do her. Do you want me to call her for you, Glenn? Oh, no. No, I... I wouldn't want you to do that. Yes, you would. When you called me this afternoon, I knew that's what you wanted me to do. I'll call her right now. Well, well, all right, if it isn't too much trouble. You know it isn't. Oh, that's a silly thing to do. I started to dial the wrong number. Well, good heavens. Hello? Why, Sheila, what a coincidence. I was just trying to get you. Sheila, what is it? What's the matter, Ella? Sheila, I can't understand you. Sheila! Sheila! Ellen, what's wrong? What's happened? I don't know exactly. She seemed terrified, something about someone trying to break into her apartment. And then her voice seemed smothered, and, and we were cut oh, off. Oh, good Lord, we'd better get over there. Well, I'll call the police. Maybe they can get there quicker. Oh, I hope I'm mistaken, Glenn. Sheila simply has to be all right. Well, we'll soon find out. Oh, Glenn, wait. What? Down the hall, that patrolman. Standing guard outside Sheila's door. Oh, Glenn, do you, do you think... Come on. Well, we'll let you up. We're friends of Miss Blaine, officer, so we're going inside. Oh, are you? Well, I don't know how you got by downstairs. Nobody tried to stop us, officer. We simply came right up. Why can't we see Miss Blaine? What's happened? Just a minute now, just a well, what's minute. What's going on in there? What's wrong? I said hold your horses, young fella. Wilson, get downstairs and take... Who are these people? Well, sir, that's what I was just My about... name's Ellen Livesey. I called police headquarters about Miss Blaine. Oh, yes, Miss Livesey. And Captain Hazlitt of the Homicide Division. Homicide? Captain, what's happened? Sheila Blaine has two bullets in the back of her head. She's dead. Wait a minute. Have you tried new Signal Gasoline? That new super fuel that offers you premium performance at no extra cost? If you have, you know what an amazing new motor fuel it is. Not just pre-war quality... Not just an improvement on old-style gasoline, but an entirely new type of super fuel that embodies in one giant stride the amazing advances of wartime chemistry. For Signal is the new gasoline you can prove is superior. With new Signal in your tank, you immediately notice, one, quicker starting the moment you touch the button. Two, faster pickup. You actually feel it. Three, higher anti-knock. Just listen to that old motor purr, even on the steepest hills. And four, you'll find you go farther than ever on new signal because you'll be shifting less 
enjoying more economical high-gear miles. For you folks who like proof, there's a scientific reason why New Signal gives you all these advantages, and I'll be back later to tell you about that. But for the best proof of all, let a tank full of New Signal talk for itself in your own car. Let the quicker starting, faster pickup, higher anti-knock, and longer mileage show you why New Signal is the new post-war gasoline you can prove is superior. And now, back to the whistler. Livesey, this time it looks as if you won't have even to be a bridesmaid. Your best friend, Sheila Blaine, is dead. What kind of emotion does that call up in you? Are you properly heartbroken? Or is there a faint smile of triumph in your face? The following morning, when Captain Hazlitt called you, Glenn Reed, and Paul Carroll to his office at police headquarters... Yeah? <clears throat> now, I'll tell you frankly, we haven't developed a single lead on Miss Blaine's murder since last night. You three seem to have been her closest friends, though, so if there's anything you can tell me... What do you want to know, Captain? Well, you've already told me how Miss Blaine called you. Uh, by the way, I'd like to thank you for calling headquarters so promptly. Oh, I thought it was the thing to do, Captain. As I understand it, you knew Miss Blaine intimately. Yes, we've been friends since we were in school. Had her life ever been threatened before? Well, there was no reason for anybody to threaten her, Captain. Ah. Oh. You were with Miss Livesey when Miss Blaine called. That's right, at 7.30. And you, Mr. Carroll... You were at a movie at that time. Well, from what I've heard, I must have been inside the Regal Theater when she... when it happened. Miss Blaine made her phone call at 7.30. Apparently, she was killed immediately after that. What time did you get home? Just after 11. One of your men was waiting for me. What time did you enter the theater? Just after 7. Wasn't that a little early for you to attend a movie? Well, I don't see why. I hadn't anything to do last evening. Decided to drop in as I was passing by. Can you prove you were there? Now look here, if you're implying I had anything to do with this, Someone's I Someone's would... been murdered, Mr. Carroll. It's my job to try to find out who did it. I have to start with those who might have done it. And you mean to say I'm one of them? Why not? Well, what motive would I have? Motives are usually and can easily be found. Does that mean Miss Livesey and Reed are under suspicion, too? Everyone's under suspicion, Mr. Carroll. We suspect everyone at this stage of the game. I went to the Regal Theater last night, Hazlitt. I was there from 7 until 10.30. We can check it anyway. How long had you known Miss Blaine? Six weeks. You were, uh, quite friendly? We were going to be married. You're a liar. Just a minute, Mr. Reed. He's lying. They weren't going to get married. Glenn, please, please control yourself. Oh, we just have his word for it. Sheila never told anyone. Get hold of yourself, Reed. I take it you were, uh, on friendly terms with Miss Blaine, too. I was in love with her. And Carol says he was going to marry her. I told you he was lying. You're talking pretty carelessly, Reed. I'd watch myself if I were you. What are you doing, warning me? I'm telling you to use a little common sense. Because if you don't, I'll, I'll... get what Sheila got. Huh? Are you Sit dirty down, little down. down. Take it easy. You're both under a strain, but so is Miss Livesey. I'm ready to tell you whatever I can, Captain. No, thanks. I suggest you all go home now. But I thought you had questions to ask us. I'll do that later. One at a time. Then we're free to go now? Yes. What yes. about Sheila's murder? Is this all you intend to do about it? We'll go on checking into it, Mr. Reed. But she's dead. Don't you understand that? Somebody's killed her. Somebody's got to pay for that. We'll go on checking, Mr. Reed. Haven't you any ideas or, or theories at all? Right now, I'd say the coroner's jury will have to hand in a verdict of homicide by person or persons unknown. We get those cases every so often. Sneak thieves, intruders, surprised by their victims. Kill, get away. Sheila wasn't killed by any sneak thief. How do you know? I don't know for sure, but it couldn't have been that. Go home and get some sleep, Mr. Reed. I'll call you if I want you. Thanks for your cooperation, everyone. Thank you, Captain. Paul. Yes, Helen. Will you be good enough to take me home now? <laughs> It's all quite a mystery, isn't it, Ellen? The police get nowhere, and soon it's almost forgotten. Yes, even you almost forget it. 
because of a new anxiety, a new emotion. Your anger because you haven't seen Paul Carroll since that day he drove you home from the police station. With Sheila out of the way, you thought he'd be around much sooner, didn't you? You thought you could wait. But every day you're away from him. Well, he's very much in your mind the afternoon you face Wilson Andrews in his office. Wilson Andrews, Sheila's attorney. Before Miss Blaine's will is admitted to probate, Miss Liversy, I'd like you to read it, or if you prefer, I'll read it to you to give you the gist of its contents. Mr. Andrews, I... Are you telling me I'm one of Sheila's heirs? Her only heir, my dear. Oh, no, that isn't possible. Surely you don't object oh, to... Oh, but I couldn't. I couldn't take her money. My dear Miss Liversy, she wanted you to inherit her estate. And surely you can use $30,000. Well, I... I don't know what to say. And she was quite fond of you, Miss Liversy. I'll always remember her great glee in describing how surprised you'd be. And... Yes, yes, I can imagine. If there are any questions you wish to ask, why... I think not, Mr. Andrews. Very well. Oh, yes, yes, there's one question. When, when will I come into the estate? Mm, almost immediately, I'd say. I hope this bequest will bring you much happiness, Miss Liversy. Happiness? Why, well, yes, perhaps it will. Perhaps it will... Well, this is a surprise, isn't it, Ellen? Sheila's death has brought you a double benefit. Now you're thinking more than ever of Paul. And now that you've become moderately wealthy, why shouldn't you put your money to good use? The clothes you've never had, a new, bigger apartment, a chance to make Paul Carroll notice you. But instead of Paul, across the luncheon table from you, you find Glenn Reed. You're looking awfully attractive, Ellen. Mm. New hat? New everything. I felt guilty about it all until it was all the time I was splurging. Yet I knew it was exactly what Sheila would have wanted me to do. Why did you invite me to lunch, Glenn? I had to talk to someone. The police still haven't made any arrests. They won't arrest anyone the way they're going about it. It wasn't any sneak thief who killed Sheila. What makes you so sure of that? It couldn't have been. It had to be somebody else. That isn't enough to go on, Glenn. You'll need evidence of some kind to make the police change their mind. I don't have any evidence, but I have a pretty good hunch. You mean you suspect somebody? Paul Carroll. Oh, now, Glenn, that's ridiculous. Is it? You know Paul can't be guilty. He was in a movie when it happened. The police even found an usher who remembered but him. But that doesn't mean anything. He could have sneaked out a side exit soon after he went inside. Nobody remembered seeing him come out. But what motive could he have? Why would he want to do because it? Because he found out he wasn't named in Sheila's will. He was counting on her money. Then he found out how she really felt, so he killed her. But Glenn, by the same token, I'd have a motive for killing her because I knew I'd inherit her money. But you didn't know you were named as her heir. Oh, yes, uh, that's true. Besides, we know neither of us killed her. Carol's the only one who had both the motive and the opportunity. Glenn, he was at that theater. Oh, so he says. Well, what are you going to do about it? You're going to go to the police? I don't know yet. All I know is I won't let Sheila go unavenged. I'm going to find out who killed her. And when I do... Please, don't do anything rash. Now, promise me you won't do anything you might regret later. Promise me, Glenn. I'm not promising anything. Oh, don't tell anybody what I've just said. I'll take care of this in my own way. Well, Ellen, this might be dangerous to your plans. Suppose Glenn does do something to Paul Carroll, the man you love. But wait, Ellen. Suppose Paul did kill Sheila. You wouldn't want the murder of your best friend to go unavenged, would you? Or would you? Love is a very strong emotion, even when it's one-sided. You haven't seen Paul for weeks. He hasn't called you up at all. Never mind. Now you have an excuse, Ellen. An excellent excuse for seeing him. You like my hat, Paul? Hmm? Oh, yes. Very nice. It's the very first time I've worn it. <laughs> oh, is it? You've never noticed anything I've worn, have you, Paul? What? What makes you say that? Oh, oh no reason. Why did you want to see me, Ellen? Oh, well, because we... We both loved Sheila. And because I haven't seen you since it happened. Well, I meant to call you and congratulate you on inheriting her estate, but somehow I didn't get around to it. 
Shall I consider myself congratulated now? If you like. You've changed, Paul. You're not the same at all. Maybe I've good reason for it. Were you so much in love with her? I don't know. What does that mean? Well, you knew Sheila as well as anyone. You know what she was like. She was beautiful and capricious, unpredictable, provoking. Mm. You found that out in 15 years. I knew her for six weeks. During that time, there were hours when I adored her and moments when I could have killed her. <laughs> Not a very good choice of words, is it? I know what you mean, Paul. Now she's gone, my world's pretty much upside down. And yet if she'd lived, I don't know how long we'd have lasted together. Were you really going to get married? Oh, I'd have persuaded her to. Then we'd probably have split up in no time, and I'd have been just as broke as I am now. But you don't sound as if you were really in love, Paul. I'm not trying to kid anybody, Ellen. I'm just telling you how I felt. Well, Glenn Reed doesn't think you were in love with Sheila. Yes, I gathered as much that day at police headquarters. He thinks you killed her, Paul. Well, that's insane. What's the matter with that idiot? Is he going around spreading that kind of gossip? Oh, no, I don't think so. He told me about it yesterday, though. That's the real reason I wanted to see you. I thought I ought to warn you. Has he gone to the police? Oh, he said the police wouldn't believe him. You bet they wouldn't. But please be careful, Paul. Please don't take any chances. Don't worry. I'll talk to him. Get him straightened out. Oh, no, please don't go near him. No, that might only stir up trouble. And if anything happened to you, Paul... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't mean to betray myself. I mean... Oh, it's shameless of me to talk like this. But I'm free to tell you now. I'm in love with you. And if anything Ellen, happened... Ellen, don't. If anything at all happened to you... I could never tell you before. Sheila was my dearest friend. But just like Sheila... The first time I saw you, I fell in love with you, too. Now you know. Oh, I'm a fool for telling you this way. But I don't care. I have money now, Paul. We can share it together. I'm not ashamed of myself. I'm proud. I just... I want to stand up here and tell everyone. Everett, Ellen, I, I think we'd better go. Oh, Paul, please. Please let me finish. Uh, it wouldn't do any good, Ellen. Oh. I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say. There's nothing else to say, Paul. Shall we go? Unrequited love, Ellen. Yes, you can go on hoping, but deep down inside, you know he meant it. He'll never love you. The anguish and torment of that thought gives you many a sleepless night. You go on hoping... But as the days go by, you need more than hope. You must see him, hear his voice. Well, then forget your pride, Ellen. You did once before. Hello? Oh, hello, Paul. I want to apologize for my stupid behavior last Wednesday. I wanted to call you before, but I couldn't muster enough courage until now. <laughs> oh, no, no, there wasn't anything else you could say. Well, that's awfully sweet of you. Can't we make amends? Or well, perhaps if we had dinner together some evening. Oh, I see. Yes, 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 of course. Well, if you'll call me when you get back. Yes, Paul, yes. Goodbye. When you get back. When you get back. <laughs> Hello, hello, operator. Operator, we were cut off. No, 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 it's all right now. Oh, hello, Paul. Someone must have cut in. I just thought I'd call and see I... Oh. Oh, I see. Well, I thought now that you're back, you... All right, Paul. Yes, I understand. Goodbye. Too busy. Oh, Paul. I hate you, Paul Carroll. I hate you. You 
never thought you'd say those words, did you, Ellen? You didn't remember that love is an emotion very close to hate. But now you know. Paul Carroll doesn't love you, never will love you. He's avoiding you. He's too busy. You hate him now, don't you, Ellen? You're going to take that hate out in action. Something drastic, aren't you? Hello, Glenn Reed? Oh, hello, Glenn. This is Ellen. Yes, yes, I know. I haven't seen you for ages. But I see you tonight, Glenn. Really important. About Paul Carroll. No, no, I can't tell you now. Can you come to my apartment tonight? Oh, say, eight o'clock? All right, I'll be expecting you. Yes, you're going to do something drastic, aren't you, Ellen? So you work fast. And you're ready when Glenn arrives at eight. Why, hello, Glenn. Do come in. Thanks. You haven't seen my new apartment before, have you? No, I haven't. It's pretty swank. Said you had something to tell me about Paul Carroll, Ellen. What is it? Well, please sit down first. Make me uncomfortable I standing that stand. way. What's happened? Well, it's a little hard to tell. Especially after I wouldn't believe you. My suspicions about Carroll, you mean? Yes. I, um, I saw Paul several weeks ago, just before he went out of town. He acted rather strangely at that time. Then I talked to him on the phone today, and... Well, now I'm inclined to think you're right. Something he said aroused my suspicions. What was that? Well, we were chatting casually, something about radio shows, when Paul mentioned a certain program, and he, he suddenly changed the subject. Later, I realized why. He talked about a program that was on the air while he was supposed to be at the theater the night Sheila was murdered. Are you sure of that, Ellen? I wouldn't have called you if I weren't. First, I thought of calling the police, but then I could see the evidence would seem so flimsy to Captain Hazlitt. Yes, you're right. If, if we could see Paul alone, just the two of us with him, and trick him into confessing. Oh. Well, I could invite him to the apartment tonight. I'd tell him you're here, and then when he that arrives... That wouldn't do any good, Ellen. I think it would. I'll give him a ring. I wouldn't do that, Ellen. Nonsense. We both want to avenge Sheila's death, don't we? But if you'll only listen to me... Oh, always making that mistake. I keep dialing Sheila's old number. Oh, good heavens, that startled me. <laughs> hello? Oh, well, hello, Paul. I was just about to call you. Yes, I wanted to invite you over. Oh, don't say you can't come. Well, I suppose I could. Mm-hmm. All right, Paul. Yes, I'll be there. Goodbye. Well, that wasn't hard. He won't come here, but he'll be glad to see me at his place. We won't expect to see you with me, so we may be able to surprise you. I don't think so, Ellen. Why not? We're not going to visit Carol. I thought we'd agree. Let me on the phone, Ellen. Well, Glenn, what in the Let world? Let me have it. Really, Glenn? Very well. What in the world are you... Glenn, I demand an explanation. Why don't you answer it? Oh, there's no use stalling, Ellen. I watched you dial. You see, you didn't dial Sheila's old number. You faked that call to Carol. Oh, that's absurd. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't you listen. There's nobody on the line, you see. Because the four numbers I just dialed make your own phone ring. You didn't talk to Paul Carroll just now. Really, Glenn? I'm not going to sit here and you let you tell... You couldn't have talked to Carol. I know that, Ellen. You see, I've already killed him. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I promise to give you the scientific reason why new post-war signal is the gasoline you can prove is superior. Why it actually has quicker starting, faster pickup, higher anti-knock, plus the economy of more high-gear miles. Well, you see, gasoline is composed of countless different hydrocarbon molecules. In pre-war gasolines, the molecules were left just as nature made them. But under the impetus of war, chemists found how to take the molecules themselves apart, actually how to rearrange the atoms within the molecules. The result is the thrilling, amazing power of Signal's new gasoline, bringing you performance so immediately apparent you can feel it, see it, hear it. Make it a point this week 
to drive into one of the friendly stations displaying signals, familiar yellow and black circle sign, and say, fill her up with new signal. When you touch your foot to the accelerator and feel that old motor get young again, you'll know why new signal is the gasoline you can prove is superior. And now, back to the Whistler. The unexpected can be a physical blow, can't it, Alan? Almost like the promise of death itself. Glenn's words completely upset your elaborate little scheme. You stand in horror as it crumbles about you. Glenn, you can't be serious. I can't believe it. Oh, yes. I've been following him for weeks because I thought he'd killed Sheila. I saw the two of you in that restaurant several weeks ago, and I saw you go into his apartment earlier this season. Oh, no. No, you couldn't. I went in after you left. He was sitting in his chair, his back to me. Crept up behind him, a heavy metal lamp from an end table in my hand, and then a... No one saw me go in or out of his flight. Oh, Glenn, you fool. You fool. I came here to tell you about it before giving myself up, but then you faked that call from him. Puzzled me at first. But not now, Ellen. Ellen, you faked that call from Sheila, too. You killed Sheila. Oh, Glenn, listen. You? Listen to me. Let me explain. Listen to me. I know you killed her, but why? How could you do it? Because she'd always had everything I didn't have. Money, beauty, popularity. And then Paul came along, and she got him, too. I couldn't let her take him, so I... Yes, I killed her. I killed her. And then I made my own phone ring while you were with me. I learned how when I was an operator. Now you killed Sheila, your friend. Knowing all the time I talked to you about her that night that she was already dead. If it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't have killed Carol. But Glenn, let me tell you. You didn't kill him. He was already dead. You killed him, too? Don't come near me. I... I shot him... And I made it look like suicide. As if he'd killed Sheila. We'd both have been avenged if you hadn't meddled. You meddled. We'd have gotten away with it. You won't get away with anything again, Ellen. What do you mean? What do you mean? What are you, what are you doing? I told you if I ever found Sheila's murderer, I'd avenge her. Glenn! No! 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 Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Leslie Edgley, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you try New Signal. The new gasoline you can prove is superior. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Signal, the new gasoline you can prove is superior. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, sing a song of murder. I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. (laughs) 
Success is a curious thing. Sometimes it comes very slowly, the result of a lifetime of dull drudgery. And sometimes it comes quickly, almost overnight. It was that way with Bill Randall. The fact that he was the most popular singer in the country wasn't as amazing as how quickly it had happened. Less than a year, and he was on top. His voice was as much a part of the average teenager's life as her bobby socks. Everybody was very happy about it. Everybody, that is, except Bill Randall. Bill wasn't happy at all. And after his broadcast one night, as he was taking his manager home, he told him why. Show went pretty well, Bill, but I thought you were going to run over a little. Now, you got to learn to judge times better. Why don't you get in the habit of time in everything you do? That way you Plus probably... Gordon, I didn't offer to take you home to hear a lecture. I could be doing other things, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know, Romeo. You and your swooning dames. But I didn't ask for the lift. Diana got to pick me up. I want to talk to you. So you want to talk to me. Hey, hey, better slow down a little. They keep this highway pretty well patrolled. That's better. Keep it at 35 and they'll never bother you. That way, we ought to get out to my place about, uh, ten minutes to ten, anyway. <laughs> but do you do drive the local bus? No. I just timed it. At 35 miles per hour, it takes just 36 minutes over the highway. You see, that's what I mean about timing things. That's what you ought to do. Gordon, you... what I want to talk to you about is... You can I... switch on your country beam now. Let me do the driving, will you? Frank, that contract of ours... Yeah, what about it? I'd like to buy it back. <laughs> Not a chance, Golden Voice. Well, I'm getting pretty sick of getting hooked. I'm willing to give you 10000 for it. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. You're worth half a million to me. Yeah, that's just it. I'd like to start making some money for myself for a change. Now, why start that again? Well, I think it's a dirty deal, and I don't mind telling you. Dirty deal? Huh. That's gratitude for you. Listen, hotshot. Who were you before I got hold of you anyway? Just another punk singing in a joint. I'm the guy that built you up. I put you where you are. You? <laughs> My voice put me where I am. So you got a voice. <laughs> Look, Swooner boy, there are lots of guys floating around with voices just as good as yours. The biggest asset you've got is a smart manager. I'm the guy that's made the difference between you and all the other two-bit troubadours in this town. You see those girls swooning all over the studios tonight? <laughs> I did that for you. Why shouldn't I get a cut? A cut? You call 40% of my earnings just a cut? No more than I should get, Randall. Anyway, why should you worry? You're making big money. You're making it to me. Time I pay you off and my agent and taxes, I haven't got anything left. And what happens when they don't like me anymore? I gotta think of the future. Well, listen, pretty voice. I'll do the worrying if any needs to be done. You just keep on singing. That contract's got six more years to run. I know. I wrote it. By that time, I won't even have a voice left. My doctor told me. He said I've got to take it easy. I've been overworking my throat. Uh, and it gargle. And I won't have any money left either. I'm not the one who's getting rich on this setup, you know. This isn't getting you anywhere, Randall. I'm not going to sell you your contract. I'm not going to tear it up, and I'm sure not going to give it to you. You signed it? I've got it. That's all there is to it. Yeah? Well, we'll see about that. Listen, Welcher. You start trying any smart stuff about backing out of that contract, and you're going to find yourself in trouble right up to that fat head of yours. You understand? Uh, here's a turn. I know. Hey, uh, stop in here at Gus's. I'll buy you some gas. Oh, do you think you can afford it? I've got a full tank. Now, don't start getting nasty. Gordon, that contract. I said forget it. Well, let's see. Uh, four minutes to ten. We're right on time. There's the cutoff. Will you quit that timing routine? What cutoff? Oh, it's the old road from town. Cuts off a little distance, but nobody uses it anymore. Now they get the highway. Come on in. No, thanks. Come on in. Got some endorsements I want you to sign. Besides, you can have a drink to soothe those poor, overworked tonsils of yours. That isn't very funny. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, all right. I guess Diana stayed home tonight. Hello, Dad. Oh, hello, Bill. Hello, Diana. Did you have any luck finding a housekeeper today? No, I guess I have to carry on a while longer. Well, it's not going to hurt those delicate hands of yours. I got those endorsements in my desk, Randall. Come and take a look at them. What are you going to do, make me sign them? Hmm? What do you mean? That gun in the drawer. Oh. <laughs> no, Glamour Boy. I don't think I have to use a gun to handle you. I just keep it because it's a good idea to have one. Living way out here, you know. Well, here they are. Look them over. 
I'll go fix some drinks. Oh, I'll fix them, Dad. You stay here. No, uh You mix drinks like a Sunday school teacher. I'll fix them. You stay and keep Golden Throat here company. Well, Diana, you trying to avoid me? Why, no, I... How about proving it, then? What do you mean? Bill, don't. <laughs> What's the matter with wanting a kid? It's just that that's about all you ever seem to think about anymore. Well, you know anything better to think about? You think that just because you're where you are now, you can have anything you want. Well, it seems to work. You didn't used to be that way, Bill. Hmm. I didn't know what the score was. I remember how you used to be. We used to go for walks after the late floor show and buy popcorn and just talk. And you used to tell me the things you wanted to oh, do. Oh, and... kid stuff. I wasn't dry behind the ears. And now you are? Oh, let's not dig up that stuff, Diana. How about dinner tomorrow night? I'm sorry, I'm busy. Oh, how about the night after? I'm busy then, too. Sure you are. You're probably busy the night after that, too. You're always busy now when I want a date. It didn't used to be that way before I signed the contract. What do you mean? You know what I mean. Before I signed that contract with your dad, you were very willing to go out with me. Bill, that had nothing to do with it. Oh, that. no, no, nothing at all. You just used to see me to hear me sing, because you liked me. And you just told your dad about me out of kindness. And you just talked me into signing with him because you thought he'd do something for me. That happens to be the truth. I don't think dad's been fair with you either, and I've told him so. You expect me to believe that. I'm not that big a dope, even if I was silly enough to think you loved me. I did, Bill, I did. You were sort of a nice guy in those days. But now, well, you've changed. <laughs> You're the one who's changed. I love you, Bill. But I'd love you a lot more if you signed your soul over to my father. Bill, don't say things like that. Yeah, the truth hurts, doesn't it? It isn't the truth, and you know it. You've no right to talk like that. You've got that idea in your head, and you won't listen to anything else. You've gotten so bullheaded, so conceited that you just All can't All right, say... okay. It doesn't matter anymore, I guess. I'm hooked. But listen, Diana... Someday I'm going to get even, understand? Get out of here! Remember, someday I'm going to get even. Well, Bill, that wasn't exactly a tender love scene between you and Diana, was it? Those things she said about you, how you changed, how conceited you were. They didn't set very well, did they? They made you pretty angry. You told her you were hooked. It looks as if you were right. The juicy offers flooding in don't make you feel any better about it either, do they? They just put more pressure on you, make you realize you've got to figure a way out of that contract. Then your throat starts bothering you again. So you go to see your doctor. I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, Mr. Randall. Yeah? What is it, Doc? You've got to quit singing for a while. Oh, well, I'll take a week off. Mm, it'll have to be a lot longer than that. You'll have to quit for at least a year. A year? Oh, I can't do that. You'd better. If you don't... If I don't? Your voice won't last another six months. Six months. That's what the doctor said, Bill. Six months. Then you'll be all washed up, no voice left. And the money you've got won't even pay your debts. You know, you've got to think of something. The pressure's building up, Bill. You've got to find a way to break that contract. The next day, you go to see your lawyer. You figure maybe he can help you. And he does, without knowing it. As you sit listening to him, an idea starts coming to you. No, Bill, I've been over that contract a dozen times. There isn't a loophole in it. It's airtight. Look, Steve, suppose I try to prove that I didn't realize what I was signing. Oh, no, no he... I'm afraid not. You did know what you were signing, and you could never prove you didn't. You just didn't realize it was going to mean so much money. No, you might as well give up and serve out that six years, because as long as he's alive and kicking, he's never going to let you out of it. Yeah. As a matter of fact, even if Gordon should die, his share would go to his daughter. He's seen to that. Yeah. So they're both holding the whip hand over you, Bill, both of them. Yeah, I'd have to get rid of both of them. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you still have a sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. Well, Steve, I'll be running along. Thanks for everything. I'm sorry I couldn't help you any. Let's get together soon for a little golf, huh? Okay. So long. So long, Bill. Yeah. Yeah, I've got to get rid of both of them. (laughs) 
It was just last Monday on the Whistler that Signal Oil Company first announced new post-war Signal gasoline. Yet in that short week, thousands of Western drivers have made a wonderful discovery. A discovery of thrilling new performance they never dreamed was built into their cars. For new Signal isn't just another gasoline, not just pre-war quality, not just an improvement on old-style gasoline, but an entirely new type super fuel that embodies in one giant stride the amazing advances of wartime chemistry. Yes, new signal is the new gasoline you can actually prove is superior. Prove it in four ways. One, with quicker starting the moment you touch the button. Two, faster pickup. You actually feel it. Three, higher anti-knock. Just listen to that old motor purr, even on steepest hills. And four, you'll find you go farther than ever with new signal. Because you'll be shifting less, enjoying more economical high-gear miles. Really, now, wouldn't you like to discover just how much fun driving can be? The way to do that, you know, is to drive into one of the friendly stations displaying Signal's familiar yellow and black circle sign and say, fill her up with new Signal gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. to break that contract with Frank Gordon, you've got to get rid of both him and his daughter Diana. That's the only way out, isn't it? You've made up your mind to that. But you know you need a plan, Bill, and you need an alibi. Not too much of an alibi, just enough. After your show that night, waiting for your appointment with Gordon, you're thinking about it. The plan is starting to come to you. You're late. Look, I'm not in the mood for any cracks. It wasn't a crack. What's eating you? Diana. What's the matter with Diana? Ah, that little dope, I ought to knock some sense into her. Why, what'd she do? Oh, I cut down her allowance for running the house and didn't tell her so one of her checks bounced. She got all upset about it and we had a big scene. So you had a big scene? Yeah, but it was in front of a lot of people we had at the house. I lost my temper and slapped her. She told me she hated me and went to her room. In front of all those people? Oh, that's too bad. Well, what do you want to see me about? You know what I want to see you about. Those endorsements. You stormed out of the house without signing them. Yeah, so I did. Now I've got to come traipsing around to give them to you. Looks like I have to plan everything for everybody. And here they are, little boy. Maybe you can quit parking long enough to put the famous name on the dotted line. Hurry it up, too. I'm costing me good money here. Now get off the dime. I'm going to sign them. Go on. It's about time, prima donna. Here. Well, you almost lost your temper again, didn't you, Bill? You almost said something else. You've got to watch that. But the plan's beginning to take shape in your mind. That scene between Gordon and Diana in front of all those people. You can use that, can't you, Bill? That'll fit in very well. And what was that that Gordon said about having to plan everything? Why not let him plan this too, Bill? You start remembering things he's told you, things you can use. It takes 36 minutes to Gordon's house over the highway, remember that? And there's a cutoff. And that gun in his drawer. You can use those things, Bill, all of them. Maybe it'd be a good idea for you to find the shortcut. So one day you drive out that way and locate it. It's a nice deserted road and you time the trip. You can go as fast as you want on the shortcut. Fast enough to make it in 18 minutes. 18 from 36 leaves 18, doesn't it, Bill? Eighteen minutes to kill Gordon and get up to the gas station on the corner so it'll look as if you came over the highway all the way. That's all the alibi you want, isn't it, Bill? Just enough. Now all you need is the right night. Hello? Hello, Diana. Oh. You want to speak to Dad? No, you. Look, Bill, I thought we'd settled all that. I don't see why you keep calling up every night for a date. I, I've told you there's no... But, Diane, I want to see you, to tell you, you that I... You told me enough the other night. I don't think there's anything more to say, and I wish you'd stop calling. I suppose you're busy tonight. Yes, I am. 
Anybody I know? That's another thing I wish you'd stop asking. It doesn't happen to be any of your business. No, I just want to know who the lucky guy is. It isn't a guy. I happen to be going over to Dorothy King's house for the evening. Is that all right with you? Yeah, sure. Have a good time. Thank you. Goodbye. Oh, say, Diana. Yes? As long as you won't go out with me, I might as well take care of some business tonight. Would you tell your dad I'll be out around 10 to talk over some things? I'll tell him. Thanks, Diana. Bye. Goodbye. Dorothy King's, huh? That's three miles the other side of Gordon's. Just right. Okay, tonight's the night. <laughs> That's about all for this broadcast, folks. This is Bill Randall thanking you for listening and asking you to be around same time tomorrow night. Is it a date? Yes, be with us tomorrow night, same time, same station, for another edition of Songs by Bill Randall. And don't forget, this is National Safety Week. Drive safely and save a life. It may be yours. This is Bill Randall saying good night. You duck the autograph kids and you're out of the studio now, hurrying toward your car. You knocked him dead again tonight, didn't you, Bill? But you're not thinking about that now. All you're thinking about is your car waiting for you. And your time schedule for the next 45 minutes. It's all time, Bill. Time to the minute. And here's your car. Hi. Are you Bill Randall? Uh, yes, officer. Is this your car? Uh, yes, it is. Well, what's the trouble? I'd like to check your brakes. This is National Safety Week, you know. We're checking cars. Oh. oh, well, officer, would you mind if I got it down the road away? I've got an appointment in that direction, and I don't want to be late. Uh, well, I guess okay. Only don't forget to do it. You'll probably be stopped anyway. Uh, thanks, officer. I'll take care of it. That gave you a start, didn't it, Bill, seeing that cop standing beside your car? For a single panicky moment, you thought he might know what you're going to do. But he couldn't know that, Bill. He just wanted to tell you it's National Safety Week. That's a laugh, isn't it? It's not exactly going to be National Safety Week for Gordon, is it? But you're late now. He cost you two valuable minutes, and you can't afford that. If you're going to stay on schedule, you've got to hurry, Bill. You've got to hurry. You're on the back road now, speeding up. The minutes are sliding by. Ten, eleven, faster down the back road. Thirteen, fourteen, your foot's pushing the pedal to the floor. Sixteen, seventeen, the car's wide open. You're going to make it, Bill. Eighteen, nineteen, and you're there, around the bend from Gordon's. You're almost on schedule now, Bill, but you've still got to hurry. Say, what's the... Bill, what's the matter? Quick, Frank, your gun. Well, what's the trouble? Someone's following me. Following you? Yeah, quick, give me your gun. Oh, okay, it's right in here. I'll get it. Here. Here. Here it is. Now, where is he? Thank you, Frank. Well, there it is. Don't just stand there, stupid. I thought someone was after you. No, Gordon. Someone's after you. Hey, what is this? Put down that gun. Not just yet, Gordon. Have you gone crazy? Give me that Don't gun. Don't move. No, Gordon, I haven't gone crazy. I was crazy to sign that contract, but I'm not anymore. Well, you're blowing your top. I'm going to break that contract, Gordon. And I'm going to use your gun to do it. Don't be a fool. You can't get away with it. They'll find you. I don't think so, Gordon. They'll be too busy pinning it on someone else. Well, Randall, uh... say, maybe we better talk a little. Shut maybe... up. They've talked enough. I'll get on that phone and call Diana. Diana? I... I don't know where she is. Oh, quit stalling. You know she's a Dorothy Kings. I'll pick up that phone and dial Crescent 2417. Tell her to come home immediately. It's an emergency. And nothing more. Do you understand? Okay, okay. Hello? I'd like to talk to Diana, please. This is her father. Now, for the last time, Bill, will Shut you... Shut up! Hello, Diana? Uh, listen, baby, uh, come home right away. It's an emergency. She ought to make it in about five minutes, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Well, that gives you about 30 seconds more to live. Now, Randall, You know, Gordon, you used to tell me I couldn't judge time, didn't you? (laughs) Well, I've gotten better. This is time to the minute. But, Bill, for pity's sake... You might be interested in knowing just how well it is timed. Diana's going to get here in a few minutes. 
And a little after that, the cops are going to walk in and find her standing over your dead body. I think they'll jump at the obvious conclusion. Diana, why, you're not going to drag her into this. Quite a fond parent all of a sudden, aren't you? Yes, I'm going to drag her into it. And when the cops hear about that scene between the two of you the other day, and when I show them something I've got in my pocket, I don't think they'll have much trouble establishing a motive for it. <laughs> Pretty neat, don't you think? No, Bill, no. Now, listen, please. Let, let, let's talk this over, huh? You, you... Yes, won't... Gordon. Don't, no. Yes. No, <laughs> You've done it, Bill. There he is, and you're not even nervous. Your plan has worked beautifully so far. It's 20 to 10, Bill. That gives you five minutes to make a phone call and get up to the service station on the corner. Hello, police. This is Frank Gordon at 21 Denning Lane. Come over right away. You're through now, Bill except for the fingerprints. Don't forget to wipe them off the gun and phone and door. Now you're ready. Out the door, back to the car, get it started. Down the back road, turn to the right, down the side road toward the highway, around the block, and into the service station on the corner. You made it, Bill. Yes, sir? Uh, five of the regular. You betcha. Joe? Five regular. We were cooler tonight, eh? Huh? What? Oh, yeah, it is. Hey, mister, did you know your taillight's out? No, I didn't. I'll have it fixed. Yeah, but let me do it now. It only takes a minute to put in a new bulb. Well, I don't know whether I've got time. I've got an appointment. Oh. Uh, what time is it? Let's see. Uh, yeah, about ten minutes of ten. Ten of ten. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, okay. Put it in. Hey, just take a minute. i got the bulbs right here. Just laid in a new supply. It's National Safety Week, you know. Cops checking for things like this. Taillights, brakes, and driver's licenses. Yeah, well, that's what I hear. Good thing, too. Helps cut down the number of accidents. Can't be too careful, you know. Yeah, that's right. Can't be too careful. Yeah, well, there it is. Well, very simple. Well, water okay? Yeah. How much do I owe you? Ninety cents. Here's a buck. Keep the dime. Thanks. Hope you're not late for your appointment. I don't think I'll be. Oh. Come in. You're Mr. Randall? Yeah, officer. What's happened? I was told you were expected. What's the matter? Diana. Oh, Bill, dead. What? <laughs> Mr. Gordon is dead. Dead? Oh, how? What happened? He was murdered. Murdered? Why are you looking at me like that? I didn't... Oh, no, no, Diana. Of course you didn't. Mr. Randall, we'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Why, Sure. You had a 10 o'clock appointment with Mr. Gordon? Yes. Did you see him earlier? Why, no. Did you talk to him over the phone? Not today. What was your appointment about? Why, it was just some business. What kind of business? Well, uh, I'd rather not say. It It might look Let's like... Let's have it, Randall. Well, all right. It was about this agreement I have here. Gordon was going to sell me his interest in my contract. This was the agreement. I was going to give him $10,000. Here's the check. What? Well, he said he told you, Diana. I asked him especially because... Well, because you stood to inherit your father's interest in my contract if anything happened to him. That's why I didn't want to mention this business. You know, it might look like she... Well, Uh, I... I see. uh, You've been a big help to us, Mr. Randall. But I'm sure you can account for Diana's whereabouts throughout the evening, officer. Yes, we can. We know where she was a little after the time Gordon was murdered. She was right in this room. And with what you've told us, I'd say the case was just about wound up. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, here's a special message for you folks from Missouri, the Show Me State, or any of the rest of you who like proof. For I want to show you just why it is that New Signal is so superior to old-style gasolines. Why New Signal is actually an entirely new type, super fuel. You see, gasoline is composed of countless different hydrocarbon molecules. In pre-war gasolines, the molecules were left just as nature made them. 
But under the impetus of war, chemists found how to take the molecules themselves apart. Actually, how to rearrange the atoms within the molecules. The result is the thrilling, amazing power of Signal's new gasoline, bringing you performance so immediately apparent you can feel it, see it, hear it. Yet in new Signal, you enjoy this premium performance at no extra cost. Now, if you have that Missouri trait, I can hear you say, you gotta show me. And that's just what we want to do. Next time, fill up with new Signal. Let a tank full of this new super fuel show you in your own car that new Signal is the new gasoline you can prove is superior. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, Bill, the case is just about wound up. That's what the officer said, and now you're trying not to smile. It looks as if your plan worked perfectly, doesn't it? But the officer's still talking, Bill. Yes. Maybe you better pay attention to what he's saying. We know where Miss Gordon was, because she picked me up on her way over here and brought me with her. She... There are lots of us on the highway tonight. It's National Safety Week, you know. You see, that telephone call she got from her father sort of aroused her suspicions. She hadn't told him where she was going tonight. As a matter of fact, you were the only one who knew. Me? Anyway, when we got here together and discovered the body, and I checked up with the people Miss Gordon had been with, I knew she couldn't very well have done it. But I don't... Randall, can you account for your whereabouts? Why, yes. Yes, I can. I left the studio right after my show at 9.15, drove out here on the highway, stopped for gas at the corner. I think I got there about 10 of 10. I see. Anything unusual happen on the highway? I know. I just drove along at my usual speed. That's very interesting, Randall. Very interesting. I told you it was National Safety Week. It so happens we've been stopping everyone on the highway since 8 tonight, checking driver's licenses. I'm sure we'd have stopped you if you'd been on the highway. I think you'd better come with us. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Robert Reif, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you try New Signal, the new gasoline you can prove is superior. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Signal, the new gasoline you can prove is superior. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, the man who died twice. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. It wasn't until a year or more after his second death that the public learned the facts in the case of Stash Wilk and made him famous posthumously as the man who died twice. 
That was an interesting story in itself, but it was really only a prologue to a bigger story, one which the public never knew in full. Four people were involved. Stash, his brother John, his lawyer, Ben Maddow, and his girl, Edie Shelby. But the real central character in the story was an oil drum containing $400,000 in currency buried near a lonely highway. Yes, Stash Wilk, if you hadn't been stupid, if you hadn't killed that bank guard, you might have made it. But there's no use crying over spilt milk, is there? You're in the state penitentiary now, in the death cell, 48 hours from the gas chamber. And all you can think of is the 400,000 buried in the oil drum near the highway, safe. Only you know where it is, Stash. Maybe that's why Ben Maddow, your lawyer, is trying so desperately to get you a reprieve. But listen to reason, Stash. I tell you, we saw the governor. They all turned us down. Uh, there must be some other way. Where's Edie? I gotta see her. She's coming with John. And yeah, my brother? What's he doing here? Trying to help. <laughs> you mean he's money hungry, too, like the rest of you? Please, Stash, don't you see? You've got to tell us where that dough is, so we can put it to work for you. Oh, you but... low down, you... Go, you crazy idiot. That guy's coming. Nobody gets a you... smell of that dough till I'm out, see? Yeah, yeah, Stash. Yeah. Oh, let me go. Yeah. <coughs> now, thanks. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, straighten your tie. They're coming. Miss Shelby and your brother to see you, Wilk. Ten minutes. Stash. Oh, Edie. Oh, I missed you, baby. Hope you'll miss me, too. I have, Stash. I have. <sighs> It's getting so I figure everyone's got his eye on the dough. Even you. Oh, please. Okay. What's on your mind, Johnny? I abandoned you. Ask him about... I just told Ben exactly how I feel about the dough, Johnny. Just so there won't be no mistakes. You see, there's one thing worse than walking to that little green room tomorrow. That's walking there knowing someone else is making free with that 400 grand. In other words, John, he doesn't trust us. Right. Once I'm out, it's a different story, of course. Of course. Well, that leaves us just one alternative. What's that? It's a long shot, Stash, but that's about the only kind we have left. It'll take money. Now or later? I think you'll be satisfied with later. Who? The doctor. <laughs> Are you kidding? What good can a doc do me? Let him talk, Stash. It's this way, Stash. With the right injections, a man who's been gassed to death can be brought back to life. Brought back? What are you giving me? What kind of a double cross is this? Are you all crazy or something? Relax before you have the guard here. I'm telling you a plain fact. A man who's been gassed and pronounced dead can be revived, providing you get into the right doctor fast enough. Now, uh-oh. Uh, cigarette, anyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll have one. Thanks. A little less noise now, huh? Yeah. Well, Stash, you ready to listen to details? Don't have much choice, do I? Okay, Johnny, I'm listening. But get this straight, the three of you. I don't do no talking about the 400 grand till I'm out of this pen. And you can figure how much talking I'll do if I come out dead. Yes, Stash, it's enough to make a man think, isn't it, with death staring him in the face. The guards at the prison notice the change right away. And the report goes to the warden that with a little more than a day of life left you... You've changed from a surly, scowling brute into a model prisoner. Meanwhile, Ben Meadow and your brother John are making preparations. And finally, on the morning of the execution... What time is it, John? Almost five. That doctor was... Don't worry, I told you. He's got the schedule. You're sure of him? Positive. He's done it before. We have exactly an hour. He goes into the gas chamber at six sharp. Where's that laundry man? Outside. Well, get him. Hey, come here a minute, will you? Yeah, you got everything straight? Yeah, I, I think so, Mr. Meadow. He goes into the chamber at 6. Ought to be out at 6.10. They'll take the body direct to the prison crematory. You meet the wagon at the southeast at exactly 6.13. You exchange that body in the sack in your truck for stash. Yeah, yeah, I know. Now, there can't be any slip-ups. The delay of a minute might make the difference between life and death. It's got to be split-second timing. You understand? Yeah. All right, get out and check your truck. And don't let the prison guard suspect this is anything but your usual laundry pickup. Right, boss. I'll be back at 620 sharp with the body. Laundry men. 
Good. I'll give you a hand. Right through here. Okay. Right. Right here. On the table? Yeah. Yeah. Here's your money. Uh, thanks. Remember what I told you. Keep your mouth shut. Don't worry. All right, doctor. Let's go. Methyl in blue. Here it is. Needle. Right. There. Oxygen on. It's on, doctor. Heart? Not yet. More methylene. Heart? I... I don't know yet. I can hardly tell. Give me that stethoscope. Here you are. Let's see. Wait a minute. Hmm. Give him more oxygen. He's starting to breathe, doctor. How's his heart? Easy, easy. Now down on the oxygen a little. Steady, steady. He's really breathing. All right. Uh, we'll keep the oxygen on a little longer. Doctor, is he... Yeah, he's out of the woods. He'll live? He has an excellent chance. Cover him with a couple of blankets. How long before he'll wake? There's no way of telling yet. The main thing now is that he's alive. If his constitution is as strong as I think it is, he'll come through. Ping. Remember that word? Ping. That's what cars used to do going up hills and on the getaway before the days of new signal, the new gasoline you can prove is superior. But ping is a lost word now, on its way clear out of the motoring vocabulary. For with new signal gasoline, tired old motors purr with pleasure, even when they're working hard. Ah, but higher anti-knock isn't the only improvement you'll notice when you try signal's new super fuel. No, indeed. In addition, you'll enjoy quicker starting the moment you touch the button, faster pickup that you can really feel. And because you'll be shifting less, you'll get more of those pleasurable high-gear miles actually go farther than ever with new signal. Because all these advantages are things you can see, feel, hear right in your own car, we call new signal the gasoline you can prove is superior. Why not make your next gas stop a stop at one of the friendly stations displaying signals, familiar yellow and black circle sign. Fill up with new signal gasoline and see for yourself the surprising performance there's still left in your car. Now, back to the whistler. thousand dollars is a lot of money, isn't it, Stash? It brought you back from the dead. Paid for the split-second timing, the calculated accuracy, the medical exactness that turned a one-way journey into a round trip. You remember nothing from the time the paralyzing fumes surrounded you as you sat strapped in the gas chamber. Nothing except a feeling of strangulation, the sudden stabbing of a million knives at your chest, And then darkness, a limitless ocean of darkness in which you lost all sense of time and space and being. Then all of a sudden, there's reality again. There's light coming in windows without bars on them. And Edie's here beside you. I can't believe it, Stash. Why not? I'm here, ain't I? I was scared. You were scared. (laughs) And help me up, baby. Try out these pins of mine. Yeah. There. Uh, Think you can walk? Walk? Maybe I can fly. Watch. Oh, oh take it easy. I'm okay. Boy, he's walking. Huh? Hey, well, look at that. Not bad for a corpse, What huh? a great stash. Hiya, fellas. Well, when are we getting out of here? We're not getting out of here until we make sure there won't be a slip-up. What do you mean? We're going to find you a new face. Huh? A plastic surgeon, Stash. Uh, now, wait a it's minute. It's the only way. Your picture's been in every paper in the country. You'll be spotted in two minutes if you left this house. Uh, Will it be uh, much of a job? $30,000 worth. (laughs) He must be good. He is. Okay, pay him. Let's get it over with. He wants it in advance. Well, lay it out. What's the matter? Ain't my credit good for 30 grand? Take it easy. We worked hard to get you this far, and we want to finish it, but we're broke. 
What are you giving me? What do you want? An itemized statement of how much it costs to buy your skin? All right, here it is. Five thousand each for the two attendants. A thousand for the other stiff. Fifteen hundred... Ah, you'll get it back with interest, you know that. Sure. We trust you, Stash. And what are you after? It isn't what we're after, it's what we've got to have. That 400,000 or enough of it to buy the plastic surgeon and then get us all out of here. But it ain't safe for me to go after it. You said so yourself. That's right, I did, but what about one of us? Or don't you trust us yet? Oh, I don't know. Let me think. And you don't trust them, do you, Stash? Because you know there's no honor among thieves. Still, you're not quite yourself today, are you? There's a new feeling inside you. The dictionary calls it gratitude. You don't recognize it. But it makes you feel a little like a heel doubting these people after they saved your life. But perhaps you can squirm out of it gracefully. Perhaps your brother... Johnny. Johnny, how about you? Can't you raise 30 grand for me? Right now, I couldn't raise yeast. I'm already out on a limb for part of the expenses. There's nothing we can do, Stace. We've gone through every cent we ah, have. Ah, you said that. What about raising it? I tell you, my credit's good. It won't work. Who is this duck? Martin. He's a friend of mine. Yeah, why won't he work in the cuff? He wouldn't believe me when I told him about the money you buried. Wouldn't believe you. Why not? I had nothing to show him. Why should he? You still don't trust us, do you, Stash? Wait a minute. You think you could convince this duck if I drew you a map? Now you're talking. Eh, I ain't finished. There's strings on this. Nobody does any digging till I'm ready to go with you. After the operation. But what about paying the doctor? I think I can sell him on it if I've got a map. He's afraid Stash will walk out on him. He's taking quite a chance, you know. It's all right with me, Stash. What about you, Ben? Nobody goes till I go with you, right? Okay. All right. Give me a paper and pencil. Then right at this point, on the left side of the highway, there's an auto club road sign. At 20 yards from there, right on the line with this rock, you'll find an oil drum buried. See? Right there. You can't miss it. Thanks, Stash. Now you better run out and wrestle up that duck. I want to get... Ben! Get your hands up, Stash. Over against the wall. Hey, what's you going You too, on? John. Edie, you're not going to let him do... Oh... So that's how it is, huh? That's how it is, Stash. I'll kill you, you little double cross. Get back to the wall, you... There. That's better. You always were hot-headed, Stash. She'll double cross you, too, the little... I don't think so. He wouldn't understand. Edie and I were patient, Stash. We knew what we were waiting for. And now that we've got it, there's no need to tolerate you or your brother any longer. Ben, listen. You got a hundred grand coming to you. Knock me and Johnny off, you just wind up with a murder rap. And 300,000 more. Don't forget that. Yeah, a lot of good that'll do you when you're walking the last mile. That's right, ain't it, Johnny? Not exactly. There's no crime in killing a man who has already been executed. No, Johnny. Not you, too. Look, Maddo, you're the boss now. I'm only suggesting you haven't much to gain by rubbing me out. Ben, he's right. We don't want to spend the future ducking the cops. That's no worse than ducking Johnny Wilk. For what? I'm not sore. All I want is my hundred grand, and you'll never see me again. Ben, it's the best way for us. Maybe you're right. Maybe it is smarter. Step out of the way, John. Ben, don't. Ben, for heaven's sake. <laughs> so Stash Wilk died twice, reducing membership in the corporation to three. Then Meadow, John Wilk, and Edie Shelby, each with one eye on the 400,000 and the other on their partners. They're all jittery that night on the way to the spot stash marked on the map. What are you trying to do, Edie? Kill us all? Don't jump at me. I saw the car. Well, don't drive so fast. You want to get there, don't you? Exactly. I want to get there. I can wait until tomorrow if I have to. Look, look, look. Why don't we just take it easy, huh? We, we can stop at a roadside hotel. I think it's crazy. You're outvoted. May as well slow down. All right, all right. That better? You know, it's funny, Ben. Someday you'll probably fall and break your neck in a bathtub.
There's a place ahead. Pull in there, and I'll see if they have any rooms. Be right back. <laughs> he knows better than to leave it. Leave what? Oh, don't give me those sheep eyes, Edie. You had your eyes on his inside coat pocket ever since we left. And don't tell me you're in love with the old goat, neither. You're pretty sure of yourself. I know women. You know me? Yeah. That's nice. Could be a lot nicer with old Greybeard out of the way. Any ideas? A few. For example? Mighty nice layout here. All these second-story rooms with balconies. I don't get it. Just watch me. That's all I've been doing since we met. Sort of like it, Johnny. Watching you. Wait a minute. Here he comes. Hey, what's the dope, Ben? Just talk to the maitre d'. We can get dinner and rooms. Did you reserve the rooms? Not yet. I wanted to check with you first. That's great with me. Come on, Edie. Yeah, I was thinking we could pick up a couple of those view rooms on the second floor. With the balconies? Mm -hmm. Just what I had in mind. Look at that sky, will you? Well, what about it? Nothing. Except it is going to be a beautiful night, isn't it? Shall I serve some more wine? You, John? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, Mr. Matter and I'll have some more. Yes, ma'am. Good. Now you're talking to me. There you are. Hey. Will that be all? Yeah, that's all. Hey, wait. Just uh, leave the bottle, huh? Yeah. Yes, sir. If you want anything else brought, uh, brought up, just ring. Mm. Eh. How's about another glass, everybody? We we got lots to celebrate tonight. Edie will keep you company. Hmm? Uh, I'm going to stretch my legs. Sir. Okay, Johnny. Uh, just careful, Ben. You're spilling. Yeah, it's a pretty elegant sweep. Venetian blinds. French windows. Pretty fancy, huh? Yeah. <sighs> private balcony. Yeah. Nice and private. Well, I'll see you two later. Sure you won't have another drink? No, 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 thanks. Hmm. Oh, by the way, Edie, you were right about it being a beautiful night. You two really ought to have a look outside. I don't know why, but that guy gives me the woolies, Edie. I'm beginning to think I shouldn't have listened to you. Oh, forget it, Ben. Tonight we celebrate, remember? (laughs) Sure, sure, that's right. Why do you say we walk out on the balcony? I'm comfortable here. I'm just... Oh. (laughs) Knock my glass over. (laughs) Uh, It's all right, though. I emptied it first. Come on, Ben. A little fresh air will do us Mm. both good. Here, I'll take your arm. No, 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 no. I feel fine. Mm. It is pretty out here, isn't it? Mm. You're pretty, Edie. You and me. We're going to have a great time, aren't we, huh? Why not? We'll have 300,000 bucks to keep us warm, Edie. (laughs) Anywhere we want to go, we go there. Anything we want to do, we do it, huh? I've been waiting a long time for a setup like this. So have I. Oh, Ben, look. Right in our backyard, a deer. Yeah? Oh, that's nice. Oh, look at him, Ben. He's cute. Huh? I don't see anything. Here. Here, get where I'm standing. Right by the rail. Huh? I still don't see anything. He's down under our balcony. You'll have to lean over to see him. <laughs> you sure it's not an elephant? A little pink one? <laughs> You're seeing things, Evie. Maybe we'd better go... Hey! Hey! God! What are you... Ah! Too bad, Ben. You turned your back once too often, let your guard drop for one fatal instant, forgot for a second that you were dealing with big leaguers, members of the 400 Grand Association. Of course, John and Edie testified the next morning before the coroner's jury. And, of course, the verdict was... The deceased Benjamin Maddow met his death from an accidental fall while under the influence of alcohol. And, of course, the other guests of the hotel understood when Ben's fiancée and his best friend left immediately after the inquest. Of course. 
After all, lady, you couldn't bear to remain around the scene, could you? Not with Stash's 400,000 buried 50 miles away. We're going to have to be back there tomorrow. Huh? Why? We're not acting like a couple of grief-stricken friends. Somebody's got to claim the body. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you got something. How much farther? About a mile. Oh. We'll be there soon. <laughs> not at the rate you're driving. <laughs> mm. Nice, isn't it? Two of us alone. Yeah. There's a lot ahead of us with that 400 grand. There's a lot behind us, too. We can forget it. You think so? It'll be easy with you. You're a pretty interesting character, John Wilk. Yeah? Yeah. You've been in the racket, same as the rest of us, but you've never gotten your fingers dirty. How come? I used my head, I guess. For example, see this road? What about it? That's where we're going. I'm using my head. I don't get it. You will? Why are you turning off the highway? This isn't the place. Johnny, what are you doing? Answer me, Johnny. There's nothing here at all. Stop, Johnny. You'll drive us over the edge. See what I mean about using my head, baby? Johnny. Johnny, why are you getting out? Release the brake. Johnny, you can't. You heard me. Release the brake. All right. You know what he's doing, Edie. He's too smart to shoot you with that 38 he's holding. The shoulder of the road slopes down for about 10 feet. Then the cliff. They'll find you in the wrecked automobile and there'll be no telltale bullet holes. You're thinking fast. You've got one chance, haven't you? There, he's behind the car now to start it rolling down the slope. It in reverse quickly. Run him over. I got him. You're going to have to turn around. It's narrow, but you've got to make it, Edie. That's right. Now into reverse. You have to back close to that edge. You have to watch where you're going. Better take your eyes off John for a minute as he lies on the other side of the road. Johnny! The Whistler will return with a strange ending of tonight's story in just a moment. Meantime, let's take a quick look inside the refineries where new signal gasoline is made. It looks like the movie version of a chemist's dream. For here are some of the most amazing devices ever known to science, where the atoms in gasoline molecules are actually separated, then put together in an entirely new way, creating an entirely new type superfuel. That's why New Signal isn't just a pre-war quality gasoline, not just an improved old-style gasoline, but a completely new post-war motor fuel. And that's also why New Signal is packed with amazing new power and performance that's so immediately apparent you can feel it, see it, hear it. Whether you're driving a 1932 Ford or a 1942 Cadillac, you'll know New Signal is the gasoline for your car the moment you step on the accelerator and feel that old motor get young again. That's why we urge you to let just one tank full of new signal gasoline talk for itself. Let its quicker starting, faster pickup, higher anti-knock, and longer mileage demonstrate in your car why new signal is actually the new post-war gasoline you can prove is superior. And now, back to the whistler. So the corporation is finally cut down to one. And you're it, aren't you, Johnny? It's been a hard struggle. Your chest is crushed, your right foot mangled. But there's something more important than that. You're just like Stash and Ben. Money comes before anything else. It's the thought of the 400,000 in the oil drum that gives you the strength to half walk, half crawl that last mile to the roadside. Yes, there it is. Sixteen. There's the rock. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. Here. Right here. Yes, John. 
This is the spot you've lied and betrayed and killed to reach. You don't care whether you live or die now. All you want is the sight of those greenbacks, isn't it? You look for something to dig with, a stick or a sharp stone. There's nothing. So you dig with your fingers, claw at the dirt, forget the pain in your hands. Every breath feeling as if you've inhaled a load of razor blade. But at last you reach it. The oil drum, just as Stash had said. The top comes off easily. There. No. Can't feel it. Light a match. No. What's this? Where's the... Empty. No. No, I'm wrong. It can't be. Ah, here. A piece of paper. <laughs> Just like Stash. Must be another map. The dollar bill. Map, it must be a map. Sure, he's written directions. Whoever's double-crossed me... Keep this buck for your trouble. The rest of the 400 grand... I leave to the worm. Stash. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The curious story, Death Wears a White Robe. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories. And by your neighborhood signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Stanley Rubin, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you try New Signal. The new gasoline you can prove is superior. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal. Signal gasoline. Yes, Signal is the new gasoline you can prove is superior. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood Signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, death. Wears a white robe. I am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. The cabin high on the slope of Bald Mountain had always been an important part of the marriage of Sam and Leah Wixon. A successful marriage on the surface. Only two people had any reason to think otherwise. One was Leah herself and the other was her best friend, Suzanne. Leah and Sam had met at the cabin. Their romance had begun there. And one bright day in late winter, some five years afterwards, Suzanne had come to the conclusion it should properly end there. Leah could feel something coming when Suzanne engineered the invitation for herself and her husband, Harvey, for the week. Yes, Leah, 
you wonder what's behind those innocent eyes of Suzanne. What's making the wheels whir in that sharp little mind as you and she and Sam approach the cabin. Lucky there's a crust on the snow today. Never make it otherwise. Well, these snowshoes are fun. Suzanne, darling, do let Sam carry that suitcase. Well, he's already carrying yours and his. I'm not crippled. There's an idea, Leah. On what? On how to win men and influence them. <laughs> well, well, if I were the strong, rangy type, I'd carry one for you, dear. You know I'm not athletic. Well, the strong, rangy type definitely has her points. Well, stack your snowshoes over in the corner there. Well... Everything seems to be just as we left it. No bears? <laughs> Not a bear. <laughs> uh, now, where's the key to the shack? Uh. Oh, what a beautiful spot. I'm sick just thinking what Harvey and I've missed not coming up here. Well, I've wanted to have you up several times, We've but... just never been able to work it out, dear. Have we, Sam? No. The door's stuck a little. There. Oh, what a dream of a place. Sam, the fireplace. It's divine. Oh, wait till Harvey sees that. Like it? I built it with my own two it's hands. Perfect. Did you design it, Sam? Suzanne, dear, you're positively gushing. Sam's an architect, remember? Of course, Leah. She likes the fireplace. Let it go. Well, I don't. Looks like a pile of bleached bones. Come on, Suzanne. Now, you and Harvey can have this room, darling. Uh, Sam, bring Suzanne's bag in here. All right. Why don't you freshen up, Susie? You look utterly ravaged. Your nose absolutely gleams. Oh, really, dear? I might pass you a helpful hint. You apparently swallowed all your lipstick with that hamburger we ate in town. <laughs> I never worry about makeup, darling. When you're on the right side of 30, it isn't so important. Aura, do you remember? I'm taking the sled and I'm going to get a load of wood before dark. Oh, well, Leah, you better show Suzanne where the linen closet is so she can get her bed made up. Oh, can't we help? Oh, no, thanks. Oh, Sam, what a cute bell on that sled. Well, back home in Connecticut, we always had a bell on the sled that brought in the Yule log, and I thought it was a cute idea, so I put one on this. <laughs> you have such nice ideas, Sam. Um, where do you have to go for wood? You sure we can't help? Oh, I think I can manage all right. Woodshed's about 50 yards from the house. Kind of inconvenient, but it was already built when we bought the property, and... I haven't gotten around to moving it yet. Well, I'll see you girls later. Oh, I hate to think of Sam having to drive all the way back to the city for Harvey. <laughs> or is it that you hate to think of Harvey coming up here, Susie? You're not just a teensy bit bored with Harvey, are you? There aren't any men here now, Leah. You can skip the teensy. You didn't answer me, darling. Don't judge others by yourself. What do you mean? I married for love, you know, not money. Oh. Did you? Well, could anybody doubt it, looking at Sam? Well, I grant you, Sam's a handsome oh, man. Oh, oh, you've noticed. I thought you had, dear. Yes, I'm a very lucky girl. I've often thought how discouraging it would be to be married to someone who was bald and fat and unimaginative. Even if he did have gobs of money. You're referring to Harvey? Oh, darling, I think Harvey's cute. In a pudgy sort of way. By the way, does he still take bicarbonate? Leah, I might point out that I'm not trying to eat my cake and have it, too. Just what do you mean? I'm talking about your Red Cross activities. Oh? Those evenings you donate to good works. Patronizing the arts. What are you talking about? Shall I come to the point? Or would you like to fence for a while? You're not being clever, dear. Well, I'll try to be more specific. I'm referring to the movie type you picked up at Sandra Gilman's. The pianist. Picked up? I hardly know him. Why, Leah, you're actually blushing. <laughs> I can see it clear through that Westmore number 12. I have nothing to hide. Your taste isn't bad at that. He is fascinating and talented. Uh, musically, of course. But I should think you'd worry a little of Chopin after six months. <laughs> it has been six months, hasn't it? You wouldn't dare. <laughs> wouldn't I? Oh, listen, Suzanne, it's all over, believe me. There was nothing between us. I know I was foolish. I just didn't realize what was happening. Uh huh. Sam would understand all of that, of course. You're not going to say anything, Suzanne. You can't. Sam would think all kinds of things. He wouldn't understand. He'd, He'd walk out on you, wouldn't he, Leah? He isn't the kind a woman can make a fool yes, of. Yes, yes. Don't you see it'd wreck our marriage? You wouldn't do that, that, Suzanne. You couldn't gain anything by it. We've been friends too long for that. We... You can get off your knees now. I hate you. <laughs> of course you do. You always have. You're just trying to get back at me. You've been waiting for a chance like this ever since Sam and I were married. You love him, don't you? You've been in love with him for years. I didn't say that. But it's true. And you think this is your opportunity. But you won't tell Sam what you found out. You won't. Do you understand? My darling, you're so terribly dramatic. <laughs> How could you stop me? I don't know. But I will, Suzanne. 
I will if I have to... Have to what, Leah? There's just the two of us here. And I'm the strong, rangy, athletic type. Remember? That new car you've been waiting for is apparently still quite a ways off. But for the fun of improved driving performance, there's no need to wait any longer for that. No, sir. With new signal in your tank, you actually feel your present car get young again right now. Yes, whether you're driving a 32 Ford or a 42 Cadillac, you'll thrill the performance you never dreamed was built into your car. For new signal gasoline isn't just pre-war quality, not just old-style gasoline improved. No, indeed. New signal is an entirely new type super fuel that you can actually prove is superior. Prove it in three ways. One, with quicker starting. You feel your motor spring to life the moment you touch the starter. Two, with faster pickup. See your car zip out ahead with pep that makes you proud. Three, with higher anti-knock. Hear how quietly your motor purrs even when it's working hard. And what's more, because all this new power means you'll be shifting less, and shifting wastes gasoline, you know, you'll enjoy more high-gear miles, actually go farther than ever, with new signal gasoline. There's a best way to prove all this, and one tankful will do it. Just drive in this week to any of the friendly stations displaying Signal's familiar yellow and black circle sign. And say, fill her up with new Signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. You thought you'd managed the musician pretty cleverly, didn't you? And he'd seemed so important to you for a while. But now, with the prospect of losing Sam staring you in the face, it's different. He'll walk out, you're sure of it. You know him too well. Suzanne holds you in the palm of her hand, Leah. The moment she chooses to open her mouth, Sam is gone forever. And with him goes everything. Money, social position, friends. Everything your calculating mind bargained for when you married him. All through dinner, you wait for the axe to fall, but nothing happens. You can hardly bring yourself to look at her. That self-satisfied half-smile on her face makes you want to scream. And that night, when you and Sam are finally alone... Suzanne finally go to bed? Yes, her lights just went out. Good. Now, perhaps you can let me in on it. On what? On what's been going on around here. You two have been at each other's throats all day. <laughs> oh, that's just our way, dear. We've always been frank with each other. Uh, too frank, I'd say. I was so full of daggers for a while this afternoon, I could hardly see what I was doing. Come on, what is it? Well, uh, Suzanne's all wrapped up in music, you know, and uh, particularly Chopin. Well, there's a pianist we all admire that she met personally the other day, and, uh, well, we thought she wasn't being quite fair to Harvey. You mean... Oh, it, it was nothing serious, of course. Oh, Sam, you mustn't breathe a word of this to anyone. If either she or Harvey ever found out, I... Oh, I don't know what I'd do. It, it's all very silly. It isn't silly. It's darn serious. But you don't understand, Sam. It, it was really nothing. I don't care how insignificant it is. If people are talking about it, it's serious. I can hardly believe she'd do a thing like that. It just isn't like Suzanne. Harvey's a little jealous. Well, what's wrong with being jealous of your wife? Harvey's got a right to be jealous. I've got a right to be jealous. Thank heaven you're not like that. You mean you wouldn't understand if... Leah, just don't ever give me any cause. Don't ever let me down that way. I'd... I'd... You'd what, then? It scares me. I... I'd probably do something terrible. Sam. Just remember that, Leah. Don't ever give me a reason. Promise me. All right, Sam. I promise. Pretty sure of yourself, aren't you, Leah? That was a dangerous step to take. But it's your word against hers, after all. Perhaps you have something else in mind, something involving the day and a half the two of you will be alone in the cabin while Sam goes back to the city to pick up Harvey. 
They say the best defense is a first-class attack. Maybe that's why you seem to have regained a little of your old self-confidence the next morning. As you and Suzanne go out to the shed for firewood an hour after he's gone. Well, don't stand there, Leah. Help me with the door. Take your time. We've got a day and a half. Oh, oh wonderful. What? Oh, you've got the strength of a horse. You're pretty chipper this morning, aren't you? I'm delirious with excitement. A day and a half all to ourselves. Mm, it's a grim prospect. Well, are you going to stand in a corner and rhapsodize? Or are we going to get some wood? Oh, all right. I don't see why you're fussing so about wood. There's enough in the box in the house. To and... last a couple of hours. I can't understand why Sam had this wood sack clear up to the rafters. Can't even reach the top. Oh, here's one that's loose. What are you doing? Look out! What's the matter Don't with... be a fool. You'll kill yourself. Do you want that mountain of logs to crash down oh, on you? Oh, don't be ridiculous. You move those centerpieces and the whole pile will fall. Nonsense. Why? Look out! There, you see? Nothing happened? Mm. The Lord looks out for drunks and fools, darling. Huzzies, too. Wait a minute. That just about does it. I've taken about all I'm going to take from all you. All right. You want it straight from the shoulder, and I'll give it to you that way. I said you're a no good little hussy, and I'll say it again. You've been taking Sam for a ride, and I'm going to make sure he knows all about it. Is that good enough for you? You're bluffing. Hmm, you'll see whether or not I'm bluffing. You're so jealous of Sam and me, you can't see straight. I can't say I blame you staring at that moon-faced husband of yours across the breakfast table every morning. You're so miserable yourself, you can't stand happiness in anyone else. Well, you're not going to get anywhere. Sam would never believe you in a million years. I'm not asking him to believe me, dear. What do you mean? Sam ought to recognize your handwriting and your personal stationery readily enough. (laughs) Oh, you should have known better, Leah. But you weren't quite yourself at the time, were you? What are you talking about? A letter, dated September 18th. Something about you and Arturo meeting in the lobby of the Metropole at 8 o'clock. Where is it? Oh, never mind where it is. I have it. Where did you get it? Oh, I bought it. Arturo was quite attached to it. But he had his prize. Oh, you <laughs> cheap and scrupulous. Oh, you didn't really think I wouldn't come prepared, did you? Oh, Leah, dear, how can you be... Put down that axe. Do you hear me? Put down that axe. I'll kill you. Oh, no, you don't. You, you know, listen, you... Give me that axe. Do you hear me? Oh. Give... Oh, there. That's better. You, do you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do no. it. I'm the strong, rangy type, remember? Strong as a horse. <laughs> Oh, get up from there. You're not hurt. You knock me down. You hurt my arm. I hate you. I hate you. Darling, you nauseate me. You really do. I'm going out for a walk so where the air is clean. I'll kill you for this, Susan Reiner. I'll kill you. And you could do it, couldn't you, Leah? There's a blind, frustrated hatred inside you that would make you capable of anything, even murder. All that day while Suzanne is out walking, you sit alone in the living room in front of the big fireplace, staring into the embers and thinking, the two of you alone in the cabin, it would have to be perfect. The slightest indication that it wasn't an accident and you'd be done for. There simply wouldn't be any other suspect. Yes, Leah, it would have to be perfect or it couldn't be at all. Perfect. Perfect. Thinking, dear? Oh. Oh. When did you get back? Just now. I made a great to-do about slamming the door and throwing off my snowshoes, but you didn't budge an inch. What's on your mind? Nothing. Just as it should be. Where have you been? Over to the West Slope and back. You should have stayed longer. Oh? You might have been caught in the storm. Storm? Don't be silly, dear. The sun was so bright on that snow, you could hardly look at it. The radio said we're in for a bad storm sometime tonight. I just turned it off. Hmm, that raises a delightful possibility. What's that? Sam and Harvey may be delayed, dear. You and I may have several more charming days together here on the mountain. How's the food situation? There's plenty. Oh, that's good. Speaking of food, what about dinner? I haven't thought about it. Coffee on the stove. Will you join me in a cup? Thanks, no. Oh, shame to waste that gorgeous fire, isn't it, dear? If Arturo were only here... Suzanne, to... will you stop it? You've made yourself perfectly clear. I know what you're going to do, and I know how you're going to do it, and there's nothing more to be said. I can't stand this jabbing and picking any longer. I can't stand it. 
On second thought, I'll make my own coffee. It's safer that way. By midnight, the temperature outside the cabin drops to 20 below zero. And at 1.30 in the morning, the blizzard sweeps in from the north. The mercury falls another 10 degrees. You're forced to cooperate with it now, aren't you, Leah? The two of you take turns all night getting out of bed to put wood on the fire. The night seems endless, but morning finally comes. A raw, gray morning with that stabbing north wind still piling the drifts higher and higher outside. Well, you finally made it. I thought you were never going to get up. Did you happen to look out your window this morning? Leah, We're snowed in, my perfidious friend, all snug and cozy. Leah, there's something the matter. I, I don't You're know You're looking what... particularly stupid this morning, Suzanne. Oh. If I didn't know you better, I'd think you had a hangover. What's the matter with you? Why are you fumbling around there in the doorway? Leah, I can't... I can't see. Leah, I'm blind. I've gone blind. What? Come out here in the light. Look out for the table. Oh. I can't see. Your eyes are all inflamed. I'm blind. I've gone blind. Suzanne, were you crazy enough to go out without your sunglasses yesterday? Sunglasses? You stayed out all day, the sun glaring on the snow. Suzanne, you're snow blind. Snow blind? It's only temporary, isn't it? Two days, perhaps. Not not more than two days. Harvey will will be here today. Harvey won't be here today. Probably not tomorrow, either. If you could see, you'd know why. The road is blocked. The storm's getting worse. <laughs> no, I think you'll have to rely on me, darling, to be your seeing eye. the door. You'll have to come out of your room sometime. You'll freeze to death in there. Well, <laughs> you do have a large mouth, Suzanne, but it doesn't extend as far as you've daubed that lipstick. Are you cruel, Leah? You'd like to see me like this. You think it's funny. It will go away, though. You said so yourself. I- I'll be all right tomorrow. I'll be able to see tomorrow. I'm not afraid of you, Leah. Afraid of me? Oh, well, why should you be? Let me guide you to a chair by the fire, darling. Don't touch me. I, I can get there. I can... I can feel my way. Oh. Better let me help you, darling. No. I'll, I'll just sit right here. Well, how about a couple of nice poached eggs on toast and a steaming cup... I don't want anything. Oh, but it's all cooked. No good? I don't want any. Well, you haven't eaten since last night, dear. You've got to have food. Look, you're shivering. Take it away, Leah. Take you're it. cold, darling. Couldn't you possibly force just to swallow this hot coffee down? Do your world of good. Here, smell. Good? All right. I'll take the coffee. That's better. Here, I'd better warm it up from the kitchen. You know, I never really explored this cabin until today. There are all kinds of interesting things in the cellar. Sam's really quite a trapper, you know. All his equipment's there, the scrapers for the skins, the frames, the traps. There you are, dear. I put sugar in it. And a big box of some kind of arsenic he uses to cure the hides. Arsenic? Ah, gets rid of the vermin. Come on, dear, drink up. Do you good. No, I don't want it. Take it away. <laughs> oh, Suzanne, you're priceless. No, Leah, that would be too crude, wouldn't it? It would never work with inquisitive examiners and autopsies. You rejected poison at the start when you first began thinking about killing her. You're just playing with her like a cat with a mouse. You've thought of a better way, haven't you? A perfect, foolproof way. Leah! Leah, you've gone. You've left me. I'm right here, darling. Oh. Why, why didn't you answer, Leah? 
I've been thinking. Of what? Of you. Of me. Of our beautiful friendship. Leah, I want to tell you something. Leah, you, you know I'm your friend. Of course, of course, you're my dear, dear friend. And Sam's too. Especially Sam. It's not what you think. Leah, oh, I Oh, spare you... me, darling. I'm not interested in listening to you unburden your soul. Even when there's no other entertainment available. But, Leah, I want you to know this. I there's want... nothing I want to hear from you. Where? Where are you going, Leah? I'm getting our coats and snowshoes. Our, our what? Our coats and snowshoes. We have to get another load of wood. Unless you want to sit in here and freeze to I death. I can't go outside. I can't see. And I can't pull that loaded sleigh alone. We'll get along. I'll guide you. If you fall down out there, you won't hurt yourself. The snow is soft. Very soft, Suzanne. It even gets warm after a while. Here. Here's your coat and mittens and scarf for your head. I won't go out there. I won't. Listen to that wind. We couldn't find our way through that blizzard. I could get to that woodshed blindfold. Come on, put on these things. I can't. I can't. But no. you will. You no. will. No, I... No. Hey. Now, put on these mittens. No. Oh, Leah. Leah, you hold my arm. You won't let go of me. I'll hold your arm. And when we get outside, you can hold on to the rope. Ready? Come on, then. How much farther is it? We're almost there. Oh, it, it seems so much farther than before. All right. You let go of the rope now and stand right there. I'll pull the sleigh up to the shed and load it. Oh, wait. Lead me to the shed so I can stand out of the wind. Just walk about six steps forward. Right in front of you. I, I must be walking in the wrong direction. I haven't come to the shed... Leah! Leah! Answer me, Leah! Where are you, Leah? Are you in the shed? I, I don't hear you! I don't hear the bell, Leah! Oh, Leah! Leah, you're leaving me! You're leaving me out here to die! Oh, Leah, come back, please! Oh, please, Leah, please come back! Come back! Oh, which way? Where did you go? Where did you go? Answer me! Answer me! Oh, Leah, listen! Leah, what I said about telling you, Sam, I won't. Honestly, I won't. I was never going to. There isn't any letter. Oh, you're my friend, Leo. I'm not in love with Sam. I'm not. I'm not in love with him. You're my best friend, Leo. You believe me, don't you? You believe me? After me, Leo. After me! The Whistler will return with a strange ending of tonight's story in just a moment. Meantime, I want to give you the real reason why New Signal isn't just a pre-war quality gasoline, isn't just an old-style gasoline improved, but an entirely new type super fuel with performance features that until recently were reserved for war. You see, science has long known that gasoline is composed of molecules, and each molecule is actually an arrangement of atoms. But until recently, gasoline molecules were left just as nature made them. Under the impetus of war, however, certain chemists found out how to take gasoline molecules apart, then rearrange their atoms in an entirely new way, creating an entirely new type super fuel. The result is the thrilling, amazing power of Signal's new gasoline, bringing you performance so immediately apparent you can feel it, see it, hear it. It's because of this superior performance which you can actually recognize the moment you step on the accelerator that we urge you to let one tank full of new signal gasoline talk for itself. Let its quicker starting, its faster pickup, its higher anti-knock and longer mileage demonstrate in your car why new signal actually is the new post-war gasoline you can prove is superior. And now, back to the whistler. perfectly. Uh, it can't miss. You had an argument and she walked out of the house, said she was going to Cedar Village, that she couldn't stand you anymore. You tried to tell her she'd never make it, but she insisted on leaving, and that's all you know. 
Yes, it's perfect. No weapons, no blows or marks, just her frozen body, 200 yards from the house. Far enough so you couldn't have heard her over the storm. You can't hear her now anymore as you pile wood into the sled. She's probably staggered further in the wrong direction. Well, you need plenty of wood, Leah. Make it a full load, enough to carry you through tomorrow. There you are, pilot high. One from the side. One from the end. Look out. Remember what Suzanne said about pulling one out from the center. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The curious story, Death Laughs Last. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories. And by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Virginia Teal, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you try New Signal, the new gasoline you can prove is superior. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal Gasoline. Signal, the new gasoline you can prove is superior. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, death. Laughs last. I am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. It had never been the same after the death of Eddie Lamar. Eddie was his closest friend. They'd gone to school together, come up from the streets into the big time, side by side. Their partnership had been a profitable one. Eddie had plenty of money. There were no domestic troubles. His health was good. And Clint had always seemed puzzled as to why a man like Eddie would commit suicide. It just wasn't in the cards. Still, no matter how much pressure Clint put on the police department, their answer was always the same. Did you forget it, Garvey? was suicide. The coroner says so, the police surgeon says so, and I say so. You could still be wrong. Now, look. It's been a year now. One year this month since we went on the case. We've gone into every angle. We know Lamar's past like a book. The records fill two file drawers down at the bureau. And everything we've got says it's suicide. 
Why won't you forget it? Because I knew Eddie Lamar better than all of you, and I know he wasn't the kind of a guy who bumped himself off. That's why. What do you know about the inside of his mind? We got a million cases just like it. Guy comes home happy, kisses his wife, not a care in the world, bingo. Puts himself away. Not Eddie. You're off the beam, Sergeant. I'm sorry, Clint. We're closing the case for keeps this time. There's nothing more we can do. Ever made a mistake, Sergeant? Not very many. Check the record. This department is a pretty high batting average, Clint. There hasn't been a single unsolved murder in the books for the past 18 months. Oh, come on, Sergeant. You're not trying to tell me that for eight... Just check the record. It's all there in black and white. Well, I better get going. Do at the desk in 20 minutes. I'm sorry, Garvey. You're a smart boy in your own line. But you better let us make the decision when it comes to murder. It's our business. So long. So long. <laughs> yeah, the boobs. <laughs> the poor, dumb boobs. <laughs> oh, what I'd give to tell them off. <laughs> Yes, Clint. If there were only a way you could tell them off, show them what blundering saps they are. It was a perfect crime, wasn't it? So perfect that for the past year you've had a wonderful time playing with them, watching them stumble, goading them on, almost daring them to discover how Eddie Lamar really died. Yes, Clint, it was a new kind of sport, full of thrills and danger. But you knew you were safe. Because it was so perfect. No loopholes, no loose ends. You saw to that when you killed him. How you'd love to tell the public the real story of Eddie Lamar and then lean back and laugh with the rest of them while Chief Bradshaw and his clowns crawl into their holes. But that's the trouble with a perfect crime, isn't it? You can't tell anybody. You've just got to sit back and smile and boil a little inside. And then, one Saturday night on the highway north of San Diego, your lights pick up a hitchhiker at the edge of the road. Where to, buddy? Stick him up. Wait a minute, pal. You don't know... You heard what I said. Stick him up. Okay. Now, get out of the car. He took everything. Your watch, your ring, all your money... Except that hundred-dollar bill you always carry in your right shoe. Left you on foot ten miles from Chalmers Cove, the nearest town. Nothing to do but wait for morning in a haystack near the highway. You were boiling mad, weren't you, Clint? Didn't feel much like talking when that breezy truck driver picked you up the next morning. I'm always glad to give a guy a lift. Against company rules, of course, but, well, you know, it gets darn lonesome pushing one of these six-wheelers all day. Always managed to find a ride of nights, too. That's when you need a guy to talk to. Yeah, keeps you from dropping off like that guy did last night. Huh? What guy? I just heard about it back at the station. Guy must have fell asleep at the wheel. Drove off a graded curve. Yeah, killed him dead. Car burned to cinders. Some guy from Frisco. Mention his name? Yeah, Garvey. Made a note in my mind without thinking. Garvey. (laughs) That's gravy spelled backwards. See? (laughs) Wait a minute. Hold it. I think I'll go on to San Diego. Change my mind. You can let me off here at Chalmers Cove. Yes, sir? Got a room for me? Yeah, I think so. I can give you 29 That'll be $4 with that. That'll do. My name's Lawrence. Sign the register, please. Yeah. Okay. Now give me one of those newspapers, will you? Here you are. Uh, the maid will be in to make up the room right away. Tell her to skip it for a couple hours. I want to be alone. The body was burned beyond recognition, but police confirmed identification of Garvey through articles of jewelry discovered in the wreckage. The car, a 39 Buick Coupe, was purchased by the victim in San Francisco. I'm dead. What do you know? I'm dead. Say, clerk. Yes, sir? 
How does the mail run around here? I mean, tomorrow being a holiday. Uh, it'll be picked up Tuesday morning at 9. When was the last pickup on Saturday? Let me see. Was it 5? Yeah, yeah, that's right. 5 o'clock Saturday afternoon. I see. Your mind's going a mile a minute, isn't it, Clint? A whole year of talking to yourself, of chuckling in private at the stupidity of Bradshaw and his homicide detail. And now it's laid right in your lap. You think it through carefully alone in your room. They can't execute a dead man. And as far as their records go, you were killed Saturday night. A confession letter would knock the props out from under Bradshaw, wouldn't it? A letter from a dead man telling the citizens what a bunch of clowns they've got in the police department. A letter mailed to Jerry Slade of the San Francisco Times Star, Bradshaw's number one enemy. Uh, beg your pardon, clerk. Uh, oh, yes, sir. Where'd you say the mailbox is? There's one down the road at the next corner. Right by the signal oil station. Thanks. You can leave it here at the desk if no, you like. No, no, I want to put this one in the box myself. It's kind of important. And Jonathan Skinny Wainwright... The general who saw the stars and stripes hauled down... Morning, Mr. Lawrence. Checking, Checking out. Checking out? It's Tuesday. Oh, you said... yeah, and I changed my mind. I think I'll hang around a while longer. Tiger changed your mind, huh? Yes, it's Any idea how long? Can't tell. It'll all depend. Oh, I see. This is my dad. It's the greatest news, day of huh? all in the life of yeah. Skinny Wainwright. Well, now, here's a that's it. Better turn it off. Police reveal no. a new development in the Wait case of the automobile which crashed on the highway north of San Diego late Saturday night. When they announced examination of the death of the charred victim, proved him to be not Clinton Garvey, but one Joseph Castro, an itinerant wanted in Salinas for robbery. It is believed that the car registered to Garvey had been stolen. Police are puzzled by the fact that Garvey has not yet appeared to report the theft and are checking on his whereabouts. And those to this What's the matter, Mr. Lawrence? What? Reporter what time is it? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. The, station for the mailbox news. mail's picked up at nine. The mailbox? Say, what's the matter, Mr. Lawrence? Where are you going? Gee, there's something wrong with that guy. I bet he's changed his mind again. Could you describe how an olive tastes to a friend who's never eaten one? <laughs> It'd be a pretty tough job, wouldn't it? Because an olive is so different from any other food. And that's the same fix I'm in when I try to describe new signal gasoline. This great new super fuel is so superior, you really have to try it to believe a gasoline can make such a difference in driving. But I can promise you this. With your very first tank full of new signal gasoline, you'll see the difference. Yes, and feel it, and hear it, too. Now, here's what I mean. With new signal gasoline in your car, when you touch the starter, you feel your motor spring instantly to life. When you step on the accelerator, you see your car step ahead with pickup that makes you proud. And even when your motor's working hard uphill, you hear it purr contentedly. Proof of signals, higher anti-knock. What's more, because you'll be shifting less and shifting waste gasoline, you know. You'll enjoy more high-gear miles, actually go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. No wonder there's been such a swing to signal. No wonder so many folks are saying... I didn't realize how much pleasure driving could be till I tried new signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. Clint, the shoe's on the other foot now, isn't it? The laugh won't be as loud or as long as you'd hoped if that letter ever reaches San Francisco. Yes, if it gets there, you're a dead duck, and you know it as you race pell-mell down the side street in Chalmers Cove toward the mailbox you dropped it in last night. Five past nine, the pickup scheduled for nine o'clock. Maybe the truck will be late, you keep telling yourself. Yes, it's pulled up at the box as you turn the corner. Hey! Hey, wait a minute! Huh? Wrong. Listen. Listen, this letter I mailed last night. Yeah? I, I don't want to mail it. I changed my mind. I got to get it back. Well, where'd you mail this it? This box right here, last night. Well, can't get it back against department regulations. Once she's in the box, she's our baby till we make delivery. Better take it up with the postmaster. Well, listen, nobody will know about it. All you got to do Sorry, it. bud. I tell you, I got to get it. I can't. Okay. <clears throat> 
Sorry, pal. I'm under the bushes, will you? Uh, where do you keep your keys? Ah, oh, here. Okay, check the box first. Empty. Oh, he's already got it in the truck. Three mailbags. Okay. Canceled. It's all incoming. Oh, maybe the others. Canceled. Incoming. <laughs> Better be in this one. Oh, this is incoming, too. Been picked up the Los Angeles Post Office. I still got a chance. Just a minute, just a minute now. Now, what was that again, ma'am? You say you left a request at home. Pardon He's me. writing me each week for six weeks, wanting always one can mixed nut. Yeah, but you gotta have the letter with you on all overseas packages. Uh, pardon me, Chief. There's something I want to ask. Yeah, wait your turn, will you, pal? What was that, lady? Well, it'll only take a second. I just want I to... said wait your turn. Now, lady. One package mixed nuts I'm sending in week with to Okinawa Yeah, 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 I know. But you can't send a package that size without a written request. It's home, I'm telling you. Today, my husband Look, is... Look, Chief, you've got to tell me... Say, what's eating you? Take your time, will you? Now, look, lady. Who'd you give the nuts to here at the counter last time? Over there. Him. Oh. Hey, Kelly. Hey. Oh, he's on the phone. Wait a minute. He'll be through. Yeah? Uh, what do you know? Just a minute. Uh, what's the matter, Ed? This woman here wants to send a package overseas. Says you took one from her every week. You left a request at home, she says. Oh, yeah, she's okay. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, okay. Okay, lady. Oh, see, it'll be 27 cents. Uh, Thank you. Sure. Next okay. time I bring the letter. Right. Now, what can I do for you, pal? Listen, I sent an airmail letter this morning from Charmers Cove to San Francisco. What plane will be on? What time did you mail it? It was picked up at 9. Oh, what do you know about that, Ed? What? I had a mail robbery down the line this morning. Yeah? Where? Chalmers Cove. Chalmers Cove? Hey, wait a minute. Now, where'd that guy go to? Oh, what's the matter? Take the window, Kelly. I got a phone call to make. Eleven o'clock, Clint. One hour to make that plane, and you haven't a chance without a reservation. Unless... Yes. You walk into a phone booth in a drugstore. There's a chance it might work. I've got to take it. Hello, Pacific Airlines. Uh, this is the Army Priority Board. A civilian passenger for San Francisco will arrive at the airport in a half hour. J.G. Eastlake. Yeah. Give him a two-priority on Flight 6 at noon. Right. Thank you. Noble, Gray, and Hackett on Flight 10 to Las Vegas. Please report to reservation desk. Flight 8 to Phoenix, All right, El Paso, Mr. Sarge. and East Baggage checked at 42 pounds. Seven. Priority 3. Uh, pardon me, clerk. Uh, just a moment, sir. Be right with you. That's Flight 10 to San Francisco. Change for the Reno plane at midnight tonight. There you are. Uh, what can I do for you? I want to leave on Flight 6 to San Francisco. I see. Your name? My name Excuse is... Excuse me just a minute. You're Miss Gregg. Yes? I'm Reynolds. Oh. Oh, yes. How do you do, Mr. Reynolds? Has he checked in yet? No, he called here about a half hour ago. Naturally, we confirm all calls from the priority board by calling back. They've never heard of him. I see. Well, I'll be in the lobby here. All you have to do is give me the eye. Right. Thanks, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, what was that name again? Uh, name is Vickers. Howard Vickers. You say you're on flight six? I'm trying to make it. I... Take off in 15 minutes. Yes, I'll wait. You'll have a pretty fair chance. As it happens, we're running two sections on Flight 6. Two sections? Yes. That's a break for you, isn't it? Yeah. Quite a break. Two sections, Clint. Both of them carrying mail. You can see the trucks out there on the strip now, loading it on both planes. Even if you make it now, you've only got a 50-50 chance. The first plane takes off at noon. Finally, at nine minutes past twelve. Mr. Howard Vickers, please report to reservation desk. 
We have your reservation on flight six, second section. Mr. Vickers, please. If you knew how to pray, Clint, you'd be praying now. Praying that the letter that means life or death to you is in one of the sacks you saw them load into the tail compartment of the plane you're riding on. Yes, and that you can follow it from the airport in San Francisco, tail the postman who takes it to the office of the Times Star. But if it's on him, if it's delivered before you arrive, you're just as dead as if you'd stayed in Chalmers Cove and waited for them to come and get you. You need a break, Clint, a good, healthy break. Then at half past one... Fasten safety belts, please. There's nothing to worry about. Fasten safety belts. Fasten safety belts, please. We're going to land. There's absolutely no danger. We've simply run into a storm and we're landing until it blows over. But where are we? We just passed over the Salinas. It may be necessary to spend the night here. A company limousine will pick you up and take you to a hotel. Just relax. We're landing now. Stewardess, stewardess. Yes, sir? What about the first section up ahead? Oh, I couldn't say, sir. They may be through the storm. They'll arrive in San Francisco before we do? Well, maybe. I don't know. I'll try to find out for you later. This is an emergency field. There's a shelter down to your right. This way, please. What's the matter, sir? Why, oh, I, I don't know. Well, you'd better come along, sir. I, I, I don't feel well, Stuart. It, it was a pretty bumpy landing. You'll feel better when you get your feet on the ground. Is, is everybody gone? Yes. Good. Well, what are you... Never mind, just do what I tell you and you'll be okay. Get out the keys. But I don't... Don't tell me you haven't got them. They're in your shoulder bag. All right. That's it. All right, now open up that tail compartment. But I have no right Listen, to... Listen, sister, I'd hate to drill you. I don't want to play games. See, now get back there and open it up. All right, all right. There you are. Packages. Well, what did you expect? Where's the mail? Letters. There isn't any. It's all express. Don't hand me that. There's got to be letters. There are. On the other plane. Give me those keys. Now get in that compartment. Hurry up. You're pretty panicky, aren't you, Clint? There's no way out of it now. For once, you don't know what to do. And just as you're about ready to give up, Make that train. It's a quarter mile along the edge of the field of the tracks. A car is pulled up on the highway at the grade crossing. That's a better idea, isn't it, Clint? A car. Hey! Hey, you! Hey! Yeah? What's up? Wait a minute, will you? Wait a minute! Sure! What's the matter, mister? Had a wet, ain't you? Never mind that. Get out. What are you talking I said, about? Get out or I'll blow your head off. Hurry up. Oh, yeah, sure. I didn't see All that. Right, beat it. Yeah, Mr. Sure, I'm going. I'm going. You've still got a chance, Clint. The other plane's delayed. Must have been. It's a big storm. Covers all the central California coast. You hit Watsonville at dusk. Take a chance on the shortcut to Los Gatos. You're almost there when... Bridge washed out. I gotta turn back. Back to the junction. Optos, Sokel, Santa Cruz, Ben Loman. Sorry, bud. There's a slide on the pass up ahead. There'll be a two hour wait at least. Two hours. Ten o'clock now. It'll be midnight before you get across the mountains. You can't think of anything but that other plane. If it were delayed long enough, the delivery would be held over until morning. That's the one you're counting on, isn't it, Clint? Then finally, at four in the morning, you're there. You leave the car on 3rd Street and take a taxi the rest of the way to the Time Star building on Mission Street. There's a one-armed coffee joint across the way where you can telephone. Pacific Airlines. Listen, I want some information. Yes, sir. About Flight 6. What's your destination, please? Incoming Flight 6, yesterday from Los Angeles. What did you want to know, sir? Did it arrive here? Well, Flight 6 from Los Angeles yesterday was in two sections. Yes, I know it was in two sections. One was grounded north of Salinas. I want to know about the other one, the first one. Just a moment, please. 
What is the reason for your call, sir? Does there have to be a reason? I'm sorry, sir. Is there someone aboard the I'm plane? I'm calling from the San Francisco Times Star. There's a very important airmail letter aboard the first section of Flight 6 addressed to my office, and I want to know whether it'll arrive this morning. Does that satisfy you? Just a moment, sir. The first 8 o'clock delivery. Thanks. Three hours to go. Three miles of pacing up and down Montgomery Street, over to Kearney, up market to 7th and back again. Five cups of coffee. You're going on your nerve, Clint. Your hands are shaking so you can hardly light a cigarette. Then at five minutes of eight, a mail truck drives up to the rear entrance of the Time Star building. And you're ready for it, waiting on the platform. Uh, hello there. Is, uh, is that our mail? Well, this is for the Time Star, if that's what you mean. Great. Everything here? Yeah, it's all in that sack. Well, I'll take it up. Save your trip. Well, thanks a lot. Hey, better take her by the cord here. Okay. It's heavier than it looks. Yeah. I'll see you later. So long. I'm working up. Phone booth, get up. Well. What? What would you be taking that mailbag into a phone booth for, Mr. Garvey? Get away from me. I'll Give me job. it. Thanks. 38 caliber, professional model. You know how to use it, too. I'm Reynolds, FBI. Saw you yesterday at the Los Angeles airport, right? What's the gimmick? Charges? Well, let me see. There are two assault charges, two mail robbery counts, a car theft, and defrauding an innkeeper. Uh, you didn't pay your bill at the Chalmers Cove Hotel, you know. Of course, I'm mainly interested in this mail business, just like you are. You gotta tell me why. You seem to know a lot of answers. Suppose you tell me. You knew one answer you weren't supposed to know, Garvey. You were the only citizen in San Francisco outside the Pacific Airlines organization who knew the second flight of Flight 6 was grounded at Salinas yesterday. You know it doesn't take much fooling with mailbags to get a lot of publicity. We checked you from that affair you pulled yesterday at Chalmers Cove, right through to the call you made to the airline a little while ago. I was down there when it came in. Now, suppose you just walk along far enough in front of me to uh, keep things friendly, hmm? We'll take care of the mail. The Whistler will return with a strange ending to tonight's story in just a moment. Meantime, a word about two important items that have been making news recently. One, the atom. And two, new signal gasoline. <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell you there's atomic power in new signal gasoline. But recent developments in atoms actually did make possible this great new motor fuel. And I'll tell you what I mean. You see, science has long known that gasoline is composed of molecules. And each molecule is an arrangement of atoms. The way those atoms are arranged determines just how much power you get from the gasoline. In old-style gasolines, the molecules were left just as nature made them. But recently, certain chemists found out how to take gasoline molecules apart, then rearrange the atoms in an entirely new way. The result is new signal. The new gasoline you can prove is superior. Not just a pre-war quality motor fuel. Not just old-style gasoline improved. But an entirely new type, super fuel with performance so immediately apparent, you feel it, see it, hear it. Yes, with new signal in your tank, you actually feel your car get young again. And the easy way to prove it? Just drive into one of the friendly stations displaying signals, familiar yellow and black circle sign, and say, fill her up with new signal gasoline. Now, back to the Whistler. Clint, you have a lot of time to think it over in your cell at the city jail during the next week. It was bad enough to be picked up just as you got to the payoff with a letter practically in your hand. But worse than that is the fact that you were outsmarted. That you're going to be on the receiving end of that horse laugh, as you call it. That's why you're puzzled as the days go by and there's no mention of the letter. Nothing of Eddie Lamar 
and the murder that used to be perfect. Then, ten days afterwards, Reynolds walks into your cell block. Hello, Clint. Hello. We got it. What? The letter. Took you long enough. Yeah. Slow service. Why you been holding it? We haven't. Oh, wait a minute. What it you... wasn't in the sack, Clint. Where was it? Back at Chalmers Cove. A hotel. What? You're a little behind the times, Clint. The airmail rate is eight cents, not six. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale, the curious story of the house on Sycamore Road. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you try New Signal. The new gasoline you can prove is superior. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal. Signal Gasoline. Yes, Signal Gasoline is the new gasoline you can prove is superior. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood Signal Dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, The house on Sycamore Road. I am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Sometimes weakness results only in failure and disillusionment. Sometimes it's much more serious than that. It can take a sinister turn sending its victim down the spiral that ends only in death. That's the way it was with Harold Phillips on the day he and his wife, Muriel, rented the house on Sycamore Road from old Sabina Fielding. It wasn't much of a house, but it was destined to be the most important element in Harold's life. Like Sabina, it was old, but there was a kind of majesty about it, veiled as it was behind a mat of unkempt shrubbery, and a pair of magnificent elms in the front yard. Muriel had objected to it, of course. But there was no other alternative. Rents were sky high, and the house on Sycamore Road was the only answer. As they stand talking with Sabina in the front hallway, Muriel is a little impatient. Well, that just about covers everything, Mrs. Fielding. Yes, I think we'll make out very comfortably here. It's hard to leave. Never thought I'd mind it this much. Of course. Uh, It's been in the Fielding family for now. Let me see. Well, uh, there was Rodney and Lisa. Uh, Yes, uh, five generations. Five generations? Yes. I I do hope you young people will be happy in it. A fine house in its time, you know. A proud house, just like the Fieldings. Yes, we're a proud family. (laughs) None of us ever... 
never had money, uh, excepting Richard, of course. Uh, that's my grandson. Richard had money, but it, it didn't do him any good. Well, even he's gone now. I'm the last now, the last Fielding. And I'm afraid I haven't much longer. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Mrs. Fielding. Oh, no, no, no. I'm an old woman, Mr. Phillips. Yes, it's hard to leave. Oh, <laughs> that clock. I can remember when my daddy bought it. Let me see now. Was that 68 or 69? Uh, Mrs. Fielding, Harold will be glad to drive you into town. 68 or 69? Uh, eh? Oh, yes, yes. I, well, I'd better be going. Well, I'd be glad to take you. Oh, well, uh, it's only two blocks to the bus stop. I can still walk that far without any trouble. I really think it'll be easier for you now, having just one room in town. You'll be closer to everything. Yes. Yes, so I'm told. Are you sure now? You don't want me to drive you? Oh, you're very kind. And I do like to see that in young people. But I can manage, thank you. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Phillips. Goodbye. I know you'll be happy here. I'm sure of it, Mrs. Fielding. Goodbye. Goodbye, young man. Young people, she says. We'll be very happy. For heaven's sakes, Muriel, she'll hear you. I could scream my head off in here and she wouldn't hear me. Come to think of it, screaming wouldn't be a bad idea. Will you quit it? That old crone is probably laughing herself silly right now after pawning off this old barn on us. But, Muriel, you know as well as I do it's the best we can do right now. Where have I heard that before? Or I'm getting sick of it, Harold Phillips. I'm getting fed up with shabby substitutes. Well, I've got a job. I don't know what else you want. Classified advertisements on a stupid hometown paper. What kind of a job is that? Well, it's the best I can do, and this house is the best I can do. You may as well make up your mind I to it. I know, I know. I've been through all that before. But I'm not getting reconciled to it. You can make up your mind to that. Huh. Anything else? Yes, you. I can't say it's very inspiring, living in a moth-eaten shanty with an ink-stained nobody. Muriel. And this flock of antiques. That old clock she's so proud of. Listen to it. If you think I'm going to sit here day after day with that thing ticking in my ears... What's got into you anyway? I'm fed up, that's what. Now what are you doing? I'm going to stop this clock. Any objections? Will you be reasonable? Will you shut up? Where's the catch on this thing? Oh, look out, you'll knock it over. All right, so I'll knock it over. Oh, now look what you've done. Harold. You hadn't lost your temper again. Harold, look. Why, in the world? Look at all that money. Just look at it. Stuffed away in back of the clock. Hundreds. Thousands. Harold. Oh, Harold, darling. As you sit listening on Monday nights to Signal Oil Company's program, The Whistler... Has it ever occurred to you how many millions of persons around the world have never even heard a radio... Missing a lot of pleasure, aren't they? Oh, but wait a minute. Before you start shedding tears for those folks, just consider the pleasure you yourself may be missing if you haven't yet tried new signal gasoline. No fooling, folks. You'll never know how much driving pleasure there's left in your car till you try Signal's new super fuel. For new signal gasoline is packed with performance that's so apparent you can actually feel it, see it, hear it. Here's what I mean. With new signal gasoline in your car, when you touch the starter, you feel your motor spring instantly to life. When you step on the accelerator, you see your car step ahead with pickup that makes you proud. And even when your motor's working hard uphill, you hear it purr contentedly, proof of signal's higher anti-knock. What's more, because you'll be shifting less and shifting waste gasoline, you'll enjoy more high-gear miles, actually go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. I know that's the kind of performance you'd like to enjoy from your car. And here's the easy way to get it. Just drive into one of the friendly stations displaying signals, yellow and black circle sign, and say, fill her up with new signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. like a dream, isn't it, Harold? You and Muriel, kneeling on the floor of Sabina Fielding's old house, 
literally surrounded with the money that spilled from the old clock. Muriel's in seventh heaven, as you counted. She even called you darling, didn't she? You work automatically, sorting the bills, twenties, tens, fives, into small, neat heaps on the scarred hardwood floor. How much is it, dear? How much altogether? Wait, let, let me finish. I simply can't believe it. 80, it's like a dream. 90, 100. There, that's the last 100. How much altogether? It hardly seems possible. How much, Harold? Tell me. $50,000. Oh. 50000 in currency, small bills. It's probably been hidden away in this compartment behind the clock for years. $50,000. I never thought I'd see this much money all at once. The things we'll be able to do. All the marvelous things I've always dreamed of. All the clothes. Maybe go abroad. Who in the world? Harold, who can it be? I don't know. Who oh, can't let them in, all this money? We won't answer it. We won't let them in. Well, we'll have to. They can see the lights are on. But all this money. Well, stay here and hide it. I'll see who it is. All right, then. All right, but don't let them in. Nobody must see this money. Nobody must know we have it. Yes? Huh? Who are you? Looking for someone? I figured maybe the old lady fell asleep and couldn't hear me. Old lady? Sure, sure, the old girl, Mrs. Fielding. Oh, oh, well, uh, Mrs. Fielding doesn't live in this house now. Uh, now, wait a second, No, she doesn't Jack. live here now. She lives in town. Uh, who are you? My wife and I are running the house. Who are you? Well, I think you might do well to tell me who you are first. Okay. I'll come in and we'll talk things uh, over. Uh, no, no, please, uh, wait a minute. Now, listen, Jack. Look. You see, my, my wife is very ill. We, we can't have any visitors. I don't want to talk to your wife. I can't talk to you now. I'm very busy. Good night. Okay, mister. But I'll be back. So long. Who was it, Harold? Harold? Who was it? What did he want? Wait, wait. Or why are you snooping from behind those curtains? Well, I want to make sure. They... Yeah. Yeah, he's getting in his car. And there he goes. There who goes? Who was it, Harold? A uh, uh, man. Oh, uh, did you set the clock up against the wall again? Yes, the glass was broken. I threw the pieces in the fireplace. Well, where's the money? I put it back in the clock. Who was it? Oh, I don't know. A fellow about my age had a red scar on his right cheek. He wanted to see Mrs. Fielding. He wouldn't give me his name. It's funny. Uh, he said he'd be back. Well, what are we going to do about the money? We can't leave it there. Maybe we could... Harold, what's the matter? Hey, I think I know who he is. Muriel... What did Mrs. Fielding say about Richard Fielding? Something about money? He's dead. She said she was the last, don't you remember? I'm not so sure. That's the trouble. I'm not sure at all. Muriel, we may as well face it. It's not our money. It belongs to him. Don't be stupid. He's dead and she doesn't know anything about it. We found it. It's ours. For the first time in our lives, we have a chance to get off the treadmill and get somewhere. But it isn't ours. Besides, she needs it. She's going to die. We've got a whole lifetime ahead of us. But... I don't know, Muriel. What if it is his? What if he knows about it? We don't know for sure that he's dead. We can find out for sure. How? Mrs. Fielding knows. We're going to call on her the first thing in the morning. It's quite a problem, isn't it, Harold? You know it's wrong to take this money, but $50,000 is enough to set you staggering. Muriel didn't make that decision, did she? You would have made it all by yourself. Yes, Harold, there's only one thing that keeps you from taking it. The thought that someone else may be in on the secret. The man with a scar on his face, for example. You can't sleep all night thinking about him. And neither you nor Muriel stop for breakfast the next morning. At nine o'clock, you're both talking to Sabina Fielding in her furnished room in town. Uh, sorry, I can't be a better hostess. I'm feeling mighty poorly. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Fielding. We just thought we'd drop by and see if you were settled yet. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. You're, you're so kind. I'm really very happy you came. I don't get many visitors, you know. No one cares much about an old woman. Of course, we don't want to tire you. Oh, fiddlesticks. <laughs> you're a little like... Part of the family now, living in my house. You do like my house, don't you? Oh, we're in love with it, Mrs. Fielding. It's a lovely old place. Oh, I'm so glad. You see, I didn't want it to go to anyone who wouldn't understand it. 
Houses are like people, you know. They have to be understood. Not everybody understands my house. It certainly has atmosphere. That uh, that clock is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Oh, you like it? It's always been my favorite. I'm happy you like it. I guess you understand my clock, too. Richard always wanted it, but he didn't understand it, so I never gave it to him. Why did he want it, Mrs. Fielding? I never knew. Richard and I never got on together. Always said he had bad blood in him. Oh, he could have been such a nice boy. Handsome and strong. Until the accident, at least. Accident? Yes. He was never the same after the accident. He had it coming, though, Richard had. There was bad blood in him. I... Uh, I don't like to talk about my grandson. Uh, do you ever hear from him? I don't want to talk any more about him. No, no, not any more. Ah, uh, would you have some tea? It's a little early, I wish but... you'd tell us about uh, Richard. Uh, have you uh, any uh, idea... Muriel, I'm afraid Mrs. Fielding's tired. We'd better be going. Oh, but well, I, I'm sorry to be this way. Uh, now, perhaps some other time, uh, when I'm feeling oh, better. Yes, of course. Yes. Yes. Come along, Muriel. <laughs> That convinced you, didn't it, Harold? It all fits. The scar on the face of the man who called on you last night ties in with Sabina's story of Richard's accident. Her remark about his fondness for the clock. It was too easy, wasn't it? Fifty thousand dollars isn't hidden in a clock and then forgotten. It's Richard's money, and he's bound to come back for it. There was no reason for tiring Sabina any longer. Muriel would have worn her out with questions. After all, Muriel isn't the kind who gives up easily. After you've arrived back at the house, she keeps it up, never letting down for a minute. Harold, of all the ass and There was nothing else to do. She would have told us if you hadn't... Sometimes I think you have the mentality of a child. What more do you want? She practically came right out and said it. He had money. He was in an accident. The scar, you remember? He always wanted the old clock. Could she make it any plainer? All right, all right. Jomu, what are you going to do? We can't do anything. He knows the money's there. What do you mean we can't do anything? We can leave, can't we? When? Right now. Huh. That's a prize suggestion. Why, he could trace us in five minutes. We'd be in jail in a week. Listen, Harold. You've got a chance. For the first time in your shabby, ordinary little life, you've got a chance at something real. Are you going to throw it away? Well, I... I don't know. Sabina knows nothing about the money, Harold. There are only three people in on it. You and I and Richard Fielding. And he's coming back here. He said so. You'll probably never have another chance, Harold. What are you suggesting? Think it over, Harold. There isn't much more time. Yes, think it over, Harold. Is she right? You can see her point, can't you? You will never have another opportunity like this as long as you live. Just more of the same, day after day. Thousands more classified advertisements. Scrimping, pinching pennies, trying to make five dollars do the work of ten. And only Richard Fielding stands between you and everything you ever wished for. Only Richard Fielding. Uh, oh, what's that? Someone's at the door. It's too late. He's come back. Well, what are you waiting for? Let him in. Huh? He's getting impatient, Harold. Let him in. But but he's come for the money. Why, Harold, what's the matter? You said it belonged to him. I don't, I don't know, Muriel. Nothing else we can do, is there? We can't take it. You said so. We'd be traced. Oh, no, you're right. He, he can't take it away. It's the only chance we'll ever have. There's no other way, Harold. Or is there? Why, I... What do you mean, Muriel? He might be difficult, Harold. There's the poker beside the fireplace. Oh, no, I couldn't. All right. Give the money back to him. But it's mine. He can't. Harold, get hold of yourself. Muriel. Harold. Get the poker. Yes, yes, Muriel. The poker. Yes? Hi, I'm... Uh, I'm back again. Hey, you remember me, don't you? I was here the other night. Sure, sure. I, I remember. Uh, what do you want? I'd like to come in for a minute. My car's stalled outside. 
All right. Come in. Yeah, I uh, got this far from town, then my jalopy stopped dead on me. I, I didn't even know it was your house till I found myself on the steps again. Well, uh, come in the living room. I, uh... I've been poking up the fire. Yeah, I noticed. Who is it, darling? Oh. Hello. Good evening. What's the matter? What are you looking at? Didn't you ever see a scar on a man's face before, Mrs. Phillips? How do you know my name? I've been in town today asking a few questions. He's the one, Harold. It's he. Now, wait, Jack. Now, Harold. Wait. Wait. <laughs> oh. The poker, Harold. Pick it up. I, I think I'm going to be sick. Pick the poker up. Put it back where it belongs. I, I've killed him. I've killed a man. Harold, stop it. Get control of yourself. I'm going to be sick. Stop it. I don't feel any better than you do, but it's done now. We've got to go through with it. I've, I've killed him. Maybe you haven't. you better see. Oh, no, I can't. You've got to, Harold. Think of all that money. He's out of the way now. We don't have to worry. See if he's dead. Well? Yes. Yes, he is. Go through his pockets. Oh, I can't. You've got to. See if he had a gun, his identification. There's an automatic and a shoulder holster. You see? He would have killed us. A wallet. Fifteen dollars in it. That's all. It has to be more than that. His identification. Oh, there's nothing else in it, Muriel. A handkerchief in his pocket. There's nothing in this. Nothing here. And that's all. Well, we've got to get rid of him. Get rid of him? We can't leave him here. Take him out to his car. It's it stalled. That was just an excuse to get in here. Where are those chains? Chains? The ones you had in the car, are they still there? Oh, yes, I think so. All right. Weight his body down with them and we'll drop him in the river. We can leave his car somewhere. Uh, They'll never trace him. No identification. And then what? And then we can take our own sweet time. You can give notice at the express in the morning, and we'll leave town in a couple of weeks. You can say you've got another job. But the, the money... Don't worry about it. There's no one left to talk, is there? You've killed a man, Harold. It stopped you for a while, didn't it? But after that first wave of nauseating panic, you can think more clearly... The weighted body goes into the river, the car left on a lonely road. Then during the next few days, you try to appear normal at work while you wait for the news to break. It's hard to concentrate, isn't it? Mr. Gardner, your boss, has to call you on the carpet because of absent-minded errors you make in the daily classified section. The others notice you aren't eating at lunchtime. Five days, six days, a week. Nothing happens. They must have found the car. They couldn't miss it parked down the highway ten miles. Finally, you deliberately stroll into the city hall and look up Chief of Police Norton. Well, hello, Harold. Sit down, sit down. Have a chair. Thank Where you. have you been keeping yourself? Missed you at the lodge meeting the other night. Oh, I've been pretty busy. How about you? Ha, <laughs> ha, Never a dull moment around here. You know, police work's funny. Yeah? Sometimes it gets so quiet you can hardly stand it. Have trouble keeping the men in line. I can hardly blame them playing around with traffic violations day after day. <laughs> Men, all of a sudden, everyone gets so darn busy, he wishes he had six hands. Yeah, look, like now, for instance. You got a handful, huh? Uh-huh. This is a quiet town, Harold. Too quiet sometimes, almost like a snake coiling up ready to strike. Last week, nothing but traffic violations. Well, maybe a bunch of wild kids breaking a store window somewhere. This week, stolen automobiles. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Just gave the story to one of your boys. That isn't all. We got a murderer on our hands. Huh? Uh Uh-huh. Somebody right in town, too. Just like I was saying, Harold, it's a quiet old burg, but I suppose as long as people get together, there'll be murder. Hmm? Yes. Well, uh, Uh, what was it? uh, uh, Ah, just like all those nosy newspaper guys, aren't you? Sorry, Harold. We can't say anything until we get him. You, uh, got any leads? Sure. There's always leads. Don't worry. We'll get him. When we do, you'll know about it. Oh, excuse me. Norton speaking. Yeah. Fielding? When'd you find the body? 
Oh, gosh, that's tough. Huh? Well, yeah, Harold's right here. Just happened in. What's it got to do with him? What? Well, that's a funny one. Wait a minute. I'll get Phillips. Say, Harold, what did... Hello? He just ducked out the door. I'll get hold of him for you. Muriel. Muriel. Harold, what on earth? What's wrong? Don't ask questions. We've got to get out of here. What's happened? Norton's found out about Fielding. They found the body. What? Hurry. We've got to get away from here before he comes out here. Too late to run. Get the money. It isn't any use, Harold. Why not? If they found the body, they're sure to catch you. You can't hope to get away by running. Me? What, what do you mean, me? I'm not running away, Harold. You're an accomplice. You think so? Well, you're just as guilty as I am. Why, if you hadn't been so... Oh, no, you don't. It's your word against mine. I had nothing to do with it. You had everything to do with it. I told you I was tired of being married to a failure. You failed again, Harold. You even failed at murder. You won't get away with it. What about the money? What money? In the clock, the clock! I didn't know there was any money in the clock. And I'm sure no one will find any there, even if you tell them to look in it. You've hidden it. You've hidden that money somewhere else. Have I, darling? You're going to take it all for yourself when you're rid of me. That's why you said there was no hurry. You planned it this way, didn't you? Perhaps. Well, you won't get away with it, Muriel. You won't. I don't know how you can stop me at this point, darling. You see? That's Chief Norton at the door now. I watched him drive up outside while we were talking. Better let him in. Oh, no. Not until I've taken care of you first. No. Hell, no. Oh, I didn't get rid of Fielding's gun, you see. Hell, no. Please. Please, I, I didn't mean anything I said. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, let's take a look at a few of the new post-war products we've all been waiting for. According to news releases, the first of the new nylon hosiery will be of pre-war quality. The first new automobiles will be 1942 models with improvements added. But when it comes to gasoline, new signal gasoline, ah, that's another story. For new signal is not just pre-war quality gasoline, not just old-style gasoline improved, but an entirely new type of motor fuel with performance features that until recently were reserved for war. You see, science has long known that gasoline is composed of molecules, and each molecule is an arrangement of atoms. The way those atoms are arranged determines how much power you get from the gasoline. Well, in old-style gasolines, the molecules were left just as nature made them. But recently, certain chemists found out how to take gasoline molecules apart, then rearrange the atoms in an entirely new way. The result is new signal, an entirely new type super fuel with quicker starting, faster pickup, higher anti-knock, and longer mileage. Because these are all features you can actually feel, see, and hear, we urge you to let just one tank full of new signal gasoline talk for itself. Let its performance in your own car show you why new signal actually is the new post-war gasoline you can prove is superior. And now, back to the whistler. It was too late to do anything else, wasn't it, Harold? Too late to do anything but get even. And you did it very efficiently. Muriel, your wife, she's dead now, lying at your feet, as Chief Norton comes into the room. Harold, what got into you? You killed her deliberately. It doesn't matter. Good Lord, man, what are you talking about? You've committed a murder. Doesn't that mean anything to you? He was as guilty as I am. She was in on it, too, understand? She wanted the money, the 50000 She wouldn't give me any peace. When Fielding came back for his money... Fielding? What Fielding? Richard. It was his money in the clock. She made me kill him, Norton. She made me. He came to the house for the money? Yes. He had a scar on his right cheek? Yes, of course he did. Oh, will you drop it? I've had enough. Wait a minute. You've made an awful mistake, Harold. What? The man you killed was the murderer I told you we were looking for. He was Richard Fielding's partner in a bank robbery last year. Murderer? Yes. 
They quarreled over the money, and he killed Fielding. When he broke out of the pen last week, they notified us, figuring he'd check in here sooner or later. Yes, but down at your office, what were you talking about on on the telephone? Sabina Fielding. She died last night. Sabina? But I thought... (laughs) Funny. I've always thought Sabina was a pretty good judge of character. She sure missed the boat this time. What do you mean? She must have taken a fancy to you and your wife. Left the house and everything in it to the two of you. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Leslie Edgley, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you try new Signal. The new gasoline you can prove is superior. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal. Signal gasoline. Yes, signal gasoline is the new gasoline you can prove is superior. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, final return. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. They say there's always a woman in the life of every successful man. A woman who inspires him or pushes him or nags him from obscurity to fame. Yes, a woman can be a man's destiny. If it hadn't been for Sylvia, Alex Kirby would have worked his life away at one of the open hearth furnaces of the Williston Steel Company. And the state would have lost one of its colorful political figures. But fate had something else in store for Alex Kirby. Something that had its beginning at a high school prom he attended one night with his friend, Leonard Evans. Oh, look, Len, I'm getting out of here. I I shouldn't have come. Now, wait, Alex. I told Sylvia I wanted her to meet you. Oh, some other time. I I don't belong here. What's that mean? Well, look at all these kids having a swell time. And then look at me. (laughs) What's wrong? You an old man at 21? (laughs) Len, I never went to high school. That's the answer. I don't want to kid myself I belong here. I suppose I do. Sure you do. You went to high school, to college. And you know this Taylor dame. She's not a dame, Alex. She's a teacher. That's what I mean. They're all dames to me. I don't belong here. Well, it's too late to back out. Here's Sylvia now. Hello, Leonard. Hope I didn't keep you waiting. Oh, no. Sylvia, this is Alex Kirby. You've heard me talk about him. Oh, yes. Alex, Sylvia Taylor. How do you do, Mr. Kirby? Hello. Have you gentlemen been dancing Oh, as a matter of fact, Sylvia, Alex was just saying... Hey, now look, Len. How about it? Why don't you two take this dance? Well, if Mr. Kirby... Of course he does. Go ahead. I'll, I'll go sample the punch bowl. dance very well, Mr. Kirby. Oh, oh, do I? Poor Leonard's an atrocious dancer. (laughs) Oh, Len's a swell guy. Yes, his whole family is sweet. 
They've been wonderful to me. I, I board with them, you know. I've no family of my own. Uh, yeah, he, he told me. You, uh, you work in the open hearth, don't you, Mr. Kirby? Yeah, where muscle counts. Len works in the chemical lab. You haven't any family either, have you? How'd you know? Oh, Leonard talks about you. He thinks very highly of you. Yeah? Yes, he says you've earned your own living since you were 13. He thinks you have great potentiality. Yeah? And so do I. Yeah? <laughs> For goodness sake, Mr. Kirby, the word is yes. What? Not yeah, yes. Oh. You are to make anything of yourself. You must learn to speak properly. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. <laughs> Hey, you like to know something? Something. Okay, something. You're the first day, uh, girl who's ever corrected me. <laughs> kind of hopeless, though, don't you think? Oh, I don't know. Mr. Kirby, I'm beginning to think you have possibilities. Alexander. Yeah? Uh, yes? Have you told Leonard yet? Uh, no, not yet. Oh, you promised me you'd do it today. Oh, well, I couldn't. Why not? Well, Len's such a nice guy that... Men are not nice guys and good guys and swell guys, Alexander. How many times must I tell you that? I know, I know. Surely you can tell Leonard about our engagement. Why not? Oh, I know, but the way Len feels about you... I've never given him the slightest encouragement. Are you... Are you sure you want to marry me, Sylvia? I knew it the moment I met you. Sound pretty sure of yourself. I'm sure of you, Alexander. Very sure of what the two of us can do together. We're going straight to the top. Oh, there you go with that heading for the top stuff again. You've got me all wrong, Sylvia. I'm nobody at all. You're handsome. That's a start. I mean, I, I don't have any background, no schooling. Well, we'll make up for that together. You'll go to night school and I'll tutor you. Gosh, I'd, I'd sooner have a good time than go to school. Rather, dear. Not sooner. Oh. You'd rather have a good time. Oh, okay, rather. But the point I'm trying to make it is... It isn't a valid point, Alexander. Mine are. You're handsome. You're well-liked. You have native intelligence. And you have the qualities of leadership. Everyone who meets you knows it. And we're going to capitalize on those gifts. Are you inferring again? The word is imply, not infer. But I'm doing more than imply. I'm telling you flatly. We're going into politics. But I don't know anything about politics. You will. You're going right up to the top. Well, where's that? The governor's mansion. <laughs> you know, Sylvia, this is the first time I've ever heard you crack a joke. Oh, I'm not joking. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. Hey, you mean it, don't you? Of course I mean it. We're going to do things in this world, Alexander. Someday we'll leave this scrubby little steel town, but it can give us something now. Small and cheap and shoddy, but it's a start. Oh, don't you see, Alexander? You can have anything you want, if you want it badly enough. The only thing that can stop you is death. How old is a car? Well, in years, the average car on the road today has passed its seventh birthday. But like most folks, a car is really only as old as it feels. And many cars today feel much younger than their birthdays, thanks to that amazing new super fuel, new signal gasoline. Here's what I mean. With new signal in your tank, you touch the starter and instantly you feel your motor spring to life. As you step on the accelerator, you see your car step ahead with a pickup that makes you proud. And because of new signal's higher anti-knock, you hear your motor purr contentedly, even on steep hills. It's because of these features, which you can actually feel, see, hear, that we call New Signal the post-war gasoline you can prove is superior. But while you're enjoying this improved performance, you'll be interested to know that you're also enjoying an extra bonus in extra miles. You see, because New Signal's amazing power means you'll find less need for shifting into second or low gear, and shifting is the demon that wastes gasoline, your speedometer will tell you it's a fact. You actually go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. Yes. 
Yes, Alex. Sylvia was very much your destiny from the first time she met you and corrected you. She was never a pretty girl, was she? In fact, when you married her, all the lively little Polish girls you danced with and made love to wondered why you'd chosen a cold fish like Sylvia. They didn't know a man can't run away from his destiny, did they, Alex? At the time, nobody could guess that six years later you'd be the most important man in that grubby little steel town. Thanks to Sylvia. Yes, thanks to the books she made you study, the ambition she instilled in you, her untiring correction of your mistakes in grammar and speech and the social niceties. You were able to run for mayor and win the election. And on election night, after everyone had finally gone home, everyone but Leonard Evans, Will somebody pinch me now? I still can't believe it. I never had any doubts about the outcome, did you, Leonard? No, no. Uh, you can never be sure about an election, Sylvia. I'll admit I wasn't worried about the mill guys, uh, uh, the labor vote, but when the other side of town poured in for me, too, why, my gosh, it was a landslide. Sylvia told you it would be, Alex. Well, I know, but anything can happen in politics. Now, like I told that reporter... As you told that reporter. Oh, now, Sylvia, can't I relax when <laughs> nobody's around? School isn't out yet, I see. Well, I guess I'd better run along. I have some packing to do. Packing? W what do you mean, Len? I'm leaving town tomorrow, Alex. Oh, you're kidding. No, no, I'm not. Ask Sylvia. Leonard told me two weeks ago, dear. But you didn't tell me. You let me think. I thought it could wait until the election was over. I didn't want to worry you. Oh, I'm a child, is that it? So I'm a kid who has to be shielded from everything. Now you're being absurd. Okay, Sylvia, okay, skip it. Well, where are you going, Len? The West Coast. I'll be up to my neck in chemical engineering. Sure you won't change your mind? Oh, sorry, Alex, I can't. I've, uh, I've got to get away. Well, I hope you'll make a hit at whatever it is. Thanks, Alex. I know you'll be successful. You'll always be. As long as Sylvia's beside you. As long as Sylvia's beside you. With her, you're a success. Without her, a failure. Leonard's right, isn't he, Alex? As the years go by, she's there beside you like your right arm, writing your speeches, standing quietly in the background as you move up the ladder higher and higher. It's inspiration at first, and slowly, subtly, it changes to desperation. She never lets up, eternally nagging, pleading, insulting, anything to keep you moving up higher and higher. Sylvia! Sylvia! Yes, dear, I hear you. In here. Sylvia, it's all set. What's all set? The nomination. I had lunch with Ed Stevens today. He said it'll be automatic. I'm as good as on the ballot as the party's candidate for the 48th district. That's not bad, huh? It's very good. <laughs> well, aren't you going to congratulate me? All right. Congratulations. You're not very enthusiastic. Is it because you didn't have your hand in it for once? Because I somehow managed to swing it without you? I don't want to disillusion you, Alex, but Mr. Stevens and I had it all settled last week. What? Yes. Furthermore, the one reason they selected you, according to Mr. Stevens, is the fact that you had nothing to do with the Preston machine, and I think you'll agree that was my decision. Am I right? Yes, Sylvia. As usual. Yes, Alex, higher and higher, and she's always there, making every decision, correcting your speech jumping on you like a wildcat when you try to make a move on your own. And the trouble is, she's always right, isn't she? She has a genius for being right. You wonder if there's any escape, if she'll ever be satisfied. Washington, a seat in Congress. Still, she's there, picking away, goading you on. Then, at a smart embassy cocktail party, a girl walks into your life. A girl who represents everything Sylvia has denied you. So you're Alexander Kirby. I've been wondering when I'd meet you. Did you expect to, Miss Rowland? Oh, yes. Dad's talked so much about you, you see. About me? <laughs> you don't know who I am, do you, Mr. Congressman? Well, uh... I'm Senator Rowland's daughter. Oh, I get it now. Of course, Senator Rowland. <laughs> Sounds surprised. Well, I never expected the senator... Well, frankly, I never imagined the senator having such a pretty daughter. <laughs> Of course. Dad has other accomplishments besides bellowing on the Senate floor. <laughs> well, if you're only one of them, he's a very remarkable man. 
very potent champagne, isn't it, Mr. Kirby? I don't think it's the champagne. Maybe the atmosphere? Oh, maybe. <laughs> you have the bluest eyes I've ever seen. You're not going to take inventory of me, are you, Mr. Kirby? Oh, I know I'm clumsy at this sort of thing. It's been a long well, time. I don't think you could be clumsy at anything you do. Ah, uh, now you're laughing at me. No, it's a defense mechanism. I, I always talk this way when... when I'm scared. Scared? Can't you tell? I'm scared to death. Why? For the same reason you are. Vivian. Silly, isn't it? We're both trembling. Vivian, when can I meet? Wait. Somebody's watching us. Hmm? Oh, where? Over there. The woman in that frightful dress. See her? Yes. She's my wife. But listen, you've got to listen to me, Sylvia. I don't think you know what you're saying. I knew it would be a shock to you, but there just isn't any other way. I've got to have a divorce. Why? Because I don't love you. Oh. Furthermore, I never did, and I don't think you've ever loved me. Is that good enough reason? If it's true, it is. Of course, there are other considerations, too. Yes, I know there are, Sylvia. They just don't seem so important to me now. They're important to me. Who is she? Vivian Rowland. The one you were dancing with the other night? That's right. She's quite pretty. What are you leading up to, Sylvia? I'm just approving of your taste in women, dear. She's a lovely girl. Glad we agree on that. It's a shame you'll never be able to marry her. Sylvia, I don't understand you. I swear I don't. I thought you had pride. I have more pride than you will ever have, Alexander. And I don't think I flatter myself by claiming a little more intelligence. What do you think I am, Alexander? Why do you think I spent the best 15 years of my life making a somebody out of a nobody? Why, when I first knew you, you didn't know the difference between a, a champagne glass and a shaving mug. Why do you think I gave up everything I oh, had? Oh, wait a minute, Sylvia. I do know. I know exactly why you did it. You picked me out like you'd pick out a promising colt at a horse auction. That's all I was, a, a hunk of clay you thought you could make a career out of. And I've got to hand it to you. You did it. You rang the bell. You put your dough on a winner. That's me, a front runner, unbeatable at a mile and an eight. Alex. Oh, it's true, isn't it? Oh, you're clever, Sylvia. You're smart. You're as cold and accurate as a piece of machine steel. But you made one bad mistake, my dear. You forgot I'm alive. I think, I feel, I got a heart. Oh, I beg your pardon. I have a heart. That's why Vivian Rowland is more important to me than anything else. And that's why I'm going to marry her. You mean you're going to commit bigamy? I've already told you divorce is out of the question. You've got to be reasonable, Sylvia. I think I'm being fair. I've devoted my life to you. I think I'm entitled to something now that we've arrived. You might as well put divorce out of your mind, Alexander. I'd die before I'd give you up. Is that clear? Yes, I suppose it is. <laughs> Have you told her yet? Uh, no. You said you'd do it last night. I will, Vivian. Tonight, for sure. You do love me, don't you? If I could only tell you, Vivian. Oh, I can't wait to let Daddy in on it. He doesn't suspect anything, does he? Oh, of course not, silly. Nobody knows about us. What do you think he'll say? Oh, he thinks you're smart and ambitious, and I think you're handsome. <laughs> I think we'll agree on you. Of course, he might think I'm a little old for you. You're only 35. Well, still, that's a little older than you are. I want it that way. I'm really not a know-it-all, Alex. I'm a fake. You a fake? Yes. You'll have a lot to teach me, Alex. Teach you? Scare you? No. Just happened to think I... I've never been asked to teach anybody before. You, you will tell her tonight, won't you, sweetheart? I'm getting awfully tired of waiting. All right, Vivian. I'll tell her tonight. <laughs> Well, Alex, what are you going to do? It looks as if the next move is up to you. You know it's useless to argue with Sylvia, don't you? She has you where she wants you. In the center of the ring, like a trained seal, balancing a ball on your nose while she stands over you with a whip. There isn't room for anything else in your mind, is there, Alex? Not even the biggest election in your career. Hello, Jerry. Jerry, this is Alex. Look, tell him I can't speak tonight. 
Well, I'm sorry. Tell him I don't feel well. Tell him anything. I just can't make it, that's all. Oh, okay, so it loses me a million votes. What if I don't care? All right, I'll lose the governorship, too. I'm not talking tonight, and that's final. Alexander, why aren't you down at the auditorium? I'm not speaking tonight, Sylvia. What's the matter? Just wasn't up to it. You know what it means? Yes, I know what it means. How long are you going to keep up this silly brooding? Sylvia, won't you listen to reason? You're not happy the way things are, are you? I don't suppose I am. Well, why won't you... I'm sorry, Alexander. Believe me, I'm sorry. It's a horrible situation. There's no way out for you, and there's no way out for me. You see, I'm just as determined to go to the top with you as you are to get rid of me. Listen, Sylvia... Look at my side, Alexander. Does it seem fair to you to toss me aside after I served your purpose? You're a sort of a work of art, dear. You're something I made with my two hands and my brain. You're like a picture I spent a lifetime painting. When you're gone, there's nothing left for me, don't you see? There'd be no reason for me to go on living. All right, Sylvia. The next week is like a long nightmare, isn't it, Alex? The clamor of the campaign rings in your ears. You find yourself making speeches, the speeches Sylvia wrote for you, by the way. Banners, posters, cheering crowds are all around you. But you hardly notice them. Slowly, insidiously, something is happening to you. Everything except you and Vivian and Sylvia fades into insignificance. There's no way out, she said. As long as she lives, you belong to her. It was a shock when you first found yourself thinking of it, wasn't it, Alex? As long as she lives, you belong to her. You were panicky. You hurriedly cast it out of your mind. But it came back again and again, each time appearing less terrifying and more logical. And then finally... Sylvia. Oh, oh, you startled me. I didn't hear you come in. Come on, get your coat. We're going out. What for? Never mind what for. We're going out. We're going to decide this divorce business once and for all. Now, let's not go into that, Alexander. Okay. How many times must I tell you okay is vulgar? You've told me for the last time, Sylvia. What do you mean? You've corrected me for the last time. I'm going to kill you, Sylvia. Alexander, if, if this is a stupid attempt to frighten There's me... nothing stupid about this revolver. Alexander, you're not... You're not yourself. You can't get away with this. Don't worry. I'm not going to do it here. That's why we're going out can't be serious. It's never more serious in my life. For that Roland girl, And eh? for me, too. For my own salvation. You're throwing it all away, aren't you? Everything we spent 15 years building. Maybe if I'm caught. You will be. You're as stupid at this as you are at everything else. Or you'll never get away with it, Alex. All right, I won't get away with it. So what? I said I'd rather die than give you up, didn't I? Something like that. Maybe... Maybe it is worth dying for. What do you mean? You can't understand it, I guess. I... I don't suppose anyone could understand it. That's the trouble, you see. No one can know how I feel about you. It isn't love, exactly. It's, it's a lifetime of work and worry and sleepless nights. Years of mustering every ounce of strength I have to make you great. That's what you're throwing away, Alexander. And I won't let you do it. I won't. Listen, Alexander. If you're going to kill me, you can do it right, at least. You can let me help you here, too. What are you talking about? I'll write you a note, Alexander. I'll write you a suicide note. Oh, Alex, darling, I feel so sorry for you. It's been such a shocking blow. Yes, I... I know, Vivian. You have everyone's sympathy. No one ever dreamed she would kill herself. It's the last thing in the world I expected. Oh, I thought it was because of us. Oh, no, 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 Vivian. You mustn't think that. After all, there was her note. Yes, that note. Oh, let's think of the future, darling. You've everything in the world coming your way. And now we'll both share it. Always. We can't get married for some time yet, though. Oh, I know that. But after the election... Yes, I, uh, I won't see you much until then. I, I'm going back into the campaign this week. But afterwards... We'll always be together, dear. Forever and ever. Well, Alex, it's 
It's really simple, isn't it? No one suspects you. Everyone's most sympathetic, and Vivian loves you. You go back into the campaign in earnest. No time now for anything but politics. Your own politics this time, your own ambition. You forget all about Sylvia and the ugly, sordid past. Until one night a few months after the murder. Well, what in the world can that be? Hello, Alex. Well, Len. Well, for heaven's sake. I thought you were on the coast. I was. Uh, well, sit down. Thanks. How'd you happen to come east? Business. Been a lot of water under the bridge since I saw you last, Alec. Yeah. Tough about Sylvia. I, uh... I'd like to talk about it, Lynn. Funny thing. You never knew how I felt about Sylvia, did you, Alex? I loved her, you know. Always had until I introduced you two. Then it was all over. I'm sorry, Lynn. Yeah, so am I. I've been reading the newspapers. They gave the story quite a spread. Yeah, I know. Natural, of course, with you a political bigwig and all. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, oh, what business brought you back here, Lynn? Sylvia. What did you think? What do you mean? It's very simple, Alex. I'm going to kill you. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, while the smashing of the atoms is still making headlines, I'd like to tell you how another group of scientists have already put atoms to work for you, not by smashing them, but by putting them together. You see, it was actually by separating the atoms in gasoline molecules and then putting them together in an entirely new way that chemists created that amazing new type of motor fuel, new signal gasoline. That's why new signal is not just pre-war quality gasoline, not just old-style gasoline improved, but an entirely new type of super fuel packed with new power so immediately apparent you can feel it, see it, hear it. To discover what proud performance there's still left in your car, you really owe it to yourself to try new signal gasoline. Stop this week at one of the friendly stations displaying Signal's familiar yellow and black circle sign. And let just one tankful of this great new super fuel prove in your own car why new signal actually is the new post-war gasoline you can prove is superior. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Alex, you try to talk, but all you can do is jabber. And it's no wonder with your old friend Leonard Evans calmly sitting on the Davenport toying with a thirty-eight automatic. Oh, wait. Yes, Alex. Uh, uh, wait. It's enough to make anyone wait. jabber, isn't don't, it? Don't be a fool, then. Put that gun down. I will later. May put it in your hand, in fact, just as you did with Sylvia. Why did you kill her, Alex? What? Why did you kill her? She killed herself. It was suicide. Everybody said so. The coroner, the police surgeon, the, the papers. You're not giving a statement to the papers now, Alex. You're talking to someone who knows you. Why did you kill her, Alex? It can't mean what you're saying. It doesn't make sense. You got tired of being pushed, didn't you? Thought you could get along without her. I don't know, Alex. Maybe I'm jealous. It couldn't have happened to me, you see, no matter how hard she pushed... We never could have reached the top of the ladder. And she wanted the top so badly. Well, that's beside the point, I guess. Why did you kill her, Alex? Why did you write that suicide note for her? I didn't write it. And you forced her to write it for you before you killed her. Listen, Len. I got a copy of it right here. I took it out of the paper. Let's see. Here it is. I don't mean to infer you have been unkind to me. Does that sound like Sylvie, Alex? What's wrong with it? She never would have used infer, Alex. Imply is the right word, remember? She used to call you on it all the time. Uh, Let's get this over with. Hello, Joe. Oh, hello, Mr. Evans. A scotch and soda double. Right away, sir. Uh, that was tough about Governor Kirby killing himself. I just heard the news. Yeah. He's a friend of yours, wasn't he? Yeah. Yes, it sure was tough, wasn't it? Yeah. Here, Joe, buy yourself a drink. 
Gosh, Mr. Evans. Twenty bucks. Yeah, I won't be needing it. Taking a little trip, Joe. Down to police headquarters. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale, the curious story, Call It Coincidence. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Leslie Edgeley, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking, and suggesting that you try... New signal. The new gasoline you can prove is superior. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal. Signal gasoline. Yes, signal gasoline is the new gasoline you can prove is superior. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Harvest of Death. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. It wasn't a large farm, but it wasn't small either. It kept two strong men busy from sunup to sundown taking care of it. And they did a nice job because the farm prospered. Mort Grant owned the farm and lived in an awkward-looking unpainted farmhouse with his wife, Nellie. Jim Hayward was the higher man and lived in a spare bedroom. But actually, he'd been there so long that he was more like one of the family than a hired hand. And that's what worried Mort Sanders. <gasps> Mort! Scared me half to death popping in the kitchen door like that. Did I? You certainly did. You know, I'm nervous enough without you acting like a cat chasing a mouse. I've gone and broke one of my best dishes. Hello, Jim. Hello, Mort. Kind of ambitious, aren't you? Well, I surely wish that you were a little more ambitious around the house. I could use a little help now and then. A woman's work is left to the women. Men have enough to do with their own work. That right, Jim? Well, I guess it is, Mort, but Nellie looked a little tired, and I thought it wouldn't hurt anything if I stepped out in the kitchen and helped her a mite with the dishes. You should rest quiet a while after eating supper. I'd like to see the day when I get any rest after supper. I'm not really tired, Mort. I don't mind helping out a little extra bit. Well, if you don't mind, you can be as foolish as you want, I guess. Nobody's being foolish. I think it's downright generous of Jim to want to help. We ought to help each other more around here instead of living like three hermits. I don't see you out plowing. Come on, Jim. Leave the old lady to her work. Uh, if you don't mind, Mort, I'd just soon finish what I started. No, I don't mind, Jim. Not at all. Suit yourself. Suit yourself. Well, as I was saying, Mr. Hawley, the postman, calls Jim, and Jim comes striding down from the chicken coop. And Mr. Hawley tells him the good news. He'd think he'd had the baby instead of his wife. Well, then, he gives Jim a cigar, and you know what Jim says? I couldn't guess. 
Well, he says, seeing as how you're the mailman, I suppose your baby comes special delivery. <laughs> Can you tie that? Well, don't you get it? Special delivery. Oh, that Jim. Doesn't sound very funny to me. Huh. If you'd said it first, you would have thought it was funny. Maybe so. But if I said it, you wouldn't have thought it was so funny. Mort Sanders, if I hadn't been married to you all these years, I'd think you was jealous. I'm not jealous. But you do seem to enjoy Jim's company to mine. I'm only your husband. All I hear from you is Jim did this, or Jim said that, or Jim says and does the funniest things. Why don't you pay attention to me once in a while? Oh, Mort. I'm running this farm, and I'm tired of hearing what Jim does. So will you do me a favor and talk about something else? You shouldn't get so angry, Mort, because anger leads to all kinds of human excesses. You might even do something you'd be sorry for later. And regret isn't worth the time you take to indulge in it because it's always too late. Of course, if you try to get along with Nellie a little better, you wouldn't have to worry about Jim. But you can't see that, can you, Mort? So at supper time, you're the same old Mort, suspicious and foolish. Supper ready? Not for a few minutes yet. Jim won't be in for a while. He's working on the tractor. Well, if he can't make supper on time, that's his tough luck. Well, just the same, it isn't ready, so you'll have to wait. Well, don't you notice anything different? No. Well, look around. I still don't see anything. What's it all about? Well, if it had teeth, it'd bite you. Over there in the corner. Hmm, bookcase. <laughs> Where'd you pick up that thing? kind of small, and it doesn't have any books in it yet. But it is pretty, isn't it? I don't know. Where'd you get it? Nice red color. I ask you where you got it. Well, for goodness sake, stop shouting. I can hear you. Jim made it. Hmm. What'd he do that for? Well, how do I know what he did it for? I guess maybe he heard me say once that I wished I had a bookcase and thought it'd be a nice thing for him to make one for me. Oh, he did, did he? How much further is he going to go with this sort of thing? Yikes as if he was your husband instead of me. Well, Lord knows you never buy anything for me. Pinching every penny. What I do with my money is my business. Oh, now, Mort, don't get your blood up. Well, why shouldn't I get my blood up? You seem to be interested in Jim more than anything else around here, even me. Every time I turn around, you're chatting with him over in a corner, or he's helping you with the dishes, or you're taking a fancy ride together into town. And if that ain't enough, every time you open your mouth, Jim pops out. Now, Mort. Don't now, Mort, me. I've had enough of it. Now that bookcase. Well, it's only a little gift, and it is pretty. Well, it won't be pretty when I get through with it. Mort, what are you going to do? Just watch me. You don't even own a book to put in this. I don't like useless furniture cluttering up my house. Oh, Mort, for heaven's sake, stop it. Are you going crazy? No, I'm just getting some sense. If you so much as lay a finger on that bookcase, I'll never speak to you as long as I live. Well, stop talking then, because here it goes. <gasps> Mort, no! There. Right, take a look at your fine gift from Jim now. I hate you. You'll get over it. When Jim finds out if he's half the man I think he is, he'll beat you to a pulp. Where is he? I told you he was working on the tractor. For your information, fine lady, I'm going out and fire him. I don't want any wife stealer working for me. Hello, Mort. Supper almost ready? Almost. I won't be able to finish this tractor tonight, I'm afraid. Turned out to be more work than I thought. The wrist pins... Never need... mind. Give me the wrench, Jim. Oh, you want to take a hand at it? No, but you won't be needing this wrench anymore. What do you mean? Hand it over. All right, Mort. Anything you say. Here it is. Thanks. Now, what's it all about? You look like you've got something serious in your mind. I just come out to tell you I won't be needing your services around here anymore. Huh? You can leave as soon as you get your things together. I'll pay it at the end of the week. Oh, you can't mean that you're firing me, Mort. That's exactly what I mean. But I don't get it. I've always worked hard. Why, I, I always thought of this place as sort of like home. That's yeah, a trouble, Jim. You've been acting as if you owned the farm instead of me. Well, now, look, Mort. If I said anything to make you mad, I, I'm sorry. I don't mind you taking a big interest in the farm. But when you start moving in on my wife... That's where I draw the line. Your wife? Yeah. What? Well, I haven't done anything to your wife. 
Why, Nellie and I, well, we get along. That's but... the trouble. You get along too well. Every time I look around, you're with her, telling her stories or taking her someplace or making something for her. And I don't like it. I don't want to be see any more of it. So get your clothes together and get out. Now, look, Mort, you're talking kind of rough. I'll talk any way I want to. It's my land, my farm, and my wife we're discussing. I'm sick and tired of having a dishonest, wife-stealing, backstabbing farmhand around here. So get out before I throw you out. Those are big words. You want some bigger ones? If you think you're big enough to say them. As a matter of fact, there's a few things I can say myself. I never worked for such a miserly, selfish old coot like you before. Won't even trust a bank with your money. That's enough out of you, Jim. There's one more thing I always wanted to give you before I left. A punch in the nose. Stay away from me, Jim. Put him up, Mort. I'll give you a chance to back up them big words of yours. All right. You ask for it. Mort, put down that wrench. Try and make it. I'll be taking it away from you. There. You got the wrench, all right. Jim. Jim, you'll be okay in a minute. Jim, wake up. He's dead. If we of the Whistler cast sound a bit on the excited side tonight, there's a good reason. This is the 100th consecutive performance of Signal Oil Company's program, The Whistler. Because of your enthusiastic letters, Signal Oil Company has continued The Whistler without interruption even through the summer when so many programs go off the air. And month after month, the Whistler's popularity has grown until for the past eight months, it has ranked tops in popularity among all West Coast programs. We of the cast want to thank you for your loyalty, which has made this record possible. It's our richest incentive to keep every performance a top performance, so you'll continue to tune in on the Signal Oil program each Monday night for more broadcasts of The Whistler. And incidentally, next time you're out driving, we of the cast also hope you'll stop at one of the friendly service stations displaying Signal's familiar yellow and black circle sign. And try that other great Signal success, the new Signal gasoline. There's no better way to tune in top performance for your car than with today's power-packed new super fuel, new Signal gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. seems you've reaped a bigger harvest than you ever imagined from the little hatred you sowed. But it's not a crop to be proud of because it's a harvest of death. After you killed Jim Hayward, you didn't know what to do with his body. You had to think. But thinking takes time. So after finding a temporary hiding place in the barn, deep in the soft, fragrant haymow, you turn back to the house for supper. Supper ready? It's all ready. Sit down. Coffee or milk? Coffee. Mm, sit still. I'll get it. Here. <laughs> well, what's the matter? Oh, you, you startled me, I guess. Where's the sugar? Where's the sugar? Well, land's sake, it's right in front of you. What's the matter? Can't you see? Uh, I didn't notice it. Well, isn't Jim coming in? Hmm? I said, isn't Jim coming in? Not right away. Well, he can't work much longer. It'll be dark in a few minutes. Potatoes will be cold if he doesn't come in soon. Uh, I knew you wouldn't fire him. You couldn't fire Jim, not after he's been with us all Cut it, will you? All right, Mort. I uh, took care of the bookcase. I finished breaking it up, and I put it in the stove. When Jim comes in, I'll say... Jim, I'll say, I got some bad news for you. But I expect you can take it. Seems I fell up against the bookcase. It uh, wasn't very big anyhow, you know, and I broke it. Mort, you're not eating a thing. Huh? Oh, I was listening to you. Well, it's about the first time you ever were. Well, Jim should be in here by now. I think maybe I'll look out the window and wave to him to come in and eat his supper. Mort. What? 
It's getting dark, and I can just barely see the tractor, but I can't see hiding her hair, a Jim. Can't see anything moving out there. Sit down and eat your supper. Jim's old enough to take care of himself. Well, I suppose he's putting the tools away. Jim's always the careful one. Mort, you're still not eating. I'm not very hungry. I bet Jim's got a big appetite tonight. Will you stop talking about Jim? Well, for heaven's sake, Mort, what's got into you? You don't have to shout like that. You're scared to live in daylight, Tony. I asked you before to stop talking about Jim. I was just trying to be sociable. If you were sitting there like a mummy, a body could go crazy for something to do. Well, if you want to know, Jim won't be having supper tonight. So you can stop waiting for him. Why won't he have supper tonight? Because I did what I said I was going to do. You mean that you fired him? Yes, I fired him. Well, of all the Nelly, selfish... I don't want to hear one word out of you about it. It's done, that's all, and there's nothing you can do to change it. All right, Mort, if Jim's fired, he's fired, but I don't... Shut think... up. Well, at least he can have one more meal before he goes. Candy? Jim's gone. Gone already? Yes, he's gone already. How many times do I have to say it? Well, it seems funny he didn't say goodbye to me. He didn't even come after his clothes and things. Oh, he can't be gone yet. I told you he was gone. Gone for good. He won't be back. Did he ask you to send his clothes to him? No. Well, didn't he tell you where he was going? Look, he just left. He didn't tell me anything. Was he angry? A man who gets fired isn't exactly happy. Well, aren't you going to give him a character reference or something so that he can get a job someplace else? Where he's going, a reference for me isn't worth a thing. Oh, then you do know where he's going. You said before that you didn't. I don't know. All he said was that he thought he might go north, and maybe to Canada. That's all he said. Well, it's funny he left late in the day like this. You'd think he'd wait until morning and get a fresh start. Can a man do what he wants with his own life without you analyzing the whole thing? I thought I knew Jim. I thought I could tell just what he'd do. Well, you couldn't, so forget it. Well, it seems to me the whole thing's all very funny. It's all very funny. Well, it's 11 o'clock, Mort. Two hours past your bedtime. Mort. Hmm? What? Well, don't you feel well, Mort? That old kidney trouble isn't starting up on you again, is it? Because if it is, we still have some of the medicine left, the stuff that Dr. Kermit prescribed. I told you I'm not sick. So stop trying to give me medicine. All right, I was just trying to be helpful, that's all. After all, I am your wife. Sometimes I wonder. Well, that's a nice thing to say. Oh, forget it. I know what's bothering you, Mort. You do? Yes. You fired Jim over a petty little argument, and now you're sorry. Am I? But don't you worry. If I know Jim, he'll be back bright and early in the morning, just as if nothing had happened, and you'll both be plowing up land together just as happy as you please. Got it all figured out, haven't you? Oh, sure. Jim couldn't stay away any more than you could have him stay away. He's just like one of the family. He probably just went into town, had a few drinks to help him forget things for a while... But he'll be back as happy and friendly as ever you wait and see. How many times do I have to tell you Jim won't be back? He's gone for good. Oh, not Jim. I tell you, he's not coming back. I wish you'd stop talking about it. All right, Mort. All I can say is wait and see for yourself. Why don't you go to bed? Oh, not until you do. I'm not going to let you sit here all alone making yourself unhappy over a little mistake. My good heavens, everyone makes a little mistake now and then. It's nothing to fret over. You know, just the same, I miss Jim already myself. Oh, it used to be comforting to watch him sit in the rocking chair, rocking back and forth, just as comfortable as you please, smoking away on his pipe. Nellie, Nellie, look, the rocking chair. It's rocking back and forth. Just as if Jim were sitting there. Uh, how could it? How could it rock by itself? Well, don't get all excited, Mark. Can't you see? It's only the cat. Huh. Here. I'll chase it away if it bothers you. Yeah, yeah. There. Oh, the chair won't rock anymore. Uh, never liked that darn cat anyway. Now, don't go blaming anything on the poor little cat. She probably misses Jim, too. I don't miss Jim. Not one bit. What makes you think I do? Well, you're sitting there like you'd lost your last friend. What's that? Somebody's coming up the stairs. Somebody's at the front door. Oh, sit still. I'll look. Maybe it's Jim. 
Oh, it's only the screen door banging. There. Heavens, you're a nervous man tonight. It was only the screen door banging. I guess you forgot to hook it. Anyway, I fixed it. I'm going to bed. Well, at last. Now, maybe you can relax a little bit. You're so jumpy, you act as if you'd killed somebody. Nellie comes awfully close to the truth sometimes, doesn't she, Moyd? Uncomfortably close. But never mind, she doesn't really know what happened to Jim Hayward. So you go upstairs to try to sleep and forget the whole affair, if you can. Perhaps you'll even think of something to cover up your tracks forever. (gasps) Oh, oh, it's you, Mort. Oh, you give me a start. I just opened my eyes and thought I saw somebody standing over me. What are you sitting up in bed at this hour of the morning for? I can't sleep. Oh, just lay back on the pillow and relax. You'll go to sleep. I can't. I tried. It's too hot or something. <sighs> want me to get up and get you some coffee or something? No, I don't want anything. Oh, let me put the light on. Well, no wonder you're so hot. You're fully dressed. When did you do that? I got up and dressed about an hour ago. I think I was cold. What in the world's got into you, Mort? First, you're as jumpy as a thoroughbred. Then you can't sleep. Then you turn cold, and now you're too hot. Are you sure you're not sick? I told you there's nothing wrong with me. Well, you surely must be hot. The sweat's pouring right off you. Now, there's no need to get so worried about Jim that you make a nervous wreck of yourself. He'll be back, I tell you. If you mention Jim once more to me, I'll strangle you to death. All right, Mort. I I didn't mean to get you mad, but you're beginning to worry me now. Go back to sleep. Where are you going? Mind your own business. What are you lighting that lantern for? If you got to be so nosy, I... I'm going out to the barn. At this hour? Are you out of your mind? Look, you just go back to sleep and keep your nose out of my business. I won't mind my own business. Mort Sanders, tell me where you're going. All right. I'm going out to the barn. I'm worried about something. One of the horses. What's the matter with it? I don't know, but she's been kind of sick today. I want to take a look at her. You're up to something, Mort, and it isn't a horse. What is it? Wouldn't you like to know? I took you long enough. So you're up. Well, I couldn't lie up there in bed while you're gallivanting around the farm at three o'clock in the morning. Get back to bed. I put some coffee on. We might as well have a cup now that we're up. I don't want any coffee. Where's the lantern? Do you always have to ask him any questions? I haven't got it with me, have I? I left it in the barn. Mort, look out the window. That barn. The barn is on fire. <laughs> Pretty, in it? Well, do something. Don't just stand there as if you were enjoying it. The horses in me burned alive. There are no horses in the barn. They're all out in the pasture. Mort Sanders, you're a murderer. Shut up. I won't shut up. Don't try to pull the wool over my eyes. I'm not so innocent as I look. I know why you couldn't eat and couldn't sleep. I know why you were cold one minute and then hot the next. You didn't know I knew, did you? I told you to shut up. I was looking out the window when you fired Jim. I saw you hit him with a wrench. Jim's dead and you killed him. If you ever say that again, I'll kill you. You don't frighten me. You hid Jim's body in the barn and now you're burning it to get rid of him. You're as much to blame as I am. Jim had no right to be fooling around with my wife and you had no right to let him. At least he was human. And a grouchy old man who wouldn't talk half the time. Go on up to bed. I won't. Do you want to know something? I was in love with Jim, and he was in love with me. We were going to run away together. And here's something else. I don't want to hear it. You want to hear this. Yesterday, I took all the stocks and bonds that you'd bought with the money that you've saved in 15 years, the whole $20,000 worth, that you were too afraid to leave in a bank, and I gave them to Jim. Are you telling me the truth? If you're lying, I'll kill you. I'm not lying. Jim had the oilskin pouch with the bonds in his inside pocket when you murdered him, and now they're burning up. I don't believe you. If you don't believe me, look in the steel box on the desk. You did. You did, you thief. You gave him all my bonds. I told you I did. <laughs> Won't do you any good slapping me. They're burning up right now. I'll get them. There's still time, and then I'll get you. I'll get him. I'll get him. Don't worry. Hurry, Mort! Hurry! You've got to bring it up! 
barn. The barn will only last long enough. I'll get him. There's, there's so much smoke and fire. I can't see. He shouldn't have poured that gasoline around. It's a roof. Hold it, hold it. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, because the gasoline you use has so much to do with the performance you get from your car, I think you'd be interested in knowing how a new scientific development has put amazingly increased power into that great new super fuel, new signal gasoline. You see, science has long known that the way the atoms in gasoline molecules are arranged determines how much power you get from the gasoline. Well, in old-style gasolines, the atoms were left just as nature arranged them. But recently, certain chemists found how to rearrange the atoms in gasoline molecules in an entirely new way. The result is new signal gasoline with amazing new power. Power so immediately apparent you can feel it, see it, hear it. It's because of this superior performance you can actually recognize the moment you step on the accelerator that we urge you to let one tank full of new signal gasoline talk for itself. Let its quicker starting, faster pickup, higher anti-knock, and longer mileage demonstrate in your own car why new signal gasoline actually is the new post-war gasoline you can prove is superior. And now, back to the Whistler. So for once you listened to your wife, Mort. For once you took her advice and hurried into the burning barn. And to death. Of course, the flames lighted the night sky and brought a crowd of neighbors, but there wasn't much they could do. They stand outside the house watching the last glowing embers talking in hushed tones. But you can't hear them, can you, Mort? It's awful. Awful. Both of them at once this way. Constable fears Mort must have gone in to try to save Jim. Jim was almost like one in the family, you know. Yes. Uh, What about Nellie? Is she all right? She's just uh, sitting in there in the rocking chair by the window. Stunned, I guess. Oh, poor soul. I'd best go in and see if I can comfort her. Nellie. Oh, Miss Thompson. I've come to see if there's anything I can do, dear. No. It's all done now. Now try to be brave, dear. I know it's a shock. But we've got to be practical. The men folks will build you a new barn, and we'll all see that you're took care of. I'll manage somehow. Why, of course you will. Is there something I could get you? Some hot tea, maybe? No, thank you, Miss Thompson. I'd... I'd just like to sit here a while. Well, of course, I understand. We're all so sorry about Mort and Jim, too. But everything will be all right. You just keep telling yourself that. Everything will be all right. Yes, Mort. They're all so sorry about you and Jim, too. And Nellie, poor Nellie, just sits there sniffling and rocking through the night in Jim's favorite rocking chair through the night until dawn. Then, when the last neighbor is gone, she stands up, stares out the window for a moment toward the blackened ashes, walks to the pantry shelf, takes down the coffee can, and lifts the lid. Now, what do you think, Mort? Inside, wrapped in an old piece of oilskin, are $20,000 in stocks and bonds. And here's a surprise for you, Nellie. Those securities were not worth the paper they're written on. Mort wasn't a very smart investor.
Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories. And by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by John Hayes, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you try new signal. The new gasoline you can prove is superior. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the signal oil program, The Whistler. Remember, let every traffic signal remind you. With Signal, new Signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for Signal's big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, The Seeing Eye. There was only one love in the life of Captain Martin Quiss. It wasn't money. He'd long since made more than enough to retire comfortably. And it wasn't women or liquor or self-indulgence. Captain Quiss was part of the sea. It had been his home in his life since the day in 1907 when he signed aboard a purse seiner out of New Bedford as an apprentice seaman. But a love as strong as that of Captain Quiss for the sea can be dangerous. It can blind a man to more important things like human decency and justice. It can lead to compromise and ruin. The closing chapter in the career of Martin Quist began on a stormy night off the Florida Keys, aboard the steamer Carson City out of New Orleans, bound for Portland, Maine. The night wind, pushing up strong from the east, had reached gale strength when the cabin door burst open. Grant. What are we running here, a ship or a nursery? Now, wait a minute. You wait a minute. Well, address me properly or not at all. All right, Captain Quist, sir. That's better. Now, what's the matter, Mr. Grant? The first mate's drunk again. He just ordered me off the bridge. That's a serious charge, Mr. Grant. I'm not making charges, Captain. This isn't a pink tea at the Mariners Club. We're in dangerous waters. Ryder is perfectly capable. I tell you, he's drunk. He has no right to be on that bridge. If you don't believe me, call him. Very well, Mr. Grant. Bridge. Ryder. First mate Ryder in the bridge. Lights are bright all as well. Uh, Ryder, Grant has a watch until eight bells. It's all right, Chris. Got everything under control. Tell Grant to turn in. Listen, Ryder. Never mind, Chris. Don't worry, little head. I'm in charge here. Yep. <laughs> I'm in charge. <laughs> what did he say? Mr. Ryder's in charge. He's perfectly capable of standing the watch if he chooses. Now, wait a minute. Let's skip the double talk. It's my watch. My name's on the log. It's my responsibility to see that this ship stays on its course for the next three hours. You'd better go to your quarters, Mr. Grant. Captain Quist, don't you care what happens to your ship? Mr. Ryder's been sailing for 15 years. Yeah, and every time he gets a few drinks under his belt, he thinks he's Columbus. This isn't the first time, Captain. He's done it before. 
I can't understand why you let him get by with it. You're here to take orders, Grant. Not to tell me how to run my ship. Now get down to your cabin. He's got something on you, hasn't he? Huh? What do you mean? Nothing. There just ought to be a reason why you let Ryder get by with murder. Why he has complete command of the ship three days running while you sit in your cabin. Get out of here, Grant. There's something wrong, isn't there, Captain? Get out of here before I throw you an iron. All right, Captain Quiss. I'm just trying to do my duty as an officer. If you want to trust your ship to a rum pot, go ahead. Yes, Captain Quiss, there is something wrong, isn't there? Ryder has plenty on you, hasn't he? Enough to make you overlook the fact that the first duty of a master is to the safety of his ship. Enough to make you afraid to face Ryder and force the issue. It worries you, doesn't it? Instead of turning in, you sit at your desk in the cabin, thinking, wishing there were a way out. Then at six bells, an hour before midnight, you hear a strange and terrifying sound. The roar of the surf to the starboard. It's close, Captain, too close. Good Lord, Roger. Do you know what you're doing? Ah, go away, Chris. I'm busy. Give me that wheel. I'm sure of this. You'll ship. pile us up. You'll pile us up on the rocks. Watch your helm, man. Get out of here. Watch your helm. helm. Well, Chris, Grant was right, wasn't he? The Carson City did pile on the rocks, a total loss. Two sailors dead, a valuable cargo gone. But there is an out, isn't there? Ryder's name doesn't appear on the log. Nobody knows he was at the wheel but you. And Charles Grant, second mate. And Ryder must be cleared if you're to continue your career. You don't care what happens, do you, Quiz? Nothing matters now except getting Ryder off. Your life on the sea is at stake. So you play ball because of the strange hold Ryder has on you. You testify that Grant was on the bridge at the critical moment. That in your opinion, he's guilty of gross negligence. And the court agrees with you. Second mate, Grant. Will you rise and face the court? It is the finding of this court that on the night of May 11th, you as the officer in charge were guilty of criminal negligence, resulting in the wreck of the ship Carson City, with the loss of two lives and an entire cargo. You are therefore sentenced to a year and a day in the federal penitentiary, with cancellation of your credentials as an officer in the United States Merchant Marine. Do you have anything to say? No, Your Honor. Nothing. To the court. This court is declared adjourned. <laughs> Congratulations, Captain. I'm sorry, Mr. Grant. I was right, wasn't I? Ryder does have something on you. I said I'm sorry, Mr. Grant. Perjury doesn't come easy. There's got to be a reason. I'm sorry, too, Captain Quiss. I'm sorry for you. Because if it takes me a lifetime, I'm going to hang this wrap around your neck and watch you sink. Signal. New Signal Gasoline. With the prologue of tonight's story, The Seeing Eye, the Signal Oil Company brings you another of the strange tales by The Whistler. Have you seen the new 1946 cars now being displayed? They're nice, aren't they? But if you've also inquired about delivery dates, you know you're likely to be driving your present car a good while longer. No need to wait any longer, however, for the fun of improved driving performance. No, sir. For with new signal gasoline in your tank, you actually feel your present car get young again right now. And that's because new signal isn't just pre-war quality gasoline, not just old-style gasoline improved, but an entirely new type super fuel. There's a long scientific explanation about how chemists actually rearrange the atoms in gasoline molecules to put quicker starting, faster pickup, higher anti-knock, and longer mileage into new signal gasoline. 
But for the easy way to prove these advantages, just drive into one of the friendly stations displaying Signal's familiar yellow and black circle sign. Get a tank full of new Signal gasoline. As you step on the accelerator, your own motor will show you why new Signal gasoline actually is. The post-war gasoline you can prove is superior. And now, back to the Whistler. Yes, Captain Quist, the end of your career on the sea began the night that the Carson City piled up and sank on a reef off the Florida coast and sent Charles Grant, your innocent second mate, to prison for criminal negligence. There was no other way, you told yourself. Ryder must be cleared at all costs. And as he said, you're indispensable to each other. During the years that follow, you make one ironclad request before each sailing. Ryder must go as first mate. Yes, Quist, the partnership works well during those four years. Until one day when your current vessel, the Patricia K., pulls at her moorings in the port of Cape Town, South Africa, anxious to be off on the return trip to New Orleans with her cargo of hemp, leather, and drugs. You're waiting on the bridge for a new officer to arrive. Second mate Charles Grant reporting for duty, sir. Grant? Surprised, Captain? What are you doing here? I'm shipping aboard a second mate. Any objections? Oh, yeah. See here, Grant. What's the matter, Captain? Nervous? Hey. I'm sorry, Grant. You won't do. I'll call the agent. Good. Tell He'll tell you I'm aboard the Patricia K on orders from the home office. You better have a good reason, Captain. Your record shows... I'm not shows... worried about my record, Captain, and the home office isn't either. I'm surprised you're willing to bring up the matter of records, Captain. See here, Mr. Grant. Sorry, Captain. All I have to say, Mr. Grant, is that you'd better be sure you handle your duties well. The past is gone. I'd rather not discuss it. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, I'm glad they've given you a new chance. You'll find I haven't changed. But you have, Captain. How's that? I never saw you wearing dark glasses before. Perhaps that's why you didn't recognize me when I walked up just now. Uh... Oh, yes, yes, of course. I. You'd better go to your cabin, Mr. Grant. Stow your gear. All right, sir. Ryder! Ryder, open up! Yeah, what's the matter? I. I don't know. Wait a minute now. Take it easy. Look out! Look out there! Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. You're I... sorry. It was a fifth of my best bourbon, you stupid stumble bum. Why don't you hang on a side? I didn't see it. Of course he... you didn't see it. One more like that, and I'm going to hand you a white cane. Where's your sense? I told you to stay on the bridge till I came up. What do the men think when they see you stumbling around on deck? Listen, right I'm got... through listening. You're falling to pieces, Quiz. I'm tired of playing seeing eye for you every time you have one of these spells. If I had the brains I was born with, I'd make you retire. I'd kill you first. You know, I think you would. Come on. We'd better cast off. Got a half hour to clear the port. The new second mate aboard? Yes. Who is he? That's why I came here. He's not a new second mate, Ryder. Oh, who is he? Grant. Grant? What are you talking about? You heard what I said? He's been in stir. He hasn't got a license. He's here on orders from the home office. Nothing I can do. What do you mean there's nothing you can do? That guy can't sail. That's all there is to it. I called the agent. Call the agent. the agent. Good Lord, why didn't you have him shanghaied? I tell you, that guy's not going to sail. I'm going up there. I'm now, wait a minute, Ryder. Shut up. I'm going up Ryder. there. Ryder! I'm still in command of the ship. And I want you to remember that. If there were anything I could do, I'd do it. But unfortunately, there isn't. Grant's on board for the voyage, and we've got to make the best of it. All right. I'll make the best of it. And I'll make the best of it when we get to New Orleans, too. Oh? Whether you like it or not, Quiz, this is your last voyage. I'm through hanging on to a guy who's fallen to pieces. What does that mean? 
Grant isn't dumb. And he isn't here for the trip. If you had the brains you were born with, you'd have seen it and brushed him off. It wasn't possible. I don't care whether it was possible or not. It had to be done. And if we're lucky enough to keep him guessing this trip, you're going to decide to retire when we get to New Orleans. And if I don't? The home office is going to be surprised to discover that one of their top skippers has a habit of going blind every six weeks. Wait, you... And don't try to scare me with that negligence charge. You'd go up just as fast as I would, and for just as long. Who are you? And one other thing. You're going to recommend your bright young first mate to succeed you. How does that sound to you, Quiz? Captain Ted Ryder. It's hard to take, isn't it, Quiz? The idea of giving up your ship, of leaving the sea forever, hardly seems real to you. In your bunk that night, after the Patricia K has put out into the South Atlantic, you try and think back over the past four years. You remember the two men who died on the Carson City, two men whose lives ought to be on your conscience, two men who'd be sailing today if you cared about anything but Martin Quist, ship's master. Perjury, bribery, the conviction of an innocent man... Nothing mattered, did it? Finally, you sleep. Although the pain in your eyes tells you another attack is coming on in earnest. All you can make out the next morning as you walk down the deck to the bridge is the hazy line of the horizon and the dull blur of the ship plodding forward against a head-on swell. You arrive to find Grant there, alone. Morning, Grant. Hello. <coughs> oh, I... What happened? Nothing. I... Just bumped into the chart table. Why don't you take those dark glasses off? Why don't you stop asking me questions, Mr. Grant? That's one way of finding out things, that's all. Happens to be the wrong way at the moment. Hand me my log. What? Don't what me, Mr. Grant. Hand me my log. Why, Captain, it's right in front of you on the table. Huh? Yeah. Yes, I... I didn't notice it. Don't you feel well? I feel quite well, thank you. I'm glad to hear it, sir. Uh, what do you suppose that schooner is doing on our starboard bow? Never saw a ship that small in the South Atlantic. Huh? Where? Over there. See her? Huh. Oh, yes. How do you make her out? Uh, coastwise African trader, probably. We're only a day out. Can't be more than 100 feet. Or would you say she was larger? I'm not interested in whether she's 100 feet or 1,000 feet long, Mr. Grant. Turn to your wheel. Yeah. Who are you trying to kid, Captain? What do you mean? You wear dark glasses day and night. You bump into the table. You can't see the log. Who said I can't see the log? You might as well know, Mr. Grant, that if I choose to wear pink glasses and a green jacket, I'll do so. It so happens it's none of your business. On the open sea, the captain's eyes are everybody's business. It has nothing to do with my eyes. It was an accident? Of course. That... That ship out there, is that an accident, too? What are you getting at? I can see that ship perfectly well. I apologize, Captain. I was wrong about your eyes. You have excellent vision. Thank you. It takes a good man to see over the horizon. What do you mean? That's where she must be. There isn't any ship out there. Tell me, Captain, what made you think you'd get away with it? A ship's captain without eyes. But you t- I you told that you that... I felt sorry for you once. I still do. That's where the partnership comes in, isn't it? Your brains and riders' eyes. Now listen, Grant. You'd do anything to keep that lousy master's license, wouldn't you? You'd stab your best friend in the back, buy and sell witnesses, perjure yourself. Yeah, you'd even kill me if you thought you'd get away with it. Why, Quiz? Why didn't you have sense enough to throw in the towel before it got too big for you? You wouldn't understand. You bet I don't understand. And the families of those two men in the Carson City don't understand either. You're a murderer, Quiss. I suppose you know that. Will you stop it, Grant? Stop it! That's exactly what I'm going to do. When we get to New Orleans, I'm going to stop it. For good this time. You can buy all the witnesses in the world, Quiss, but it won't do you any good. This time it's going to stick. Yes, 
Ryder was right, wasn't he, Captain Quiz? You should have done anything to keep Grant off the ship. But it's too late now. He knows your secret. Each day brings the Patricia K closer to New Orleans in the end. You decide to play for time, order the course of the ship change, sending it north to Cape Verde, four days out of its way, hoping your eyes will improve. That by the time you arrive in New Orleans, your vision will be sharp and clear and defensible. But it continues to get worse until finally ten days out of New Orleans, you can't see at all. And then one night out of a clear sky, something happens. The opportunity you've been waiting for. As the ship approaches the Florida Keys, not far from where the Carson City foundered, you hear a scuffle outside your cabin. All right, now get away from there. What's going on here? Kelly, come here. Try and pull it again, will you? Kelly! Okay, I'll let you. There. Now. All right, get up, Ryder. Mr. Grant. This is none of your business, Quiz. Get up, Ryder, or I'll pull you up. Now, wait a minute, Grant. Kelly, grab me. Let go of me, Kelly. Get him, Get him. Barnes! Yeah! Take care of Ryder here. Kill him, that's what I'll do. Kill him. Ryder, shut up. He's okay, mate. Now, take it easy. Don't get you for this crowd. That's Ryder. enough, Ryder. Shall I put them in irons, Captain? No, Kelly. But, Captain... It won't be necessary, Mr. Kelly. Take them to their cabins. That gave you an idea, didn't it, Quiz? There's a way out after all. You feel your way back into your cabin and think. Ryder was up to his old tricks again, drunk, trying to take the wheel away from Grant. It was timed perfectly, wasn't it, Captain? Two competent witnesses present, two reliable supporters, both of whom heard Ryder swear he was going to kill Grant. The men are puzzled as to why you didn't throw them in irons. But there's a good reason. They have to be free to come and go as they please during the next night free to jump through the hoops you're preparing for them. You go to your cabin after dinner the next night and sit at your table thinking it through. Then at seven o'clock, you call Grant. Did you want to see me, Captain? Did we... Oh. Oh, it's you. Yes. I've been standing here for some time. Uh, Grant, I've been doing a lot of thinking lately. Perhaps you wondered why I didn't exercise my authority when you and Ryder had that scuffle last night. I didn't expect Ryder to get it, if that's what you mean. As a matter of fact, I've... Well, I've come to the conclusion you're right. What do you want? When's your trick at the wheel tonight? I'm on at eight bells, replacing Ryder. I see. I've decided to clear you, Mr. Grant. I'm going to put it in writing. It's apparent I'm not much good on the sea anymore, and at least I can try to right the wrong I've done. What? I know it's hard to believe. But I'm going to ask you to keep it to yourself until we arrive. Ryder mustn't know about it. But, but how can you? I you... can manage a typewriter quite nicely, thank you. I'm not asking for any thanks. I don't deserve anything. I'll go that far, will you? Report here just before you go and watch. Eight bull shop. Is that clear? You're a little unpredictable, Quiss. I didn't ask for your opinion. I ask whether or not it was clear. Very well, Captain. I'll be back at eight bells. You were afraid of that one, weren't you, Quiz? But he fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. You'll be ready for him at eight bells with Ryder conveniently alone, unseen on the bridge. You can tell he's alone... Anyone going to the bridge must pass the narrow strip of deck outside your door. Quietly, you feel around in the drawer of your chest. Ryder's Navy revolver, right where you put it this morning. Now the knife and some string. You walk carefully to the door and run your hands over the panel to get just the right spot, breast high, a little to your right, on a line with Grant's heart as he comes in the door. You drive in the point of the knife and tie the string to the knife handle. Then you walk back to the desk, drawing the string with you. At the desk, you sit down. You pick up the gun and prop it up with the barrel running alongside the tight string. When the gun is properly lined up, you pull the string and draw the knife toward you. You put them back in the drawer. 
Then you release the safety catch on the gun. And wait. You're ready for him now, aren't you? With the gun accurately aimed at the spot in the doorway where the bullet will count most when Grant opens that door. It seems like hours. Your hand is cramped around the gun, but you don't relax for a second. There's determination in your mind. You're doing it for the sea, and you won't give it up for anyone. Then... Whistler will return with a strange ending of tonight's story in just a moment. Meantime, with chill winter weather definitely here, don't forget that you're not the only one who'll be needing winter clothes and a winter diet to keep feeling fit. It's just as important for your car to have Signal's winter diet to keep wear down when the thermometer's down. For the transmission and differential, that means draining, flushing, and refilling with Signal winter gear lubricant. If it's been 5,000 miles since your front wheel bearings were serviced, now's the time to have them removed, thoroughly cleaned, and repacked with Signal Long Life Wheel Bearing Grease. And for your motor, it's high time to drain out summer weight oil and refill with real winter protection. Refill with Signal Pen, the pure Pennsylvania oil with a famous fighting film that flows freely even on coldest mornings. With this complete Signal diet, your car has the cold weather lubricants it needs to help keep it purring through another winter. And the place to get it is at that friendly station displaying Signal's familiar yellow and black circle sign, your neighborhood Signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, it's over now, isn't it, Captain Quiss? Your system worked. The second shot wasn't necessary. You're shaking as you get out of the chair and wipe the fingerprints off the gun, throwing it on the deck beside the body. Then you call the engine room and order Kelly to the cabin. You're ready for him when he arrives. Good Lord, what's happened? You were right, Kelly. I should have put them on irons. Seems that Ryder just shot Mr. Grant. What? Where is he? Ryder? Yes. Yes, throw him in the brig immediately. But, but, Captain, are you blind? What do you mean? Why, this is Ryder here, on the floor. What? I didn't know. All I heard was a scuffle and I... Minute, Quiss. Grant! I'm in charge now, Kelly. Put Captain Quiss in irons. Captain! He's Ryan, I'm in charge you. You're even more stupid than I thought, Quiss. Take him away, Kelly. Wait a minute. Do you know why Ryder came here, Quiss? Because I didn't show up for my trick at the wheel. I didn't show up because I've been here, right in this room, from the time you called me in here an hour ago. It was quite a show you put on for me, Quiss. I'll want the knife and string. May need them to illustrate my lecture when we get into New Orleans. Grant, no! No! Kelly! I'm sorry for the poor guy. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by John Michael Hayes and Bud Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Whistle, 
is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states, from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things where I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with Signal, new Signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for Signal's big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular Signal stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Coincidence. Coincidence can kill a man and do it as effectively and brutally as a professional murder. Yes, coincidence can be a murder weapon, particularly when it falls into the hands of someone like Francia Legrand. It began shortly after her sister Elise had separated from her husband and moved to the Strathmore Apartments on the west side of Manhattan. And naturally, Francia didn't know at first that coincidence was working behind her. But it was there, one night when she returned from an errand. Did you go to the drugstore, Francia? Yes, here you are. But, but that isn't what I want. I'm sorry, Elise, it's the best I could do. They were out of the other kind. What are you writing? A letter. You can take your hand off it, dear. I won't look over your shoulder. Cigarette? No, thanks. You are wrought up, aren't you? Shall I sit down? If you like. I seem to be as welcome as the Black Plague. I'm sorry, Francie. Oh, I... don't apologize. I understand perfectly. You don't want to see anyone. Your husband is gone. Life isn't worth living. Please, Francie. Ross isn't coming back this time, Elise. I know he's gone. You don't have to tell me. You're afraid to face it, aren't you? Why don't you admit it? You've made a mess of your life, Elise. You had everything you wanted and you chucked it out the window. There's no one to blame but yourself. Francie, stop it. Why do you keep throwing it up to me over and over again? What difference does it make to you? It's my life. It's my marriage. That's where you're wrong. It's not yours anymore. What do you mean? It's my turn now, Elise. Your turn? I'm not going to make the same mistake you did. Why? You... You love him, don't you? Of course I love him. Well, take him. He's all yours. You don't have to tell me I've made a mess out of my life. I know it. I've always, I've always known it. But I couldn't do anything about it. Don't you see? I'm no good. You're right. Everything you've said to me over and over again is right. Now get out of here. Go on. Get out. Just a minute. I want you to know Ross had nothing to do with it. There's never been anything between us. I know. I know. I'm sorry, Francie. It's all my fault. And I admit it. Perhaps you can make him happy. He deserves it. I hope so. 
Now, please go. Annette? Annette? Yes, madame? Please get Miss Legrand's things. She's leaving. And uh, do you suppose that you could spend the night with your sister? But of course, madame, if you wish. I'd rather you would. Tonight, I... I'd like to be by myself. Well, Francia, she's defeated, isn't she? It's taken five years, five frustrated, maddening years. And now, at long last, you've accomplished what you set out to do. That's why you're elated as you go into a phone booth in the lobby downstairs. Hello, Ross. This is Francia. Ross, I've been up to see her. It's simply no use. I tried to patch it up. Well, I'd rather not discuss it over the phone. Suppose I pick you up at 79th and Madison in a half hour. Well, it's no use, Ross. She wouldn't listen. It was at that moment, while you stood in the phone booth talking, that coincidence moved into the picture, Francia. First in a taxi cab pulling up to the main entrance. Take the side entrance, driver. I can't park here, Chief. Don't argue with me. Pull around the side entrance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Second, just one minute later in the elevator, not far from the booth where you're talking. Twelve four, mister. What do you mean, twelve? I told you ten. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking. Don't hand me that. Take me back to ten. I haven't got all night. Yes, sir. And third, at the entrance of apartment 1072, next door to your sister, Elise. Joe! Hello, Marie. Are you crazy, Joe? What are you doing here? What's that detective doing at the main entrance? I don't know. You, uh, wouldn't turn me in, would you? <gasps> know any more now, Marie? No, Joe. Joe, listen. <laughs> Joe, please. You and I got some talking to do, honey. <gasps> Yes, Francia, that's where coincidence moved in. When Joe Fortescue, gambler, fugitive from justice, walked down the corridor to apartment 1072, next door to your sister Elise, the machinery of coincidence was in full motion. But as you drive through the park, you have no way of knowing that now. All you can think of is Ross. Did you tell her what I said, Francia? Yes, she wouldn't listen. Maybe it's just as well. What did she say? It's all over, period. Just that? Just that. Oh, I knew it would never work out, Ross. She's not your kind of a girl. She never understood you. Maybe I expected too much. No, no, it wasn't that. It's hard to figure out what it was looking back at it now. Maybe it was those awful, ugly quarrels. You know, Francia... It almost seemed as if I were married to two different women. I know. Yeah, I guess you do. Ross, now that it's all over, I want to tell you something. Yes? Those five years were difficult for me, too. Standing on the sidelines, seeing you married to someone you didn't love. What? Are you going to make me say it, Ross? Yes. Say it. I wanted to for so long, but I couldn't. She was always there between us. I... I do love you, Ross. What? What's the matter? How could you do it? What do you mean? The pieces all fit together now. It makes sense for a change. Ross... You were always there beside her, weren't you? The pal, the faithful sister. Oh, you're wrong. I didn't... Don't lie to me. I've got to hand it to you, Francia. You did a great job. Magnificent. Never made a slip. You don't understand. I'm afraid I do. She was two people, wasn't she? She was herself and she was what you made her with your vicious, insinuating remarks. I only hope I can put the pieces together again. Let me out. I have an important phone call to make. In the middle of the park? I don't care where we are. Pull over, will you? Oh, 
Why aren't you going to let me explain? You've explained enough. And it wasn't only a stab in the back, sweetheart. It was an insult. I'd have to be pretty desperate before I'd fall in love with you. I could kill you. You could kill him, couldn't you, Francia? Five years of careful, deadly planning gone for nothing. It was an insult, he said. If he weren't so bitter, he would have laughed at you. You drive through the park thinking, it's all over, isn't it? You've driven them together this time, done them a favor. Elise would never believe you this time. Or would she? You decide to take a chance and turn your car toward the Strathmore Apartments again. Elise is probably still up, finishing her correspondence. This time, there's no other way, Ross, dear. Killing oneself is wrong, I know. I only hope you'll try to understand. Goodbye, darling. Elise. Francia, Elise has caught up on her correspondence, and now she stands at the window looking down into the street ten floors below. The telephone rings in the bedroom, but Elise pays no attention. She isn't even conscious of the argument between Joe and Marie in the apartment Joe, next door. Ah, do uh, you're a killer, you lying little rat. Why don't you admit it? I wouldn't double cross you, Joe. Why should I? What? <laughs> What's that? Christopher, look down there. <gasps> oh. Somebody just fell out of a window. Signal. New Signal Gasoline. With the prologue of tonight's story, Coincidence, the Signal Oil Company brings you another of the strange tales by The Whistler. If you drive a car, this timely warning from the National Safety Council is for you. During one year, 97,800 persons were killed right here in America in accidents. Of the deaths caused by autos, one out of five occurred when roads were wet or slippery. One out of five when drivers' vision was obscured. Fortunately, precautions can be taken to help prevent these two types of accidents. For instance, tires that are worn smooth tend to skid more readily. But a deep, heavy retread job, the kind signal gasoline dealers are prepared to give your tires, will restore their grip on the road, help you stop more quickly. And if a worn windshield wiper is leaving streaks across your vision, signal gasoline dealers will install a fine new Rainmaster blade while you wait. So have your tire tread and your windshield wiper checked the next time you're at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealers. You'll feel a lot better knowing your car is prepared for the wet weather driving ahead. And it may help save a life. Possibly your own. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, Francia, coincidence can kill, particularly when there's someone to help it over the humps. The suicide of your sister Elise is the center of it, of course. And the other threads are beginning to weave together now. The thread Joe Fortescue contributed when he got out of the taxi at the side entrance of the Strathmore Apartments at 10.30 and went directly to room 1072 next door to Elise. The thread that put Ambrose Marks, detective, in the lobby at the same time. And most important of all, the thread that placed you and Ross together in your car at five minutes to eleven in the middle of Central Park. 
There's an excited crowd milling around the base of the apartment building as you arrive. Quiet, everybody. We haven't identified her yet. What's the matter? Some woman's hurt. Maybe killed here. Stand back. Away from the curb, everyone. That's a detective. She fell from a window up there. Uh, let me through, please. Stand back, please. please let me through. Who, who is she? Who... We don't know. Now, stand back, lady. Well, where's the body? Maybe Sorry, I... Sorry, lady. Now, please move on. But I tell Later, you... Later, lady. All right, folks. The lady's dead. Here, There's nothing we can Pardon do me, for please. her. Thank you. Let me through, please. Going up? Yes. What floor, ma'am? Ten, please. Right. Have they uh, found out who she is yet? No. <laughs> Great guy, Detective Marks. Ain't even figured out what floor she jumped from yet. Or was thrown from. What do you mean, thrown? I got my own ideas. A guy came up here a while ago who looked like he was ready to put the fix on somebody. All bundled up with a scarf over his face. You mean it was murder? What else? Of... What was that floor again? Ten. Hmm. Funny. That's where he got off, too. Elise? Elise, are you in here? Medicine. That note she was writing. Ross, darling, I'm going to kill myself tonight, and I want you to know why. It's clear now that I can't live either with you or without you. It was Elise. down. Main floor? Yes. I was right, you know. About what? Well, the guy in the tan coat. Wasn't I just talking to you? Oh, yes. You mean uh, the man who was angry? Yeah, the guy in the tan coat and the muffler. The dame on the night floor has really got the goods on him. Heard him and the girl fighting upstairs right over her apartment. Two minutes later, boom, she's on the pavement. Here you are. Main floor. Uh, just a minute. Going up. Ten, please. Oh, well, Hey, what's the matter? Where are you going? I'll be right back. Hello, uh, Ross. Oh, it's you. On your way up to get your nickels worth? I've been up. She isn't there. Well, I'll go up and wait. And by the way, you might as well go. I want to see her alone. Naturally. Any objections? No. Well, that's mighty decent of you. Say, what's the matter? Why are all these people in the lobby? And where did that boy go? He's over there with the police lieutenant. Police? Well, what are they doing here? There he is, chief, in my elevator. That's the guy. Are you sure? Positive. That's the guy in the tan coat. Well, Francia, that throws a new light on things, doesn't it? For the first time in your life, you have Ross where you want him. And you smile to yourself, thinking of the suicide note. Tucked away in your purse. You could clear him in a second, couldn't you, Francia? If you wanted to. But you'd rather watch him squirm, stammering answers to Detective Marks' sharp questions, trying to fight his way out of the tangled mass of circumstantial evidence piling up around him after you've both identified the body. All right, Mr. Mansfield. The taxi driver and the elevator boy have both identified you positively as the man in the tan coat who got off at the 10th floor shortly before your wife's death. The lady in the apartment downstairs says it was your voice she heard in the apartment overhead. Listen, Lieutenant, I tell you there's something wrong somewhere. Miss Legrand, isn't it true that Mr. and Mrs. Mansfield had several serious quarrels during the past month? Well, I... Oh, Ross, what'll I say? I'm asking you, Miss Legrand. I'd rather not answer. Oh, you'd rather not answer. You know how that sounds, don't you? All right, it's true. We hadn't been getting along. But that has nothing to do with tonight. All right, Mansfield, we don't seem to be getting anywhere. I'll ask you to be available to the DA's office on 15 minutes' notice until the inquest is held. That clear? Very well, Mr. Marks. It's pleasant, isn't it, Francia? Ross is really squirming now, desperately trying to get out from under. 
You follow the papers carefully during the next few days, full of the man in the tan coat, headlines screaming of Ross Mansfield, prominent architect, suspect in wife killing. The district attorney refusing to comment, stating an indictment should be forthcoming soon. And out of the welter of guessing, out of the quotes from informed sources, out of the analyses by crime experts, there comes one significant fact. The only thing that can save Ross Mansfield is an alibi. That puts it up to you, doesn't it, Francia? You have the power of life and death over him now. You can kill this man with a single statement. Hello, Ross. What are you doing here? It's rather important or I wouldn't have come. All right. Have you um, decided what you're going to say at the inquest tomorrow? Of course. There's nothing to worry about, Francia. All we have to do is tell the truth. Ross, do you still feel the same about me? How can you talk like that? Well, I'm only asking you. Skip it, will you? You don't have to jump at me. Francia, she was my wife. I loved her. She's dead. Does that mean anything to you? No, it doesn't, does it? It ought to, though. It ought to be on your conscience as long as you live. What are you talking about? They're right. She didn't kill herself. You murdered her. Just the same as if you'd shot her with a gun. That's where you're wrong. You killed her, Ross. Or, uh... Haven't you read the papers? Well, don't say anything. I'm going. See you tomorrow at the inquest. You decided then and there, didn't you, Francia? You're tired of watching him squirm now. You're going to put him out of his misery. It was murder, wasn't it, Francia? He's right. But murder doesn't bother you. You watch the flames creep slowly across the suicide note. The only other thing that could save him. And smile as you think of the inquest. Order, please. Order. <coughs> Lieutenant Marks, are you ready with your first witness? Yes, Mr. Coroner. Uh, I'd like to impress on the jury the fact that the testimony of this witness is perhaps more important than that of any other in this case. For that reason, I'm calling her first. Miss Legrand, will you take the stand, please? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Sit down. Miss Legrand, what is your relation to the deceased? I'm her sister. Would you say that the marriage of Mr. and Mrs. Mansfield was a happy one? No. There were quarrels? Yes, lots of them. Have you any idea what caused them? I think so. What? Mr. Mansfield was rather fond of me. Francia! You know that's not true. Just a minute, Mr. Mansfield. Proceed, Lieutenant. Well, is it true, Miss Legrand? It is. He's in love with me. I see. Now, this is very important, Miss Legrand. Were you or were you not with Mr. Mansfield riding in your automobile in Central Park between the hours of 10.45 and 11.05 on the night of your sister's death? I was not. You realize you're under oath. I do. You realize the consequences of this testimony? Yes, I do. I didn't see him all evening. I swear I didn't. Is that enough? Yes, Miss Legrand. That's enough. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, because Americans are curious people, like to know what makes things tick... I want to explain just what it is that gives new signal gasoline its amazing power and performance. You see, science has long known that the way the atoms in gasoline molecules are arranged determines how much power you get from the gasoline. Well, in old-style gasolines, the atoms were left just as nature arranged them. But recently, certain chemists actually found out how to rearrange the atoms to give amazing new performance to new signal gasoline which explains why New Signal isn't just pre-war quality gasoline, not just old-style gasoline improved, but an entirely new type super fuel packed with thrilling power. For the fun of feeling your car get young again, make this test, won't you? Try just one tank full of New Signal gasoline. Feel its quicker starting. 
See its faster pickup. Hear the smooth purr of your motor, thanks to Signal's high anti-knock. And check your speedometer for proof that with new Signal, you do go farther than ever. And then you be the judge. See if you don't agree that new Signal actually is the new post-war gasoline you can prove is superior. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, Francia, coincidence can kill a man, particularly if mixed up in it somewhere, there's a mind full of hatred to fill in the gaps. The case is complete, even though the inquest is hardly underway. They were right, Francia. Everything depended on your testimony on the alibi. Uh, just a minute, Miss Legrand. I'm not finished. If you weren't with Mansfield, where were you? I was out for a drive. Alone? Yes. Anyone see you? No. That's a pretty weak alibi. Alibi? See here, I'm not under suspicion. That's where you're wrong. Exhibit A, please. Recognize this? What? A box of poison, Miss Legrand, purchased by you on the night of the murder. Poison? Some people call it a sedative, but it's powerful enough to kill when taken in quantity. And it was taken in quantity. Enough of this drug was found in your sister's stomach to support this officer's contention that she was dead or nearly so before the fall. I didn't buy it. But you did buy it. I intend to call the druggist to the stand to prove it. She, she sent me for it. I never saw it after I brought it to her. Then how does it happen that your fingerprints are on the metal box? Why, the box was on the note. Yes, that's it. She used the box for a paperweight to hold the note down. What note? The suicide note. I burned it. Oh, there was a suicide note and you burned it. Why? I... I don't know. I see. You're asking the jury to believe that your sister committed suicide and that you deliberately went out of your way to incriminate yourself. I had no reason to kill her. You just testified you had every reason to kill her. You're in love with Mansfield. You implied as much not one minute ago. You hated your sister, didn't you? I didn't hate her. We got along beautifully. And I'm prepared to put your sister's maid on the stand to testify that you had a crucial quarrel with Mrs. Mansfield over her husband less than an hour before she was murdered. She wasn't murdered. She... What about the man in the tan coat? His name is Joe Fortescue. He's been in custody for two days. Wait a minute. You're wrong. You can't go ahead with this. You're accusing me of murder. Right. Murder in the first degree. Premeditated. Willful. Oh, you can't. Th th they'll send me... Oh, no, listen. Lieutenant, you've got to believe me. That's Please, just what me. we're doing. We're believing you. We believe you when you say your relationship with Mansfield was not exactly platonic. I know. We believe you when you swear you weren't with him at the time of the murder. Oh, but I lied. Ross, tell them I lied. I couldn't have killed her. I was with you. Wasn't I, Ross? Wasn't I with you? Do <laughs> you have anything to say, Mansfield? Lieutenant, I... Well? All right, Lieutenant. I was with her. There. There, you see, that proves it. I couldn't have killed her. It does prove something. What do you mean? It proves he loves you. As far as the murder goes, you're going to have to convince a jury. And believe me, it's going to take a lot of convincing. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Independent research rates it the most popular radio program on the Pacific Coast. Remember, let every traffic signal remind you. With Signal, new Signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for Signal's big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular Signal stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. The Stray Dream. Chris Claggett was never meant to commit murder. He knew it the minute he did it. But of course, it was too late then. The minute it was over and he looked down at Steve Robinson lying there on the floor, he knew that nothing would be the same afterward. That no matter how perfect it was, no matter how thoroughly he outsmarted the police, the big battle was going to take place inside himself, in the middle of his mind. He felt it even stronger two hours afterward as he paced the floor of his apartment, waiting for the telephone call that was bound to come sooner or later, trying to read and throwing the magazine aside, mixing drinks and pouring them down the sink, lighting cigarettes he was too nervous to smoke, waiting, waiting. Kathy was bound to call. She had to discover it sooner or later. Five minutes of two the night before Easter, Steve working late at the florist's shop, But she'd know he couldn't be working that late. She'd go down to see what was keeping him. And then she'd call. Chris was ready for it an hour ago with just the right amount of surprise and shock. But now, at five minutes of two, he didn't know. The waiting was getting him. And the silence. There it is, Chris. No, no, wait a minute. Let it ring. Now. Uh, hello? Chris, this is Kathy. Oh, Kathy, dear. You know better than to call me at this time. Chris, night. listen to me. Something terrible has happened. Huh? What's the matter? Steve. Steve is... He's dead, Chris. What? He was working late tonight at the flower shop. When he didn't come home, I went down and... and found him. I... I just called the police. Police? Yes, he... He's been murdered, Chris. Good Lord. Can you come down right away? Of course. Let me call the night editor first. I'll be right over. Well, Chris, at least the waiting is over. You carried it off pretty well, didn't you? Just the right amount of surprise and shock. But there's a strange new feeling inside, in the pit of your stomach, something you've never felt before. And the sight of Steve lying where you left him on the floor of the back room of the flower shop, surrounded by banks of Easter lilies and roses, brings the feeling to a dangerous pitch. You're thankful for your training. You don't even have to think as you watch Lieutenant Nelson. You're a police reporter. Your pencil moves automatically, taking down everything you see and hear. Well, what do you think, Chief? Uh, Probably struck from behind as he was working at this bench. Yeah, but how did the guy get in? Didn't have to get in, Gibson. Could have reached in this open window. Oh, Claggett. Yeah? You'd better go and file your story. I don't think anything else will break tonight. Just photographs, fingerprint men, and that sort of thing. All right, Lieutenant. It's tough, I know. All murders are tough. I think the flowers here are what make this one so horrible. 
All this beauty and ugliness in the same little room. He was a friend of yours, wasn't he? Yeah. I'd better go, Lieutenant. What'll I tell Mrs. Robinson? Tell her I think she's had enough for one night. I'll uh, see her tomorrow afternoon. Okay. Well, Chris? It's pretty terrible, Kathy. What? What did Lieutenant Nelson say? You can go now. He'll see you tomorrow afternoon. Oh. I, uh, I gotta file my story. That's something, isn't it? Me filing a story about oh, Steve? Please, please, Chris. I'm sorry. I, I just... I, I know. Chris, I... I don't know what I'd do if... If you weren't here. I'll always be here, Kathy. Remember that, will you? Sure, Chris. I, I'll remember. Just the right balance, Chris. Just enough grief and just enough business as usual. The outside battle is going well, isn't it? Tonight, the reporter, carrying on in spite of everything. Tomorrow, a little less grief, a little more business as usual. At the city editor's desk, for example. Oh, just a minute, Holloway. I tell you, I'm right, Chief. The door into the, into the sales room was locked. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. Why? I remember. That's the trouble. You think you remember. Where's Chris? Over there at the counter. All right, we'll see. Oh, Chris. Yeah? Come here a minute. I'll show you what I mean, Holloway. What's the matter, Chief? Oh, Holloway here is doing a feature on the murder. He says the door into the sales room was locked. Check it, will you? Yeah, it's a second. Uh, let me see. Oh, here we are. The door had a Yale lock, but it was on the latch and the bolt above it was open. Yeah, I see. Now, wait a minute. There was a triangular rubber door stop against it on the workroom side, so it couldn't have been used as an exit. That's it. See what I mean, Holloway? He doesn't trust his memory. He takes everything down. Well, that didn't seem very important. How do you know it's not important? Take it down anyway. But I was so busy... So was Chris. Doesn't matter how busy you are. A first-class man makes notes without even thinking about it. Right, Chris? Yeah, I suppose so. You see, Holloway? That's what I mean by a reporter. You're an expert, a precision machine, accurate to a millionth of an inch, never wrong on a fact, never guilty of bungling errors like the other reporters. And because you used the same methods to kill Steve Robinson, the outside battle was over before it started. Three months later, the case is shelved. Kathy's yours, Chris. She's Mrs. Claggett now. You have what you set out to get. Why don't you forget about the battle that's still going on inside? Yeah? Chris, where are the roses I put on the mantel? Roses? Oh, yeah, in the green vase on the mantel, dear. Oh, yeah, well, they, they're kind of wilted. I threw them out. Wilted? Oh, Chris, I just got them from the florist yesterday. Why must we always have flowers, Kathy? Well, be, because I like well, them. Well, I don't. What's the matter, dear? Ever since we got back from our I just honeymoon... don't like flowers, Kathy. Is there anything wrong with that? Well, don't jump at me. I'm sorry. What's wrong, Chris? You used to send me flowers before Steve and I... I know it. You don't have to tell me. It's very simple, Kathy. I don't like flowers because they remind me of Steve. That's why I want them. Huh? They remind me of Steve, too, Chris. I like to think of him once in a while. Why? Because I loved him. Kathy, don't you understand? I was fond of him, too. He was my best friend. But we're not living in the past. Keeping him in front of us all the time isn't going to help. Well... Is that why you objected to living here? Of course. He's here in the house with us. Everywhere I turn, I see him. Knickknacks of his all over the place. His picture on your dresser. Well, I, I thought you understood when we were married. I guess I didn't. Oh, excuse me, Kathy. I'm going to bed. And so you go to bed, Chris. But you don't sleep for hours. You haven't really slept since the murder, have you? And tonight, it's worse than ever. Your mind's like a spinning top. You aren't conscious of the exact moment it begins. But suddenly, you find yourself in the press section of a courtroom covering a trial. It's a courtroom different from any you've ever seen. Roses are everywhere. They cover the walls. They flow down over the judge's bench and up the aisles. The scent of them is almost sickening. 
There's a strange, cold feeling inside you as you take in all the details. The judge, the jury, the counsel for the defense and the prosecution. Then your heart almost stops as you realize that the man on trial for murder is you. Wait a minute. Let me explain. You got me all wrong. No, no, listen. I didn't... Uh, I didn't... Uh, I... Uh, I... The dream. What am I doing out of bed? Kathy, she heard me. No. Still asleep. Thank heaven. More coffee, Chris? No, thanks. Well, you usually have two cups. I think I'll cut down a little. I didn't sleep too well last night. Oh? Must have been something I ate. You you hear me tossing around? <laughs> no, I was dead to the world. I I had the feeling when I woke up this morning I've been talking in my sleep. You remember hearing anything? <laughs> no. You must have something on your conscience, dear. <sighs> yeah. Well, that's a relief, isn't it, Chris? It's a good thing Kathy sleeps soundly. You don't remember what you said, but no matter what it was, it would have sounded bad under the circumstances. You feel better that afternoon as you take Kathy downtown for a beauty appointment and get into the swing of things at the office. Then that evening... Chris... Don't you think it might be a good idea to call off our bridge date with the Bartons tonight? You seem so tired. Yeah, I could use some sleep. You know, I've been thinking all afternoon about last night. Huh? What do you mean? Well, this morning when you asked me, I didn't remember anything unusual, but this afternoon the strangest feeling came You mean you heard me? me? Heard what? Oh, uh, well, you remember I, uh, I was telling you I had some crazy idea I'd been talking in my sleep. Well, no, I didn't hear anything. Oh, I, I was just sitting here reading when I suddenly realized I had a funny dream. Oh, yeah? Well, maybe it's because of the roses. Roses? Well, yes, you remember we talked about them before going you to bed. You mean you dreamed about roses? Well, yes, all, all mixed up with something about a trial and a courtroom. A court? Kathy, are you sure? What? Well, what's the matter, Chris? Is that all? Well, that's all I can remember. Chris, what's the matter? I... I don't know. With the prologue of tonight's story, The Stray Dream, Signal brings you another strange story by The Whistler. In place of the message about Signal gasoline, usually heard at this time on The Whistler, Signal Oil Company has asked me to talk with you about something much closer to the heart, about someone you may have forgotten to put on your Christmas list. I'm talking about a serviceman, one who won't be able to be home with his family and friends this Christmas because he's in a hospital, recovering from wounds he suffered, fighting for his country and for you. Can't you imagine the happiness it would bring some serviceman on Christmas morning to receive a gift he wasn't expecting that would tell him, as nothing else could, that he hasn't been forgotten? It needn't be a large gift, but it should be something appropriate, something he could use. And the Red Cross is ready to help you by suggesting the right gift for the right man. Just call the camp and hospital committee of your local Red Cross and tell them you'd like to send a Christmas gift to a serviceman. They'll give you the necessary information. And on Christmas morning, you'll be twice as happy because you'll have brought a ray of happiness to someone who gave so much to give us the best Christmas gift of all. Peace. Remember, the place to call is the camp and hospital committee of your local Red Cross. Don't put it off. Call tomorrow, won't you? And now, back to the whistler. For the first time in your life, you're beginning to lose faith in yourself. The shadow of a doubt is slowly making itself felt inside you. You keep telling yourself it must be a coincidence. How else could you and Kathy have had the same dream at the same time? A courtroom filled with roses. 
Yet she couldn't have pulled that one out of the air. It's too fantastic. It can't be coincidence. Yet what else can it be? Once again, you lie awake for hours trying to find an explanation. And then, just as before, it's all there in front of you, the same courtroom, just as you saw it last night from the press section. You're sitting there, just as before, watching the witnesses, listening to statements by the attorneys. But this time, instead of roses, the courtroom is filled with Easter lilies. The same variety you found in the florist shop. Then slowly it melts away, and you lapse into the restful blackness of sleep. Seven o'clock. Kathy? Kathy? Yes, Chris? Where are you? I'm in the living room, dear. I'm coming. What's the matter? When'd you get up? Four o'clock. Four? Why? I... I couldn't sleep. You mean you had another dream? I don't know what's the matter with me, Chris. It... It's so... So real. Did you have another one? Tell me. Why, Chris. I'm sorry. Tell me about it. It was... It was just like before. The courtroom and the judge, but... But what? It... It wasn't roses this time, Chris. It was Easter lilies. see me, Chief? Yeah, I just wanted to talk to you for a minute. What's wrong, Chris? Hmm? What's eating you? Well, I don't know. I... Well, for years, I point you out to all the Cubs as a shining example. Everything a star reporter should be. And suddenly, your stuff starts coming in so garbled I can't use well, there's it. There's nothing wrong, Chief. Now, don't hand me that. I know you too well. Something's eating your heart out, and I want to know what it is. Well, it's none of your business. It is my business. When the best man on my staff turns in a story on the shake-up at the city hall full of scrambled references to roses and Easter lilies... You can bet your shirt it's my business. What was that? You heard me. Uh, I I guess I've just been working too hard. Is that all? Yeah. Yeah, Chief, that's all. I doubt it. You've been through a lot tougher grinds than this, and I've never seen you fall to pieces yet. What's the matter, Chris? You look like a ghost. I told you that that there's nothing the matter. I, I just need a rest. All right, then take one. A long one. How long? As long as you want. On full salary. And don't come back until you can write a straight story. Holloway? Uh, Oh, yeah, Chris. Holloway, uh, didn't you do a story once on a professor over at the university? Something about experiments on extrasensory perception or thought transference or something? Uh, yeah. His name was Duncan, I think. What did he do? What was it all about? I don't remember very well. I, I think they'd line up a batch of students at one end of a room and have them concentrate on numbers. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Mm-hmm. And then another group would try and write the numbers down. What's his name again? Duncan. Charles Duncan. I really don't like to appear too definite on this, Mr. Claggett. Nothing has been proved conclusively. You mean there's no such thing as thought transference, Professor Duncan? It's hard to say. It's a very unscientific attitude to take, assuming that two minds are uh, in tune, so to speak. But we have found rare cases in which there seems to be no other conclusion. I see. Uh, Does distance... Seem to make any difference? Oh, yes. Uh, I would say it cuts down the possibilities considerably. Uh huh. Thanks, Professor. That's the only way you can explain it, isn't it, Chris? You and Kathy must be one of the rare cases the Professor talked about. There's no other answer. It's maddening to have carried it off so perfectly. To have won the outside battle so completely. Only to lose your grip on the secret while you're asleep and the bars are down. And there's only one defense, isn't there, Chris? He said that distance did make a difference. Hello, darling. Chris, what 
What in the world are you doing home so early? Oh, I had a talk with Jones. He says I need a rest. Well, he's right. So how would you like to go away for a couple of weeks? Where? Oh, Tahoe, maybe. Why, I... I think that's a wonderful idea, Chris. Could you be ready this afternoon? Well, I don't know. It's a rush order. Oh, there wouldn't be much packing. We'd just knock around our old clothes. Well, I'll try. Great. Great. I knew you would. What about you? Well, I was about to tell you. I'll have to join you later. There's some things I've got to clear up, you know. Well, why can't I wait? We could go up together. Now, don't be that way, darling. I want you to have it all ready for me when I arrive. I'll get your reservations <laughs> on the 3 o'clock train. How about it? <laughs> well, all right, Chris. Great. Oh, gee, look at the time. We've got to hurry. Come on. I'll help you. <laughs> Well, Chris, she's out of the way for the time being. You're relieved for the moment. But the old tension returns that night as you lie down to sleep in Steve's house among Steve's things. She's at Lake Tahoe, Chris, 250 miles away. You keep telling yourself that distance will make the difference, just as the professor said. You try not to think of it as you lie there. Try to make your mind a blank. But the same impressions come back again and again. He's there, Chris. Steve is there in the courtroom with the flowers all around him. You sit in the press section, you can't take your eyes off him. He's smiling at you, Chris, as he gets slowly out of his seat and walks toward the witness stand, stepping carefully over the rows of roses and Easter lilies. You're going to talk, Chris. You realize there's no other way out now. Then you find yourself on your feet, shouting your lungs out, telling the court you killed him. I killed him! I admit it. I can't stand this any longer. I killed him because I loved his wife. I thought I'd I'd be happy, but I was wrong. I I don't care anymore. I I don't care. What? Good Lord. Oh, good Lord. Martin's Cove, Lake Tahoe. Hello, this is Christopher Claggett. I'd like to speak to Mrs. Claggett, please. Just a moment. Yeah. I'm sorry, sir. She doesn't answer. All right, I'll call back. She doesn't answer, Mr. Claggett. I'll tell her you called. Hello? Hello, Kathy. Hello, Chris. Where have you been, Kathy? I've been calling you since 8 this morning. It's 4 o'clock. I know it. Why didn't you answer? I couldn't. I was so upset by... Chris. Chris, I had the dream again. It was awful. You're lying. No, Chris. It's no, It's impossible. No. You couldn't have. It was your trial, Chris. Steve was there testifying. Stop it, Kathy. I tell you, Chris, it was real. I could swear I was right there in the courtroom. I said stop it. Listen, Kathy, listen to me. You've got to let me explain. Don't do anything. Don't see anybody. I'll be on the next train. It leaves Berkeley in an hour. There's only one way out now, Chris. It's you or Kathy. You did it once and got away with it. You're wondering now whether you can do it again. But there's no alternative, is there? It's you or Kathy. That's why, at five minutes past midnight, you're at Martin's Cove walking through the darkness behind the row of hotel cabins. You know Kathy's in number 16, and at this hour she'll be sleeping. You keep well in the shadows of the trees at the edge of the cabin area. Fourteen. Fifteen. Sixteen, this is the one. The window's open. You can see her head on the pillow. You pull out your revolver. You wish there were some other way. But there isn't. Just a moment now. Hey! What are you... Drop that gun! I got him! Let me go! I said drop that gun! All right, Claggett. Nelson! You can come along peacefully, or you can come feet first. At the moment, I am not particular. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. 
Meantime, here's an interesting feature about the new 1946 cars. One of the leading sixes advertises 25 to 30 miles per gallon. And throughout the field, auto manufacturers are stressing increased mileage. This is being done not just as a matter of economy, but because mileage is the result of better performance, a proof of greater efficiency. Well, as you know, signal gasoline has long been famous as the go-farther gasoline. But here's the important point. Signal Oil Company, always quick to give the motoring public the advantage of new trends, new improvements, has actually engineered new signal gasoline to help you go farther than ever. How Signal did it involves a long scientific explanation about rearranging the atoms in gasoline molecules to give amazing new power to new signal gasoline. The immediate noticeable results of this new power are quicker starting, faster pickup, and higher anti-knock. But because this increased power means you'll be shifting less, and shifting is the demon that wastes gasoline, your speedometer will prove to you that it's a fact. You do go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. So you finally lost the inside battle, didn't you, Chris? There in the shadows with Gibson pinning your arms to your sides and Lieutenant Nelson standing in front of you with a gun in his hand, you realize it's all over. You had the feeling from the first, didn't you? From the moment you killed Steve Robinson in the rear of his flower shop, you knew it was a losing battle. But it was too late to change anything. You should have known that it wouldn't go, Chris. How did... How did you know? Your wife called us. Thought so. Not until you confessed, of course. Confessed? Yes, all written out pretty as you please. Ten pages of it in your own handwriting. Garbled up with a lot of nonsense about roses and Easter lilies. What are you talking about? You didn't really think that you and your wife were dreaming the same dream, did you? My error. You must have. Or you wouldn't have tried to kill her. She wasn't asleep on that first night, Chris. She watched you get out of bed, take one of your spare notebooks out of the dresser drawer. I was writing. It was real. Well, the writing was real at least. You almost had a stump, though, when you sent her up here. We had to wait three hours until you went out for lunch to get into your house and find the notebook. She couldn't answer you when you called, of course, until we got to her by telephone and told her what she had dreamed last night. Well, that's it, isn't it? You were too good a reporter, Chris. A guy who can take notes without thinking should never take a crack at murder. Especially if he walks in his sleep. at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, produced by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler.
the whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular program on the West Coast. Remember that every traffic signal reminds you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Poison is quicker. Most men lead lives of quiet desperation, said Thoreau. Quiet desperation. How well little Alfred Smithers, who never read a word by Thoreau in all his life, knew the meaning of that phrase. All the nagging dullness of a humdrum existence and a tiresome wife. Yes, the saucy little servant girl Alfred had married in London so many years before had become a lazy, slovenly housewife whose untidy little home had miraculously survived the Blitz. Now, with the coming of peace, Gracie Smithers sat in that dingy front parlor night after night, reading murder mysteries and yawning, while Alfred gazed blankly at his Daily Express and wished he were rid of her. Wished it with all his heart and did nothing about it. Oh, oh. Well, that's another one off me docket. The author didn't play fair, though. I still don't see how that little what's-his-name could have been the Crimson Hangman. <sighs> what you thinking about, Alfie? Nothing. Hmm. Still waters run deep, you know. You don't just sit there thinking about nothing. Only a perishing statue does that. I was thinking about the days. What? The days aren't so bad. At least I have something to do with the office. At least I keep occupied. What's the matter, Alfie? Getting the jitter? Never mind. Don't you like our happy little home all of a sudden? If you must know the truth, Mrs. Smithers... I say now, what's got your back up? Oh, nothing. Feeling sorry for yourself again, dearie? Oh, shut up. Get back to your murder rubbish and don't bother me. Really, Alfred Smithers? Read, can't you? Let a man have a little peace and quiet. Hmm. There's nothing to read. I was hoping you'd pick up some more thrillers for me at the bargain shop tomorrow. All right, all right. What do you want me to get? I wrote down the titles somewhere. Got them ready for you. Oh, yes, here they are. Dearest Alfred. What's that? <laughs> oh, don't get the wind up, lovey. It's only a book title. Oh, doesn't sound much like a murder mystery to me. Perhaps it isn't. I thought I'd like to see the Alfred in real life if he's anything like Alfred in the book. Very amusing. The others are all thrillers, though. Death is my bridegroom. <laughs> there gives you the creeps, don't it? Nobody loves me. That's a murder that looks like suicide. Yeah. This way out, a spine chilling cat and mouse game, the catalogue says. I could hang. Hmm. Don't know that one. And the last one, poison is quicker. Rubbish. Nothing but tripe. Alfred Smithers, you're a snob. Everybody reads murder novels. I don't. Oh, you've always thought yourself better than anybody else. Especially better than me. I've never been good enough for you. That's for you to say, my dear. That's a fine thing to say to your wife. Oh, give me a list, Gracie. I'll pick the books up tomorrow. Well, okie doke. Here's the list. Be sure and get poisoners quicker. It's all about somebody murdered for insurance. Stark realism, the catalogue says. Cheap trash. Dearest Alfred, death is my bridegroom. Nobody loves me. This way out. I could hang. But poison is quicker. Hmm. Dearest Alfred, death is my bridegroom. Nobody loves me. This way out. I could hang. Poison is quicker. 
Alfred, I... Well, what's the matter? Why are you shaking so? I don't know. I must have caught a chill or something. Almost like a note to you, isn't it, Alfred? The barely coherent elliptical style of a suicide note. If Gracie were dead and that note were found beside her body, you try not to think of it. Why, it's monstrous. You're thinking of murder. You want to be rid of her, but not that way. Still, if you simply left her, you'd have no money. And Gracie does have insurance. But poison is quicker, she said. Poison. That arsenic powder you used in the garden. The thoughts in your mind all that night and all the next day. It's coming out now from its hiding place deep inside you. And then when you return home that evening, it happens. The little push that makes you a murderer. Well, where are they? Where's what? My books, dearie. You said you'd bring them home with oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry, Gracie. I forgot all about them. You forgot? Yes, Gracie. Oh, I had other things on me mind. Other things on your mind? Such an important little man, aren't we, Elfie? Can't keep a promise to your own wife. I couldn't help it, Gracie. They slipped me mind. Like fun they did. You done it deliberate. I know you did. Gracie, don't raise your voice. It's vulgar. Oh, so now I'm vulgar, am I? Well, if I'm not good enough to do things for, I'm not good enough to do things for you. You can make your own tea and toast tonight. Don't shout at me, Gracie. Don't scream. Oh, don't, don't, don't. I'm sick and tired of getting the frosty eye from you, dearie. You're not so high and mighty. Just a miserable little clerk in a dirty little office. That'll do. Oh, just a second, your highness. Gracie! Don't. You'll only upset yourself. I'll make tea for the four of us. You'll make none for me. That wishy-washy, weak stuff you'll brew for yourself. I'll make me own. All right. For once, I'll do it your way. Eh? Tonight, I'll make it the way you want it, Gracie. Just as strong as you like. <laughs> With the prologue of tonight's story, Poison is Quicker, Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. Inflation. You hear that word all around you these days. But in the midst of higher and higher prices and dollars that buy less and less, it's gratifying to find a product that actually offers more quality than ever before in history, but still sells at its pre-war price. Yet that's just what you get in new Signal Gasoline. Of course, improvement isn't new to Signal Gasoline. Since that day 14 years ago, when Signal Oil Company introduced the first guaranteed anti-knock gasoline at no extra price, Signal Gasoline has been constantly improved to give you the benefit of every latest development in the automotive and petroleum industry. But today's Signal Gasoline, in which the atoms in gasoline molecules have actually been rearranged to create amazing new power is so superior to pre-war gasolines, it's really a completely new type super fuel. To discover what thrilling performance there's still left in your car, try just one tankful of new Signal gasoline. When you step on the accelerator, you'll know why Signal products, although still young in years, have grown and grown in popularity. Until today, those friendly stations displaying Signal's yellow and black circle sign now serve seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, back to the whistler. But poison is quicker. Strange what a book title can do to a man, isn't it, Alfred? Who would think it could be the stepping-off place to murder? And yet Gracie's dead now, the victim of arsenic poisoning. And you are already playing a new role, the part of a shocked husband, the little man who seems so dazed and bewildered. It's only four hours after you made Gracie such a nice cup of tea. And now she's dead. And Police Sergeant Jellaby is questioning you. You're thankful you're still in the safety of your own home. You might lose your head if you were in the hostile atmosphere of a police station. Are you sure you can't think of any reason why your wife would wish to take her own life, Mr. Smithers? Not right now, Sergeant. I, I just can't think now. I'm sure you understand we must get to the bottom of this unfortunate oh, of affair. Of course, of course. 
Now, about the question of motive, then. Well, the books... Uh, might have been the books. Books? But it's such a tiny thing. You'd better tell me about it, Mr. Smithers. Well, my wife is very fond of reading. Last night she asked me to pick up some novels for her in the city today, and I was so busy, though, I forgot all about them. She was rather upset when I come home without them. Upset enough to kill herself, Mr. Smithers? Oh, good heavens, no. At least I didn't think so then. You quarrelled about it? Oh, no, we never quarrelled. She was upset, as I said, uh, and it disturbed me. In uh, in what way? Oh, I felt rather guilty about failing her, so while she was making our tea, I... Your wife made tea after your little incident? Oh, yes, she always done that. She said I made such audible tea. Our neighbours can tell you that. Who are they? Well, there's Mrs. Applegate next door. She's a widow. And then there's Henry Small across the road. I see. Go on, Mr. Smithers. You said you uh, felt guilty. Oh, yes, yes. I, so I did. So, so while she was making the tea, I decided to surprise her. Make up for what I'd forgotten to do, like, uh, you know. In, in what way? Well, I remember the rental library on the Queen's Road might still be open, so I... I thought I'd better take a quick walk over there and pick up a few novels for her. I left the house without a word. Wanted to surprise her, like, see? Uh -huh. How long were you gone? I left at half past six. It, it was foggy, you know, the way it gets this time of year. Uh -huh. So I, I was longer than I'd bargained for. Over half an hour I was. And these are the books you got her? That's uh, Embers of Desire and Love in the Desert. Sort of thing most women like to read. Did your wife read this sort of thing as a general rule? Uh, I read... Don't know. I, I, I never much thought about the books she read. What books did she ask you to get for her in the city? Books? Uh, yes, what titles? Oh, well, I, I know it's absurd, Sergeant, but I, I simply can't remember. Are you quite sure? Well, I just can't think of them, I mean to say. I, I forgot about them in the first place, and now I'm so mixed up... Perhaps it'll come to you later. Now about the note... Yes? Doesn't it strike you as rather odd? I don't think I know what you mean, Sergeant. Well, it isn't coherent for one thing, and she didn't sign her name to it for another. Uh, I, I thought of that. My wife, she must have been under great mental strain when she wrote it. Uh, I can see that. Decided to take her life on a sudden impulse, eh? Mm. Must have thought you'd left the house in a fit of anger, then hurried about the business of writing the note and putting the arsenic in her tea. It's a... Terrible thing to think about, and it's hard. Right. Arsenic poisoning's not the most pleasant of deaths. Since you weren't here to prevent it, perhaps it's just as well you didn't get home until... until it was all over. Yes. Is... Uh, is that all, Sergeant? Yes. You'll be notified when to appear for the inquest, Mr. Smithers. Uh -huh. I'll see you then. Good night. <laughs> And so you've gotten away with murder, Alfred. Or have you? Is Sergeant Jellyby as stolid and blind as he seems? He certainly didn't seem too sympathetic. Was that merely his official manner, or does he suspect you? And was your trip to the rental library after you'd watched Gracie die as clever an alibi as you thought? You had to lie about the type of novel Gracie read... You deliberately brought home those trashy love stories to ward off any questions about the suicide note. But if Henry Small or Molly Applegate should remember that Gracie read mystery novels... Ah, oh, you made a mistake there, Alfred. But it's too late to rectify it now. All you can do is attend the inquest with Molly Applegate and Henry Small on either side of it. A nasty business, this elf. It'll soon be over, though. I hope so, Henry. You think that the coroner's jury could have made up their minds by now? Can't see why they're taking so long about it. Well, it really isn't so long, Mrs. Applegate. They've only been gone a few minutes. An arrowing ordeal for you. That's what it is. I don't see how you could be so cool up there on the witness stand. The man can't reveal his grief in public, Mrs. Applegate. That he can't. You've done yourself proud, Alf. Me, now... The few questions a coroner asked me, they had me shaking like a leaf. Pretty silly if you ask me. How do you mean, Molly? The few questions he put to you. Didn't really need to call you as a witness. Same goes for me as far as that goes. I'm sure I could have told a sight more if I'd been asked. Just what do you mean by that, Mrs. Applegate? 
They're coming back. The jury's coming out. Mrs. Applegate, I'd like to know what Shh, you... Now, here, here's the coroner. Me members of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have. How find you the case of the deceased Grace Smithers? In the light of the evidence disclosed, we find the deceased Grace Smithers is suicide while of temporarily unsound mind... Well, that's it, Elf. There it is. My, yes. Nothing to worry about now. What do you mean? Nothing well, to worry about. Well, really, Mr. Smithers. Well, what do you mean by it? Nothing to make you bite my head off, I'm sure. Only that it's official now. Oh, sorry, Mrs. Applegate. I, I'm not quite myself, you know. Well, I didn't mean to snap at you myself. You're right, of course. I, I haven't anything to worry about now. Nothing at all. Nothing to worry about, Alfred. Then why is fear so clammy and cold inside you? You've always been afraid of so many things. And now you've actually killed Gracie. You're afraid you'll be found out. That's the greatest fear you've ever known. Murder was so easy. But that was only the beginning. What about Molly Applegate? What more could she have told if she'd been asked? question haunts you all during the funeral and through the next day and the day after when the insurance man calls at the house. Just one more question for our files, Mr. Smithers. I don't see why I have to answer any more questions. You can get all your information from the police records. It's a formality we have to follow, Mr. Smithers. My company's not in business for its health, you understand. But surely I told you everything you want to know. Uh, just one more thing. What really made your wife take her own life? That's in the evidence at the inquest. It's available to you. My instructions are to get it in your own words. You want your wife's insurance, don't you, Mr. Smithers? No sense in going to pieces, you know. If I were in your shoes, you know what I'd do? Take a trip. If you was in my shoes. Yes, do you good. Now, what about your wife? Oh, I guess the war was too much for her. She finally gave way after it was all over. Sergeant Jellaby told me you said that. Then you've seen the police. Well, it's part of my job, you know. Is that all you want? I think so. The money will come through in due time, Mr. Smithers. Yeah. Good day. Panic won't help you at all, Alfred. Still, Mr. Chatham, the insurance man, seemed much too suspicious, didn't he? Why all the leading questions? If he were in your shoes, he said, he'd go away. As if he knew that was already in your mind. But that's your plan now, isn't it? The moment you get your money, you'll go away, start all over again in another town, maybe even another country. You hold to that thought all the next day. And then you stop at the corner pub on your way home from the office and have a beer with your friend Henry. Well, here's to you, Elf. A long life and no slip-ups. No slip-ups? Accidents. Hope nothing ever goes wrong for you. Cheerio. Uh, cheerio. Oh, that's a bit of all right, what? Yes. Yes, it is. It ran into that insurance bloke this afternoon, uh, Chatham. You did? Tells me you're thinking of going away. What gave him that idea? I don't know. Uh, uh, perhaps he didn't say that exactly. Uh, said he mentioned it to you. Uh, where are you thinking of going, Elf? Well, I, I haven't got them. Uh, south of France is the spot this time of the year. Well, I haven't even thought about it, Henry. Yeah, speaking of France, by the way, I read across a rum item in the paper last week. Oh? This French bloke's wife killed herself, see? Suicide. Plain as the nose on your face. Bloke collects the insurance and then skips off. Hops off to Paris and starts blowing in his brass on riotous living, you might say. The gendarmes picked him up like that. Give himself away, he did. He killed her himself. Now, if he'd stayed where he was, nobody would have been any the wiser. Now, the way I look at it, Elf... 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 Oh, where'd he go? I say there, a pig. You could see a friend, Mr. Small. Well, he was here only a second ago. I was just chinning, not looking at him especially, and he ups and disappears. He walked out while you was talking, Mr. Small. 
white as a sheet it was, just like he'd seen a ghost. <laughs> It wasn't a ghost you'd seen, was it, Alfred? Merely the folly of trying to go away. Henry Small's right. People would immediately start to talk. Wait, though. Henry Small never invited you to have a beer before. And why did he tell you that story about the Frenchman? It's very suspicious. As frightening as Molly Applegate's remarks at the inquest, what was the information she could have given the coroner? The question beats at your mind again as you walk home from the pub, trying to hurry through the fog that's come up. Mr. Smithers! Oh! Oh. I hope I didn't startle you, Mr. Smithers. You, you did give me a bit of a turn, Mrs. Applegate. I, I didn't notice you waiting at the doorway. Thought you'd be along about now. I've been waiting for you. Waiting for me? I know how it's been for you since Gracie passed on. I thought perhaps you were tired of having your tea alone by now, eh? Oh, well, I haven't thought about it much, Mrs. Applegate. As a widow, I know what it's like to be lonely myself. I just got some uh, lovely fish and chips at the shop, and I left tea on at home. So if you'd like to come in... Well, really, I... I, I thought we might have uh, <clears throat> things well, uh, to talk about. Things to talk about? I'm a woman what keeps her eyes open. I know how things were with you and Gracie. What do you mean? Oh, uh, in our mystery books. Well, what about them? Believe me, I understand. Understand what? What is it to understand? You can trust me not to breathe a word to anyone. Mrs. Applegate, I'm sure I don't know Alfred, what you... Alfred, you've known me long enough now to call me by my right name. You can call me Molly if you want to. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I really must be getting home. Oh, but our tea. I it's don't want no tea. I, I'm oh. not hungry, Mrs. Applegate. Uh, good night. <laughs> What's happening to you, Alfred? Sergeant Jellyby, Henry Small, the insurance man, Molly Applegate. They've all talked to one another about you. Are they playing a cat and mouse game with you? You've got to find out how much they know. Ask Henry Small. Question him skillfully, cunningly, so that he won't suspect anything. But get the truth from him. That's it. Invite him to the house. He's late in arriving, though. By the time he does get there, it's late afternoon and fog is beginning to creep through the streets again. What did you want to see me about, Elf? Well, Henry, I'd like to apologize about the other night at the pub, you know. Apologize? What for? I suppose you thought it was odd of me, uh -huh. Jonah. I said... Why are you looking out the window? Oh, nothing, nothing. What's up, Elf? I wanted to talk about something else, too. What's that? Well, I don't quite know how to say it. Something troubling you, Elf? Why do you say that? Elf, sometimes to get it off your chest. Like I was saying to Molly Applegate this Why morning... Why must you keep looking out that window? What's that, Elf? You expecting something? Is that it? Is that why you was late? Here he is. He's coming now. Oh, who are you talking about? Another minute and you wouldn't be able to see him for the fog. Oh, is it? Here. Yeah. Let me see. Them uniforms don't keep out the cold in weather like no, this. No, he can't. What's up, Elf? He can't come here. What's he wrong? can't come here. Look here, mate. Easy does it. Now, look, Elf. Is anything the matter? He's at the door, Elf. You better let him in. Elf, don't you hear him? You better go to the door. Elf! Elf! Good heavens. Elf, what have you done? Here, let me help you. You can let him in now, Henry. You all thought you were so clever. But poison is quicker. <laughs> The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a word about a sight that's becoming more and more common these cold mornings. Somebody trying to start his car, but no luck. The reason? Another war-weary battery has gone dead. So that this can't happen to your car, I'd like to suggest that you take advantage of your signal gasoline dealer's complete battery service. At least every two weeks, stop in to have him check the water level and remove destructive corrosion from the terminals. If your battery seems run down, your signal dealer has the latest equipment to tell its exact condition as well as to give you a thorough recharge job. In the event that you need a new battery, 
He has top quality signal batteries, fully guaranteed for long, trouble-free service. And I might add, signal dealers also have America's finest spark plugs, champion spark plugs, which play such an important part in cold weather starting. So stop in at your signal dealer soon. You'll find he's much more than just a place to buy Signal's famous go-farther gasoline and fine lubricants. For wherever you see Signal's yellow and black circle sign, there you'll also find complete Signal service and accessories to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. And now, back to the Whistler. Yes, Alfred, poison is quicker, quick enough to kill you while that uniformed figure still rang your doorbell. The cat and mouse game is over. The moment you saw his vague form coming up the walk through the fog, you knew that giant paw was descending on you. The police had come for you at last. So now you lie dead in a huddled heap in your little kitchen, while Molly Applegate, aroused by Henry Small's outcry, and Henry talk to the newcomer about you. Terrible, terrible. How soon do you think the police will get here? Sergeant Jellyby ought to be here at any time now. Not that he can do anything nobody can now. What made him do it? (sighs) Well, mate, the minute he saw you, he makes a dash for the kitchen. By the time I realized something was up, it was too late. Oh, poor fellow. Seemed to go all to pieces after his wife died. I did what I could for him, too. Stood him a drink the other night. Ran out on me while I was telling him some yarn or the other. I must say I was wrong about him. Wrong? Well, I feel proper ashamed of myself now, but I got the idea she hadn't been a good wife to him. I tried to tell him so. Poor old chum. Ain't it funny how he jumped on the edge the minute I spotted you coming up the walk? Thought you might be bringing me a quid or two on the football pool this week. Instead, you called on old Elf. What gets me... Why does he do it just when I'm ringing the bell? What was it you had for him, Mr. Postman? A special delivery letter registered from the insurance company. It's the money from his poor wife's policy. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Leslie Edgeley, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak.
Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular program on the West Coast. Remember, let every traffic signal remind you. With new Signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, The Cistern. There was murder on Ronnie Hartfield's mind long before he discovered the cistern in Round Valley. But the discovery, more than anything else, made him decide to do it. The groundwork had been laid, of course. He was a partner with old Hank Murphy in the gold-bearing ledge Hank had discovered on the shoulder of Sharp's Peak. A million dollars in rich ore. And Ronnie owned ten percent of it. That wasn't bad for a young metallurgist fresh out of college. But Ronnie wasn't the kind to think of his own ten percent. No, his mind was on the other ninety. And the inheritance clause in the partnership agreement. There had to be other things, of course, like the casual conversation he had one afternoon with Sheriff Dawson as they sat on the porch of the sheriff's office, yes, looking yes, across I the know, lake. But that ain't what makes the law enforcement out here so much tougher than in the city. What's the first job in a murder case, for example? Find the body. Body? Yeah. Hmm, look at that lake. Look at that, Ronnie. What? The sun on that water. <laughs> If I could move that lake to the coast, I could sell it for a million dollars. <laughs> Come around sometime during a rainstorm and I'll close the deal for ten cents. Mm, why? Well, she ain't a natural lake, you know. Well, we've had to move this shack twice now when the water was right up the floor level. She ain't always as pretty as she looks now. Blue and calm and shiny. I don't know. I think it's worth it. Well, you'll be a mountaineer yet, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was I saying a while back? You were talking about law enforcement. Oh, yeah. It was this business of bodies. You can say all you want to about city police, but let me tell you they ain't in it with a county sheriff when it comes to a murder case. No. You see, before you do anything else, you gotta find the body. You gotta prove the guy's dead. No. That's one thing in the city, but it's something else in a place like this. No, what do you mean? Or down in Arizona, for instance. Where a man's got 20,000 square miles of country to hide the body in. I see. Funny thing, though, how bodies have a way of turning up. That guy in Arizona I was telling you about. Yeah? Eight years it took us, knowing all the time he'd done it. You found it, huh? Yeah. The wind uncovered it in a dry gulch ten miles from town. Dry air has a way of preserving things. You could identify it? Sure, we hung him. Hmm. But if it hadn't been for that wind... Well, it would have been something else. Sometimes it don't pay to go looking for it. If you just lean back and relax, it'll work itself out. Sometimes. Well, Ronnie, it's odd that the sheriff should have hit upon the subject of bodies. And it's a good thing he couldn't read your mind. Because everything he said made you think of the cistern in Round Valley, with the bare traces of a ruined cabin more than a hundred years old nearby. You'd been exhausted the day you found it, after following a four-point buck down the length of the ridge above and losing him there in the willows. Then, as you fought your way through the brush, your foot suddenly rang hollowly on the cover of the cistern. And there it was, deep and dark, completely lost in the tangled mass of trees. No desert wind there, was there, Ronnie? Once you dropped Hank into the cistern, he'd be there for keeps. Ronnie? Ronnie? Huh? Oh, <laughs> sorry, Hank. You know what, Hank? I think Ronnie's in love. <laughs> well, what's the matter? <laughs> I've just been talking to you for five minutes, that's all. Oh, I was thinking, I guess. Mm, just like you, Hank. Comes into my store to buy groceries and goes to sleep by the stove. <laughs> he, he's thinking about that hole in the ground. What? What's the matter? Marge knows all about the mine. Oh, yeah. You picked yourself a pretty good partner, Ronnie, if that ledge is as good as Hank said it is. Even Stephen. I got myself a good metallurgist, too. 
What with a stamping mill to be built and all. Uh, th- this ain't no pick and shovel project, you know. Gonna take money. Oh, don't worry about that. We, we got that all settled, ain't we, Ronnie? Soon as Mr. Coulter sees the plans Ronnie made up. Who's Mr. Coulter? Oh, fella down the city, old friend of mine. I'm going down below to see him next week. Alone? Yeah. Ronnie thinks he better stay around and look after things. Uh-huh. What's the matter? Don't know about Hank alone in the city with all them saloons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go on, Marge. Well, last time Hank went down for a weekend, nobody saw Hyde and Harem for six months. If we didn't know him better, we would have thought he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Better keep a close tab on him, Ronnie. <laughs> You're right. I'd better. <laughs> You're pretty close to the brink, aren't you, Ronnie? The sister was in your mind then, too. And it keeps returning more and more frequently until it excludes almost everything else. Particularly at night, when there's no sound but the crickets outside. And you can lie awake and think of the ledge. A million dollars or more in gold ore, almost on the surface. A tenth of it yours, according to the agreement. Unless, of course, something should happen to Hank. It would be all yours then, wouldn't it, Ronnie? A million dollars. And that kind of thinking always leads to the cistern in the willow thicket at Round Valley. There's no possible way they could ever discover it, is there? Finally, on the night before Hank is scheduled to leave, you make up your mind. Hank! Yeah? I just ran on to something. Uh, what? What? I want you to come with me. Well, what are you talking about? I've been up to Round Valley all day. Well, what were you doing up in that godforsaken place? I got a new outcrop, Hank. I'm sure of it. What? In Round Valley? Why, there's no gold. But there in is. The... You've got to see it before you go down to the city. Whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This ain't a joke, is I it? I tell you, there's gold up there. I'm serious. Look, it'll only take us about two hours. Tonight? Why, it's dark already. Listen, will you believe me? This can't wait. Okay, Ronnie. Let's go. up, Ronnie. I can't see where I'm going. It's not much farther. Why didn't we come up the other ridge? I don't see no sense in cutting across this infernal willow thicket. Wait up, will you? Over this way. Where are you? Can't you see the light? No. Went out of something. Ouch. Oh, these darn trees. I can't see a thing, Ronnie. Oh, doggone it. Where's the light, Ronnie? I can't keep my feet in this brush. Ronnie. Where are you? Ronnie! Ronnie! Here I am, Hank. Oh, you... <laughs> you scared me. Here's the thought... light, Hank. Huh? Thanks, I... Oh! oh. Now, the cistern... With the prologue of tonight's story, The Cistern, Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. There's an old Hindu fable about the blind men and the elephant. Being unable to see an elephant, these blind men decided to feel one to determine what an elephant is like. Well, the first blind man, happening to grasp the elephant's ear, promptly exclaimed, Why, an elephant is like a large leaf. But the second blind man, wrapping his arms around one of the elephant's huge legs, protested, Oh, no, an elephant is like a tree trunk. And the third man, feeling the elephant's tail, shouted, You're both wrong. An elephant is like a rope. Well, all three were right, but only partly right. And I'm always reminded of this story when I hear a motorist say, Signal gasoline is outstanding for quicker starting. Or another say, Signal is tops for faster pickup. Or a third, say, new signal has higher anti-knock. Now, all three are right, but only partly right. For in new signal, you get all three advantages, quicker starting, faster pickup, and higher anti-knock. But in addition, there's a bonus, a bonus of extra mileage. For because of the amazing power in signal's new super fuel that helps you get this greater efficiency, this extra performance from your motor, you actually go farther than ever. With new signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. (laughs) 
Yes, Ronnie. It took a combination of things to put the murder of Hank Murphy in your mind. The ledge on Sharp's Peak and a million dollars in raw gold. The sheriff with his idle discussion on the importance of finding the corpus delecti. Marge's contribution about your partner's habit of disappearing for months at a stretch. But most of all, it was the cistern in the willows of Round Valley. The hiding place a thousand men could hunt for without ever coming close. That was the most important thing, wasn't it, Ronnie? And it's the thing that makes you feel absolutely secure now. On the morning after you kill him, as you walk into Marge's general store. Morning, Ronnie. Hello, Marge. Ah, uh, now wait a minute. If you're going to ask me how I am, the answer is awful. Well, what's the matter? Ah, uh, coffee. No coffee. Forgot to pick it up last night. Yeah, I missed you. Missed me? Mostly Hank. He's picked up his groceries on Tuesdays and Fridays for as long as I've been here. <laughs> well, what'll it be? A pound? Yeah, that'll do. Fine. Funny thing about Hank. He's an old galoot in lots of ways, but part of him is regular as clockwork. <laughs> his drinking arm, for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and getting his grub for another. <laughs> Last night, when he didn't show up, I says to myself, there's something wrong somewhere. Uh, you say you ain't had breakfast yet? Uh, no, no. Huh. Hank's probably cussing you out for fear, waiting for his coffee at this hour. <laughs> Drunk or sober, he gets his breakfast at 7 o'clock. What do you mean? Ain't he waiting up in the cabin? No, he's gone. Huh? Yeah, he left for town this morning. Why, he wouldn't do that. Huh? What? Go off like that without... Tell me, what time did he leave? I don't know. When I woke up, he was gone. Well, that's a funny one. He swore on a stack of Bibles he'd take a package down to my niece in Sacramento. Oh, he had a few drinks. Probably forgot. Well, where'd he get the liquor? Why, I suppose he had it in the house. He didn't have a drop in the house. He told me yesterday when he came in here and tried to buy some. We were out, too. As far as I know, there wasn't a drop in town, and none come until Monday. Oh. Say, how'd he get out of town? Uh, oh, the six o'clock bus, I guess. You know, I can't help feeling there's something fishy somewhere. Huh? Why? Well, there wasn't no six o'clock bus this morning. It's still at Kramer's bar with a broken axle. Say. What? You don't suppose old Hank sprouted himself a pair of wings, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> you can't beat that old varmin. <laughs> I told you keeping a tab on him was no sin. <laughs> it's funny, though, ain't it? What? About that package for my niece. Hank never done a thing like that, long as I can remember. Forgetting that away. You know, that's not like Hank at all. Well, Ronnie, you're not whistling now as you cross the street to the bank. You keep telling yourself that Marge is an old busybody, that the rest of the town will chuckle over Hank's unceremonious departure. There's a forced self-assurance about you as you walk up to Mr. Jenkins at the teller's window. Hello, Mr. Jenkins. Hi, Ronnie. What can I do for you this morning? Ah, uh, how about $20? Okay. All right. There you are. Ten, fifteen, and five is twenty. Say, what about Hank? Huh? Ain't he supposed to leave today? Oh, he left this morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's funny. What's the matter? What do you use for money? Why, he had the money. No, he didn't. He came in here yesterday afternoon after three and told me he didn't have dime. Wanted me to open up so he could draw two hundred dollars for the trip. Well, what do you know about that? He didn't pick it up either. Pick it up? I got it for him just for closing and left it at the express office. Hmm, now, ain't that something? You couldn't have gone down without money. Maybe, maybe that's why he borrowed a hundred from me. Hmm? <laughs> That's why I came in this morning. He took all I had. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Ronnie. Are you kidding me? No, why? Hank never borrowed a dime in his life. It's kind of a legend with him. Oh, I... I suppose since I'm his partner, uh -huh, he... not Hank. Well, he didn't have much choice leaving this morning. I told him the money would be waiting at the express office. Hmm. Ain't that one for the book. Never heard tell of Hank Barron. Just not like him, that's all. <laughs> Oh. 
you're beginning to thank your lucky stars for the cistern, aren't you, Ronnie? During the next few days, the town's curiosity about Hank doesn't die down. It changes first into wonderment, then into genuine worry. There's a feeling in the air that something is wrong. It hangs over the town like a cloud. And as the days go by, you begin to notice the conversation suddenly hushed as you approach. The penetrating, curious glances. The feeling of terrible doubt. Then, just a week after Hank's disappearance, you come home to the cabin to find the sheriff waiting for you. Uh Uh-oh. Hello, Ronnie. Hello, Sheriff. What do you want? Just dropped by to say hello. Getting a mite worried about Hank. Yeah, so am I. Are you? What do you mean? Nothing. Curious, ain't it, how a man can get out of town without transportation or money? He had money. Maybe. And maybe he could have got liquored up without liquor, too. I don't know where he got that. Kind of jumpy, ain't you? Well, I'm getting sick of this talk. All all this insinuation behind my back. Nobody's insinuating, Ronnie. We're just a mite worried, that's all. I tell you, he's probably in San Francisco right now. That's just it. He ain't. Just picked up this wire from the telegraph office. Take a look. Huh? Been expecting Murphy for a week. Where is he, Coulter? Whoa. He's probably in some bar down there. No. What do you mean? He used to disappear for months at a time. You just don't know Hank. If there's money mixed up in it anywhere, there ain't a sober man in the county. You're crazy. Hank was a drunk and you know it. Was? Uh, I mean, he is. Hmm. Ain't it funny that you and I were talking about murder cases just the other day? Now, listen, here I am. Better see who it is. Hank Murphy live here? Yeah. They told me down at the hotel that the sheriff was up here. What do you want? Send him in, Ronnie. Come on in. You the sheriff? Yeah, what is it? I just happened to say something down at the hotel tonight, and they told me you might be interested. I was driving through here the other morning on my way to Sacramento. What morning? Friday. Okay. I picked up a guy on the road about six o'clock. What did he look like? Did he have on a... Just a minute, Ronnie. Tell us what he looked like, son. Oh, I'd say about 55. Kind of bald up here with gray hair and a mustache. I think he was kind of drunk. Said the bus wasn't running. Do you have a suitcase? Yeah, yeah. And I think he was wearing a black suit. I see. Six o'clock last Friday morning, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I took him down the road a ways. Let him off at the Sacramento Highway. Satisfied, Sheriff? Might be. Like I was telling you, Ronnie, sometimes it don't pay to get all worked up over these things. They have a way of solving themselves. Sometimes. Well, I better be getting home. Looks like we're in for a storm. You have a lot of time to think during the next few days, haven't you, Ronnie? With the storm pounding around your ears, forcing you to keep close to the cabin. The nervous feeling inside is almost gone now, thanks to that boy who just happened to pick up an old hitchhiker at the right moment. That was a lucky break, wasn't it? Most of the townspeople are satisfied now that Hank is off somewhere on another spree. And you finally feel it's time to call again on Mr. Jenkins at the bank. As a matter of fact, Mr. Jenkins, I'm beginning to wonder about Hank. It's been more than a week now. Yeah, it is funny. Him hitchhiking out of town that way. Listen to that. Bet we've had ten inches of rain in this storm. Lake level's up twelve feet. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me if the sheriff had to move his office again. And now, let's see, you wanted to look over the agreement between you and Hank. Yes, you see, there's a lot to be done before winter sets in. We ought to settle that business with Mr. Calder, get our materials up to the mm-hmm. site. And you're wondering if you can go ahead. Yeah. Mm. Looks as if Hank's in the driver's seat. Long as he's alive, anyway. Of course, in case of his death, you'll take a I didn't mean that. All, all I meant was we're losing a lot of sure. time. Sure. I know you didn't mean that. Well, I uh, guess you got to wait till Hank shows up, Ronnie. And put this away now. Getting kind of tired of looking at it. Sheriff was just in an hour ago asking the same question. What? Yeah. He wanted to know about the 10% and the 90% and who got what when who died. He got no right to stick his nose in my business. Funny about the sheriff. 
Seems to think this is his business now. Maybe you better go see him. That's a good idea. Well, Ronnie, kind of wet for you to be running around, ain't it? That doesn't, doesn't seem to bother you, does it, Sheriff? That lake's beginning to bother me, I'll tell you. Look at her down there, 20 feet away. That's not what I'm talking about. Well, sit down in the porch here and tell me what's eating you. Let's go inside. Nothing doing. I'm going to keep an eye on that lake. Now, what's the matter? When are you going to admit you're wrong? About Hank? Yes. Well, I'll likely admit I'm wrong on the day that Hank walks up to this porch like he used to and says, Howdy, Sheriff. Have a cigar. Trouble is, that ain't never going to happen. So I reckon I ain't never going to admit I'm wrong. That answer your question? He left town. Didn't that kid satisfy you? No. Could have been someone else. Who? Don't know. Too bad no one had a picture, eh? Don't you see what you're doing with your stupid guessing? They all think I killed him. Well? Well, what? They're right, ain't they? They're wrong, I tell you. He was gone when I woke... Now, wait a minute, Ronnie. Hank was nothing more than a hunk of clockwork. He never went off his schedule. You just didn't know him well enough. That's why I know you killed him, Ronnie. I know why, and I think I know how. But just like I told you, when it comes to finding a body, a county sheriff has a job on his hands. And, of course, we can't do nothing till we find the body. I tell you, you've got no right to Take talk... Take it easy, sir. Now, wait a minute. If you're trying to bluff me, it won't work. I ain't bluffing, Ronnie. You see, all the time you and Hank were supposed to be inside your house having a few drinks before he took off, the house was empty, wasn't it? Because you happened to be off somewheres killing him at the time. I happen to know, because I dropped by at 10 o'clock to deliver Marge's package. Don't worry, though. I can't do nothing until I find the body, and like I told you, that takes time. Oh, no. Eight years, that time in Arizona, but we got him the day after that windstorm. County sheriffs just got to have patience, you know. Matter, Ronnie? Nothing. Nothing. You're white as a sheep. What you looking at? It's nothing, I tell you. Oh, you sick? I... Uh, uh, it's all right. Oh, it's all wrong. Something's haywire somewhere. I... What are you staring at? Good Lord. Do, Why, it's... Do you, do you see, see it too? In the water. The edge of the lake. It's... It's Hank's body. No, it's not. It can't be. Come on. Let's take a look. No, no. I can't. I it's said not... come on. Well, Ronnie? It is Hank. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, with reconversion occupying the spotlight today, here are some facts I think you'll be interested in. You know, of course, the vital role that independent businessmen played in the building of America. And you know that today, more and more men are expressing a desire to get into business for themselves. But did you know that my sponsor, Signal Oil Company has for over 14 years sold its products only through independent businessmen, substantial, responsible men, who are so earnest about their business of serving the motoring public that they're willing to invest their own money in it. Naturally, signal dealers are carefully chosen for their ability and integrity, which explains why the average dealer has been with Signal Oil Company over seven years. So you see, there's a good reason why you find more conscientious, experienced men operating signal stations. And why signal dealers, with an incentive to build their own business, naturally give your car more thorough service that does help it go farther. And now, back to the Whistler. It's too much, isn't it, Ronnie? Too much after the tension of the past week. To look down at Hank's body floating at the edge of the lake right under the rail of the sheriff's porch. 
everything breaks loose at once. You're jabbering like an idiot, telling the sheriff it's impossible. Oh, don't lie to me. You found him, didn't you? You found him and brought him here. It was a plot, wasn't it? Wait a minute, Ronnie. Well, why did you have to drag it out? You knew it all the time. You just wanted to talk to me. Shut up. Listen, I, I don't have... Shut up. That's better. Now, what in thunder are you talking about? Somebody brought him here. I put him in the cistern. Cistern? In Round Valley in the Willows. Cistern in Round Valley? There ain't no such yes, thing. Yes, there is. In the Willow thicket that runs along the... Bottom. Wait a minute. Did it have a square wooden cover on it? Yeah. Huh. What's that mean? Looks like you sent Hank back to us. Special delivery, Ronnie. What? It was dry, of course, until this rainstorm. Uh, it was dry when you put him in it, wasn't it? Yeah. You see, it ain't a cistern, Ronnie. It's an underground water flume. A what? A water flume. Carries the water underground from the upper lake to this one. When she overflowed up above... The water just picked up Hank and delivered him right to my door. <laughs> like I said, Ronnie, sometimes it just don't pay a county sheriff to get all excited and go running over the hills. It pays to just lean back and wait. Sometimes. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular program on the West Coast. Remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Lucky Night.
cities are noisy, sprawling things, tentacled with streets and avenues, scarred by towers and ditches, built of shacks and mansions. They combine the beautiful and the ugly. And the people of the cities are as diverse and varied as the buildings, rich and poor, educated and ignorant. The hurrying, scuffling, pushing mob that makes a city live. They are the principles in a million stories enacted every day in the city's streets and its buildings. Here, for example, is the beginning of one story. A man running down a street in the cheap section of the city just after nightfall. He darts across a narrow street without looking... He comes to the intersection of a street and alley, just as a car turns the corner. Hey, you hit him. How bad? He's dead. What are we going to do? Two. Get out of here. Drag him in that alley. Yeah, but he's dead. That's hit and run driving. We ought to report. You heard me. Drag him in that alley and let's get out of here. Yes, the man lying dead in the alley marked the beginning of a story. A very important story to Mr. and Mrs. Craik, Albert and Carolyn. Two lovely people who run a boarding house a few blocks away. It's a vital story to them because it involves money. And anything that involves money is more important than life itself to Mr. and Mrs. Craik. And another thing, Albert. You've got to go up and see Mr. Sedgwick right this minute because he ain't paid his rent for next week. He's a new boarder, and it's best we show him right off that we ain't going to put up with back rent. Yeah, it'd be a lot better if we could get that Mr. Sedgwick out of here. I don't like the looks of him. Besides, he burns the electric too much at night. <sighs> it's getting so too honest people ain't able to run a decent, respectable place no more. Yeah. Well, anyhow, you go right up and see that, Mr. Sedgwick. And if he ain't got the money, out he goes. I don't like the way he looks at me, Caroline. Hmm? He has got a funny way of looking at people. But that ain't got nothing to do with the rent. And you tell him... Who's there? Your star boarder, Mr. Caffier. Oh, dear. Now, what does he want? Good evening, Albert. Caroline. You ain't to call us by our first names. I told you that. A friendly gesture on my part, Mr. Craig. But I didn't descend into these charming quarters of yours to discuss the amenities of nomenclature. Now, you stop that fancy talk. And don't bring that cigarette in here. Hmm? Uh, you ain't been smoking in bed now, have you? No, but it's an idea. At least the feeble glow would provide more light than the ceiling fixture. Uh, you're complaining again, and you're getting a good room and a reasonable rent. There ain't many boarding houses in the city where you're no, getting... No, you're right. There aren't many boarding houses in the city where the boarders have to race home at night to make sure they can get their evening paper. Or where the owners get up at four in the morning to steal the cream off the milk. Are you calling us thieves? No, I don't think so, Mrs. Craig. I'd have to qualify that. Sneak thieves, I should say. Well, you... Oh, no, no, stop it. Let's don't argue about it. What about the hot plate in my room? What's the matter with it? It belies its name, Mr. Craig. It is no longer a hot plate. It has become a refrigerator. You broke it. In the passage of time, sweet Caroline, mechanical and electrical appliances... Get out of order. But uh, we can't get parts, Mr. Campion. All right. Let's get to something else. The bedspread, for example. It has become one of the most exciting games I've ever played, to find a spot in the spread free from holes. It embarrasses me when I have guests. We can't afford a new one, Mr. Campion. <clears throat> we shall forget the bedspread and take up the subject of the ceiling fixture. That ain't broke. Well, not exactly, but it certainly is eccentric. It goes on and off, Mr. Craig, like a lighthouse. Though guaranteed to be untouched by human hands, yet it flashes ambitiously and energetically. Ah, you keep finding fault with everything. I am not alone. And now that I've registered my complaint, I shall retire to the damp chill of the crypt I occupy and for which I pay 68 bucks a month. If you don't like it, you can get out. That, Mrs. Craig, is a line which becomes you well. Good night. Yeah. Young puppy, for two cents I'd... Such extravagance, and from you of all people. Good night. Well, I'll never. Albert, as soon as we can, we'll put him out. Well, Carolyn, it might be hard to rent that room, and he does pay regular. Well, oh, Mr. Sedgwick. Eh? You go right up there and get the money from Mr. Sedgwick. Now, Carolyn, maybe he'll bring it down. Night ain't over yet. You're scared of him. 
I don't like the way he looks at me. We'll both go. Huh. All right. There goes that Miss Barton turning on the water again to wash her hair. Miss Barton, you close off that water good and don't use too much. <laughs> yeah, she knows all right. Her being a day behind with her rent. Mr. Sedgwick? Mr. Sedgwick! Your lovely knuckles, Caroline. You'll skin them. You keep quiet. Wouldn't you uh, rather I told you that Mr. Sedgwick went out? How do you know? He went out the front door some time ago. Now go away and stop pounding. I have work to do. <laughs> I'd like to slap that smart alecky Mr. Campion's face for him. Uh, uh, never mind, Caroline. Uh, let's go for our walk. Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Craig, you are a remarkable couple. You do take the cream from the milk, and you do read the newspapers before the boarders get home to save a couple of pennies. And now you go for your walk. Not for exercise, though. It's to save electric light bills. Every night it's the same, down the same street, past the warehouse, over to the brewery, and along the street running through the wholesale district until you finally get sleepy and turn homeward. Albert, if that smart Mr. Campion tells you that he ain't using electric light in that lampy board, he's lying. Yeah, if we could just catch him at it. He's got enough light in his room. He don't need no more lamps. It's costing us money to put up with him. That's right, Albert. <sighs> money, money, we always got troubles. Uh, wait, wait a minute. That's a man laying there. <laughs> Drunk, most likely. Yeah, that's right. Honest people have to slave for their money, and some no good like this drinks it up, and then... I don't smell no liquor. Well, maybe I'm going to look closer. Keep away from him, Albert. Maybe it's a trap. He might be a hold-up man. Carolyn, it's Mr. Sedgwick. It is. Look, what's the matter with him? He's... he's dead. Albert! <sighs> Looks like maybe he got hit by an auto. What's that? His pocket. It... it's stuffed with money. And him owing us rent. <laughs> look, Carolyn, it... It's... it's so much. Albert, what do you suppose... Shh, shh. Ain't nobody in sight. Uh, what are you thinking? Huh? Me? What are you thinking? Nothing, nothing. I ain't thinking nothing. Ain't nobody in sight. But uh, it'd be stealing. Ain't nobody in sight. Oh, Albert, it's so much money. Uh, looks... Uh, uh, probably he, he come by it bad. I never did like the way he looked. Like... Like one of them gangsters. Yeah, he wouldn't do no good with it. And he owes us rent. Yeah. It's his kind that spend it on some chorus. Yeah, you and me, we... Albert, are you going to do it? Or ain't you? Well, uh, ain't nobody watching. Ain't nobody saw him before us either. And uh, there wouldn't be no money. Albert. Carolyn, come here. Come on. I got it. With the prologue of tonight's story, Lucky Night, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. If you're a Whistler fan, you've heard me say that with new Signal gasoline, you now go farther than ever. But if you've gotten the impression that drivers interested in mileage are the chief buyers of Signal gasoline, you'll be interested in a little experiment I conducted this week at a Signal station asking customers why they preferred Signal gasoline. An engineer in a 1942 Buick told me that new signal helped him get maximum efficiency from his motor. The driver of a 1937 Ford told me that with new signal in his tank, his tired old car actually felt young again. And a traveling salesman emphasized the importance of signal's good mileage. Now, if it seems strange to you that three drivers interested in three different qualities should all find them in the same gasoline... Well, I can clear up that mystery for you in a hurry. You see, scientists, by rearranging the atoms in gasoline molecules, put amazing power into new signal gasoline. And because that power helps you get greater efficiency, extra performance from your motor, you naturally get maximum mileage. That's why, while you're enjoying its quicker starting, faster pickup, and higher anti-knock, you'll find you do go farther than ever. 
with new signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. You've taken the money from Mr. Sedgwick, Albert and Carolyn. But look, isn't someone behind you? Faster, walk faster. Just a shadow, wasn't it? But you didn't know that, Mr. and Mrs. Craig. That money is heavy in your pocket, isn't it, Albert? Faster now, both of you. Hurry home to hide the money in the mattress. Yes, in the mattress with the rest of your miser's hoard. But faster again. The memory of Mr. Sedgwick lying back there is pursuing you, and you've got to get away. Faster now, faster. Carolyn, I... Lock the door. You didn't lose it, did you, Albert? No, no, I got it right here. You got to put it in the mattress with the rest well, of Well, the... welcome uh, home. Back early, aren't you? Mr. Campion. Yes, sir. Were you expecting someone else? No, I wasn't. Hey, what have you two been doing? Running? No. Why should we be running? You might have heard the nickel I dropped upstairs. Hey, you ain't funny, Mr. Campion. I wasn't trying to be funny, Albert. Now, look, what's the matter with you two? Uh, Mr. Mr. Craig ain't feeling good. Oh, he looks a little pale around the gills. Someone chasing you? No, no, nobody chased us. Why'd you ask that? Well, from the way you dashed in here, I thought perhaps you'd robbed a bank or something like that. We're honest people. Mm, To a certain extent, yes. Are you calling us thieves again? I explained that once before tonight. But... So you two certainly do look excited. <laughs> and the only thing that could bring a flush to your careworn cheeks would be money. Perhaps left by a rich uncle? We ain't got any uncle. And that ain't no way to talk, Mr. Campion. Okay, we'll forget it. I'm going for a walk. A uh, 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 walk? Hmm? Well, sure, why not? The ceiling fixture gave up the ghost altogether a few minutes ago. Can't work anymore. Uh, which way are you walking? Hmm? Does that make any difference? Well, of course not, but uh, it's it's damp out. Yes, uh, you might catch a chill. Huh. Oh. Your solicitude is absolutely amazing. Can this be the Crakes? The same people who all through the winter dole out heat by fractions of degrees? <laughs> you, uh, you want that light fixed, don't you? Unless I am to become a mole, light would be welcome, well, yes. Well, then you go along with Mr. Crake, Mr. Campion. Aha! What's the matter? I see. See what? Mr. Craig has... What have I got? Wire. Wire to repair the ceiling fixture. If I help him, it saves the electrician's fee for you. You're always poking fun at us. Oh, no, Mrs. Craig. Well, come along, Albert. You and I shall play Steinmetz to the ceiling fixture. All right. Oh, but Mrs. Craig... Huh? I should still like to know what encounter brought you two home before sleep deadened your elfin steps and dulled those brilliant minds. Are you coming, Mr. Campion? Uh, certainly, Mr. Craig. Yeah. Certainly. Halbert, you better leave that package with me. Oh, I... I forgot. Package? What package? In his coat pocket. Albert, give it to me. I ain't gonna leave you alone with it. Uh, Mr. Campion. Uh, yes, Albert? Uh, there's wire and stuff in the cellar. You get it yourself here. Here. Uh, here's the key to the basement. What? what? Wonder of wonders. The key to the Craig cellar. And shall I find vintage 1902, or perhaps the skeletons of former boarders? You, uh... You fix the light, Mr. Campion. Uh, if there's anything you need, you can buy it tomorrow. We'll pay you for it. Numb. Absolutely numb, I am. This is the epitome of surprise. The key to the cellar, an offer of payment by the Crakes, all in one evening. You going to fix it or not? Certainly. Tomorrow may see the Crakes back in usual form. Therefore, tonight, I shall gather the golden fruits of whatever occasion this munificent uh, day. You're a fool. You mentioned package and there ain't none. I want to see how much is there. We could have counted it later. How do I know you wouldn't have took it some from yourself? Uh, you shut up and come on. We'll count it in our room. So you count the money, Mr. and Mrs. Craig. And how much is there? A hundred? Keep counting. Three hundred? Oh, much more. Five hundred, seven, a thousand. Keep counting. Perspiration is 
beading your foreheads. Your hands are damp, sticky. The bills stick to your fingers. Now you reach two thousand, three, thirty-five hundred, and you're not through yet. Keep counting, counting. Your breath hot, your eyes glazed with greed. Ah, now you finished counting. How much? Five, five thousand dollars. <laughs> And we found it. Just found it. We went for a walk and we found it. It's allowed. You wait, everybody. Oh, we're rich. We're rich. Who's Who's there? Campion. Is anything wrong? Uh, No, no. There's nothing the matter. But I thought I heard Mrs. Craig. Uh, Did you fix the light? Oh, yes. Here's the key to the cellar. Well, uh, put it under the door. Put it under the door. Shh. Keep quiet. Uh, Just uh, shove it under. Okay. But uh, are you sure there's nothing... Uh, no, just go to bed, Mr. Campion. I'm going out for a walk. If anyone calls, I'll be back in a half hour. Albert, he can't go. Maybe he'll go the way we did and see him. Uh, did you hear me? Uh, sure, sure. I, uh, 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 Mr. Campion. Yes? Hey, it's, uh, it's awful chilly out. Well, if you'll observe closely, I'm the possessor of an overcoat, a serviceable Benny. Uh, you... uh, wouldn't you like a nice cup of... Uh... Of tea. I, I beg your pardon. Well, you like tea, don't you, Mr. Campion? I don't understand. And tomorrow we'll have a new hot plate for you. Yeah, yeah maybe we can pick up one second hand. Mr. and Mrs. Craig, take a close look at me. My name is Campion. I've been living here for six months, during which time you must have seen that I am not affluent in any way. I have no influence with the governor... I know no politicians or statesmen. What little money I have, I spend for bare necessities. In short, Albert, Caroline, why are you spreading this soft soap with such a lavish hand? We're willing to let bygones be bygones. Oh? Well, thanks very much for the offer of tea. But I shall take a walk just the same. He'll go the way we did. I know he will. Forget it. Close the door. (laughs) What if he does find him? All he'll see is that Sedgwick laying in the alley. We didn't kill him. Anybody could see it was Otto that done it. Campion can't know about the money. Sedgwick was only here two days. But we got to hide it in case. Uh, In the mattress with the rest. We ain't got time. What if Mr. Campion does know about the money? What if he sees Mr. Sedgwick and comes back here? We ain't got time to open the mattress and close it again. Well, then what do we do? Put it in the fireplace until tomorrow morning. Then what? When the bank's open, you go clear over to the outer side of town. If it's a nice day, you can walk. Uh, change one of the big bills into littler ones. Yeah, you're crazy. What good's that going to do? You'll see. Now listen. Then go to another bank and put the littler bills in a bank account. We ain't got none. You can open one. Maybe do the same thing for a week until all the money is out of here. Ain't nobody knows us on the other side of town. Yeah. Yeah, I see. <laughs> well, that's a good idea. And then, when we're good and sure nobody else knows about the money, we can take it out of the banks and bring it back here, see? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's smart. That's pretty smart, Carolyn. <laughs> I bet even Mr. Smarty Pants <laughs> Campion couldn't think of nothing like that. <laughs> That's a splendid idea, Albert and Carolyn. Splendid. You hear Mr. Campion come back. Go to his room upstairs. He doesn't knock on your door. He says nothing. So you sigh with relief. But you spend a sleepless night just the same. What if he does know and guesses? Then it's morning. You leave the house, Albert. In your pocket is a hundred dollar bill. You start for a bank across town, a bank where no one knows you. You reach the bank, give the bill to one of the tellers. He looks at you hard. Is there some suspicion in his glance? Is there, Albert? But he changes the bill, and you hurry out. You start for another bank blocks away. But before you get there, a newspaper headline catches your eye. You can't read it all, but two words make you start and turn pale. Bank robbery. You read as much as you can. But your lifelong miserliness doesn't let you spend a nickel, just five cents for that paper. Then one phrase strikes your eye. Marked money. Marked money. 
Now you hurry home. The other bank is forgotten. You should take a taxi. But you don't think of it, even though fives and tens are clutched in your pocket, the dampness from your hand making them a pulpy mass. Now you're home. Safe. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Craig. Uh, I, I can't stop now, Mr. Campion. Okay, so you can't stop. Don't you want to know why this policeman is here? Policeman? Where? Using the phone down the hall. It seems our good friend Mr. Sedgwick has some shady dealings. Sedgwick? Yes, you see, there was a little incident. Well, I, I got to go to Carolyn. I, I went out to get some medicine. I'll, uh... Oh, the law will wait, Mr. Craig. The law will wait. Carolyn! Carolyn! Is, is the policeman gone, Albert? No, he ain't. I saw him coming down the street while I was looking out the window for you. Why was you gone so long, Albert? Oh, never mind that. He what? came up the stairs and he rang the bell. Uh, I couldn't answer the door. I just couldn't, Albert. So I pretended I wasn't here. Uh, then Mr. Campion came down and knocked on our door. Did he hear you? He know you was here? Well, I must have made some kind of noise because he talked to me. I didn't say nothing. Then I heard the policeman and Mr. Campion talking. You tell me what they were saying. I couldn't hear it good. I put my ear against the door, but I couldn't hear nothing but low talk. Uh, and that's what it's for. That's what it's for. What are you saying? Where's the rest of the money? Still in the fireplace. Are they going to arrest us, Albert? Are they going to arrest us for taking money from Mr. Sedgwick? The paper said it was marked. Oh. The bandits took marked money from the bank. The serial numbers was all wrote down. Now, we got it. That Mr. Sedgwick was a crook. We got to give it back. Yeah, you're crazy. Then we, we, we got to tell him we stole it off Sedgwick. We got to get rid of the money. Albert, what are you doing? Burning it. Oh, no. Albert, let go my no. arm. That, that fellow at the bank, he looked funny at me. It took me 20 minutes to get back here. He told the police before I got back. You burned it. Burned it. You shut up. Oh, no. Burn it. Up. Shut up. Oh. Albert, you didn't have to hit me. You didn't have to hit me. <laughs> That's a police. Shh, shh, shh. Quiet, quiet. That's a policeman. Now you go keep him away. The money's nearly gone. And then he can come in. Go ahead now, go ahead. Don't stand there like a fish. Go ahead. Who? Who is it? Campion with a stout minion of the law name of... His name is McCarthy. Just a couple of seconds more. Just a couple of seconds. I, uh... I ain't dressed. Oh, come, come, Mrs. Craig. It's after ten. You were up early this morning. I heard you. It's done, Carolyn. You can let him in. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Don't you be surprised if someday somebody stops you on the street and asks such questions as, what do you consider the most important qualities in gasoline? Or, why did you select the brand of motor oil you're using? The questioner will probably be from the research organization which Signal Oil Company regularly employs to find out how they can serve you better, how they can help you get more pleasure from your car. It's this policy of finding out what the motorist wants, then giving it to him, that has led to the development of ever finer signal products, including that amazing new signal gasoline that's so packed with power you can actually feel the difference and see it and hear it. Give it a try. The chances are you'll say signal gasoline has everything. For after all, new signal gasoline, like all signal products, is the answer to what you, the motoring public, have told signals research people that you want. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Albert and Carolyn, it was just too good to be true, wasn't it? You thought it was your lucky night that your good friend Mr. Sedgwick, lying dead in the alley, would turn out to be a profitable investment after all. But there were too many things you didn't know, too many strings attached to that $5,000. That's why you're relieved now as you watch the last of it smolder in the grate after admitting Officer McCarthy and Mr. Campion. Uh, what's that, officer? What about Mr. Sedgwick? Well, when we found his body lying there in the alley, we had to find out where he was staying. That's why I'm here. You say he's been living here? Only for two days. Uh, we didn't know nothing about him. Sure, to no honest folks would. Him with a record a yard long and more aliases than you can shake a stick at. Uh, as soon as I read about the bank robbery, I said to Carolyn, that Sedgwick is the kind of a man who looks like a robber. Sedgwick? Robber? Is that right, McCarthy? Lord, no. Small stuff with Sedgwick's line. Sneak thieving. 
The bank robbery's been cleared up and all the money's recovered. No, that's not right. It's in all the morning papers. The Crakes never buy newspapers, McCarthy. Papers cost a nickel. But I read, I saw... Uh, Did you read the paper? Well, I couldn't read it all, only what I could see. A typical Crake action. Peek over and read as much as possible on the newsstand or over a shoulder. But Sedgwick, he he had $5,000. He... $5,000? How do you know? He had it. We know. Not a penny on him when we found him. Oh, oh, that night you came in, excited, out of breath. Oh, no, I can't believe... Oh, no, this is too much. McCarthy, Sedgwick was a sneak thief. He was. Albert. Eh? Uh. Caroline. Eh? Uh-huh. Did you keep money in your room here? Did you? Oh, the mattress! It's been split open! You! You burned our own money, you fool! You burned our own money! What's she talking about? Briefly, McCarthy, poetic justice. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Russell Hughes, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular program on the West Coast. Remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, Miracle on 49th Street. No one knew better than Eddie Steckles that it would take a miracle to save him this time. He'd been up on murder counts before, but this was going to be the toughest one he'd ever faced. The prosecution had drawn all the high cards. His old friend, District Attorney Matthews, had sworn to get him. And Matthews would never let this one slip through his fingers in a million years. 
Yes, it would take a miracle. And Eddie was smart enough to recognize it. For it was only by grace of luck and a brilliant lawyer that he was out on bail, with only two weeks until the formal indictment. But Eddie wasn't one to give up easily, even when the odds were a million to one against him. Miracles had happened before, they could happen again. Even in a place like Hardy's Drugstore on 49th Street. Even to a character like his friend Dutch. Yep. A uh, pipe to smoke, sir. Uh, doors. Here you are. Fifteen. Oh. Thank you. Let's see now, I want an evening paper. Hey. Eddie! Oh, Eddie, I thought you were tied up with the lawyer. Having a sandwich, eh? I'll have a coffee, a cup of coffee with you. Hey, hey, Clark. Yeah, well, I'll pay. Uh, cup of coffee, huh? Gosh, Eddie, I, I saw Brandon yesterday. Sure looks tough. The DA ain't kidding this time. You know, I was telling Brandon that, that you... What's the matter, Eddie? Did I say something wrong? Well, I'm sorry. I. Well, you see... Uh... Uh, I can't. <laughs> Clark, huh? Here's your coffee. Cream? Uh, uh, no, uh... Hey, there's a customer waiting over at the back counter. Oh, I see you. Uh, I'm sorry, Eddie. Always opening my big mouth in front of all the wrong people. You can take over the whiskers now. What? what? <laughs> that voice you were using. If I had to close my eyes, I'd have sworn it was someone else. <laughs> what about Brandon, Eddie? He's a good lawyer. There's a way out. You can bet he'll find it out. Find it for you. I'm sorry. I don't understand. What's the matter? Why, you're trying to kid me, are you? I'm afraid you've made a mistake. You see, my name is Oliver Littlefield. Oh, now, wait a minute. <laughs> you ain't trying to tell me. Listen, Eddie, I'm Judge. Remember me, your pal, Judge Watson? Oh, I'm happy to know you, Mr. Watson. Uh, this is rather embarrassing. You see, I am Oliver Littlefield. I don't know Eddie. I don't know you. I've never seen you before. Huh? Hey, wait a minute. Come here. Look at me. Holy cow, you're right. Why don't you sit down, Eddie? I told you it's all tied up in a hard knot. I couldn't get you out of it if you were the governor. You get two weeks, ain't Maybe. Maybe. Well, Brandon, what do you mean, Maybe. You're a $50,000 lawyer. So is the D.A., Eddie. And he's not playing for peanuts this time. He could recommit you tomorrow if he wanted to. What do you mean? I'm out on bail. Yes, today. Tomorrow you go back in if Mr. Matthews decides he has the case. And I think he has. <laughs> I'm sorry, Eddie. You're sorry. You shouldn't have shot that cop. Ah, shut up. There's got to be a way. There's got to be something. Give me a cigarette. Well, there's always one thing left. Yeah. I can run for it. Hmm. They'd be waiting for you with open arms in every city from New York to San Francisco, looking for you on every freight, pictures in all the post offices. No, you don't need a lawyer, Eddie. You need a miracle. Yeah. Eddie? Yeah. Eddie, Eddie, you'll never believe it. I can hardly believe it myself. Huh? Who is this? Dutch. I'm calling from a drugstore on 49th Street. There's a guy here, Eddie. A, a guy I sat right next to, maybe a foot away. What are you talking about? This guy. He's you, Eddie. Yeah, you drunk. Honest, honest, Eddie. I couldn't tell that guy from you if I was touching noises. I, I never seen anything like it in all my life. All right, so what? Is that all you called me for? Well, I... Yeah, uh... shut up. I'm busy enough without having you blubber on the other end of a telephone line. So the guy looks like me, so what? Uh... matter, Eddie? Nothing. Dutch. Dutch. Yeah. Tell that guy. Don't let him out of your sight. But, Ed... He's still there, ain't he? Yeah, but why? Never mind why. Tell him. Follow him home. Then get back here as fast as you can. Okay, Eddie. What was it, Eddie? Uh, you hear anything? No. Good. You're all through, Brandon. You can go now. Huh? You heard me beat it. I don't want to see you again. Are you crazy? Maybe. Crazy enough to think you're right, Brandon. I don't need a lawyer. I need a miracle. With the prologue of tonight's story, The Miracle on 49th Street, 
The Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. But now, with only two hours and 52 and a half minutes left of the old year, it's interesting to look back on the changes 1945 brought in a commodity we found was mighty essential to our American way of life. Gasoline. Remember, just four months ago, you A-book drivers were struggling along on only two gallons of gasoline per week. Two gallons. And as for quality, well, wartime restrictions made motors express great unhappiness in slow starts, balky pickup, and pings. But that's all changed now. Today you can again thrill to those three little words, fill her up. And when you fill her up with new signal gasoline, you're getting the finest gasoline made for motoring. In fact, new signal is really an entirely new type super fuel in which chemists actually rearrange the atoms in gasoline molecules to create amazing new power. But even this is just the beginning. For just as fast as still further advances are made in automotive or petroleum science, you will find them incorporated in an ever finer signal gasoline that will continue to merit the public preference, which has made signal grow in just 14 years from a mere handful of stations in Southern California to almost 2,000 signal dealers serving seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, back to the whistler. You're right. Your lawyer is no good to you now, with District Attorney Matthews piling up a murder case against you piece by piece like bricks in a wall. What you need is a first-class miracle, like the one Dutch ran into in the drugstore on 49th Street. A miracle in a gray tweed suit, five feet ten inches tall, 165 pounds, sitting up at the counter eating a ham sandwich. Oliver Littlefield is a miracle, isn't he, Eddie? He makes you remember the old wives' tale about there being a duplicate of everyone in the world. and makes you believe it. You're not pacing the floor anymore, are you, Eddie? After Brandon leaves, you sit quietly in the chair for a while, thinking. Then you pick up the phone and call a friend of yours. Mike Castro? Hey, Mike, this is Eddie. Yeah, I'm out on bail. Hey, listen, Mike. Got a job for you. Want to wire a joint for sound? Yeah, your dictaphones. Right. And uh, we might need some recording equipment and a 16-millimeter movie camera. You get over here in a half hour? Uh, Stanley Hotel. Okay, Mike, I'll be waiting. That was a cinch, Eddie. He lives in a little house in Wilmot, 40 minutes out of town. You get the address, Dutch? Yeah, 2224A Euclid Avenue. I'll have a little feel. Two, two, and four, a Euclid Avenue, Wilmot. What's the matter, Eddie? I'll have a little feel. I love him like a brother, Mike. I was thinking about it while I was telling him. It's quite a thing, ain't it? Yep, quite a thing. I uh, think maybe we all got the idea. A sweat? Yeah. Yep. Uh-uh. You said you couldn't tell us apart, Dutch. Uh, it ain't that. He'll talk. He's got alibis. They'll check his press. Now, ah, wait a minute. He won't talk because he'll be dead. Out in the highway somewhere. And they won't check his prints because he'll take one look at his face and write Eddie Steckles off the books as a gang murder. No, no, it won't work. I won't go for it. Why? It's crazy, that's why. Does 10,000 bucks sound crazy to you? Huh? Say it again. 10,000 bucks cash on the line. 10,000 bucks? That's a lot of dough. Yeah. Okay, now, Dutch, you and Mike work together. And the first thing you do is steal a telephone truck. Huh? One of those little green babies I use for service in residence telephones. What do you want? How do you do? Are you Mrs. Littlefield? Yes. Telephone company. Can't it check the wire? What? Why, I didn't call into... Out of the service, madam. Every so often we have to check up. You know, connections get loose, insulation wears out. Well, that's strange. This has never happened before. You don't suppose you could come back a little later, could you? I was just leaving for the afternoon. No, no, it wouldn't work, ma'am. We have orders, you see. Uh, This is 2214A, isn't it? Yes. Uh, 
Perhaps if I called in and explained... No, uh, you'd only get us in trouble. Yeah, yeah, trouble. Well, all right then. You can go on in. I'll have to leave you alone here, though. Oh, don't worry about that, ma'am. We'll find everything all right. So you want a place to rent, huh? Yeah. It's awful tough. Haven't got a thing on my books except a shack over on Acacia Street. Fifty dollars a month. It's not worth fifty cents. Uh, that the one you advertise? Two, 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 five, uh, Casey? Yeah, that's it. Backs up on you, Glad, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll take it. Look, Eddie. Out the back window here. Yeah, this is an awful dump. Yeah, but look. We're back to back with Littlefield. Mike ran the line from under the back porch to the fence and into the back bedroom. He's in there now, setting up that recording machine. Yeah, did you check on Littlefield? Sure, runs a hardware store just off the main track. No other employees. Takes an hour and a half for lunch and hangs a sign in the door. You know, regular small town operator. Uh, you can't beat that guy. I told you I love him like a brother. You think it'll work, Eddie? Just watch me. Before the week's out, I'll know more about Oliver than he knows himself. Listen, a couple of things I want you to do for me tomorrow on the way to the library. Library? Yeah. We're going to get some books on the hardware business. On the way, I want you to stop in at the Bradshaw Bureau. What's that? Uh, they put out confidential financial reports. It'll cost you 20 bucks, but get one on Littlefield. Uh, it'll tell you what his investments are, how much he owes in his house, his earnings, all that kind of stuff. They won't ask questions. Yeah, just tell him he wants to borrow a thousand bucks from you on a personal note. No, uh, where's Mike? Uh, oh, this way. Hey, how you like this broken down joint I run it, huh? It's broken down, all right. How's it, Mike? Working perfect. Close the door, Dutch. Anything but doing? Yeah, they've been going at it. Quite a wife you've picked out for yourself, Eddie. Give a listen. I simply can't understand it. Why in the world you had to close the store for two solid hours this afternoon to take three gallons of paint out to that Marsden woman? You never make deliveries for your other customers. Why, for all you know, you might have missed a $20 sale. Please don't refer to her as that Marsden woman, Cynthia. Oh. You call her by her first name. I call her Miss Marston. Well, I don't approve. I'm sorry, Cynthia. Now, put it down a minute, will you? Where are they? They're in the dining room. The microphone's under the table. What happens if they go out of their room? Just a minute. I'll show you. Uh, well, what's he doing? Nothing coming through. Probably standing in the hallway in his bathrobe. It's his old brown bathrobe, Eddie. She took the buttons off his good one in the ring her last week. Well, I suppose I might as well take my shower. There won't be any dinner until you do. And you'd better take some kerosene to those hands. They're full of green paint. Yes, dear, right away. And don't forget to clean your fingernails. All right, Cynthia, all right. But now what do you do? Watch. We faded out the dining room. Now we turn this dial up. Cynthia? Cynthia, where's the soap? You have it all figured out, haven't you, Eddie? The smart way. You're determined to make the most of a miracle on 49th Street. For the next week, you sit at the speaker, listening to the voices of Oliver and Cynthia, picked up by the efficient microphones Mike Castro has installed under tables and behind pictures in the Littlefield house. You make records and play them over and over, learning the little details Oliver and Cynthia agree on, the things they argue about practicing the inflections of Oliver's voice, absorbing his personality. Try it again, Dutch. Uh, from where? Uh, from the part about the roses. Okay. Oliver, I was talking to Mrs. Gray again today. She says we simply have to do something about those roses. They're all covered with mildew. Huh? Well, what was that, Cynthia? Oh, you weren't even listening. I said the roses are all covered with mildew. I don't know how many times I've told you to bring home some spray. And that isn't all. The snails are in the pansy beds. Uh, I'm sorry, Cynthia. I forgot it again. I'll be sure to bring some spray home tonight. <sighs> I don't know what's got into you lately. I'm getting tired of your nagging after all these years, Cynthia. That's what's got into me. All this picking and jabbing is getting on my nerves. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go to work. Why, Oliver? All right, Cynthia. I'm sorry. <clears throat> there you are, boys. 
What a day to be tied up to. Okay, here you are. Now, read me the speech about the pansy beds. Hey, pansy beds. Oh, yeah. Oh, here. Oh, you mean I got a credit on that dame again? Yeah. Oh, all right. I don't know how many times I've told you to bring some spray home. And that isn't all. The snail's out into the pansy beds. I'm sorry, Cynthia. I forgot it again. I'll be sure to bring some spray home tonight. I don't know what's got into you lately. I'm getting tired of your nagging after all these years, Cynthia. That's what's got into me. All this picking and jabbing is getting on my nerves. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go to work. Why? Oliver? All right, Cynthia, I'm sorry. Yeah, what's wrong with that? Oh, nothing. You're in the wrong racket, boss. It's perfect. Yes, Eddie, it is perfect. But you don't stop there. At every spare moment, you're studying up on the hardware business, learning the details of Oliver's financial dealings from the confidential reports Dutch brought you. And Mike has been busy, too, with a movie camera, photographing Oliver from an automobile parked across the street from the hardware store, or while he stands innocently on a street corner as Oliver hurries off to lunch. You study the pictures carefully, Eddie, capturing his walk, his nervous little mannerisms. But there's still something missing. You know practically nothing about his friends and neighbors, the people they play bridge with on Thursday nights, the members of Oliver's Lodge, the things you'll have to know about. It worries you, doesn't it, Eddie? And then all of a sudden, you get another big break. One afternoon, as you're bending over your books, Mike comes into the room. Well, Eddie, I hope you can get by on the records we already made. Why? There ain't gonna be no more. What's the matter? Machine break down? Cynthia left town last night on the 11.15 train. Going to visit her mother's. Huh? Heard Oliver telling the guy next door. Uh, Can't make records if you ain't got no one to talk to. Yeah, yeah. Tough break, huh? No, not exactly. Huh? What do you mean? Mike, did anyone except Mrs. Littlefield see you the day you came to repair the phone? Uh, no. You sure? Yeah, why? Did you find yourself a camera, a speed graphic like the newspapers use? Well, what's that got to do Could with... you find one? Yeah, sure. Okay, but... get one. And buy yourself a new suit. Huh? Tomorrow night, you're going to call on Oliver. You're from Snap, the photo magazine. And you're assigned to do a story on the typical American citizen. The average guy who lives in the suburbs. What he does in his spare time at home, who his friends are, what they do, his hobbies, the clubs he belongs to. You know, regular feature story. And the guy the committee selected as the average citizen is Oliver. Now, see here, Mr. Dickinson, I don't know... Now, whether... Mr. Littlefield, there'll be nothing to it. Well, you've come at a rather bad time. My wife is away. We can get pictures of her later, Mr. Littlefield, and, of course, you'll get the usual fee of $500. $500? Yep, I can spend the afternoon with you here on the interview, and tonight we'd like to have a little party for you. At the magazine's expense, of course. <laughs> we can invite all your friends and take pictures. You'll get yourself a lot of nice publicity. Do you a lot of good in the hardware business. How did you know I was in the hardware business? Uh, uh, we went into that before you were selected. Always check up a little before we decide. Well, um, how about it, Mr. Littlefield? Well, I don't really want publicity, but... But you could use the 500, huh? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I could. Good. I knew you'd be a sport. Now, suppose we get down to business, huh? First, I'll uh, get a list of all your relatives, where they live and what they do, that kind of stuff, and then we'll check up on your... Uh, I'm Mrs. Lake. I live down the street a few doors. 2228 Euclid, that is. Known the Littlefields, well, ever since they came here in 1927. Oliver was working for the gross department store in the hardware department, and my husband, Clem, he was in the men's ready-to-wear. My name is Barton, pastor of the Congregational Church. Oliver's been a member for more than ten years. I'm his Aunt Sarah. I guess when you get right down to it, I'm his only living blood relative. I'm... Well, there it is, Eddie. Everything you need right there in the book, complete with photographs. You were right, weren't you? 
In a matter of ten days, you've learned more about Oliver Littlefield than he knows himself. And it's none too soon. Daddy! Uh, Daddy! You, you seen the papers? What's the matter? Look. Huh? Eddie Steckles, fugitive from justice. They record your bail. When did this come out? About an hour ago. Yeah, that's okay. Where's Mike? He's coming. Did he give Oliver the 500 bucks? No, no, he stole him off. Said he'd have a check for him tonight. Yeah, the guy's getting smart. Beginning to think for himself. We better get it over with, Eddie. It, it don't look so good. Huh? But the neighborhood's full of patrol cars. Maybe somebody called a magazine over or something. Yeah, you get the jitters. Uh-huh. When Mike came out of Oliver's house tonight, he says there was a guy standing across the street that he could have swore was a plainclothes dick. Well, forget it. We gotta take a chance. It's tonight or not at all. Call Oliver and tell him we'll be around about 8 o'clock to pay him off. Which way, Eddie? Uh, take the next road to the right. That's it, up there by the sign. Uh, see here, what's this all about? I haven't done anything. Shut up, Wh Oliver. Just keep your hands up, that's all. That's better. Uh, around to the right, Dutch. How far, Eddie? Uh, anywhere along here. Uh, this okay? Yeah, sure. Come on. I know what you're going to do. You're going to kill me. Listen, let me explain. Shut up. Come on, Oliver. Eddie. Yeah, right behind you. He's all yours, Eddie. No. Please don't kill me. Hmm. Nice work, Eddie. No, Mike. Not Eddie. Oliver Littlefield, remember? The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. But first... A word about the 248 people who were killed in auto accidents over the Christmas holiday. Reports already indicate that tonight's total will be even higher. Driving conditions are not good. Cars are old. Many people are at the wheel tonight who should not be. If you don't absolutely have to go out tonight, don't. But if you must drive, take it easy. I know that with new signal gasoline in your tank, there's great temptation to step on the accelerator. But don't tonight. Keep the speed down. Keep a sharp eye on the other drivers and the pedestrians. You see, your signal dealer isn't only interested in your business. Because he's your neighbor and your friend, he's also interested in you. That's why he's asked me to bring you this message. So that one of tonight's auto accidents may not mar the happy new year, which all of us in the signal organization hope will be yours. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, Eddie. It was a miracle that sent Oliver Littlefield to you at the exact moment when you could use him best. And you knew how to make the most of it, didn't you? You've already decided what's going to happen from here on. How you'll suddenly disappear from Wilmont one fine morning without telling anyone where you're going. There'll be gossip about Oliver Littlefield finally wearying of his nagging wife. But after a month or so, it'll die down. South America, the Pacific Coast, Canada. There's lots of opportunity, isn't there, Eddie? Plenty of room for the smart ones. You abandon the car, Eddie Steckel's car, on the highway and hitch a ride back to town. Outside of a slight pinch in the shoulders, Oliver's gray tweed suit fits perfectly. Almost as well as your clothes fit him back there in the trees on that side road. It's 11 o'clock when you finally get back to 1214A Euclid Avenue and fit Oliver's key in the lock on the front door. You know, there's a light switch. Oof. The way up with the door. Yeah. Now I... Who are you? Why, Oliver, don't you know me? Oh, oh I'm sorry, of course I... Sure, you know me, Oliver. Uh, your wife wanted some work done in the garden. She called. 
in that. Oh, oh, yes. Hey, the spray. Yeah, the spray. And there was something else, Oliver. The spading. You didn't know about that, did you? Oh, see, here, I... My name's Patoli, Oliver. From headquarters. What do you mean? You didn't know about the spading she'd ordered in the back of the yard. Or you wouldn't have buried her there the day before that class. Buried her? Sure. You shouldn't have killed her with arsenic, Oliver. Too easy to find in a post-mortem. Oh. That's it, huh? Put down that gun. Yeah. Hmm. Packing a gun. <laughs> Who would have thought it of a punk like Oliver Littlefield? Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, produced by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harold Swanton and Charles Smith, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Whistler. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Treasure Hunt. If it were possible somehow to stand at some point in the distant future and look back at the life of Robert Bolton, we'd find it neatly divided into two halves, divided by a matchstick. The first half was successful. Robert was an egotist whose egomania led him to believe that because he'd given the world the ecstatic pleasure of his company for 32 years, it owed him a living in return. He lived by his wits. And because they were extraordinary wits, he managed to dodge, double in his tracks like a smart halfback avoiding tacklers, and keep one jump ahead of the law. And then one day, shortly after the train he was riding on, pulled into the little country town of Redmond, Robert, standing on the station platform, put a cigarette in his mouth and reached in his pocket for a match. The pocket was empty. He shrugged and strolled across the street to the general merchandise store, 
to buy a box. But it's $200,000 at least. That's what you've been saying ever since old Colonel Randolph died. They've been living on credit for five years. Oh, every soul in town. And I'm telling you, Gregory Mott, we ain't going to see one red cent. You mark my words. How do you know we ain't? Well, just you go back and look at them bills the Randolph sisters has got run up here. Flour and eggs and milk and everything. It's nigh on to $500. But Martha and Evie's bound to find that money any day now. Can't never tell. If I hear that again, I'll scream out loud. When we find Grandfather Randolph's $200,000, we'll pay our bills. <laughs> well, they ain't found it yet, and they ain't gonna, if you ask me. Huh. Reckon the old colonel hit it good. And that's another thing. Why'd any man hide that much money around and leave a crazy poem to tell where it was hid? Is that reasonable? Oh, I know, Lou. It's just that Martha and Evie Randolph are such nice... I know. They're ladies wearing them lace things like they was rich. I notice Martha's too much a lady to marry Sheriff Conway and get her bills paid. Maybe you ain't ask her. <laughs> Evie thinks she's too good for him, and that's why. Ain't no excuse for letting their bills run. Why, they could take in boarders. They're willing to take in boarders, but who stops over in Redmond? Well, talking about it won't get us our money. I'm just getting <coughs> tired of this whole I thing. beg your pardon. Oh, hello there, mister. Been here long? No, I just came in for a box of matches. Sure. Here you are. Thanks. Uh, you just passing through on the train? Yeah, yeah. You, uh, have a nice town here, Mr. Mott. I was on my way to Florida, but Redmond is such a charming little place. Might stay over for a while? Could be, Mr. Mott. Could be. Oh, uh, conductor? Yeah? My name's Robert Bolton. I'm in car 63, bedroom G. Would you have the porter get my baggage, please? I'm getting off here. With the prologue of tonight's story, Treasure Hunt, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But now I think you'll be interested in a letter I received after a recent Whistler broadcast in which I had told how the atoms in gasoline molecules are actually rearranged to put exciting new power into new signal gasoline. The letter read, Mr. Miller... You say they rearrange atoms in making signal gasoline. I thought atoms are the things scientists split to make atomic bombs. Well, it occurred to me that other listeners may have wondered about this, too, so I'd like to make this point clear. Splitting atoms to release atomic power is one thing, but rearranging atoms is a completely different branch of science through which some of today's most remarkable new products are being created. Take nylon hosiery, for instance. Do you know how nylon was created? Why, by rearranging atoms. And that fine new synthetic rubber for tires, it too was made by rearranging atoms. So you see, in rearranging gasoline atoms, Signal is just using the latest scientific method to put tremendously increased power into new Signal gasoline. Just another example of the alert, progressive policy of Signal Oil Company, which for 14 years has been quick to bring you every latest scientific advancement in the fine quality petroleum products wearing the name Signal. And now, back to the Whistler. Yes, Robert. That matchstick made a difference, didn't it? They laid it on the line for you while you were waiting at the counter in the store. And you're thinking it over carefully now, as you sit in the parlor of the huge old Randolph home in Redmond, making your first impression on the Randolph sisters. It took you only a minute to analyze them. Evie, ailing, suspicious, jealous of the family traditions. Martha, 45, hungry for sympathy, color, laughter... She's uh, made to order for you, isn't she, Robert? Your opening move is a triple play. You talk to Evie, your remarks are aimed at Martha, and your mind is on the $200,000 hidden by Grandfather Randall. And so you see, Miss Evie, I just had to stop in here and inquire about a room. It's, it's such a perfect place to uh, uh, finish my book. Oh, you're an author. Yes. 
I write poetry. Poetry? Oh, how beautiful. I have always considered poetry a frivolous way of expressing thoughts which might better be done in prose. I love it. Your judgment is not to be considered, Martha, but... Uh... Go on, Mr. Bolton. Well, I graduated from Harvard in 1931, and I wandered around a bit. India, China, Japan, even got as far as Tibet. Oh, how wonderful. You've really been to those places. Yes. Mr. Bolton, I am not interested in your wanderings. Oh, I'm sorry. But I've got to have some place in which to write a, a place like this, Miss Randolph, with these lovely trees, these grand old rooms with their fine floors. That mahogany staircase. Why, that's a poem in itself, Miss Randolph. A sweeping curve ascending high to end its rapture in the sky. Oh, that's William Brown. Why, yes, Miss Martha. You know his poems? He that to the voice is near, breaking from your ivory pale. Need not walk abroad to hear the delightful nightingale. I think it's so lovely. And I think we have had enough of this grammar school recitation. Yes, Evie. Mr. Bolton, you may have the room. However, I am not a well woman. Therefore... I must have it understood that should I change my mind at any time, I shall expect you to understand. M Martha? Yes, Evie? You may show Mr. Bolton to the room above the veranda. Thank you again, Miss Randolph. I'm sure that uh, my stay here will prove mutually profitable. Well... You're established in the Randolph house, Robert Bolton. But there's work to be done if there are $200,000 hidden someplace. You know Evie Randolph is shrewd, almost as clever as you are. But again, there's Martha, poor, homely, pathetically eager Martha, who hangs on your words. And you can be charming, can't you, Robert? It's not long before you've made a conquest, and such a simple one. Martha never has had such wonderful times, has she? Movies, poetry, a drive in a rented car. Oh, oh, please, Mr. Bolton, you mustn't go so fast. Why not? It's like living in another world, just flashes of the earth we know. Gone before you can see the ugliness, the gray drabness. Oh, yes, it, it is like that. Oh, oh. Oh, it's wonderful to hear you laugh, Martha. Wonderful. I... I was laughing, wasn't I? Her laughter like the bells of Eden. Oh, it's... It's all so lovely, Robert. All so lovely. Do you really mean this is the first movie you've seen in three years? I never go out much, Robert. You see, Evie... Oh, you're wonderful, Martha. So unselfish. Yes, Robert. It takes only three days. Martha is hopelessly in love with you. But you've been very careful not to make love to her, haven't you? That you've been saving for a very important moment. A moment that comes one day as you walk with Martha in the garden at the Randolph place. Robert, is, is there anything wrong? Wrong? Is, is something troubling you? Well, the book isn't going so well. Oh, is that all? But you've got to expect times when, when you think things are all wrong. You told me that yourself, Robert. Yes, but this is different, Martha. I'm... Maybe I'm a failure. Maybe people are right when they say a poet is some odd kind of a freak. But I don't feel that way. I know that, Martha. And I'm grateful. No. I'm the one who should be grateful. And I am, Robert. So grateful. You? But what for? Oh, well, because you've made me laugh. You... You brought something here that, that... I shouldn't talk like this, Robert. Why not, Martha? Well, yes. I... No, no, I won't say it. Say what, Robert? Look here, I... I... Oh. <laughs> well, for the first time in my life, I find myself unable to choose the right words. But, Martha, what, what would you say if I told you I... I loved you? Oh. Oh, please, Robert, No. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said it. But you did. You did. I'm, I'm a fool. You said it. But you can't mean it. Look at me. Look at me, Robert. I am, Martha. There's nothing for you to fall in love with. I'm ugly, Robert. Ugly. Don't say that. It's true. 
It's true, Robert. No, no, it's not. Listen to me, Martha. What is beauty if it has no soul? What is loveliness if there is no heart? That's... Robert Bolton. Martha. Oh, Robert. No, no, I shouldn't have. What have I to offer you? Nothing. You and your sister have all this, the house, the garden, money. Money? Well, Robert, dear, we have no more than you. Oh, you're, you're joking. No, my darling. No, I'm not. Abby and I have been living on credit. Everyone thinks we'll find Grandfather Randolph's money. Money? There is money? Well, I don't believe it, but Evie does. She's looked for it so many times. Oh, treasure hunt, huh? Yeah. You're making fun of it. Oh, no, no, dearest. But, well, things like that just don't happen, not in real life. But suppose there there was money, and we found it. Then you wouldn't have to worry about staying here with Evie. She could have the money, and we could have each other. Do you mean that, Robert? Don't you believe me, Martha? Oh, yes, Robert. But Evie would never let us have the verse. Verse? I don't understand. Well... Grandfather Randolph left the secret of the money hidden in a little verse he wrote. Evie keeps it in her room. I've only seen it once. Oh, well, that's that. But I could make a copy of it when she's asleep. She wouldn't have to know. Oh, you're clever, sweetheart. You know, I never would have thought of that. And if we find the money, we... We we... shall taste the sweets of Araby and live but for the ecstasy that life shall bring to us. That was simple, wasn't it, Robert? Having Martha suggest a plan herself was clever. She doesn't suspect a thing. Poor, homely Martha, who doesn't know you're going to leave the moment you find the money. And the same night, she brings you a piece of paper. Here it is, Robert. Are you sure Evie is? Evie is asleep. I left her medicine on the table by her bed so she doesn't have to call me. Ah, You are clever, my darling. Now, now, let me see the verse. Oh, here it is. Oh, When the bishop's mitre points to three, then a shadow long you'll see. Four steps left and two steps right. Careful now, you'll need the light. Oh, it it sounds crazy. Just just a minute. Bishop's mitre. Bishop's mitre. I look, that the chest uh, the chest table in the corner. Has it ever been moved? Oh no. Evie wouldn't allow anything to be moved. Then where are the chessmen? In the drawer of the chess table. Oh, good. Well, why are you setting up the chess table? You'll see. Now, now, which bishop? There are four. And one has to point to three. To three. All of them point up to the ceiling now, but if we... If we lay them on their sides, then... Look! This black queen's bishop, it points to the grandfather's clock on the other side of the room. And if you point it to three... That's it. The bishop's mitre points to three. Martha! It's Evie. She woke up. You, you, you better go. We'll continue this tomorrow night. Go ahead. She won't wake up tonight, will she? Oh, I don't know, Robert. But did you figure out... I think out... so, now. The bishop's mitre points to three. Then a shadow long you'll see. Shadow. Let's, let's look outside. At three o'clock, the shadow of that elm tree would be... Come on. You're so wonderful, Robert. It's all so simple now. Four steps left. Then two steps right. And right in front of the old cooling shed. And the next line reads, Careful now, you'll need a light. Martha! That means we'll need a light to see inside the cooling shed. That's it. The money is in the cooling shed. It is. It is. But uh, uh, we just don't have a light now, do we? We'll have to wait until tomorrow night. Well, I can get a lantern. No, no, Martha, darling. We'll wait until tomorrow night. But why? Can't we tell Evie now? You're not going to tell Evie until we get the money, do you hear? I... All right, Robert. Anything you say. Of course, Robert. Wait until tomorrow night. Then you'll plan to sneak outside without Martha. And you needed time to pack, didn't you? Get ready to leave suddenly with the money and without Martha. So the next day you sit in the garden smoking a cigarette, smiling to yourself. 
thinking how easy it was. Then suddenly... Howdy, Mr. Bolton. Oh, hello, Sheriff Conway. You know me, huh? Why, of course. You've been pointed out to me. In addition, the star glittering on your vest is in itself a monumental advertisement. Yep. Mind if I sit down a mic? Why, certainly not, Sheriff. Make yourself at home. Uh, did you come here just to sit in the sun, or do you have something more important on your mind? Well, Bolton, I ain't one to beat around the bush. There's some talk going around about you and Miss Martha. Really? What harm is there in that? Well, you're a young man, handsome. <laughs> Thank you, Sheriff. <laughs> I didn't know you cared. I don't think you're up to any good, Bolton. Martha's good 15, 20 years older than you. Oh, and... so that's the way the wind blows, is it? Torchbearing in the provinces. You love her, don't you? Listen, I came here friendly-like, but I'm having a hard time now to keep from smashing that pretty face of yours. But you won't do it, Sheriff, because you'd look a great deal sillier and more stupid than you do now. You can't afford that, Sheriff. You're smart, ain't you, Bolton? Smart enough to know you haven't got a thing to say in this matter. Now you listen. I intend to remain here as long as I like. You're after that money. You can prove that, of course. He ha. doesn't have to. Miss Evie, you hadn't ought to come out here. Well, I it can... was thoughtful of you, Sheriff Conway, to concern yourself with our affairs, Martha's and mine. However, I am quite capable of handling this. Miss Evie, don't go getting riled up now. You're hard, Please, you know. Sheriff Conway. Mr. Bolton. Yes, Miss Evie. I gave you to understand when you came here that any time I chose to ask you to leave, you would do so. So what? Consider this your last day here. You'd better reconsider that. You heard Miss Evie Bolton. Sheriff? Yes, Miss Evie. Mr. Bolton, I'm a sick woman, but I'm not blind. My sister Martha is impressionable. She is infatuated with you, and you've done nothing to discourage her. Perhaps I love her. That's ridiculous, and you know it. Mr. Bolton, if you're not out of the house, in, in one hour... I shall ask Sheriff Conway to evict you. Martha might have something to say about that. I've already told her. You have one hour, Mr. Bolton. Well, Robert, that was a blow, wasn't it? If you leave, the money stays in the cooling shed. If you stay, the sheriff will have a field day throwing you out. Your only hope is Martha, isn't it? And you haven't much time. You sit alone in the garden thinking. And suddenly it comes to you. There is a way, isn't there? You hurry over to the little pharmacy where you and Martha bought the medicine for Evie. The clerk knows you and says nothing when you ask for a little bottle of poison to uh, kill rats. You sign the poison book and hurry back to Martha with a half hour to go. She's in the parlor playing the piano. Robert. Please, Martha, go on play. I want to remember you like this. It rather fits the mood. Please, Robert. I'll just stand here by the piano and... Oh, I... It... It's poison. Robert, what were you going to do with this? You weren't supposed to see that. Give it to me. You... You were going to kill yourself. All my life I've had cherished and loved things taken away from me. I'm tired, Martha, tired and beaten. Misunderstood by the people I love the most. Your sister. You. Not me, Robert. I swear it. Not me. You were going to stand by and let me leave, weren't you? But what could I do? Evie You me... see? I love you, Robert. I love you so much. And does that solve the problem? No. What can we do? What can I do? You could marry me. Then Evie would see that I do love you. Robert. Marry? Don't you want to, my darling? But Evie. Give me that bottle. No! No, I'll marry you, Robert! Now, today, we can go to Milltown right away. Yes, 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 anything you say, Robert. Anything you say! You don't seem to like me as a brother-in-law, Evie. I despise and loathe you, Mr. Bolton. Evie, you don't know, Robert. You don't understand him. You poor blind fool. Don't you see what he's after? But, Evie, Just he... a moment, Martha. Very well, Mr. Bolton. I suppose I have no alternative. You're quite correct. Martha, would you leave the room for a moment? What? Mr. Bolton and I have something to discuss in private. Well, 
If you say so, Evie. Be with you in a minute, dear. Yes, Robert. Now, Mr. Bolton. This is what you wanted, isn't it, Mr. Bolton? $200,000 in securities. You've got it. Of course. I've had it for ten years. The verse was simple for me, too, Mr. Bolton. I thought it was cash. Half of it is yours, of course. Shall we divide it now? No, we'll have to have them analyzed. It'll take time. It's simpler than you think, Mr. Bolton. As a matter of fact, I'd just as soon you had them all. What are you talking about? Here you are. Take them. Well, I uh, can't say I expected this. I'm not being generous, Mr. Bolton. You see, these securities have been worthless since 1929. What? Take them, Mr. Bolton, and get out. What kind of a trick is this? I said get out. You know it now. Tell the whole town about it. We defrauded them. We lived for ten years on credit because they believed the money was here. You let me marry that ugly, stupid sister of yours. She knew it all the time. She did not know it because I never told her I found them. Now get out. Get out! (laughs) Take your securities, Mr. Bolton. You've got what you came for. (laughs) Martha! Martha, come quick! Uh, Martha! Abby! Muriel! Oh, Robert, please! You! You, I hope you die! Robert! Robert, wait! What time's the train leave, clerk? Little trouble up the line. Might be late today, maybe five o'clock. You can quit worrying, Mr. Bolton. You ain't taking no trains. What do you mean, Sheriff? You ain't leaving, Redmond. No? Well, just try and stop me. Let her charge desertion. Let her charge... It ain't that, Bolton. It's murder. Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to bring you the solution to a little mystery that's puzzling a lot of drivers these days. Why are so many batteries going dead? Well, the answer is simple. Most batteries today have already seen a lot of use. And cold weather starting puts even more strain on today's tired batteries. That's why, if you don't like the experience of going out to start your car and finding your battery dead, It's just good insurance to make regular use of your signal dealer's complete battery service. He has the instruments and the know-how to determine the exact condition of your battery. If it's run down, your signal dealer has the latest equipment for charging. And if you do need a new battery, his rugged signal batteries are built to signal's own exacting specifications and guaranteed for long, long life. So stop in at your signal dealer soon you'll find he's much more than just a place to buy Signal's famous go-farther gasoline and fine lubricants. Wherever you see Signal's yellow and black circle sign, there you'll also find complete Signal service and accessories to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. And now, back to the Whistler. That one stopped you, didn't it, Robert? For once, you have nothing to say. And though you don't know it, the first half of your life, the half you lived before you reached into your pocket on the station platform at Redmond and found you were out of matches, is over. And the second half is about to begin. The sheriff refuses to explain further as you go together back to the Randolph house. He waits until you go through the door into Evie Randolph's bedroom, until you stand there staring down at her still figure on the bed. Sheriff, I swear to you I didn't. I tell you I had nothing to do with it. You bought this bottle of poison at Rigby's pharmacy. For myself, I told you. Ask Martha. I got a feeling the jury's not going to believe anything Martha says about you. They'd think she was trying to cover up for you. But I ain't telling you anything, though, am I? You likely know juries pretty well by now. Evie got that poison by mistake. Sure, when Martha took it away from you and hid it in the medicine cabinet. And that's where poor Evie found it. Sick, dazed. That's it. I knew you didn't believe I did it, Sheriff. Who says I don't? What? What are you getting at? Well, you can have your pick. You can leave Redmond. Yes. 
and face a murder charge. There's the money, the fight you had with Evie, the poison register at the store. Wait a minute, you can't do this. No. Or you can stay here and make Martha a good husband. Write poetry for her, take her writing, make her happy. And I'll forget about the other. Well? I... I won't do it. Huh? Murderers hang in this state, Bolton. All right, Sheriff. You win. And I'll be around checking up. And if you ever try to run out on her, I'll reopen the case on new evidence. And I swear before the Lord, Bolton, I'll hang you... Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Russell Hughes, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That Whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Whistler. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you With new Signal Gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. The Strange Sisters. The three Randall girls were as different from each other as day and night. Even the people of Newton who had watched them grow up found it hard to accept the fact that they were sisters. Pamela, the eldest, was forceful and overbearing, heavy-set and unattractive. Kathy, the youngest, was a weakling. Life was a little too complicated for her, and she found the easiest solution was to let Pamela face it, to bring her problems to Pamela, to listen meekly to Pamela's instructions and then to quietly obey. Yes, Pamela and Kathy were two extremes. And Sally, the third sister, was in the middle, both in age and temperament. The combination of Pamela's strength and Kathy's frailty had produced in Sally a kind of radiance that had made life easy for her, that had made her sure of success where her sisters had failed. And the more she succeeded, the harder it became for Pamela and Kathy to face it Until one morning, Mrs. Stokes, the housekeeper, called Kathy for breakfast. There was no answer. Miss Kathy, your breakfast is on the table. Oh, that girl takes a team of horses to get her out of bed. Miss Kathy! 
Your breakfast is ready, young lady, and I ain't going to keep it warm for you another moment. Miss Kathy, answer me. I know you're... Good Lord. Locked. Now, my key. Here. Miss Kathy, what are you... Gas. The heater. Oh, where's the handle? There. Miss Pamela! Miss Pamela, come up quick! Oh, the window. <coughs> there. Miss Pam? What's the matter? What's the matter with you? It's, oh, it's Kathy. She's... Oh, Miss Pamela. Yes. Uh, Miss Kathy? Miss Kathy? Here, here like me. Yes. Kathy. Kathy, dear. Yes. Let me see here. Her pulse. Mm. Oh, she's alive. Call Dr. Johnson quickly. Wait, do you think she... Don't stand there like an idiot. Call the doctor. Yes, Miss Pamela. Right away. <laughs> Hello, Pamela. Well, it's nice of you to leave your work, Sally. That's a peculiar remark to make. I think it's apropos of the moment. I don't. As usual, I suppose we disagree. Oh, where is she? In there with Dr. Johnson. Will she be all right? I don't know yet. Well, I'm going in and... Wait a minute. You're not going in there. You can't stop me, Pamela. I've got a right to know. And since you didn't choose to tell me over the phone, I'll find out for myself. I said wait. Kathy is my sister too, Pamela. She doesn't belong to you. You've had her under your thumb for so long, the poor girl can't even think for herself. All right, go on in if you want to kill her. What do you mean by that? I've managed to convince Dr. Johnson it was an accident. It was an accident. She left the gas heater on You've and... You've never been very clever, Sally. Kathy tried to kill herself. You're wrong. You're making it up. She didn't have a reason. I admit it wasn't a very good reason. But it's been used a thousand times. Go on. It's a man, Sally. And a rather shabby specimen at that. She was in love? Yes. How long has it been going on? Six months or more. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. Who is it, Pamela? Your fiancé. Henry? Why? Oh, you're wrong. You must be wrong. He never gave her any reason. He's, he's hardly even spoken to her. You asked me and I told you. Pamela, where did Kathy get the idea that Henry French was in love with her? Tell me, Pamela. Where did it come from? I don't know. You stepped into that part of her life, too, didn't you? Answer me. Oh, come now, Sally. Don't distort that pretty finishing school face of yours. It's your biggest asset, you know. It's gotten you everything you ever wanted. There's no end to what it can do. How can you be so contemptible? Maybe I was wrong. Maybe you are clever. Insinuating your way into father's confidence. Bowing and scraping. Playing the faithful daughter when he was ill. That's why father left everything to you when he died. $50,000 and two sisters to provide for, if and when you felt like it. We're your favorite charity, aren't we? That's part of the act, too. Lady Bountiful. I've heard all I want to hear, Pamela. Very well, perhaps you'd better go. I'm going to see Kathy whether you like it or not. You see, I was wrong. I'm admitting it. Oh? I was wrong in leaving you and Kathy under the same roof. I just hope it isn't too late to do anything about it. Perhaps you're forgetting it's my roof, too. As long as I choose to let you stay here, Pamela. Hmm. It's funny, isn't it, Pamela? You try to be fair. You try to do the right thing, and it all blows up in your face. Well, Dr. Johnson? I think she's going to be all right. May I see her, Doctor? Uh, she asked for Pamela. Oh, well, I'm sure if she knows I'm here. Uh, perhaps you'd better wait, Sally. She was rather specific. What do you mean, specific? She doesn't want to see you, Sally. Oh. I'll go in, Doctor. Are you going to wait, Sally? No. I'll go. I left her prescription on the dresser, Pamela. Three drops and half a glass of water every four hours. Uh, may I drop you off somewhere, Sally? Oh, thank you, Doctor. Kathy, Kathy, are you all right? No. No, I'm not all right. I'll never be all right anymore. You mustn't feel that way, dear. I made a mess of this, too. I never do things right, do I, Pam? What will... What will Henry think of me now? They only know what I told them, Kathy. They think it was an accident. Don't worry about Henry, dear. You must have been wrong, Pam. 
He doesn't love me. He couldn't. He would have told me. He wouldn't have just gone off with Sally. Well, maybe you'll believe me now, Kathy. She's capable of anything. She owns it all now. The house, the money, and now Henry French. Don't you see, Kathy? He was the only thing she didn't have. He was yours. And she made up her mind she wanted him, too. He never told Of course me. he didn't. Sally never gave him a chance. I hate her. <gasps> it's awful, Pam, but I can't help it. I hate her. So do I. What can we do? Well, well maybe you'd better rest a while now. No, no. Now tell me, Pam. What are we going to do? There's a way. Yes. There is a way. What? Kathy. Kathy, we're going to kill her. With the prologue of tonight's story, The Strange Sisters, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. You've no doubt noticed those big red and yellow billboards that tell you you now go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. Well, that's important. But unfortunately, there isn't room on those billboards to tell the equally important part of the story, the finer performance in new signal gasoline that makes this good mileage possible. Now, here's what I mean. New signals quicker starting naturally saves gas. Signals smooth, fast pickup saves gas. And signals effortless anti-knock power that sends your motor purring up the steepest hills saves gas. So you see, the features in gasoline that make driving a pleasure are the very same ones that add up to more mileage. That's why we say your speedometer is the best proof of gasoline quality. If you want the tops in performance from your car, the logical place to find it is the new super fuel that now helps you go farther than ever. New signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. Pamela, jealousy can do strange things to a mind like yours, can't it? And it's a peculiar mind, filled to the bursting point with frustrated black hatred for your sister Sally, accumulated during the long years the three of you spent under the same roof with your father. She always had everything, didn't she? You and Kathy had to take what was left and like it. Yes, Pamela, that jealous hatred has brought you to the point where you'll stop at nothing. Lying, cheating, twisting the truth in such a way that your poor, gullible sister Kathy believes the very existence of Sally condemns her to begging for crumbs at Sally's table when the bread is rightfully hers. And you've thought of everything, haven't you, Pamela? You're confident that Kathy is prepared for the talk with Sally that's bound to come sooner or later. But, Kathy, I know I'm right about Pamela. Why must you always talk about Pamela? Pamela did this if it wasn't for Pamela. Oh, stop it, will you? I tell you, Pamela's the only one in the world I can turn to. Please, Kathy, please believe me, you're wrong. I'm not wrong. You are, dear. She's filled your mind with all sorts of hateful lies about me and Henry. Why do you keep throwing that in my face? Henry, Henry, Henry. He's yours now, isn't he? You've got him. You were smart. Just like she said. All right, take him. Marry him. I don't care. Doesn't make any difference now. Kathy, apparently there's nothing I can do or say that will make any difference in the way you feel. I promised Father I'd take care of you. Well, I'm leaving you the house and all the furniture. And I'm making arrangements for a trust fund that'll provide for you both. That's charitable of you. Under the circumstances, I think it is. I'll expect you and Pamela to be civil to Henry until we leave. Is that clear? Is he coming here? Yes. To live? Yes, for a week or so. I don't understand. It's very simple. We're going to be married tonight. Yes, Pamela. Kathy was prepared, wasn't she? Sally was right. Nothing she could do or say would make any difference. Because Kathy is yours, isn't she? For too many years, she's depended on you for guidance, looked to you for advice. 
regarded everything you said as truth and everything else false. Yes, jealousy is a strange thing, Pamela. It's been there, deep inside you, for as long as you can remember. And it was convenient for you to find a cause for it. Sally and your father, the legacy, the house, the money. But that's gone now, isn't it, Pamela? Sally's been pretty fair about it. She and Henry are married now, and you have the house and your share of the money. That's what's strange about jealousy. The cause is gone, but it's still there, stronger than ever. And with it, your plan for murder. Did you get the key to their room for Mrs. Stokes? Yes. I... Here it is. She doesn't know you have it. No, she's gone to the store. I took it off the hook. Give it to me. What are you going to do? Just look around a little. Why? Henry's things are up there. He brought them in last night before they left. Well, I'm just curious, Kathy. Just curious. All right, Kathy, you can put the key back now. Did you find anything? Yes, several things. What? Kathy, I'll do the shopping tomorrow. Shopping? Pam, you never do... I'll tell you later. It seems Mr. French is a vicious man, Kathy. Perhaps you're just as well rid of him. Vicious? Of course. He must be, dear. Otherwise, why would he keep a loaded revolver in the upper drawer of his dresser? Well, Miss Pamela, what are you doing around here? Why, you ain't been in the store for six months now. Oh, I thought the walk might do me good. Well, what'll it be? A small rolled roast, please. About three pounds, perhaps. I got just the thing for you here. You ain't looking too well, if you don't mind my saying so. Something wrong? No, nothing. Oh. Yeah. Will this do? Yes, that'll be fine. It's kind of small. Oh, it'll do, Mr. Watkins. You see, Kathy and I haven't been too well lately. Uh, I, I thought so. Now, come on, what's up? I... Oh, I know I shouldn't say anything, but... I've got to talk to someone, Mr. Watkins. Gosh, is it that bad? I don't know. It's Sally and that husband of hers. Oh, you don't say. Oh, they've been quarreling dreadfully. It's been going on all morning, and I just had to get away from it somehow. It was only married night before last. You you won't say anything, will you, Mr. Watkins? Promise me. Oh, sure, sure. Well, it's about the estate. Sally told him she was going to deed part of it to Kathy and me, and he flew into the most dreadful fit of temper. I could hardly believe my eyes. Here's your sugar, Miss Pamela. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. I'm uh, I'm sure sorry about that. You you won't say anything, will you? Me? Oh, no, no. Ain't there anything you can do? Let's see now. You wanted a shampoo and a finger wave, Miss Pamela. Yes. Gosh, you know, I can hardly get my mind in my work after what you told me. Well, you, you won't say anything, will you? Oh, of course not, Miss Pamela. Not a word. You're very efficient, aren't you, Pamela? The town of Newton is like a smooth pond. All you have to do is cast a few pebbles here and there, and the ripples spread over the whole surface, clear to the edges. There's another step now, a very important one. Sally is hostile and suspicious, and you're going to need her confidence. Who is it? Pamela. Well, Pamela, may I come in? Must you? Please don't make it difficult for me, Sally. I don't understand. I have something to tell you. I'd like to come in and sit down if you don't mind. All right, Pamela. Now, I... Well, I've been doing a lot of thinking, Sally, and, and I haven't slept much. Not since you told us about the house and, and the money. Yes, it was so unexpected, I... Well, you see, it threw me a little off balance. What are you trying to say? Oh, you know me so well, Sally. The past few years have been hard, and I know I've been unreasonable and difficult. Pamela, you're trying to say you're sorry, aren't you? Oh, I... I'm so clumsy at this sort of thing. Oh, I do so want to have you and Henry forgive me. Oh, my dear. I really believe you mean it. I do, Sally, I do mean it. And I'm going to try to make Kathy understand, too. You're right, Sally. 
I've been such a terrible influence on the poor thing. Oh, Pam, darling, I'm so happy that it's working out. Oh, Sally, I... Come on now, let's forget all about it. I'm sure Henry will understand. It's odd, isn't it? I had the feeling underneath that somehow it would work out. I just knew it, Pam. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Now, you go on downstairs and tell Kathy. I've got to finish the packing. Packing? Well, but... But you're not leaving until the end of the week. Henry has to make a business trip to New York. Some things he has to settle up before we leave. What? When's he going? Tonight. He's leaving at nine. Oh, that reminds me. I must call the cab. He said to be sure to have it here for him promptly at nine. Now, you run down and tell Kathy it's all cleared up, will you? Oh, of course, Sally. Of course. <laughs> That's what I get for avoiding them. How could I have been so stupid? Oh, it's all right, Pam. Henry will be back. Oh, don't be ridiculous. He's leaving for New York tonight, and they're taking the steamer from there in four days. No, Kathy. He's not coming back. He'll send for her, and she'll meet him there. But isn't there some way? There's only one way. It's got to happen tonight. Oh, oh I'm scared. Pam, maybe... Oh, stop gibbering, Kathy. The town is ready for it, and it's going to happen. Henry French is going to shoot his wife in a fit of temper and try to leave the country. Pam, Pam, the gun. How are we going to get the gun? You see, we can't do it. We can't do it without the gun. And, and, it, and it's in his dresser and, and she's up I there. I said stop gibbering. I've got to think. Turn on the light. It's getting dark in here. Yes, Pam. There. The light. Yes. The light. That's it. The light. What is it, Pam? The basement. Kathy, the fuse box is in the basement, in the furnace room. The fuse box. You get here about six. I'll go down in the basement and unscrew a fuse. The lights will go out. You know, Henry, he'll trot down to the basement to fix it. What about Sally? I'll wait till she's downstairs. You'll be on the second floor in a room at the end of the corridor. And then, when he leaves, you can go into the room and get the gun. You can see it pretty clearly now, can't you, Pamela? The People versus Henry French, the charge murder. It's easy to think there in the basement as you wait in a dark corner after you unscrew the fuse and listen to the confusion upstairs as they stumble around in the dark. Then, as an afterthought, you find an old blown-out fuse on the shelf and screw it into place, just in case Henry might wonder how a perfectly good one could come unscrewed by itself. Then, when it's over, you return secretly to your room at the end of the second-floor corridor. Did you get it? Yes, here it is. I wore my gloves, Pam, just as you told me. All right, now listen. We haven't much time. He's down there now, waiting for the taxi. Have you got your watch on? Yes. Now, let's see. Oh, luminous dial, that's good. Now, listen carefully. The taxi is calling promptly at 9 o'clock. Understand, it's going to happen shortly after he leaves. About 5 past 9. Who's going to do it? You are. Oh, Pam. You've got to. I'll have to be upstairs. You'll be in the basement. Henry will leave in the taxi at 9, and I'll get Sally up on the second floor on some pretext. At 5 past 9, I'll scream that you've fallen down the basement stairs. She'll run down. Uh, yeah. Yes, Pam. I understand. Now, remember, not until after nine o'clock. We've got to be sure Henry is gone. All right, Pam. I'll look at my watch. I promise. Good. Now, you'd better get down there. It would be rude of me not to be there to say goodbye to him. <laughs> So the time has come, hasn't it, Pamela? Forty years of pent-up hatred is about to find release at last. For the first time in your life, you're actually cordial to Henry as you make small talk with him in the entrance hallway, and you feel a glow of satisfaction as you watch him carry his bags to the waiting taxi. Then, just as you begin to wonder why Sally isn't there to see him off, you hear a foot on the stair, and your heart stops. Sally! What's the matter? Why, the... The suitcase. You're in traveling clothes. Well, what's the matter with that? 
You're going to? Oh, that's it. I guess I'm not used to having you concerned about me, Pam. As a matter of fact, we decided just five minutes ago. I convinced Henry that walking out on his wife after four days of marriage was a pretty dirty trick. <laughs> yes, dear, I'm coming. Well, goodbye, Pamela. I'll wire you if we decide not to come back. Sally, you... You can't. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing, Sally. You watch unbelieving as she walks down the steps to the taxi cab. It failed, didn't it? Just like everything else you ever tried. Sally succeeded and you failed. There's a lump in your throat. You're all choked up with disappointment and bitter, corrosive hatred. Then suddenly, you realize there is another way. You've got to get to Kathy and tell her. You glance at the clock, 8.45. It's still safe. Then over to the basement door. Kathy! Kathy! Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to tell you about an interesting experiment I witnessed the other day. An automobile motor that had been driven 35,000 miles without taking the head off was being torn down for inspection. Ordinarily, you'd expect to find a good deal of carbon in the cylinder head and worn motor parts. But this motor was remarkably clean, free of carbon, and all parts were in excellent condition. Now, the thing which makes these results so interesting is that this motor was lubricated only with Signal 4-Star motor oil. A signal engineer who was present, however, explained to me why Signal 4-Star oil takes such good care of motors. Because of solvent refining, one of the latest and most costly developments in petroleum engineering, Signal 4-Star motor oil has three important advantages. One, forms less carbon, far less by actual test than many leading brands. Two, its tougher film clings to moving parts, protecting them from wear and sealing in power. And three, Signal 4-Star oil flows freely, instantly on coldest mornings, yet doesn't thin out when your motor is hot. In these days when motors have to last and last, your motor needs this triple protection. You can get it by making your next oil change a change to the better, a change to Signal 4-Star motor oil. And now, back to the whistler. So it didn't work out, Pamela. You're a failure, even in death. And without you, Kathy is lost. She's helpless now, cringing before the sharp questions the officers throw at her, trying futilely to lie her way out of a hopeless trap. And Sally stands there, unbelieving, as the hatred, the jealousies come to the surface for all the world to see. More questions, more stumbling answers, then still more and more, until finally... Take her away, Joe. Well, there you are, Mrs. French. I... I can't believe it. It's so fantastic. Yeah, it is at that. They knew Mr. French was leaving at nine. Planned to kill you with his gun. In the dresser drawer. That's where he kept it. Pamela was smart, Mrs. French. But she forgot one thing. The clock on the wall read 845. So she figured it was safe to open the basement door where Kathy was waiting to kill you. She forgot it was an electric clock. When she pulled the fuse down there and cut out the current, the clock lost 18 minutes. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. 
This program, produced by George W. Allen, based on a story by Bernard Girard and Zane Mann, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Whistler. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Panic. Leora had been on his mind all morning. He tried not to think of her. Tried to throw himself into the office routine. Dragged out all the things he'd set aside during the past month. Told his secretary they were going to work late. Then, by one in the afternoon, he found himself slipping. Letting his mind relax and settle on Leora again. And at three, he discovered he was dictating nonsense to his secretary. At that point, he stopped suddenly and deliberately thought of Leora. Of her leaving tonight. Walking out of his life forever. An hour later, he was hurrying out of the passport office on his way to the steamship agency. Yes, sir? Uh, I believe a Mr. and Mrs. Charles Moffat are listed on tonight's sailing. Would you check it for me, please? Of course, sir. Hmm. Midnight sailing, Baratania. Yes, here we are. Mr. and Mrs. Charles Moffat, A-deck cabin 12. Uh, Is there any space left on that ship? Well, as a matter of fact, sir, I have a cancellation right here. I'll take it. The name's Kent Buckley. That's the way it is, isn't it, Kent? You agree to be sensible, to remember that she's married to respectable, wealthy Charles Moffat, surrounded by signs that say, Keep off the grass, in big red letters. But it's always been hard for you to be reasonable where Leora's concerned, hasn't it? Yes, Kent. And it's certainly not reasonable for you to be taking the elevator to the 10th floor of the Park Lane Apartments that night at 9 o'clock. Just three hours before sailing time. And walking down the corridor to Leora's door. Kent. Leora, darling, I had to come. Charles is back in the study. You've got to go. I don't give a hang where Charles is. I just as soon have it out with him right now. I couldn't get you out of my mind. But we agreed to forget it. Did you? No. Neither did I. There's no sense to this, Kent. We're leaving in an hour. That's why I came, Leora. I'm going, too. What are you talking about? I got passage this afternoon. I'm not going to let him take you away. Oh, Kent. Kent, darling. Leora. Mm-hmm. Charles. 
Hello, Buckley. Go on upstairs, Leora. Charles, please. Get out of here, you two-timing little brat. Wait a minute, Moffat. Did you hear what I said, Leora? Get away from her. You'll find yourself an answer for this one. Charles! Charles! Stop! Don't hit him again! Oh, Oh, right! All right, Charles! Ready. The expressman's downstairs. Wait a minute. Let me think. I gotta think. Oh, Leora. Leora, please. Oh, what have I done? Ken! Ken, what have I done? Come on, you better sit down. sailing time. Three hours. We'll never get away. There's no use trying. The baggage. Wait a minute. Leora, where are the steamer trunks? In the study. Come on. Oh, it's no use. Oh, we've got a chance. Whose trunk is this? Charles. His clothes. It's big enough. Yeah. Sure. He's going in it. Come on. Help me get it open. Hello? Just a minute. It's the expressman again. Tell him to come up in five minutes. Oh. Hello? Trunks will be ready in five minutes. Here. Yes, please come up. Listen, Leora, you've got to get hold of yourself. Oh. This is going to take nerve. Yes, Ken. All right, now listen. I'm going to leave now. I'll meet you on the pier. The trunks will be sent aboard. Yes. You and I are going up the gangplank as Mr. and Mrs. Charles Moffat. They'll check. Not until later. The cabin check comes after we get to sea. Maybe not till tomorrow morning. Ken, it it's got to work. You know what happens if it doesn't? Yes, I do. All right, now listen. Your husband's going to commit suicide tonight, right after we sail. He's going over the side. If I'm right about that cabin check, if it doesn't come off till tomorrow morning... But if it does... We'll find a way somehow. I've got to go now. Remember, I'll see you on the dock. <laughs> With the prologue of tonight's story, Panic, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. You hear people say there's a reason for everything. Well, there's certainly a reason why, in just 14 years, the Signal Oil Organization has grown from a mere handful of stations in Southern California to almost 2,000 dealers, serving seven western states from Canada to Mexico. Briefly, that reason is quality of product. Fourteen years ago, it was Signal Oil Company that introduced the first guaranteed anti-knock gasoline at no extra price. And since then, Signal gasoline has been constantly improved to give you the benefit of every latest development in the automotive and petroleum industry. In today's new Signal gasoline, for instance, the atoms in gasoline molecules have actually been rearranged to create amazing new power. Power that not only helps you enjoy quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter anti-knock performance from your car, but also helps you go farther than ever on each gallon of signal. So you see, there's good reason for the swing to signal, 
Good reason for you to get acquainted soon with the friendly station in your neighborhood displaying signals, familiar yellow and black circle sign. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Kent, you know what panic is now. The blind, paralyzing terror that begins somewhere in your stomach and creeps upward towards your brain. You feel it as you stand on the dock, waiting for Leora, watching the stevedores load baggage, trying to recognize the tan, brass-bound trunk that holds the body of Charles Muffet. You've got his overcoat on, dark glasses, his hat and muffler pulled close around your face so your features are hardly visible. You stand out of the crowd, moving toward the gangplank, waiting. Five minutes. Ten. Then... Kent. Oh, Leora. Get out of sight, quickly. What's the matter? Hurry. There's no one in the freight office. Come on. What's the matter? She's here. I forgot all about her. Who's here? Alice Merton, the friend of Charles. I just saw her that I remembered. Kent, she's going too. She's on the same ship. Good Lord, where is she now? Wait a minute. Let me look. Over there. That woman in blue talking to the purser. Yeah. Oh, Kent, if she ever sees you, Richard. Wait. She's turning away. Going back to the waiting room. Looking for us, probably. If we can get to the cabin we're in, you can tell her I'm sick. Can't see anyone. Well, as soon as I can get away, I'll leave the ship by the visitor's gangplank and come back on board under my own name. Understand? I think so. All right. Let's go. Remember what I told you. I'll do the talking. Just keep calm. Seven twenty-two, right? Tickets, please. Here you are, Mr. And Mrs. Charles Moffat. A deck, cabin twelve, right? Here you are. Come on. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, uh, Mr. Moffat. Yes. Uh, I'm awfully sorry, sir. I have a note here about cabin 12. Apparently, the agent made an error. It's been sold to two parties. What do you mean? Well, uh, would cabin 60 be all right? It's on the same deck and it's double. (laughs) Yes, that'll be all right. Thanks. Thank you, sir. This way, Mr. Moffat. Right down at the end of the deck. Your hand baggage is down there now. All right, Leora. What about the purser? I don't know. It was dark. He couldn't have seen my face. Oh, here we are. Cabin 60. Oh, darn it. She's stuck again. I'm going to have to have a fix to keep telling myself. Can't. Shh. Can't look. Leora. No, darling. Mrs. Burton. Can't you hurry? This dog's gone key. Now, let me try. I'm stuck. Charles, I've been looking all over for you. Now, look out. Let me have that key here. Leora, darling, where have you been? Hello, Alice. Uh, about your trunks, Mrs. Moffat. They're on their way to the baggage room, but I can have Excuse them. me, Leora. I simply must see Charles. Uh, wait a minute. Alice, Charles is quite ill. He's he, ill? I've got to get below, Mrs. Moffat, if you'll just tell me I'll about I'll talk to you trunk. later. Well, I'm sure Charles won't mind it. Please, Alice, please. I said Charles is ill. He doesn't want to see anyone now. You understand? Why, of course. If he feels that way. Okay, I'll send the trunks to the back. I'm sorry, room. Alice. He's been very low lately. I... I'm sure you'll feel better tomorrow. Why, of course. Good night, Leora. Well, that was a close one. Oh, I've got to sit down. What about the baggage? I don't know. I couldn't hear what he was saying. Something about the baggage. We'll have to get it later. I hope they don't make the cabin check tonight. Oh. All ashore, let's go to shore. <laughs> Oh, I gotta get off. The overcoat. Oh, yeah. There. Right, now listen. Forget about the body. We'll get rid of it later. Wait until about three in the morning. Three in the morning. Check yes. the deck carefully. Yes. Then run out and scream that Charles has jumped overboard. Shoot the works, collapse everything. Oh, Scatter dear. his personal stuff around the room so it'll look like he's been here. Okay? Okay. Yes, Kent. Panic is a terrible thing, isn't it? And it's eating away at you as you leave the ship with the bon voyageurs. As you return and present your own ticket. 
Then, an hour later, after the ship is pulled out, you discover to your horror that they're making the cabin check. Who is it? Kent, open up, quick. They're making the cabin check right now. Be here in 20 minutes. we got to do it now. That man outside. What, what man? He's hung around here ever since you left. Out there by the rail. Oh. Yes. He's back again. I'll have to get rid of him. You know what to do? I think so. Good luck, darling. I'll wait till he's looking the other way. There. Now. Okay. Nice night. Oh. Oh, you, you startled me. I, I didn't see you. Sorry. Cigarette? No, thanks. I got a cigar here. Uh, Buckley is my name. Grayson. Glad to know you, Buckley. Uh-huh. First trip? Well, matter of fact, it is. Well, have a drink on it at the bar down on the next deck. <laughs> no, thanks. I don't drink. Oh. Been over the ship? Yeah. Nice tub at that. Well, I was just about to take a walk around the deck. How about joining me? Oh, you better stick around. First is collecting the tickets. Maybe afterwards, huh? Yeah, all right. Mm-hmm. Oh, there they are now. Yeah, yeah, there they are. Oh, well, what's wrong? My oh, heart. Doctor. Hey, good Lord. Purser. Purser. This man's had a heart attack. That was the only way out, wasn't it, Kent? Grayson and the purser carry you down to the ship's hospital, and the doctor examines your heart. Then leaves you to rest on the couch. You can almost see the purser now, moving closer and closer to Leora in cabin 60. There's nothing you can do except wait. And your mind takes up the rhythm of the clock. He's at cabin 20 now. 22. 24. 26. 28. 30. 32. Man on the board! 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 Man on the passengers, officers, members of the crew stand at the railings, trying to see through the blackness. And Leora's on deck now, outside the cabin, quiet, please. following instructions. Quiet. Now, Mrs. Moffat. I don't know. I don't know why he did it. He just got up all of a sudden and said he was going for a walk. I looked out the window just in time to see him climb over the railing. I see. <laughs> That's rather odd, isn't it? Leora. Leora, darling. Oh, Alice. Alice, dear, I'm so glad you're here. There was something wrong, wasn't there? That's why he acted so strangely a while ago. Uh, Pardon me, what's your name, please? Alice Merton. I'm a friend of Mr. Moffat. You would say he was acting strangely? Yes, he was ill. Yes, yes, that's it. He wasn't himself all afternoon. He he said he was ill. That's hardly a reason for suicide. Uh, I beg your pardon. Yes? Mr. Moffat had every reason for suicide. My name's Grayson. I'm one of his creditors. I see. I took passage on this ship because I suspected he was leaving the country to escape his financial obligations. Oh. What? I didn't know. Oh, well, I'm I'm sorry, Mrs. Moffat. I'd better take you down to the dispensary, Mrs. Moffat. The doctor will give you a sedative. Oh, this is there, so there, now, now. Oh. Everything is going to be all right. <laughs> Well, that's one important hurdle, isn't it, Kent? But the rest is going to be more difficult. There must be no way for anyone to connect you and Leora to link up your convenient heart attack with Charles Moffat's suicide. You have to take advantage of every moment the two of you are alone together. For example, as you are resting side by side on the beds in the ship's hospital, the doctor goes out for a moment. Did I sound convincing? Wonderful. Grayson was a blessing in disguise. We can take our time now. Yeah, three more nights. Get into Southampton in the morning of the 16th. Well, if that trunk ever gets into customs... Don't even think about it. We've got to be careful. I'm worried about Grayson. I know. Look, I'll be in the lounge tomorrow morning after breakfast reading a magazine. You can come Shh. in. Here you are, Mrs. Moffat. 
Take two tablets tonight and a glass of water. Make you sleep. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Buckley, I'm uh, awfully puzzled about your heart. Oh, it's only happened once or twice. It seems perfectly normal. Strange, isn't it? You see her again the next morning as you sit in the ship's lounge, reading a magazine, back to back with Leora and Alice Merton on the sofa behind you. I understand, dear. I know it's hard. After all, I thought as much of Charles as you did, but it's not going to help any to sit alone in your room and brood over it. I know it, Alice. I'm going to see the deck steward. Perhaps we can arrange a game of shuffleboard. I'll be right back. Ken. Grayson's been talking to the doctor. Your heart? Yeah, he's beginning to wonder, too. Check the baggage clerk. I'll send the trunk up any time I want it. Good. When? Not till we're ready. You'll have to help me. I can't lift him alone. I know it. Leora, dear, it's all arranged. The steward has it all ready for us. But Alice, I... Oh, no, no, not another word. That nice Mrs. Broderick's going to join us, and... Uh, oh, let's see. We need one more. How about this young man? Uh, I beg your pardon. Oh. Uh, how do you do? I'm Mrs. Merton. How do you do? Kent Buckley. I'd like you to meet uh, Mrs. Moffat, Mr. Buckley. Oh, how do you do? Hello. Would you like to join us in a game of shuffleboard, Mr. Buckley? Uh... Oh, I'm sorry, not quite up to it today. Uh, perhaps tomorrow. All right, tomorrow. It's a date. Good shot, Leora. Your turn, Mr. Buckley. All right, here goes. The deck watches last night. Yes. And when... uh, here comes another one, Mrs. Merton. All right. I'm just getting warmed up. We'll do it during the captain's dinner. That's on the last night. Why are we doing it? What are you waiting for? Hurry up. Oh, oh, just a second. It's our best chance. Everyone will be there. Nobody on deck. All right, here's the last one. How's that? Oh, you're too good for me. Another ten. Now, where'll I get going? Kent, I don't see why. Skip it for now. Look, leave your green purse in the dining room today at lunch. I'll pick it up. My goodness, you two seem to be old hands at this game. Oh, we just had a run of luck. Kent's never played... Oh, it's Kent, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Buckley. Oh. oh. Well, you're up, Mrs. Merton. Uh-huh. This your purse, Mrs. Moffat? Well, yes, yes, it is. A gentleman found it in the dining room. Thank you very much. Uh, here you are. Oh, thank you. Everyone will show at captain's dinner except deck watches. Get trunk to cabin by 6. Dinner starts 6.30. Watch me and leave when I do. Meet at cabin. Cat. The waiting is the worst part of it, isn't it, Kent? Sitting, wondering what she's thinking. Wondering if she'll be successful in getting the trunk to the stateroom. A whole day of waiting. Then a night and another day. You're 24 hours out of Southampton and the customs. But you were right. Your best chance is during the captain's dinner, attended by all the passengers and officers. No one to worry about except the deck watches. And you've been careful to note the exact time the watch on the after deck goes down to the galley for coffee. You're at the table in the dining salon at 6.30, seated next to your friend, Mr. Grayson, uh, the man who represents the creditor. I uh, saw you out playing shovelboard yesterday, Buckley. Yeah. Enjoy it? Yeah, great game. A little strenuous. <laughs> you don't mean that. I mean uh, for a man with a weak heart. Oh, yeah. You know, if it hadn't been for that, I might have been able to stop Moffat before he went over the side. Matter of fact, I'd intended to go into his cabin and talk things over with him. That's how I happened to be standing out there on the deck. Well, and then you had to go and pull a heart attack at exactly the right moment. <laughs> <laughs> Always pick the worst time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Almost peculiar the way it happened. Uh, have you got a cigarette? Uh, how about a cigar? No, thanks, no. Oh, I'd better get some cigarettes. I'll be right back. That's right, Kent. Make sure Leora sees you leave, then head for the cabin. 
Once the body is gone, Grayson and the whole lot of them can be as suspicious as they choose. The decks are deserted. Everything is right, isn't it, Kent? Exactly right. Is the trunk in the room? I had an awful time. He didn't want to send us out. Never mind that as a fan. Yes, it's All there. right. We can't be gone too long. Let's get going. Hurry. Don't touch the lights. I'm sorry. Okay. Where is it? It's right over there. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a question. Have you forgotten anything lately? Just anything? Well, of course, we all forget occasionally. But consider what might happen if even one part were forgotten when your car is lubricated. Excessive wear, a damaged part, and your car laid up. That's why your signal gasoline dealer never trusts to memory when he lubricates your car. Instead, he uses Signal's famous check chart, on which the maker of your car shows every lubrication point. And your signal dealer checks each point against this chart not just once, but twice. Which is why it's called Signal Double Check Lubrication. What's more, your signal dealer uses nine specialized signal lubricants. So each part will have the exact type of protection it needs for long, trouble-free service. This is just another example of the more thorough, conscientious service you get at independently operated signal stations. Another reason why your signal man is a mighty good man to know these days when you really want your car to go farther. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Kent, the panic is back again, isn't it? The blind, black panic you felt when you looked down at Charles, dead at your feet back in the apartment. The trunk with Charles' body is gone. Everything. All the planning, the careful meetings, the dodging and lying was useless. The trunk is gone. You forget about caution now as you and Leora hurry down to the baggage room on sea deck and call the clerk to the window. Clerk! Clerk! Yes, yes sir. What happened to the trunk Mrs. Moffat had sent up to her room this evening? Oh, I'm awfully sorry, sir. Well, where is it? Well, it seems... Well, come on, where is it? Perhaps the purser can explain. Excuse me, Mackay. Where is it, purser? It was in my cabin at six o'clock. It was an error on my part, Mrs. Moffat. I neglected to inform the clerk. Inform him of what? Of the fact that due to Mr. Moffat's death, we have to impound all his personal effects as a matter of form. What? I'm sorry, Mrs. Moffat. It's simply routine. What do you mean? We'll have to hold the trunk here till we arrive. But it will be available to you after its contents are examined and itemized by the authorities. Uh So, you see, really there's no reason at all to become alarmed, is there? Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico.
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Now rated by independent research, the most popular radio program on the West Coast. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Six-letter word for death. Thursday night was the climax. Every element in the marriage of George and Priscilla Haynes came to a sharp focus on that foggy Thursday night. Five years of it. Sixty months. Eighteen hundred and twenty-six days. Each adding a little pressure. Each day contributing a little more water behind the dam that was destined to give way on that Thursday night when the fog hung like a blanket over the campus of State College. George Haynes had known the marriage wouldn't work from the first. Yes, George, as far back as a month after your wedding, when you first felt the cold, sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach. And these five years have proven it. But no one but you seems to recognize it. No, George, not even Priscilla. George. George, I'm talking to you. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Priscilla. George, what's a four-letter word meaning former? Oh, please, dear, I'm awfully busy and... Just this one. Uh, you say four-letter word meaning former? Yes. Mm, let's see, uh, try erst. What? Erst, E-R-S-T. <laughs> That's a silly word. You sure? Well, you might try it and see. Hmm. E-R-S-T. <laughs> Looks funny. Now, I've got to get to this lecture for tomorrow, dear. Uh, let's see... Better open with Page's work on Cambodia. There's Angkor Wat, of course. Fundamentals first, general aspects. George. Distinction from South Chinese. Yes, of George. Course I... Yes, dear. I'm stuck again. There's a six letter word. Priscilla, for... darling. I've really got to get at this. Would you mind, oh, please? Oh, don't be a stuffed shirt, George. Just this one. All right, Priscilla. Just this one. No, George. No one seemed to recognize the real trouble. The president of State College, Dr. Dawes, didn't get it either, did he, George? There was no way to explain it to anybody. Tell me, George, what's wrong? I, I'm i afraid I don't understand, Dr. Dawes. Yeah, I'm afraid I don't either. As you know, the regions have been considering you and Larry Price as possibilities for the chairmanship of the history department. I'd put a lot of faith in you, George. Now I'm beginning to wonder. I know, I... I know my work has fallen off. What's the matter, George? Well, I, I guess it's nerves or something. Maybe you need a rest. Why don't you take Priscilla and go... No. To... I'm sorry, Dr. Dawes. I... I'd better go. Darling. 
morning. I'm glad you're home. Hello, dear. Larry tells me you've declined the faculty dinner. I told him there must be a mistake, George. Surely we're not... It's but... not a mistake, Priscilla. My work is in such bad shape that I've got to get down to business. But everyone will be there, dear. Larry and Dan and all the rest, they'll think something's the matter. But don't you see, Priscilla, my work is more important. Oh. Oh, so that's it. Your work is more important than my happiness. You don't care, do you? You just as soon wrap yourself up in those stuffy... All old right, books. all right, we'll go. I can't understand why we have to go Priscilla, through Priscilla, please! Please, please! <laughs> Larry and Ann and all the rest. They didn't get it either, did they, George? They can't understand the terror you feel when you realize Dr. Dawes is right. Your work is slipping. George Haynes, full professor of history, candidate for chairman of the department, is slipping. You feel as if you're standing at the edge of a cliff, and Priscilla, with her inane remarks, her perpetual round of afternoon teas, faculty dinners, and a thousand other distractions is easing you over the brink. Five years of it, George. Five long years. And each day, each hour, building like a tower of blocks designed to topple into ruins on that foggy Thursday night. The night Priscilla invited Larry and Ann to the house for an evening of bridge. George, of all the stupid plays, that one takes the prize. First you double them into game, and then you... Well, he wouldn't have doubled if you hadn't bid clubs, Priscilla. Oh, that had nothing to do with it. He was simply... I'm sorry, Priscilla. I, I guess I wasn't paying much attention to well. the game. Lucky for you, we're not playing for a quarter of a cent, George. That's enough, Larry. Huh? What's the matter, Anne? George is tired. Maybe we'd better go. Go? Oh, don't be ridiculous, Anne, dear. The evening's just well, started. I, uh, I really have got to admit that I am a bit bush. Nonsense. Let's see, that's 120 below the line. Uh, where's the pencil? Here, take mine. Oh, thanks. Um, 120. 700 rubber. You you are tired, aren't you, George? Oh, would you think I was awfully rude if I... Don't be silly. Of course you're being rude. <laughs> George just wants an excuse to get at those dusty old books I of his. don't mean that at all. I, I'm very tired And of... terribly stupid, according to the score here. Priscilla. Uh, Larry, that makes your total score 2,700. I'm for... talking to you, Priscilla. George, dear, let's not have another one of your scenes, shall we? That's just the trouble. There haven't been enough of them. Why, George, dear? I've kept quiet too long. That's the trouble. You can't keep quiet too long or it gets inside of oh, you. Oh, and... wait a minute. Take George. your hands off of me. George, you're making a fool of yourself. I ought to wring your neck. You know, I I believe he meant that. I I suppose I ought to feel embarrassed. We'd better go, Larry. Yeah, I guess we'd better. So the blocks toppled, didn't they, George? You've spoken your piece, told Priscilla you could wring her neck. And you almost feel as if you could, don't you? She won't speak to you now. And for the first time in five years, the house is silent. Larry and Anne have gone home to the house next to yours on Faculty Row. Outside, the fog is cool and clean. And you suddenly want to lose yourself in it, to feel it press around you and clear some of the haze out of your mind. Fifteen minutes later, you find yourself near the bell tower on the campus. Here, boy. Here. Come on. Come on. <laughs> That's a fella. <laughs> well, where'd you come from, fella? Huh? Huh? Say, looks like you ran away. Well, you're a nice dog. Yes, you yes. are. <laughs> yes, Sender. Where'd that pup go? Come here, Sender. Oh, hi. Hello. I, uh, I see his name's Cinder. Oh, thanks. He slipped his leash in the fog. Oh, Cinder's a good name for him. Black as ink. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to do much with him. only had him a couple of weeks. Well, I'm quite fond of cockers, particularly black ones. Uh, uh, may I ask you where you got him? Uh, certainly, at the Coldwater Kennels. It's about three miles from here. <laughs> there you are, boy. <laughs> well, we better run along, Senator. Uh, thanks for catching him. Not at all. Night. Good night. <laughs> Cute cocker. Cinder. Oh, 11 o'clock. Air's good. Well, better be getting back. Oh, oh 
Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see you in the fog. Here, let me help. Anne! Anne, wait a minute. Huh. That's strange. Yes, George, that was strange, wasn't it? You're sure it was Anne, as sure as you could be of anything in that fog. But why should she run from you? Why should she scream when you reached out to help her? You're puzzled as you turn and start for home, and worried. The fog takes on an ominous quality, closing in on you, causing you to hurry faster and faster as you get closer and closer to home. It's been a strange evening. The quarrel with Priscilla. Anne's terror when she ran into you. Then, ten minutes later, as you arrive back at the house and open the door, it suddenly takes on a horrible meaning. Priscilla? 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 Ted? Strangled. With the prologue of tonight's story, Six Letter Word for Death, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. A friend of mine, who was never too keen about babies, recently became a papa himself. When I dropped in the other night and found him, of all things, bathing the baby, he grinningly remarked, Well, it's different when it's your own. Well, friends, right there you have the reason why you just naturally get a different brand of service, more conscientious and more thorough, from a man who has his own money in his own business, such as your signal gasoline dealer. It's why, for instance, when a signal dealer lubricates your car, he takes no chance of forgetting some hidden part. Instead, he uses the famous signal check chart that specifies which of Signal's nine specialized lubricants each point should have. And he checks each point against the chart not just once, but twice, so not one part can be missed. Uh, incidentally, while you're having your signal man lubricate your car, don't forget what engineers of the American Petroleum Institute have proved, that every thousand miles is also time for clean motor oil. To get the best performance and longest life from your motor, be sure you get today's super quality pure paraffin base oil, Signal Four Star Motor Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. Priscilla is dead, strangled, lying on the floor by the window, a crossword puzzle and pencil beside her. For 15 seconds, all you can do is stand there, staring at her. Then, terrified, you pick up the phone. Operator, get the police, hurry! Police station, Sergeant Holland. Hello, hello. Police station, Sergeant Holland. Wait a minute. Good Lord. I've kept quiet too long. That's the trouble. You can't keep quiet too long or it gets inside you. You're making a fool of yourself. I ought to wring your neck. Got to get away. Get some air. Get out of here. Well, Professor, uh, what's the hurry? Officer Gavin. What's up? Well, well, nothing, Officer. I... Well, what's the matter? You look pretty worked up. Oh, there's Anything nothing wrong. Can... Uh, nothing at all, Officer. Good night, Captain. Hey, hey, wait a minute, Professor. Huh. That's funny. The fog, George. All you can think of is losing yourself in it, trying to erase the horrible picture of Priscilla from your mind. Gavin, the campus policeman, saw you rush blindly from the house, saw the terror on your face that came with a realization... But less than an hour after your exasperated statement at the bridge table, your wife Priscilla lies dead on the living room floor, strangled. You walk.
walk aimlessly in the fog for several minutes, trying to get a grip on yourself. And then finally you realize you can't go on this way, and you force yourself to go back to the house, back to the living room and the chair by the window. She's gone. It's like a nightmare, isn't it, George? The body's gone from its place by the living room window. Frantically, you search the house and finally discover it in the bedroom, stretched out on the floor. And uh, something new has been added, George. One of your silk neckties is tightly knotted around her neck. Well, George, it's clear now. You're being framed. The minute it takes your fumbling fingers to take off the necktie seems a year. And you can almost hear the police outside as you burn it in the stove. And then you dash next door to Larry's. Larry. Well, George. Larry, you've got to help me. I don't know what's behind it, but... What's the matter? What are you staring at? What's that in your pocket, Larry? Huh? Oh, this? Yes. <laughs> My pencil. Why? Your pencil? Yeah. What's wrong with that? Say, what's what's happened, George? Tell me. Nothing, Larry. Nothing. <laughs> need another cup of coffee, Prof. Here, let me get it. Why did he do it? What reason could he have for getting... Get ahead of yourself, Professor. You're not sure? I'm positive, Charlie. The pencil was right next to her body when I first went in. When I went back, she'd been moved, and the pencil was in Larry Price's pocket. Uh, That's pretty serious stuff. Charlie, you believe me, don't you? You don't think I... Yeah, I know. Almost makes me sick to think of it. I... I came here because I had to go somewhere. I, I, I thought that you'd. Sure, I believe you, Prof. Thanks, brother. You're in a tough spot. Yes, I, I know. What are you going to do? You mean I have a choice? Well, I don't know. You sure that campus cop recognized you when you ran out of the house? Oh, of course he did. I talked to him. Yeah, that's where you made your mistake. You should have spilled it then. I didn't know what I was doing. All I could think of was to yeah, get away. Yeah, I know. <laughs> what about an alibi? What happened after you left the house the first time? I, I just took a walk, that's all. Alone? Yes. No one saw you, huh? Well, there was Anne, of course. Larry's wife, she was... Oh, you can write that one off. Well, you think she'd deny seeing me? If it met her husband's neck, she would. Oh, but she's not the kind oh, you're do... wasting your time, I tell you. They're all the same. Wouldn't steal second in a Sunday school baseball game, but put them on the stand when their husband's in a jackpot and... Uh, no, Professor, that one's out. But there's no one else that's... Wait, wait a minute. That, that dog, huh? I saw a black cocker and talked to his owner by the bell tower. He'd remember me. Well, who is he? I don't know his name. Oh, great. But, uh, but the dog came from the cold water kennels. Oh. Did you see anyone else? No. I, after that, I started back. I, I didn't see anyone until I ran into Gavin when I left the house again. Oh. Well, that's a pretty important dog, isn't it? I, I guess it is. I'm awfully sorry. I would have telephoned, but the telephone... But the telephone was disconnected. Now, look. It's 1 a.m. in the morning, and I have no intention... Wait a minute, will you? I told you this was a matter of life and death, or we wouldn't have come. My good man, the cold water kennels deal exclusive in Cocker Spaniels. Over a hundred dogs we have. More than half of them are black. How in thunder do you expect... But he said he bought in two weeks ago. Look, we've sold 30 dogs in the last two weeks. You don't know the man's name, don't even know what he looks like. You come here and get me out of bed at 1 a.m. in the morning and expect me to make miracles with a sales record. It don't make sense. All right, Mr. Coldwater. Come on, Professor. Believe me, I'm sorry, but if you only had something else to go on... Wait a minute. The dog's name was Cinder. Does that help? Hmm. Yeah, there was a man. Wait. Call him Cinder. I remember now. Uh-huh. Who is it? Got it here. A man by the name of Morgenstern. He's new here. Staying at a Penn Hotel. Morgenstern? Let me check the register. Morgenstern? Where have I heard that name? 
Morgenstern. We had him here a couple of weeks ago. Kendrick P. Morgenstern. Yeah, yeah, I remember him now. He came in one night with a dog, and we had to tell him it wouldn't go here against the house rules. I've seen that name. I know it. You've got a forwarding address? No, no, he he just moved out. (laughs) He was kind of sore. It's three o'clock, Charlie. Yeah. Kendrick B. Morgenstern. I I remember seeing the name. It's such a funny handle. I would try and picture it. Uh, You sure you saw it? Oh, yeah. Well, was it printed or written? Maybe a maybe a sign on a on a store window. It was, it was written. I remember the K was funny. Well, it, it it was a signature then. You saw him sign his name. Sure. It was a check. That's right. He came here to cash a check this morning. Wait a minute. You sent the deposits? No, I didn't. Where is it? In the safe. And it's got his name and an address on it. I'm sorry, Mrs. Brendan. I know it's late, but we've got to find him. You say he was staying here. Well, it was funny. A nice man, Mr. Morgenstern, but odd. He come here from the hotel with his dog about uh, two weeks back. Thought the world and all of that But dog. you said he's gone now. Where is he? Well, I'm getting to that. He only took the room for two weeks, being he's due to go east tonight on the plane. East where? Well, I don't know. When? What plane? Left at midnight. But uh, come 11 o'clock, he decides to take his dog walking. Well, I don't see him for over an hour. Uh, 12.30 it was, but then the plane's gone. But then he's here. Oh, no, no, no. Left in an awful hurry. Think he was going to catch the next plane at 2 a.m. But I've called all the other lines. Haven't you a record of a canceled reservation on the midnight flight? Very well. Thank you. Something's haywire somewhere, Prof. Oh, it's useless, Charlie. Nothing else I can do. What time is it? 4.30. You better go home and get some sleep. Oh, that's okay. Gosh, Prof, I hate to give up. Well, there's one chance left. What's that? And Price. It's a slim chance, George, but it's the only one you have. After you leave Charlie, as you walk slowly through the campus toward Faculty Row, you try for the first time to think it through, to reason it out somehow. Lara's motive for killing Priscilla, Anne's terror when she ran into you, the brutal, heartless frame-up that hit you between the eyes when you went back the second time. It doesn't make sense, and you're too tired to think. Too tired to play with an impossible jigsaw puzzle. (laughs) Professor Haynes? Why, why, yes, I... Schultz, Homicide Squad. You know Mrs. Price, I believe. Hello, Anne. Hello, George. And Gavin, the campus policeman? I saw Professor Haynes earlier this evening. Nice of you to come back, Haynes. There are nine squad cars out looking for you right now. All right, I... I'm here now. What do you want? Why did you burn that necktie? Well, I, I... I didn't know that... It was used to kill your wife, Haynes. We found some of the ashes. Some of the threads were left on her neck. You tossed it in the stove, didn't you? Well, well I, I, I'd did rather... Did you burn that tie? Yes. Yes, I did. All right, Haynes. That's all we want to know. No, wait, wait a minute. You can't... I, 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 I can explain. Listen, Lieutenant, please. Anne... And you're my last chance. You, you've got to help me. Tell them. Tell them you saw me on the campus. You, you know, Anne, by the clock. You, you've got to help me, Anne. Tell them, will you? Oh, George, I... I don't know what you're talking about. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. But now, in honor of the Boy Scouts of America, our sponsor, the Signal Oil Company, has asked me to bring you a special message. What is a Boy Scout? Well, a Boy Scout is a boy who keeps himself physically fit. He avoids alcohol and tobacco. He guards his tongue from loose speech or boasting or a sacrilege. When he speaks of anyone, he tries to speak well of him. His scout good turns to someone each day make him many friends. For the way to have friends is to first be one. He always tries to be a useful citizen. He helps his community. Another big thing a scout enjoys is camping. 
There he finds fun in games or swimming, finds new friends in woods and other fellows. And there among the trees or under the silent stars or by the campfire's ruddy embers, he dreams out his great tomorrow. Those excerpts from the Scout Handbook tell you better than any words of mine why the Boy Scouts deserve your wholehearted cooperation. Tell you why. If there's a boy in your family nearing the age of 12, you could do him no better turn than to encourage his joining the Boy Scouts of America. And now, back to the whistler. So that's it, George. Anne denies it. She didn't see you. Charlie was right, wasn't he? Women are wide-eyed and righteous until the chips are down, until something close to them is at stake. Then it doesn't seem to matter. You stand there quietly, looking at her for a minute. Then your knees begin to get weak and you sit down. You wonder for a moment where Larry is and decide he's probably somewhere rehearsing the testimony he's going to use against you at the trial. Then suddenly you're too tired to wonder anything. George. Please, Anne. You don't need to say any more. Oh, I, I know it sounds ridiculous for me to say I'm sorry at a time like this. I, I should have known it was coming. It's been written all over his face for the past month. What? Who are you talking about? Larry. Perhaps I'd better explain, Mrs. Price. You see, Haynes Price was in love with your wife. Why, that's ridiculous. Oh, it's true, George. It came to a climax yesterday afternoon. She refused to go away with him. That's fantastic. It's true, George. Oh, don't you see? That's why Priscilla was so unreasonable last night. But how long? Oh, months. I thought Larry was acting strangely last night after we got home. And then, then when I saw him leave the house, I, I followed him. And... She saw the whole thing, Haynes. Good Lord. Oh, I'll... All I could think of was running. He knew I saw him and followed me across the campus. I ran into him at the bell tower, but he... Oh, he was so surprised. Well, Anne, that... I, Anne, that was I. What? Why? I thought it was Larry. That's why well, I... Of course. I... You were frightened. Well, anyway, I, I went to the police and Lieutenant Schultz came right out. Apparently, Price returned after she gave him the slip and realized his only out was to incriminate you. He moved the body, planted the necktie, and so on. But how could he expect to get away with it? He wasn't thinking very rationally, Haynes. Oh. Now, that's another thing. When Price knew the jig was up, he ran for it. Took off across the campus in the fog. We had every available man out looking for him. But it was pretty much of a needle in a haystack proposition in the fog for a while. Until we got that big break. And what was that? A little black dog. Apparently, the dog got excited when Price ran by his master and broke away and ran after Price... One of our men was attracted by the barking. All he had to do was follow the dog, and there was Price. Oh, uh, forgot to introduce our star witness, Professor. Uh, how do you do? This is the dog's owner, Mr. Morgenstern. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Robert Reif, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, 
The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Whistler. And remember... Let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Decision. Months later, when he finally got a chance to think about it clearly, he decided that if it hadn't happened so suddenly, it might not have happened at all. It was April, of course. That might have had something to do with it. The rhododendrons were blooming in Golden Gate Park, the kids playing ball on the green lawns, and spring sifting in the open window of his office on the 20th floor of the Hamilton Building. As Dr. Paul Evans sat looking at an uninspiring assortment of x-rays of Mrs. Harrison's chest cavity. Excuse me, Dr. Evans. Oh, what is it, nurse? There's a phone call from Mrs. John Cameron. Can you see her today? Is it important? She says so. Well, they all do. When am I free? Well, there's 12.30. All right, I'll see her then. But what about lunch? I'll have to skip it. Mrs. Cameron's heart is undoubtedly more important than my lunch. Yes, it could have been the way that it happened. It's startling suddenness, throwing you off balance. Or maybe it was just spring in San Francisco. But most of all, it was a black-haired girl with blue eyes, standing by the window when you looked up from your x-rays a half hour later. You remember exactly how she looked. The jersey dress with a gold belt and clip. The smart little felt hat, accenting her dark hair making you realize in a split second what was wrong with all the girls you ever knew. She must have come in while you sat at the film illuminator, looking at negative, Evidence, making notes. minor valvular lesions, plus slight enlargement. You're Dr. Evans. All uh, right, I'll be with you in just a moment. Request detailed cardiograph immediately. There we are. Please sit down. I'll get rid of this stuff. Now, you must... The... Oh, hello. How do you do? I'm Carol Cameron. Yes, I... The nurse said you were rather concerned about yourself. Oh, it's not about myself. It's... Well, it's about my... My husband. I see. John Cameron. Perhaps you've heard of him? Stocks and bonds, isn't it? Yes. Few too many, I'm afraid. Oh? He's... Well, he's been under a terrible strain recently. The night before last, he had a rather severe attack. His heart? Yes. Dr. Miles, our family physician, suggested I see you about it. Uh, where is your husband now? Oh, at, at home. In bed. Didn't Dr. Miles recommend the hospital? Oh, well, John's awfully unreasonable. He wouldn't hear of it. Insisted he'd be up and around in a day or two. That is unreasonable. You'll see him, Dr. Evans. Of course. I'll be glad to do what I can. Just like that, Paul. 
A minute or so, and she's gone. You look up, you see her. And 30 seconds later, she could ask if you'd mind going to the North Pole for her. And you'd tell her you'd be glad to. All afternoon, you try to shrug it off. Tell yourself it's fantastic. That this is the sort of thing that keeps you away from second-rate movies. But that evening, when you call on John Cameron, it's still there. Lucinda Withers, the housekeeper, is waiting outside the door after you finish your examination. Where's Mrs. Cameron, Lucinda? She went out for a moment, sir. Tell me, is it serious? I'm afraid it is. I knew it. I could see it coming on. He's like a son to me, Doctor. I've been with the family for 20 years now, since way before she came. I see. He was never like this before. What do you mean by that? She's not good for him. Worries him. Makes him nervous. Keeps him thinking about the 15 years between them. Uh, I'll have a prescription set over in the morning. I better be going now. My taxi's waiting outside. Just keep him as quiet as you can, and I'll check him again tomorrow. Very well, Doctor. Oh, Dr. Evan, just a minute. I wondered what happened to you. I was just about to go. I left instructions with the maid. How is he? And Angina pectoris. It's rather serious, I'm afraid. Oh, he hasn't been taking very good care of himself. He's got to now. I see. Must you go right away? I'm afraid I'd better. My taxi's waiting. Oh, I thought it was waiting. It doesn't seem to be there now. That's odd. I told him to wait. I didn't even pay him. Oh, I, I'd be glad to take you. I can't understand. Oh, we... the car's down at the curb. Oh, no, I couldn't. It'll only take a minute to call. Oh, please, I... please let me. It's really no trouble. All right. I'll get my coat. There you are, Doctor. Right to the door. It was awfully nice of you, Mrs. Cameron. Well, I... I guess the next thing to do is get out. Oh, just a minute. I, well, I... I want to tell you I lied about the taxi. I told him to go. Why? Because I wanted to take you home. I'm very flattered. Well, that's all. I just wanted to tell you. It happened to you, too, didn't it? Yes. There's a friend of mine, Dr. Andrews, awfully good heart man. I'm sure he'll take oh, the Oh, please. Case. Please don't do that. What else can I do? It's only going to make it worse. If oh, I... I know, but you... Well, you just can't throw away what's happened to us, can you? It'd be wrong It'd be to... wrong to do anything else, Carol. Is that what we're here for? Spend our lives looking for something that isn't fair? Then to suddenly find it? Throw it away? Please, Carol. Well... Shall we forget it? I'll... I'll be around tomorrow with the prescription. So that's the way it started, Paul. Yes, it was easy to analyze it, to list a million reasons why it was wrong. But the trouble was that... When you were all through analyzing, it was still there, stronger than ever. You visit John Cameron the next day, and the day after that. And before you know it, the days have grown into weeks. And the night you arrange to meet her secretly at that little French cafe on Washington Street leads to a lot more of them. The two of you at the little corner table, Pierre reserves especially, not saying much, just watching the flickering candles all around the room. Listening to the music. Well, it's been over a month now, Carol. Yes. Hard to realize it. Are you happy? Happy and miserable. Did you expect anything else? No. I knew it was going to be this way. Oh, it's just that I... I feel so... so helpless. I'm glad you could come tonight, Carol, because I... Because What? Because I think this is going to be the last time. I was afraid you were going to say that. Oh, don't you see how impossible it all is? We're both beating our heads against the stone wall. You're right, Carol. We are helpless. The only thing we can do is try and be square with ourselves. 
It just won't work any other way. I suppose not. He'll probably go on like this for years. He might if he's careful. Oh, it's terrible to feel this way. What way? I, well, I can't help it, Paul. I, I almost wish he'd... Oh, it's true. I never loved him, Paul. My family thought he'd be good for me. I didn't want any part of it. I know, I know. You don't have to tell me. He's unhappy. He's sick and miserable. It'll always be that way. Why should Please, he... Please, Carol. This is going to be the last time. I mean it. I think I can get Andrews on the case next week. Look at me, Carol. It's going to work out somehow. In the right way. Will you believe that? All right, Paul. If you say so. <laughs> Yes, Paul. It was the only thing to do. The honorable thing. Approved 100% by the Medical Association. But it doesn't help you sleep that night. And it doesn't help the next day when you make your regular call on John Cameron. Examine him. Find him the same. Leave his prescription bottle with Carol and go. Yes, it had to end, Paul. Because you were both beginning to think the thing that Carol almost said at the restaurant... That you both wish John would die. Then at ten o'clock that night. Hello? Dr. Evans? Yes? You must come at once, doctor. Mr. Cameron's had an attack. I'll be right over, Lucinda. Now listen carefully. There's a bottle of amyl nitrite in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. Break up a tablet and a handkerchief and make him inhale it. Is that clear? It's too late for that, doctor. I'm afraid he's dead. With the prologue of tonight's story, Decision, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But first, a word of thanks to you for a very special honor you have bestowed on The Whistler. In the most recent radio survey... The Whistler received the highest popularity rating in all radio history for a West Coast program. Not just top popularity, mind you, but by far the highest popularity rating in the entire history of West Coast shows. That's an honor never before received by any other program. An honor for which we of the cast and all signal dealers who bring you The Whistler want to thank you. For after all, we realize it's your loyalty to The Whistler that has made this honor possible. And believe me, with such an incentive, you can count on all of us to keep every performance our very best performance. So you'll continue to tune in the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Monday night. And incidentally, next time you're out driving, we also hope you'll stop at one of the friendly service stations displaying Signal's familiar yellow and black circle sign. And try that other current Signal success, the new Signal Gasoline. There's no better way to tune in top performance for your car than with that power-packed new super fuel that now helps you go farther than ever. New Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. finally happened, Paul. John Cameron is dead. But it hasn't affected you as you thought it would. There was something so sudden about it. It happened so soon after you and Carol had decided to call it off. After she'd almost said what you'd both been thinking. Yes, there's something wrong with it. It just feels wrong. That's why after you've examined him, you turn to Lucinda. Lucinda? Yes, doctor. You were here when it happened? Yes. Mrs. Cameron had given him his medicine and gone to bed. I heard him call. What happened then? He'd been violently sick. Said his throat was burning. What do you mean? That's right, sir. And he was all doubled up with cramps. Oh, you're wrong. You must be. It's the truth, sir. Did you give him anything? No. It was my night out. And I'd only just come in when all of the... I see. Excuse me a minute. Well, Paul... Don't go in there. There's nothing you can do now. 
I know. Well, it's, it's over. Carol. Oh, don't say anything, Paul. I don't want to talk about it or think about it anymore. Ever. We've got to think about it. I know. You don't have to tell me. Oh, he, he was all right this morning. Just as well as could be expected. All right, Carol. What happens now? I, I won't say any more. You know what's ahead, I guess. Of course. I'll be all right. Oh, it's just You better get to bed. You need some rest. I'll take care of everything. It's almost midnight when you get back to the office and take the prescription bottle out of your pocket. The one you took from Carol's medicine cabinet. You forget to take off your hat and overcoat as you throw a few pieces of laboratory equipment together. Dissolve the powder in water and make a test. A very simple test. Thiocyanin. I knew it. Poison. Well, Paul, it's quite a decision, isn't it? You look down at the blank death certificate on your desk until the letters burn into your brain and you can see them when you close your eyes. It's the most important decision you'll ever have to make, Paul. Is that what we're here for? To spend our lives looking for something that isn't there? Then to suddenly find it and throw it away? Two o'clock. Three. Four. All you can do is sit and stare at the desk, trying to think it through. Your medical certificate's on one wall. The Hippocratic Oath in a neat black frame on the other. Six o'clock, seven, eight. Then your nurse arrives. Why, doctor, you've been here all night? Yes, had an important case. Cameron. He's dead. Well, well, it was only a matter of time. Yes, I guess it was. You were filling out the certificate? You can fill it out for me. Death from natural causes. And Gina Pectoris, acute. Hello? Carol? Yes, Paul? I've just filled out the death certificate. Heart disease? Yes. Do you think they'll investigate? You've got to be careful, awfully careful. Oh, I will. Poison isn't easy to cover up, Carol. They'd find it in a second if they ever got suspicious, so listen. I'll send the certificate over this morning, take it to a mortuary right away, and ask for cremation. If nobody gets curious during the next week, I think we'll be safe. All right, Paul. We mustn't be seen together under any circumstances. I don't want you to even telephone me if you can possibly help it. Okay? Okay. That's all, then. Good luck, darling. <laughs> Hello, Evans. Oh, hello, Miles. How are you? A little puzzled at the moment. Thought I'd drop in for a minute. Sure, have a chair. Thanks. It's about Cameron. I've had a rather distressing experience. Oh? You know, I've been their family doctor for some time. I didn't know Mrs. Cameron before she married John some years ago. But I've always thought her a rather charming person. She seems to be. You, uh, you know her pretty well, Paul? Well, naturally, in attending her husband, I... Of course. You think she's a woman of character? I'd say so. So would I. Miss Lucinda Withers, however, seems to think she's a murderess. What does that mean? I don't know. The woman was completely confusing, a lot of rambling, disconnected remarks that seemed to imply that uh, <laughs> you and Mrs. Cameron were in love. But there was a practical reason for her requesting cremation. When Cameron had always been against it. Oh, what's wrong with that? Supposing she didn't know. I just think, Paul, that you ought to do something about Miss Withers. You know as well as I that this sort of thing can ruin you. Hello. Hello, Carol. Listen, darling. You've got to get Withers out of town. 
Yes, I know it'll make it look worse, but it's the only thing we can do. Where's her family? Idaho, good. Tell her she needs a rest, anything. I know it sounds crazy, but it's better than sitting around waiting for the axe to fall. That's it. Good luck, darling. You're walking on thin ice, Paul. You can almost hear it cracking under your feet. And it seems to be getting thinner. The funeral on Thursday, then Friday, Saturday, and Lucinda's still in town. Carol was right. It only made it worse to try and get her to leave. You're just waiting now. It's only a matter of time. And then bright and early Monday morning... Hello, Doctor. I'm Willard Stevens. How do you do? I'm afraid I don't... I'm John Cameron's cousin. Flew out from New York. I see. I have a rather delicate problem on my hands, Doctor. I hope you'll understand. I'll try to. About John's death, I had a letter from him indicating he planned to make certain changes in his will. It arrived just a day or two before he died. Does that suggest anything to you? No, I'm afraid it doesn't. You naturally ascribed his death to his heart condition. Yes, naturally. Well, I realize it would be embarrassing for me to contest your diagnosis. Uh, I'm hoping you'll work with me in... In what? Well, I had a talk with Miss Withers the night I arrived. She's a meddlesome old fool. No? Oh, how did you know? Dr. Miles told me. Does that answer your question? It answers that question. I assume you have others, then. Indeed, I have. And I'm afraid, Doctor, there's only one way to answer them. What's that? An exhumation and an autopsy. <laughs> So that's it, Paul. It's all over now but the trial. The next decision is easy, isn't it? It would be useless to try and run away. It would never lead to anything. You and Carol could never find happiness with an axe hanging over your head. So the next day, during the autopsy, you sit at home quietly in the chair by the phone, waiting for it to ring. Hello? Hello, darling. Is it over? Yes. They're waiting downstairs to take me to the coroner's office. Paul. Paul, would you do me a favor? Anything, Carol. Will you leave now? What do you mean? Oh, look. If it's going to happen, there's no reason for it happening to... to both of us. Oh, that's about the most ridiculous thing you ever said. Paul, please, please listen to me. Go with them, Carol. I'll be down there in an hour. Carol, there's only one thing in the world right now. When that's gone, I... I don't want to be here anymore. I hoped you'd say that. Keep your chin up, darling. I'll see you in an hour. Yes? I'm Paul Evans. Oh, this way. All right, Lieutenant. There he is. Just a minute, Miss Withers. Make him admit it. He's in love with her. It's been going on I for... said just a minute. What about it, Dr. Evans? It's written all over his face. All right, all right. I'm in love with Mrs. Cameron. So what? The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. But first, a question... Why do you suppose it is that almost 5,000 of today's overaged cars are dying, going out of service each day? Are they completely worn out? Definitely not. But certain vital parts are worn out which can't be replaced today. That's why signal dealers take no chance of overlooking even one part when they lubricate your car. Instead, they use Signal's famous lubrication chart, on which the maker of your car shows every lubrication point and specifies which of Signal's nine specialized oils and greases each part should have for long, trouble-free service. And to make doubly sure not a single part is missed, your Signal dealer checks each part against this chart not just once, but twice, which is why it's called Signal Double Check Lubrication. This is just another example of the more thorough, more conscientious service your car gets from an independently operated Signal station. Another reason your signal man is a mighty good man for you to know now. 
when you really want your car to go farther. And now, back to the whistler. <laughs> So you stand there, Paul, shouting to the high heavens that you're in love with Carol, with all of them clustered around you like vultures. It doesn't seem to matter anymore, does it? There's a long silence, and then the police lieutenant slowly walks over to Lucinda Winter. All right, Miss Withers. Now that we're all here, maybe you'll tell us why you tried to frame Mrs. Cameron. Why? I, I don't know what you're talking about. On April 5th, you bought 100 grains of thiocyanin at the black and white pharmacy on O'Farrell Street, right? I did no such thing. You signed Evelyn Jones on the register. That's a lie. Is this the woman, Mr. Thurston? That's the woman. I, I make a practice of remembering the faces of people who buy poison. Oh, excuse me, Lieutenant. I, I'd like to sit down. Oh, sure, Doctor. Take a chair over there. Now, Miss Withers... Why did you try to frame Mrs. Cameron? Why did you put poison in the medicine you knew she had to give him? I didn't. I didn't Don't do it. Don't lie to me. What did you do with the bottle? I didn't do anything with it. I left it in the... Oh. You did have the bottle, huh? Now, why did you try to frame Mrs. Cameron? Why did you try to frame her? She killed him. She killed him just as surely as if... As if she put the poison in the bottle instead of you. That's it, isn't it? She didn't love him. She never did. He was as good as dead. Oh, you thought you'd finish the job and hang it around her neck. I've I got to see Mrs. Cameron, Lieutenant. Where is she? In the next room, lying down. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Evans. Now, Miss Withers. We're going to take this all down right from the first. Carol. Oh, Paul. Darling, I'm a fool. I thought all the time that you'd killed him after what oh, you said. Oh, I know you had every reason. When I think how I acted after it happened, but well, I thought it was you. You gave me his prescription that morning, and... An hour after I gave it to him, he was dead. So Lucinda killed him. She thinks she did. They say they'll have a better case against her if they let her confess at first, before they tell her. Tell her what? Well, when, when you brought the new prescription that morning, the old bottle was still half full. And that's the one she put the poison in. What? That's the way it happened, Paul. You see, I used the new one the night he died. That's why I was so sure you did it. But the prescription was perfectly all right. There was oh, nothing... Of course it was. I was so sure he was poisoned. Those oh, Lucinda was lying, Paul, about the burning in his throat and the cramps. Don't you see? Then the autopsy was okay. There was no murder? They're going to charge her with attempted murder, Paul. You see, your diagnosis was correct. John died of natural causes. Angina pectoris. Acute. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And 
And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember that every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, The Whistler's strange story... Boomerang. It's been three months now since the career of the doorbell killer ended in a blaze of newspaper headlines announcing the execution. The case was a strange one. Some thought his motive was robbery. Some thought otherwise, but no one ever knew for sure. But the most important feature of the case wasn't mentioned in the headlines. It doesn't even appear in the police records or in the accounts of the trial. It will never appear anywhere. Because the only two people who know of it aren't in a position to testify. It's the story of Amy Clark and a husband named Ralph who grated on her nerves. At first, he merely bored her. But after a while, her boredom subtly changed into something more dangerous. She found herself trying to find a way to leave Ralph without leaving the comfortable home, the healthy bank account, and the insurance policy. And oddly enough, the rise to prominence of an unfortunate individual labeled the doorbell killer by the tabloids had a direct effect on Amy and her problem. It started one morning as Ralph sat at breakfast going through his usual routine with a newspaper. Give me a little more coffee, will you, honey bun? Oh, look at those headlines. I wonder if they got that guy yet. That's enough. Holy smoke, he's done it again. Second time. Listen. Fleeing from the scene of his second murder, a man alleged to be the so-called doorbell killer fired two shots at a patrolman in the Twin Oaks district last night at 11 o'clock. Then eluded the police dragnet around the area. Well, good Lord, Amy. Twin Oaks. Well, that's just over the hill. Patrolman Joseph Grimes had seen the man acting suspiciously on the porch of a house at 320 Green Street. He was unaware that within the doorway lay the body of Mrs. Mildred Norris, the Slayer's second victim. Evidence indicates Mrs. Norris, like her predecessor, answered the door only to meet a similar fate. Amy, you've got to be careful. Who knows what this guy's going to do next? So you tell him you'll be careful, Amy. And he gives you the usual dutiful peck on the cheek. Turns in the hallway at the exact spot he always turns, and you wait for it. Well, so long, honey bun. Don't take any wooden nickels. See you in the funny paper. <laughs> How many times have you heard that one, Amy? And how many times must you hear it again? You think about it all day as you go through your routine. And finally, in the afternoon, you get a chance to relax by the radio. Patrolman Grimes reported that all he could see of the killer was a dim shape. A heavy set man, about six feet tall, vaulting over a low stone wall in the distance. A small metal tie clasp bearing the initial R found near the scene is a possible clue to the criminal's identity. Chief of Police Henderson suspects the killer is a familiar figure, possibly a resident of the Twin Oaks neighborhood, since in both cases he was apparently recognized and accepted by the victim who opened the door. It's more than just an unpleasant news item with Twin Oaks just over the hill, isn't it, Amy? That night, Ralph comes home a little early before dark, and you notice he's carrying his thirty-eight pistol. There's an unhealthy suspicion through the neighborhood. A feeling that perhaps your next-door neighbor might be the guilty man. Ralph is tense and worried through dinner. And afterwards, during the usual routine with the evening paper, he skips his customary comments on the stock market. Well, according to this, they couldn't find the bullet. 
But from the size of the nick in the patrolman's leg, they figure it was a 38. I don't care what you say, Amy. I'm still going to pack this little pistol of mine. And if that bird ever shows up around here, I'll have the welcome all ready for... Stay where you are, Amy. I'll go to the door. I'll give this guy the surprise of his life. What do you want? Uh, well, uh, I'm Haley, evening bulletin. Working with Chief Police Henderson on the doorbell case. Uh, just checking the neighborhood. Oh, well, it's good to know the police are on the job. You seem to be on the job, too. Hmm? Uh, that 38. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Well, I'm not taking chances. Uh, yes, I understand. Got a permit, I suppose? Sure. Uh, 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 what's your name? Ralph Clark. Oh, Clark. Uh, how long have you been in this neighborhood? Three years. Uh, wife? Yeah, Amy. She's back in the kitchen. Okay. Uh, look, have you seen anyone acting suspicious around here last night or tonight? No. Where were you at 9 o'clock last night? Now, wait a minute, Mr. Haley. Did you say you were a reporter or a police investigator? I told you I'm working with Henderson. Isn't that good enough? No. You better run along, Haley. I've answered enough questions. If the chief of police has any more in mind, tell him to send one of his men in uniform. Any particular reason, Mr. Clark? Yeah. One reason and a good one. I have no intention of standing at the front door telling my life history to any reporter who happens to come along. Okay, Mr. Clark. Keep your door locked and be careful when you open it. That's all. That's when you began to think about it, Amy. As you stood back at the kitchen door and watched Ralph talking to Haley, the man from the evening bulletin. Ralph was jittery, almost suspiciously jittery, wasn't he? Standing there answering questions, the gun in his hand. And later that evening, when the doorbell rings again... Stay here. I'll go. Oh, Mrs. Gibson. That gun. What are you... Well, anything wrong with the gun? No, but I... All right. Maybe if more people had guns, these things wouldn't happen. What are you doing out this time of the night? Well, I... I just came to borrow a cup of sugar from Amy. I... Come on in. Well, just a minute. George! It's all right, George. I had Mr. Gibson watch from the window. Funny time to be borrowing sugar, if you ask me. Is Amy... She's in the kitchen. Oh, well, aren't you going to get your sugar? Oh, of course, Mr. Clark. I, I'll only be a minute. I'm sorry. I... It's all right. Get your sugar. It struck you again as he stood talking to Mrs. Gibson, didn't it, Amy? Nervous, jumpy, rude to her. Of course, it's fantastic. You admit that. But it's something to think about anyway. And perhaps a remark or two to Mrs. Gibson the next day as both of you go outside to hang up the washing. Uh, just a suggestion, a remark that slips out accidentally. Mrs. Gibson, after all, is always interested in her neighbors. She might see fit to pass it on. Here's your mail, Mrs. Gibson. A couple of magazines, too. Thank you, Postman. Sorry I jumped when you rang the doorbell. Oh, I'm getting it from everyone these days. I swear my husband George is going to break down if this business keeps up much longer. Hmm? That awful man still at large. Yeah. Oh, hello, Mr. Clark. How are you, Mrs. Gibson? Very well, thank you. I say, uh, I, I wanted to apologize for the way I acted last night. I was sort of on edge and... I see. Worried about Amy and all. And you know how it is with this doorbell man running around the neighborhood... Well, uh, I'd better be getting home to Amy. See you later. Home early, ain't he? Yes. Yesterday, too. Pretty jumpy. Do you think so? You seem to be. You know, I think the worst part of the whole affair is what the paper said about the man being a resident around here. About him being recognized by the victims just before yeah, he... Yeah, yeah. Can't trust anybody. You're right at that. For example... That tie clip with the R on it. Huh? Might even be him. R for Ralph. Oh, well, now, I don't know Could that. be, couldn't it? Six feet tall, heavy set. Oh, lots of people are six feet tall and heavy set. And carry guns? Same kind of gun the killer carries? Huh? He has one. He was carrying it right now. I could see the bulge in his pocket. Oh, now, Mrs. Gibson, it might have been something else. It's a gun. 
Amy told me this morning. You don't say a thirty-eight? Yes. Says he's carrying it on account of the knifer. Hmm. You won't mention this to anyone. Oh, no, no. You can trust me. Amy said he began acting queer just before the first one happened. Yeah? Says that lately it's gotten so he... He scares her. Told me so just this morning. You couldn't miss it, could you, Amy? A heavy set man, six feet tall. The initial R, the 38 pistol. The announcement by the police that they would shoot on sight. But even so, it's still an experiment. There's nothing solid enough to count on yet. But three nights later, after the gossip has had a chance to circulate around the neighborhood, something happens that is solid. And that's the night you and Ralph go over the hill to Twin Oaks, to the Walkers for bridge. At 10 o'clock, Harry Walker comes in from the kitchen. Sorry, folks, the bartender's up a stump. Yeah, out of ice. The old refrigerator ain't what she used to be. I guess we'll have to take them warm. Oh, gosh, that's a darn shame, Harry. Suppose I go home and get some, huh? You mean they got refrigerators in your neck of the woods? Why not? <laughs> no, 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 forget it, Ralph, old boy. In another hour, you won't care whether they're hot or cold. Right, Amy? Hey, no, wait a minute, Harry. Isn't there an ice machine down the street a couple of blocks? Say, there is a there. Forget all about it. I'll get down there. No, right no, now. no, let me, Harry. I've been wanting to get some air. <laughs> So Ralph leaves for the ice machine. And because it's warm in the house, you walk out on the porch and stand in the shadows. Yes, it's still an experiment. You'd noticed a kind of forced cordiality toward Ralph at the party, a a subtle undercurrent that would never penetrate that thick skin of his. Nothing subtle ever did. Then, as you stand there thinking, you notice a man walk up the stairs to the porch of a house a few doors up the street. There's a pause. The door opens. There's a sudden movement, the flash of a knife. Wait a minute, everybody, wait. You may as well sit down. Did you see it, Harry? Just over there. Yeah, but did you... Yes, I saw her. She's right where he left her. The police are in there now. I don't think yes, him. I can't stand it any longer. Bed to another I can. May I come in? Well, it looks like a party. Who's the host? I am. Well, I'm Haley, Evening Bulletin. What's your name? Harry Walker. Well, is it a party? Yeah, I had a few in for bridge. Well, friend, I'd send him home if I were you and tell him to stay there the rest of the night. And lock their doors. Uh, they all here? Yeah, I think so. Hello, Harry, old boy. Well, here's your ice, man. Twenty-five pounds. <laughs> the darn machine's haywire. Slammed the ice on my finger. I got a little blood on it. Hey. What's the matter with everybody? With the prologue of Boomerang. The Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But first, I want to thank all you friends who helped make January the biggest month in all of Signal's 14 years of growth. Bigger even than pre-war midsummer months when travel sent gasoline sales soaring. Yes, the recent swing to Signal has been terrific. And I think I can tell you two reasons why. The first is that great new signal gasoline in which chemists actually rearrange the atoms in gasoline molecules to create amazing new power. Power that makes today's vintage model cars feel young again with quicker starting, faster pickup, and smooth anti-knock performance. Even when you're taking the steepest hills and high. Power that gets so much extra efficiency from your motor you actually go farther than ever with each gallon of new signal gasoline. That'd be reason enough, wouldn't you say, for today's swing to signal? But there's another equally important reason. If you're already trading with a signal dealer, you know it. If not, I'll be back later to tell you about it. But for now, back to the whistler. Well, 
Well, Amy, that did the trick, didn't it? Changed it from a vague idea in the back of your head, from an experiment in creating suspicion to a solid plan to end your marriage in such a way that you'll manage to hold on to Ralph's house, his bank account, and the insurance policy. Somehow, Ralph manages to explain it to the police, shows them the defective ice machine, convinces them he actually did cut his finger when the ice dropped down. But the suspicion remains much stronger than before, and the town is aroused to such a pitch by the third killing in Twin Oaks that the police and the people are ready for anything. The next day, after Ralph has left, you visit Chief of Police Henderson, and a few minutes later... Did you see her, Chief? Yeah, Ely, I saw her. She's out there now. What about it? I don't know. Sometimes I think she knows what she's talking about. Sometimes I think she's just a dizzy dame who's got the jitters like everybody else. What are you going to do? I don't know. I checked the neighbors. They seem to think she's on the vein. The papers are screaming for an arrest. Mayor called me this morning. I think you've got a case. I don't. You know, it's funny. I had a feeling Mrs. Clark was holding something out on me. Yeah? Something she was afraid to spill. Like what? Well, that's just it. I don't know. She told me after they got home last night, she saw her husband go into the kitchen and boil a knife in caustic soda after he thought she'd gone to bed. Huh? What do you mean? That's it, so help me. You think the guy could be that stupid? He leaves a party in a house full of witnesses, kills a lady three doors away, comes back with blood in his hands and a nutty story about an ice machine, takes his wife home and goes into the kitchen to boil out the knife. Uh, What's wrong with that? Well, would you do it that way, Haley? No. Neither would the killer. I still think Clark is your man. Well, you've been right before. The guy's jumpy as a cat. I thought he was going to pull the trigger the other night, so help me. Well, you're going to get a chance to find out tonight. You're going to run him in? Yeah, just for questioning. But if his wife is right, he'll come out fighting. He's still carrying that gun, you know. Yes, yes, I checked the license. For some reason, she's afraid he'll try to kill her tonight. Oh? Yeah, now here's the plot. Sergeant Ransom's taking her home, letting her out a block away from the house. Now, she'll go in and try to get his gun. If she gets it... She'll raise the front window shade. But if she doesn't, she'll open the front door. That's pretty game of her. She says it'll be easier that way. I think she's right. What if she can't get the gun? Then Ransom goes in shooting. Well, there's a story in that for me. I think I better be out there, Chief. That's fine with me. We need all the help we can get on this case. All right, all right, Amy. I'll sharpen the carving knife. Anything to get dinner on the table. I'm just saying there's no excuse for you staying at a hen party till after dark. Especially now. Check that front door, Amy. Be sure it's locked and then come back here. I don't want you fooling around the front end of the house. Darn fool women. No wonder they get it going. What's that? Amy! Amy, are you all right? Amy, I'm coming! I'm coming! I do with that gun. The drawer. Here it is. I'm coming, Amy. Okay, brother, I... Oh! Oh. Well, you were right, Mrs. Clark. Did I get him, Haley? You sure did, Sergeant. I'd better call the coroner. think we can close this case, Haley? I don't know why not, Chief. The guy came out shooting just like she said he would. Yeah, with a knife and a sharpening stone on the floor of the kitchen. Yes, he was sharpening it when she got there. Hmm. Heavy set man, dark suit, initial R. The gun, the knife, and sharpening stone. It all adds up. Yeah, that's the trouble. Huh? It adds up too well. Comes out even. I've never been on a case in my life that came out exactly even. Oh, now, wait a minute, Chief. She he... was holding something out of me, Haley. What makes you so sure? Are you sure she isn't? I think so. I hope you're right. This is your evening reporter, ladies and gentlemen, with another last-minute news roundup. According to the latest statement from the office of Chief of Police Henderson, the case of the doorbell killer is not quite ready for the closed file. According to Henderson, the case against the late Ralph Clark was entirely circumstantial. And had the man gone to trial, the state case against him would have been very rickety. The fact that there is no living witness to any of the killings is the biggest point in favor of Clark. 
Henderson's statement naturally raised a furor amongst the city hall boys. Well, Amy, it came off almost perfectly. The house is yours now, and the bank account and the insurance policy. You're proud of yourself, aren't you? You chuckle at Mrs. Gibson's sympathetic understanding and chuckle harder at Mrs. Gray down the street who snubs you as the wife of a murderer. It won't make any difference in a week or two, will it, Amy? You'll be relaxing in Miami, forgetting all about the dull little city and the dull little people in it. Meanwhile, the case is still a little unsettled, and you decide to settle it once and for all. So you make another visit to Chief of Police Henderson's office. Now that Ralph is gone, it won't make any difference. I saw her again today, Haley. Uh, who? Mrs. Clark. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, we can send the case to close file. Oh, how come, Chief? Oh, I'll give you a statement for your paper in ten minutes. I'm satisfied now that we got the right man. You see, the case against Clark is no longer circumstantial. What do you mean? There was an eyewitness to the third killing. Wait a minute. An eyewitness? Yeah. I knew she was holding out on me. She was standing on the porch of the Walker house during the bridge party. She saw the killer walk up to the front door three houses away. Say, that is something. Do you think she could identify him at night at at that distance? She says so, and I believe her. She says it was her husband. Why did she hold out? Afraid. Oh? Satisfied? I don't know. Maybe. I think you're making a wise decision, Mrs. Clark. The real estate market is tops right now, and 15000 cash is a good price for your house. We'll follow your instructions and have the draft sent to the Florida State Bank. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Clark? Yes, we've done just as you requested. Converting the endowment insurance to cash will bring you slightly less than $20,000. Right. We'll have the check forwarded to the Florida State Bank. That's 185.60, one-way mainliner to Miami, including excess baggage. Your plane leaves tonight at 11 o'clock, Mrs. Clark. So you're all ready to go, aren't you, Amy? Your bags are packed in the living room. The house is sold. The airline tickets are in your purse. And there's over $35,000 in cash waiting for you in the Florida State Bank. It was a neat job, wasn't it? There wasn't a hole in it. Not a loose end. You're waiting now for the taxi that will take you to the airport. And then promptly, at half past ten... Hello, Mrs. Clark. Haley, evening bulletin. Remember me? There was a loose end, wasn't there, Amy? And a million questions hit you at once as Haley comes in and closes the door, smiling confidently. Haley, ace crime reporter. The man who cracked the Jenkins case almost single-handed. And he knows. You can tell it by the look on his face. Made a mistake, Mrs. Clark, a big mistake. You never should have said you were on that porch watching the guy that night at Walker's. That was a dumb trick, Mrs. Clark. You should have been sitting pretty if you hadn't opened your mouth once too often. (laughs) Just try to wrangle out of this one. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, here's that second reason for today's amazing swing to signal. The first, you'll recall, is that great new signal gasoline. But equally important is the more thorough, more conscientious service your car gets at independently operated signal stations. A typical of this is signal's double-check lubrication service. And why is it called double-check? Because each part is checked not just once but twice against Signal's lubrication chart, which shows every lubrication point and specifies which of Signal's nine specialized oils and greases each part should have. That's Signal's way of making doubly sure that not a single lubrication point on your car is ever overlooked. No wonder Signal's serviced car stays so happy and lasts so long. 
Now, wouldn't you say these are two mighty good reasons for today's swing to signal? More conscientious signal service, geared to keep today's aging cars in the running. And that great new signal gasoline that helps you enjoy peak performance from your car while you go farther than ever per gallon. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Amy, the walls are tumbling down all around you. You forget about the money in the Florida bank. Forget about the 11 o'clock plane. All you can think of is the slip you must have made somewhere. The statement to Chief Henderson that you were a witness to the third killing. Even though the man was nothing but a shadowy form to you three houses away. Somehow it caught you up, Amy. Somehow it brought Haley to you, just as you were about to leave. You stand there petrified, wondering. Then suddenly... You see something in Haley's eyes you never noticed before as he slowly walks toward you. You were going to leave town. You were going to take a powder, weren't you? Well, that'd never do, Mrs. Clark. Wouldn't do to have a loose witness floating around the country ready to spill the beans whenever she felt like it. No, I wouldn't like that at all, Mrs. Clark. There are just two people who know who the doorbell killer is. You and... Me. That's one too many. I gotta fix that, don't I? Chief Henderson of my newspaper wouldn't like it if they knew the guy with the knife was... Me? (laughs) Yes. It's been three months now since Richard Haley, the doorbell killer, was executed for the murder of Amy Clark. But the most important feature of the case wasn't even mentioned in the headlines. It's the story of a vicious, conniving woman and a husband named Ralph who grated on her nerves. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen, based on a story by Nancy and Alfred Seal, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the whistler. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you 
with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, The Master Touch. It had been 20 years since Charles Carter polished a pair of shoes. He thought about those 20 years as he sat alone in his bedroom, working on them, sponging them off carefully with saddle soap, making sure that not a speck of the gummy red clay that covered them remained. Red clay, sticky, stubborn stuff that clung to them like glue. They were beautiful shoes, handmade, custom-built, the kind of shoes you'd expect a successful businessman like Charles to wear. He was proud of what he'd accomplished in those 20 years. As he worked on the shoes, he thought of the brutal poverty he grew up in, the resolution he made as a kid that someday he'd have more money than he could spend in a lifetime. The way money became a god to him, pushed him up the ladder from factory worker to top executive, and left him still dissatisfied, wanting more. It never mattered how he got it, so long as the money was there. And now the biggest opportunity of his life had arrived. He cleaned the last bit of red clay from his shoes and waited. Yes? Charles? Yes, Amelia, what is it? Charles, I didn't want to bother you, but... Oh, it's nothing, Amelia. What is it? Could you come over, Charles? I'm terribly upset. The police are here. Police? Good Lord, Amelia. Tell me, what's the matter? I don't know. I'm afraid you are right about it. Henry, that's it, isn't it? They think so. Amelia, it doesn't matter a hoot whether or not that caretaker was a favorite of your father's. I tell you, the man's dangerous, and you've got to get rid of him. Oh, please don't discuss it now, Charles. Can you come here? Of course. Henry, the caretaker at Greenacres, Amelia Rankin's beautiful estate. You've told her he's vicious and irresponsible, haven't you, Charles? That perhaps it isn't safe for her to be living alone there with him. And she appreciates your interest. You are interested in Amelia, aren't you? Yes, in Amelia. And, uh, incidentally, in the fact that she's chairman of the board and holder of the controlling interest in the company you work for now that her father is dead. So you're concerned about Henry the caretaker when you arrive a half hour late. Amelia, what's happened? Oh, Charles, I'm so glad you could come. And uh, who is this, Miss Rankin? Oh, my name is Carter, officer. I'm general manager of Miss Rankin's firm. Now, what's happened? Charles, somebody tried to kill me tonight. What? Uh, Just a minute, Mr. Carter. If you don't mind, I'd like to continue with the caretaker here. Oh, of course. Now, Henry... Two hours ago, someone stood outside on the grounds and put a bullet through Miss Rankin's bedroom window. Don't look at me. I've been with the family ever since this place was built. He trusted me, he did. He trusted me even more than he did. Uh, Henry. It's true, ain't it? That's why he said I was to stay here. Call me alone into his room just before he died. Who? Mr. Terrence, her father. I see. Now, Miss Rankin, you say you've been reading until about nine o'clock? Yes, I got up when I'd finished and walked past the window. There was a crash of glass, that's all. Hmm. Henry, what were you doing with this gun? I've always had it. Mr. Terrence told me to always keep it handy. Any idea why one of the shells is discharged? Someone must have took it while I was asleep. And then walked out on the ground, shot at Miss Rankin, returned it to your house and left. Why not? Miss Rankin, do you know of any reason why Henry would do a thing like this? No, I don't. We checked it, Ed. Find the place? Yeah, found the spot where he stood and fired the shot. Checked the footprints against Henry's shoes. Match? So. What did I tell you, officer? It was someone else. Uh, he didn't say that. He said the prints didn't match. Hmm? Maybe what? it was someone else, and maybe you're just smarter than I think you are. Uh, Stan, what about the prints? Are they clear? Couldn't be better. Soft spot there that's made to order. Kind of gummy red clay. They've gone at last. Will you believe me now, Amelia? I tell you, that man Henry isn't safe. Oh, we don't know, Charles. You must think this over carefully, Amelia. It could happen again. But I can't let him go. He was right about Father. Well, you don't have to let him go. What am I going to do, Charles? Amelia, 
Perhaps what you need is someone here to protect you. Maybe you're right. With the prologue of The Master Touch, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. You know, friends, we of the Whistler cast think you're just about the swellest listening audience that ever turned a radio dial. And tonight we've got more reason than ever for thinking that. Remember, last month I told you that in January's radio survey, the Whistler received the highest popularity rating in all radio history for a West Coast program. Well, tonight I have in my hand the results of February's survey. And you've done it again. Yes, for the second consecutive month, The Whistler is way out in front of any popularity rating ever given a West Coast program. Naturally, this makes all those friendly signal dealers who bring you The Whistler mighty happy. In fact, there's only one thing I can think of that could make them any happier. That's if next time your car needs gas, you try just one tankful of new signal gasoline. My bet is that once you try Signal's power-packed new super fuel that now helps you go farther than ever you too will join the ever-increasing swing to Signal. A swing that has made the Signal organization grow in just 14 years, from a mere handful of stations in Southern California to a network of dealer-owned stations serving seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, back to the Whistler. That was the master touch, wasn't it, Charles? You were sharp enough to see the opportunity the minute old Terence Rankin, president of Rankin Industries, died and left the controlling interest to his lonely, frustrated daughter, Amelia. In the weeks that followed, you worked slowly and carefully to gain her confidence. And when that sharp, analytical mind of yours sensed the friction between Amelia and Henry, the caretaker, you knew what your next move would be. The red clay is dried now on the path where you stood and fired the shot through the window, purposely missing her. And the weather has changed, suggesting an afternoon walk. Just the two of you, Charles. You and Amelia. Isn't it lovely out today? It was so nice of you to ask me to come. Yes, it is lovely. All this and you, Amelia? Please, Charles. Why not? If I think you're lovely, why shouldn't I say so? Because I know it isn't true. I wish it were. Ah, the world is full of beautiful things when one's in love. You don't mean that. Why must you always say the same thing? You know, sometimes I feel as if you don't trust me. Oh, I do. Really, I do. Maybe I'm being presumptuous, huh? Not you, Charles, ever. I'm glad of that. I want you to have faith in me. I know. It's just that since Mother and Dad died, it hasn't been easy. I've been on my own and, oh, I've had everything, but, but I haven't really... I've had to be so cautious. You mean Henry, huh? No, not exactly. It's just that when you have money, too much of it, you're always meeting people who pretend to be friendly when all they want is to get their hands on the money. What makes people like that, Charles? Is money that important? It has a terrible fascination for some people. If I thought a lot of someone, and I found his motive was that, it would hurt me terribly. Of course it would, Amelia. But you don't think that I would... would... You know I'm not thinking of you. You've been so sweet and kind to me. I've never been so happy, even though I am so alone. You don't like being alone, do you? It's frightening sometimes. You do need someone, Amelia. With Henry there and the things the way they are, you... You ought to have someone to take care of you, to look out for everything. What are you trying to say, Charles? I'm asking you to marry me. Do you really mean it? Of course I do. Oh, I'm so happy. Yes, Charles, that was the master touch. It's the biggest deal you ever swung, isn't it? And it is a business deal. Dollars and cents cash on the line. The only difference is that it's accomplished in a church that the dotted line is on a marriage license, that the witnesses are wedding guests instead of company executives. 
But the plan has only begun, hasn't it, Charles? And like everything else you do, it has to be perfect. You have to take your time, move cautiously. So it's three months after you and Amelia are married before you decide to move again. Charles? Yes, Amelia? Come over here and sit beside me. I was going into the library, Amelia. I have a reference to look up. I'll only be a moment. All right. What's on your mind? These few months we've been married, have they been happy for you? Why, darling, what a question. They've been the happiest months of my life. You've been more than kind to me. You're keeping something from me. What is it? When you go to the factory in the morning, I like to watch you leave. Mm -hmm. I can see you from the bedroom window. I hope you don't mind, Charles. Of course I don't. It's a little like saying goodbye a second time if I can see you drive away. Why, that's uh, charming, Amelia. After Henry took the car out of the garage for you this morning, he went back to his cottage. Well? Henry's little dog usually goes back to the cottage with him. But he didn't go back this morning. Henry's dog? But, but... When you drove away, you ran over him. It looked almost deliberate. Why, Amelia, I had no idea. Henry was I'll broken have to hearted. speak to Henry about it. I didn't see him. Amelia, I... Well, I swear I didn't. Good heavens, I, I know what that dog means to him. I thought perhaps you were worried about something and didn't realize what was happening. Worried? You've been acting so strangely the past few days, as if you had something terribly important on your mind. Why, I... I don't understand, Amelia. I know what it must be like. Married to my money. What do you mean? It puts you, oh, outside in a way, doesn't it? Amelia, you mustn't feel that way. Just the same. From now on, everything I have is yours and everything you have is mine. That's the way marriage should be, don't you think? Please, darling, Money I... so isn't so important, Charles. Happiness means much more. I found that out. I called the lawyer this afternoon. There'll be some papers to sign and then I'll feel better. Oh, I wanted so much to marry someone who wanted me and not my money. You do believe in me, don't you, Amelia? You needn't ask me that. I always will. You hate her for that, don't you, Charles? As usual, she's done the honorable thing. Signed over all she has to you. Making you wonder whether the rest of the plan is worthwhile. You were stunned by it, weren't you, Charles? The money is yours now, and you can stand pat. That is, if you're willing to spend the rest of your life with her. When you face that question, you realize you're going ahead with a plan. It's been boiling around in your brain too long, hasn't it, Charles? So now you're going to kill her. That's why you walk up to the desk of the Roosevelt Hotel in North City the next afternoon. North City, a hundred miles away from Green Acres and Amelia. Yes, sir, may I help you? My name is Charles Carter. I have a reservation. Just a moment, I'll check. All right. Yes, sir, room 241. Oh, I asked the clerk for something at the back of the building. I have some reports to write. I'll need quiet. Well, you'll find this satisfactory, I'm sure. Soundproof and in the rear. I'll be typing all afternoon, possibly late into the night. I don't want to be disturbed under any circumstances. Yes, sir. I'll tell the operator. Oh, and would you tell the maids, too, please? If they hear me typing inside, they're not to come in. If you say so, sir. I'll have a boy take your bag. It looks heavy. Excuse me, sir. Oh, oh, oh I... I'm sorry. I was looking the other way. Clerk, I've decided to take that room you were holding for me. Lane is the name. 385. All right, Mr. Lane. Just a minute, please. Oh, here's the boy, Mr. Carter. You can go on up. Thanks. Well, Charles, it's underway, and you're a little jittery. Was it unusual that Mr. Lane, the man who bumped into you at the desk, was the same man who looked at you peculiarly when you almost ran into him at the entrance of the hotel? You finally decide that it's natural, that you're on edge, imagining things. Five minutes later, alone in room 241 at the back of the hotel, you open your bag and take out a small portable phonograph with a repeating attachment Connect it. Put on a special record and listen. Yeah, 
Yes, Charles, you're busy typing on a phonograph record. You watch it repeat a couple of times, satisfy yourself it's working perfectly, then sneak out of the room, down the back stairs, and out the trade entrance at the rear of the hotel. In a bar around the corner, you find a telephone and put in a long-distance call to Johnson, your personnel manager at the factory. You surprised us, Mr. Carter. We didn't know you were going to North City. How long will you be there? I came down to look over the new assembly line. Got in about two hours ago. Had the car checked over. I'm going to the plant in the morning. Everything all right? Well, there are those reports that you took with you. The auditors are coming tomorrow. Well, I didn't have a chance to check them over last night, Johnson. I'll have them ready by morning. Yes, but if you're in North City, I'll be coming back as soon as I check the plant. I ought to arrive at the house around 11. Why don't you and I meet there? And then I'll give you the reports. Oh, all right, Mr. Carter. 11 o'clock. Good afternoon, Roosevelt Hotel. Will you ring Mr. Charles Carter's room, please? Just a moment. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Carter isn't receiving any calls. But this is important. I'm the superintendent of one of his plants. I'm sorry, sir, if you'd care to leave a message. He is there, isn't he? Yes, sir. He's quite busy, though, and requested not to be disturbed. If you leave a message... No. No, I'll call back later. The clerk is a first-class man, isn't he, Charles? Follows instructions to the letter. You're positive now that no one can get through to you that no one will go into the room as long as the typewriter is working. You're on the last lap, Charles. On your way to the back alley where you left your car, you stop at a drugstore and pick up a small bottle of liquid. That's for Henry to help him sleep better. Henry is a rather important part of it, isn't he? Two hours later, you're driving up the road to Greenacre's. But before you get to the house, you turn off the road and leave the car in a wooded section, hiding it from the highway. Then you walk up to the house and find Amelia in the living room. Oh, oh, Charles, it's you. I didn't hear you come in. I didn't mean to startle you, Amelia. Where's the car, Charles? Why do you ask that? I didn't hear you drive up. I had a little trouble with it. Left it down the road. I'll have Henry look at it. Not tonight, Amelia. It's late. Yes, I thought for a while you might not be coming home. I'm having a glass of wine. Won't you have one with me? Thanks, I will. You look hot and tired. Did you walk far? Oh, a couple of miles, I guess. Here. This will make you feel better. Thanks. That is good. I am tired for some reason. Johnson called about noon. He was looking for some reports. Yes, he called me. I... Made a trip to North City. Wanted to look over the new assembly line. Having some trouble with the hoists. But I thought they straightened that out last week. Oh, it's a technicality. Let's not talk business tonight, dear. I'm not up to it. Oh, forgive me, dear. More wine? Please. Well, that's fine. Why don't you run up to bed, Amelia? I want to take a bottle of bourbon over to Henry. Tonight? Well, I'm going to try to make it up to him about the dog. He'll feel better over a drink. Well, don't sit up till all hours, will you? No. No, Amelia. I'll be right back. Let me pour you another drink, Henry. Aren't you drinking none, Mr. Carter? Oh, we've been drinking wine, Mrs. Carter and I. They don't mix so well for me. How come you're over here pouring me drinks this time of night? Well, Henry, I feel so rotten about that dog. You know, I, I, I want you to know if there's anything I can do to make it up to you. You I... never offered me a drink before. If only you do it now. I don't like you. Oh? Lip are changing his spots that way. You never think about nobody but yourself. Hmm. Anybody else should have stopped. You run right over, Stubby, and I'd seen it. I'm trying to tell you you're wrong, Henry. And that ain't all. Here, here. Have another drink. Let, let, me, let me fill your glass. Don't want another one. Don't want nothing from you. Oh, drink that and go to bed. You'll feel better in the morning. Take in the bottle with you. <laughs> well, it's, it's empty. Uh, could have brung a full one. You've had enough, Henry. More than enough. <laughs> He 
Yes, Charles, that's more than enough, isn't it? The dope liquor will keep him asleep and harmless until the hue and cry is raised in the morning. You pick up Henry's hatchet and gloves from the wood pile at the back of his cottage and hurry back to the house. Yes? What happened? Nothing. Nothing, dear. I bumped into the lamp. Turn off the light before you come up. All right. You stand there for a moment, Charles. At the last minute, with a hatchet in your hand, you begin to waver. What are you waiting for, Charles? What's the matter, Charles? What? Why don't you come up? I think I'll read a little while, dear. Go to sleep. I'll be up pretty soon. Yes, get yourself together, Charles. You want to give her a chance to fall asleep, don't you? You're safe now. Henry's in a drunken stupor. He can't wake up. And after it's over, you'll plant the hatchet in Henry's cottage along with the gloves, just as you did with the gun four months ago. There'll be no question this time. No footprints in the red clay path. And who'll believe poor, confused Henry and his story about the drinks you gave him? With you busily typing on a report in a hotel room a hundred miles away. A few minutes later, you see the light go out at the top of the stairs. And you sit there in the living room until you're sure Amelia's asleep. Then, holding the hatchet tight in your right hand. You start up the stairs. There's Amelia on the bed. You do hate her, don't you, Charles? You try to steady yourself. Forget the pounding in your head and walk over to the bed. <coughs> Well, Charles... Amelia! You can stop striking the bed, Charles. I'm not in it. I'm over here by the window. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a question... Which of these parts could your car get along best without? The water pump, a universal joint, or a steering knuckle? Well, the answer's obvious. Without even one of its vital parts, your car couldn't run. That's why when your signal dealer lubricates your car, he takes no chance of overlooking even one part. It's for that very reason that he uses Signal's famous lubrication chart, which shows every lubrication point on your car and specifies which of Signal's nine specialized oils and greases each part should have for long, trouble-free service. And he checks each part against this chart not just once, but twice, which is why it's called Signal Double Check Lubrication. This is typical of the more thorough, more conscientious service your car gets from dealer-owned Signal stations. Nowadays, when cars that are already old must keep on serving you until there are enough new ones to go around, I'd say this is another mighty good reason for today's swing to signal. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Charles, the master touch wasn't quite enough. You stand there, bewildered, as Amelia switches on the light. The shot through her window four months ago. The careful, gradual cultivation process. The marriage. The alibi in North City. It all seems ridiculous, doesn't it, Charles? And you're too dumbfounded to say anything. You can put the hatchet down, Charles. You won't need it. What are you doing? Nothing. I was looking out of the window. The moonlight's beautiful. You can see for miles. Isn't that your car down by Miller's Pond? It's hidden from the road, but I can see it clearly from here. You fool. No, Charles. I... I said you wouldn't need the hatchet. 
What's going to stop me, Amelia? What I have to say. Won't do you any good to stall? I've come too far for that. Yes. Much too far. You see, Charles, I know everything you did today. I hired a detective to follow you several days ago. He was waiting for you at the Roosevelt Hotel when you arrived. I talked to him on the telephone just before you came in tonight. His name is Lane, isn't it? Yes, that's the name he used. Well? He told me you were rather a good typist. And I told him that you couldn't type at all. So he went into the room. It was a clever way to establish an alibi, Charles. But I wasn't sure until he told me about the bottle of sleeping drug you bought in North City. Get to the point. It's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? My believing that out of all people, there was one whom I could believe in. Where's your detective now? Outside? No. He did his work. I dismissed him. You mean we're alone? Yes. You expect me to believe that? It doesn't matter whether you do or not. Remember our agreement, Charles? Everything I had was yours. Everything you had was mine. So when you decided to take my life... Quit simpering. If you think you can talk me out of it, I said it doesn't matter anymore, Charles. Nothing matters now. You see, the wine we drank together tonight was poison. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Robert Foster, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.